LIV, Origin and Doctrine of the Politians. Origin and Doctrine of the Politians. Their persecution by the Greek emperors. Revolt in Armenia and. Transplantation into Thrace. Propagation in the West. The Seeds, Character, and Consequences of the Reformation. In the profession of Christianity, the variety of national characters may be clearly distinguished. The natives of Syria and Egypt abandoned their lives to lazy and contemplative devotion, Rome again aspired to the dominion of the world, and the wit of the lively and loquacious Greeks was consumed in the disputes of metaphysical theology. The incomprehensible mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation, instead of commanding their silent submission, were agitated in vehement and subtle controversies, which enlarged their faith at the expense, perhaps, of their charity and reason. From the Council of Nice to the end of the 7th century, the peace and unity of the Church was invaded by these spiritual wars. And so deeply did they affect the decline and fall of the Empire, that the historian has too often been compelled to attend the synods, to explore the creeds, and to enumerate the sects, of this busy period of ecclesiastical annals. From the beginning of the 8th century to the last ages of the Byzantine Empire, the sound of controversy was seldom heard, curiosity was exhausted, zeal was fatigued, and, in the decrees of six councils, the articles of the Catholic faith had been irrevocably defined. The spirit of dispute, however vain and pernicious, requires some energy and exercise of the mental faculties, and the prostrate Greeks were content to fast, to pray, and to believe in blind obedience to the patriarch and his clergy. During a long dream of superstition, the Virgin and the saints, their visions and miracles, their relics and images, were preached by the monks, and worshipped by the people. And the appellation of people might be extended, without injustice, to the first ranks of civil society. At an unseasonable moment, the Isaurian emperors attempted somewhat rudely to awaken their subjects, under their influence reason might obtain some proselytes, a far greater number was swayed by interest or fear. But the Eastern world embraced or deplored their visible deities, and the restoration of images was celebrated as the Feast of Orthodoxy. In this passive and unanimous state the ecclesiastical rulers were relieved from the toil, or deprived of the pleasure, of persecution. The pagans had disappeared, the Jews were silent and obscure. The disputes with the Latins were rare and remote hostilities against a national enemy, and the sects of Egypt and Syria enjoyed a free toleration under the shadow of the Arabian caliphs. About the middle of the 7th century, a branch of Manichaeans was selected as the victims of spiritual tyranny, their patience was at length exasperated to despair and rebellion. And their exile has scattered over the West the seeds of Reformation. These important events will justify some inquiry into the doctrine and story of the Paulicians. 6750 and, as they cannot plead for themselves, our candid criticism will magnify the good, and abate or suspect the evil, that is reported by their adversaries. The Gnostics, who had distracted the infancy, were oppressed by the greatness and authority, of the Church. Instead of emulating or surpassing the wealth, learning, and numbers of the Catholics, their obscure remnant was driven from the capitals of the East and West, and confined to the villages and mountains along the borders of the Euphrates. Some vestige of the Martianites may be detected in the 5th century, 6751 but the numerous sects were finally lost in the odious name of the Manichaeans. And these heretics, who presumed to reconcile the doctrines of Zoroaster and Christ, were pursued by the two religions with equal and unrelenting hatred. Under the grandson of Heraclius, in the neighborhood of Samosata, more famous for the birth of Lucian than for the title of a Syrian kingdom, a reformer arose, esteemed by the Paulicians as the chosen messenger of truth. In his humble dwelling of Mananalis, Constantine entertained a deacon, who returned from Syrian captivity, and received the inestimable gift of the New Testament, which was already concealed from the vulgar by the prudence of the Greek, and perhaps of the Gnostic, clergy. 6752 These books became the measure of his studies and the rule of his faith, and the Catholics, who dispute his interpretation, acknowledged that his text was genuine and sincere. But he attached himself with peculiar devotion to the writings and character of St. Paul, the name of the Paulicians is derived by their enemies from some unknown and domestic teacher. 
but I am confident that they gloried in their affinity to the Apostle of the Gentiles. His disciples, Titus, Timothy, Silvanus, Tychicus, were represented by Constantine and his fellow laborers, the names of the apostolic churches were applied to the congregations which they assembled in Armenia and Cappadocia. And this innocent allegory revived the example and memory of the first ages. In the Gospel, and the Epistles of St. Paul, his faithful follower investigated the creed of primitive Christianity. And, whatever might be the success, a Protestant reader will applaud the spirit, of the inquiry. But if the scriptures of the Paulicians were pure, they were not perfect. Their founders rejected the two epistles of Esti. Peter, 6753 The apostle of the circumcision, whose dispute with their favorite for the observance of the law could not easily be forgiven. 6754 They agreed with their Gnostic brethren in the universal contempt for the Old Testament, the books of Moses and the prophets, which have been consecrated by the decrees of the Catholic Church. With equal boldness, and doubtless with more reason, Constantine, the new Sylvanus, disclaimed the visions, which, in so many bulky and splendid volumes, had been published by the Oriental sects. 6755 The fabulous productions of the Hebrew patriarchs and the sages of the East, the spurious Gospels, Epistles, and Acts, which in the first age had overwhelmed the Orthodox Code, the theology of Manes, and the authors of the kindred heresies. And the thirty generations, or eons, which had been created by the fruitful fancy of Valentine. The Paulicians sincerely condemned the memory and opinions of the Manichaean sect, and complained of the injustice which impressed that invidious name on the simple votaries of St. Paul and of Christ. Of the ecclesiastical chain, many links had been broken by the Paulician reformers, and their liberty was enlarged, as they reduced the number of masters, at whose voice profane reason must bow to mystery and miracle. The early separation of the Gnostics had preceded the establishment of the Catholic worship, and against the gradual innovations of discipline and doctrine they were as strongly guarded by habit and aversion, as by the silence of a stee. Paul and the Evangelists The objects which had been transformed by the magic of superstition, appeared to the eyes of the Paulicians in their genuine and naked colors. An image made without hands was the common workmanship of a mortal artist, to whose skill alone the wood and canvas must be indebted for their merit or value. The miraculous relics were a heap of bones and ashes, destitute of life or virtue, or of any relation, perhaps, with the person to whom they were ascribed. The true and vivifying cross was a piece of sound or rotten timber, the body and blood of Christ, a loaf of bread and a cup of wine, the gifts of nature and the symbols of grace. The Mother of God was degraded from her celestial honors and immaculate virginity, and the saints and angels were no longer solicited to exercise the laborious office of mediation in heaven, and ministry upon earth. In the practice, or at least in the theory, of the sacraments, the Paulicians were inclined to abolish all visible objects of worship, and the words of the gospel were, in their judgment, the baptism and communion of the faithful. They indulged a convenient latitude for the interpretation of Scripture, and as often as they were pressed by the literal sense, they could escape to the intricate mazes of figure and allegory. Their utmost diligence must have been employed to dissolve the connection between the Old and the New Testament, since they adored the latter as the oracles of God, and abhorred the former as the fabulous and absurd invention of men or demons. We cannot be surprised, that they should have found in the Gospel the orthodox mystery of the Trinity, but, instead of confessing the human nature and substantial sufferings of Christ. They amused their fancy with a celestial body that passed through the Virgin like water through a pipe. With a fantastic crucifixion, that eluded the vain and important malice of the Jews. A creed thus simple and spiritual was not adapted to the genius of the times. 6756 And the rational Christian, who might have been contented with the light yoke and easy burden of Jesus and his apostles, was justly offended, that the Paulicians should dare to violate the unity of God. The first article of natural and revealed religion. Their belief and their trust was in the Father, of Christ, of the human soul, and of the invisible world. But they likewise held the eternity of matter. A stubborn and rebellious substance, the origin of a second principle of an active being, who has created this visible world, 
and exercises his temporal reign till the final consummation of death and sin. 6757 The appearances of moral and physical evil had established the two principles in the ancient philosophy and religion of the East, from whence this doctrine was transfused to the various swarms of the Gnostics. A thousand shades may be devised in the nature and character of Araman, from a rival god to a subordinate demon, from passion and frailty to pure and perfect malevolence, but, in spite of our efforts, the goodness, and the power of Ormist are placed at the opposite extremities of the line. And every step that approaches the one must recede in equal proportion from the other. 6758. The apostolic labors of Constantine Sylvanus soon multiplied the number of his disciples, the secret recompense of spiritual ambition. The remnant of the Gnostic sects, and especially the Manichaeans of Armenia, were united under his standard, many Catholics were converted or seduced by his arguments. And he preached with success in the regions of Pontus 6759 in Cappadocia, which had long since imbibed the religion of Zoroaster. The Paulician teachers were distinguished only by their scriptural names, by the modest title of fellow pilgrims, by the austerity of their lives, their zeal or knowledge, and the credit of some extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit. But they were incapable of desiring, or at least of obtaining, the wealth and honors of the Catholic prelacy, such anti-Christian pride they bitterly censured. And even the rank of elders or presbyters was condemned as an institution of the Jewish synagogue. The new sect was loosely spread over the provinces of Asia Minor to the westward of the Euphrates. Six of their principal congregations represented the churches to which St. Paul had addressed his epistles. And their founder chose his residence in the neighborhood of Colonia 6760 in the same district of Pontus which had been celebrated by the altars of Bologna 6761 and the miracles of Gregory. 6762 After a mission of twenty-seven years, Sylvanus, who had retired from the tolerating government of the Arabs, fell a sacrifice to Roman persecution. The laws of the pious emperors, which seldom touched the lives of less odious heretics, proscribed without mercy or disguise the tenets, the books, and the persons of the Montanists and Manichaeans, the books were delivered to the flames. And all who should presume to secrete such writings, or to profess such opinions, were devoted to an ignominious death. 6763 A Greek minister, armed with legal and military powers, appeared at Colonia to strike the shepherd, and to reclaim, if possible, the lost sheep. By a refinement of cruelty, Simeon placed the unfortunate Sylvanus before a line of his disciples, who were commanded, as the price of their pardon and the proof of their repentance, to massacre their spiritual father. They turned aside from the impious office, the stones dropped from their filial hands, and of the whole number, only one executioner could be found, a new David, as he is styled by the Catholics, who boldly overthrew the giant of heresy. This apostate, Justin was his name, again deceived and betrayed his unsuspecting brethren, and a new conformity to the acts of St. Paul may be found in the conversion of Simeon, like the apostle, he embraced the doctrine which he had been sent to persecute, renounced his honors and fortunes, and required among the Paulicians the fame of a missionary and a martyr. They were not ambitious of martyrdom 6764, but in a calamitous period of 150 years, their patience sustained whatever zeal could inflict, and power was insufficient to eradicate the obstinate vegetation of fanaticism and reason. From the blood and ashes of the first victims, a succession of teachers and congregations repeatedly arose, amidst their foreign hostilities, they found leisure for domestic quarrels, they preached, they disputed, they suffered. And the virtues, the apparent virtues, of Sergius, in a pilgrimage of thirty-three years, are reluctantly confessed by the Orthodox historians. 6765 The native cruelty of Justinian II was stimulated by a pious cause. And he vainly hoped to extinguish, in a single conflagration, the name and memory of the Paulicians. By their primitive simplicity, their abhorrence of popular superstition, the iconoclast princes might have been reconciled to some erroneous doctrines. But they themselves were exposed to the calumnies of the monks, and they chose to be the tyrants, lest they should be accused as the accomplices, of the Manichaeans. Such a reproach has sullied the clemency of Nicephorus, who relaxed in their favor the severity of the penal statutes, 
nor will his character sustain the honor of a more liberal motive. The feeble Michael I, the rigid Leo the Armenian, were foremost in the race of persecution, but the prize must doubtless be adjudged to the sanguinary devotion of Theodora, who restored the images to the Oriental Church. Her inquisitors explored the cities and mountains of the Lesser Asia, and the flatterers of the Empress have affirmed that, in a short reign, one hundred thousand Paulicians were extirpated by the sword, the gibbet, or the flames. Her guilt or merit has perhaps been stretched beyond the measure of truth, but if the account be allowed, it must be presumed that many simple iconoclasts were punished under a more odious name. And that some who were driven from the church, unwillingly took refuge in the bosom of heresy. The most furious and desperate of rebels are the sectaries of a religion long persecuted, and at length provoked. In a holy cause they are no longer susceptible of fear or remorse, the justice of their arms hardens them against the feelings of humanity, and they revenge their fathers' wrongs on the children of their tyrants. Such have been the Hussites of Bohemia and the Calvinists of France, and such, in the ninth century, were the Paulicians of Armenia and the adjacent provinces. 6766 They were first awakened to the massacre of a governor and bishop, who exercised the imperial mandate of converting or destroying the heretics, and the deepest recesses of Mount Argeus protected their independence and revenge. A more dangerous and consuming flame was kindled by the persecution of Theodora, and the revolt of Carbius, a valiant Paulician, who commanded the guards of the General of the East. His father had been impaled by the Catholic inquisitors. And religion, or at least nature, might justify his desertion and revenge. Five thousand of his brethren were united by the same motives, they renounced the allegiance of anti-Christian Rome, a Saracen emir introduced Carbius to the Caliph. And the commander of the faithful extended his scepter to the implacable enemy of the Greeks. In the mountains between Siwas and Trebizond he founded or fortified the city of Tephris, 6767 which is still occupied by a fierce or licentious people, and the neighboring hills were covered with the Paulician fugitives. Who now reconciled the use of the Bible and the sword. During more than thirty years, Asia was afflicted by the calamities of foreign and domestic war, in their hostile inroads, the disciples of St. Paul were joined with those of Muhammad. And the peaceful Christians, the aged parent and tender virgin, who were delivered into barbarous servitude, might justly accuse the intolerant spirit of their sovereign. So urgent was the mischief, so intolerable the shame, that even the dissolute Michael, the son of Theodora, was compelled to march in person against the Paulicians, he was defeated under the walls of Samosata. And the Roman emperor fled before the heretics whom his mother had condemned to the flames. The Saracens fought under the same banners, but the victory was ascribed to Carbius. And the captive generals, with more than a hundred tribunes, were either released by his avarice, or tortured by his fanaticism. The valor and ambition of Chrysakir, 6768 his successor, embraced a wider circle of rapine and revenge. In alliance with his faithful Moslems, he boldly penetrated into the heart of Asia, the troops of the frontier and the palace were repeatedly overthrown. The edicts of persecution were answered by the pillage of Nice and Nicomedia, of Ansyra and Ephesus, nor could the Apostle St. John protect from violation his city and sepulchre. The cathedral of Ephesus was turned into a stable for mules and horses, and the Paulicians vied with the Saracens in their contempt and abhorrence of images and relics. It is not unpleasing to observe the triumph of rebellion over the same despotism which had disdained the prayers of an injured people. The Emperor Basil, the Macedonian, was reduced to sue for peace, to offer a ransom for the captives, and to request, in the language of moderation and charity, that Chrysakir would spare his fellow Christians. And content himself with a royal donative of gold and silver and silk garments. If the emperor, replied the insolent fanatic, be desirous of peace, let him abdicate the east, and reign without molestation in the west. If he refuse, the servants of the Lord will precipitate him from the throne. The reluctant Basil suspended the treaty, accepted the defiance, and led his army into the land of heresy, which he wasted with fire and sword. The open country of the Paulicians was exposed to the same calamities which they had inflicted. But when he had explored the strength of Tephris, the multitude of the barbarians, 
and the ample magazines of arms and provisions, he desisted with a sigh from the hopeless siege. On his return to Constantinople, he labored, by the foundation of convents and churches, to secure the aid of his celestial patrons, of Michael the Archangel and the prophet Elijah. And it was his daily prayer that he might live to transpierce, with three arrows, the head of his impious adversary. Beyond his expectations, the wish was accomplished, after a successful inroad, Chrysakir was surprised and slain in his retreat. And the rebel's head was triumphantly presented at the foot of the throne. On the reception of this welcome trophy, Basil instantly called for his bow, discharged three arrows with unerring aim, and accepted the applause of the court, who hailed the victory of the royal archer. With Chrysakir, the glory of the Politians faded and withered, 6769 on the second expedition of the emperor, the impregnable Tephris, was deserted by the heretics, who sued for mercy or escaped to the borders. The city was ruined, but the spirit of independence survived in the mountains, the Politians defended, above a century, their religion and liberty, infested the Roman limits, and maintained their perpetual alliance with the enemies of the empire and the gospel. About the middle of the 8th century, Constantine, surnamed Copronymus by the worshippers of images, had made an expedition into Armenia, and found, in the cities of Melitene and Theodosiopolis, a great number of Paulicians, his kindred heretics. As a favor, or punishment, he transplanted them from the banks of the Euphrates to Constantinople and Thrace, and by this emigration their doctrine was introduced and diffused in Europe. 6770 If the sectaries of the metropolis were soon mingled with the promiscuous mass, those of the country struck a deep root in a foreign soil. The Paulicians of Thrace resisted the storms of persecution, maintained a secret correspondence with their Armenian brethren, and gave aid and comfort to their preachers, who solicited, not without success, the infant faith of the Bulgarians. 6771 In the 10th century, they were restored and multiplied by a more powerful colony, which John Zymus's 6772 transported from the Calibian hills to the valleys of Mount Hemus. The Oriental clergy who would have preferred the destruction, impatiently sighed for the absence, of the Manichaeans, the warlike emperor had felt and esteemed their valor, their attachment to the Saracens was pregnant with mischief. But, on the side of the Danube, against the barbarians of Scythia, their service might be useful, and their loss would be desirable. Their exile in a distant land was softened by a free toleration, the Paulicians held the city of Philippopolis and the keys of Thrace, the Catholics were their subjects. The Jacobite emigrants their associates, they occupied a line of villages and castles in Macedonia and Epirus, and many native Bulgarians were associated to the communion of arms and heresy. As long as they were awed by power and treated with moderation, their voluntary bands were distinguished in the armies of the empire. And the courage of these dogs, ever greedy of war, ever thirsty of human blood, is noticed with astonishment, and almost with reproach, by the pusillanimous Greeks. The same spirit rendered them arrogant and contumacious, they were easily provoked by caprice or injury, and their privileges were often violated by the faithless bigotry of the government and clergy. In the midst of the Norman War, 2,500 Manichaeans deserted the standard of Alexius Comnus, 6773 and retired to their native homes. He dissembled till the moment of revenge, invited the chiefs to a friendly conference, and punished the innocent and guilty by imprisonment, confiscation, and baptism. In an interval of peace, the emperor undertook the pious office of reconciling them to the church and state, his winter quarters were fixed at Philippopolis. And the thirteenth apostle, as he is styled by his pious daughter, consumed whole days and nights in theological controversy. His arguments were fortified, their obstinacy was melted, by the honors and rewards which he bestowed on the most eminent proselytes. And a new city, surrounded with gardens, enriched with immunities, and dignified with his own name, was founded by Alexius for the residence of his vulgar converts. The important station of Philippopolis was wrested from their hands. The contumacious leaders were secured in a dungeon, or banished from their country. And their lives were spared by the prudence, rather than the mercy, of an emperor, at whose command a poor and solitary heretic was burnt alive before the church of Saint Sophia. 
6774 but the proud hope of eradicating the prejudices of a nation was speedily overturned by the invincible zeal of the Politians, who ceased to dissemble or refused to obey. After the departure and death of Alexius, they soon resumed their civil and religious laws. In the beginning of the 13th century, their pope or primate, a manifest corruption, resided on the confines of Bulgaria, Croatia, and Dalmatia, and governed, by his vicars, the filial congregations of Italy and France. 6775 From that era, a minute scrutiny might prolong and perpetuate the chain of tradition. At the end of the last age, the sect or colony still inhabited the valleys of Mount Hemus, where their ignorance and poverty were more frequently tormented by the Greek clergy than by the Turkish government. The modern Paulicians have lost all memory of their origin, and their religion is disgraced by the worship of the cross and the practice of bloody sacrifice, which some captives have imported from the wilds of Tartary. 6776. In the West, the first teachers of the Manichaean theology had been repulsed by the people, or suppressed by the prince. The favor and success of the Paulicians in the 11th and 12th centuries must be imputed to the strong, though secret, discontent which armed the most pious Christians against the Church of Rome. Her avarice was oppressive, her despotism odious. Less degenerate perhaps than the Greeks in the worship of saints and images, her innovations were more rapid and scandalous, she had rigorously defined and imposed the doctrine of transubstantiation, the lives of the Latin clergy were more corrupt and the eastern bishops might pass for the successors of the apostles, if they were compared with the lordly prelates, who wielded by turns the crozier, the scepter, and the sword. Three different roads might introduce the Paulicians into the heart of Europe. After the conversion of Hungary, the pilgrims who visited Jerusalem might safely follow the course of the Danube, in their journey and return they passed through Philippopolis. And the sectaries, disguising their name and heresy, might accompany the French or German caravans to their respective countries. The trade and dominion of Venice pervaded the coast of the Adriatic, and the hospitable republic opened her bosom to foreigners of every climate and religion. Under the Byzantine standard, the Paulicians were often transported to the Greek provinces of Italy and Sicily, in peace and war, they freely conversed with strangers and natives, and their opinions were silently propagated in Rome, Milan, and the kingdoms beyond the Alps. 6777 It was soon discovered, that many thousand Catholics of every rank, and of either sex, had embraced the Manichaean heresy, and the flames which consumed twelve canons of Orleans was the first act and signal of persecution. The Bulgarians 6778 A name so innocent in its origin, so odious in its application, spread their branches over the face of Europe. United in common hatred of idolatry in Rome, they were connected by a form of Episcopal and Presbyterian government. Their various sects were discriminated by some fainter or darker shades of theology, but they generally agreed in the two principles, the contempt of the Old Testament and the denial of the body of Christ, either on the cross or in the Eucharist. A confession of simple worship and blameless manners is extorted from their enemies. And so high was their standard of perfection, that the increasing congregations were divided into two classes of disciples, of those who practiced, and of those who aspired. It was in the country of the Albigeois 6779 in the southern provinces of France, that the Paulicians were most deeply implanted. And the same vicissitudes of martyrdom and revenge which had been displayed in the neighborhood of the Euphrates, were repeated in the 13th century on the banks of the Rhone. The laws of the eastern emperors were revived by Frederick II. The insurgents of Tephras were represented by the barons and cities of Languedoc, Pope Innocent III. Surpassed the sanguinary fame of Theodora. It was in cruelty alone that her soldiers could equal the heroes of the Crusades, and the cruelty of her priests was far excelled by the founders of the Inquisition. 6780 An office more adapted to confirm, than to refute, the belief of an evil principle. The visible assemblies of the Paulicians, or Albigeois, were extirpated by fire and sword. And the bleeding remnant escaped by flight, concealment, or Catholic conformity. But the invincible spirit which they had kindled still lived and breathed in the Western world. In the state, in the church, and even in the cloister, a latent succession was preserved of the disciples of St. Paul. 
who protested against the tyranny of Rome, embraced the Bible as the rule of faith, and purified their creed from all the visions of the Gnostic theology. 6781 The struggles of Wycliffe in England, of Huss in Bohemia, were premature and ineffectual. But the names of Zwinglius, Luther, and Calvin, are pronounced with gratitude as the deliverers of nations. A philosopher, who calculates the degree of their merit and the value of their reformation, will prudently ask from what articles of faith, above or against our reason, they have enfranchised the Christians. For such enfranchisement is doubtless a benefit so far as it may be compatible with truth and piety. After a fair discussion, we shall rather be surprised by the timidity, than scandalized by the freedom, of our first reformers. 6782 With the Jews, they adopted the belief and defense of all the Hebrew scriptures, with all their prodigies, from the Garden of Eden to the visions of the prophet Daniel. And they were bound, like the Catholics, to justify against the Jews the abolition of a divine law. In the great mysteries of the Trinity and Incarnation the Reformers were severely orthodox, they freely adopted the theology of the Four, or the Six First Councils. And with the Athanasian Creed, they pronounced the eternal damnation of all who did not believe the Catholic faith. Transubstantiation, the invisible change of the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ, is a tenet that may defy the power of argument and pleasantry. But instead of consulting the evidence of their senses, of their sight, their feeling, and their taste, the first Protestants were entangled in their own scruples, and awed by the words of Jesus in the institution of the sacrament. Luther maintained a corporeal, and Calvin a real, presence of Christ in the Eucharist, and the opinion of Zwinglius, that it is no more than a spiritual communion, a simple memorial, has slowly prevailed in the Reformed churches. 6783 But the loss of one mystery was amply compensated by the stupendous doctrines of original sin, redemption, faith, grace, and predestination, which have been strained from the epistles of St. Paul. These subtle questions had most assuredly been prepared by the fathers and schoolmen, but the final improvement and popular use may be attributed to the first reformers, who enforced them as the absolute and essential terms of salvation. Hitherto the weight of supernatural belief inclines against the Protestants, and many a sober Christian would rather admit that a wafer is God, than that God is a cruel and capricious tyrant. Yet the services of Luther and his rivals are solid and important, and the philosopher must own his obligations to these fearless enthusiasts. 6784 I. By their hands the lofty fabric of superstition, from the abuse of indulgences to the intercession of the Virgin, has been leveled with the ground. Myriads of both sexes of the monastic profession were restored to the liberty and labors of social life. A hierarchy of saints and angels, of imperfect and subordinate deities, were stripped of their temporal power, and reduced to the enjoyment of celestial happiness, their images and relics were banished from the church. And the credulity of the people was no longer nourished with the daily repetition of miracles and visions. The imitation of paganism was supplied by a pure and spiritual worship of prayer and thanksgiving, the most worthy of man, the least unworthy of the deity. It only remains to observe, whether such sublime simplicity be consistent with popular devotion, whether the vulgar, in the absence of all visible objects, will not be inflamed by enthusiasm, or insensibly subside in languor and indifference. 2. The chain of authority was broken, which restrains the bigot from thinking as he pleases, and the slave from speaking as he thinks, the popes, fathers, and councils, were no longer the supreme and infallible judges of the world. And each Christian was taught to acknowledge no law but the scriptures, no interpreter but his own conscience. This freedom, however, was the consequence, rather than the design, of the Reformation. The patriot reformers were ambitious of succeeding the tyrants whom they had dethroned. They imposed with equal rigor their creeds and confessions, they asserted the right of the magistrate to punish heretics with death. The pious or personal animosity of Calvin proscribed in Servetus 6785 the guilt of his own rebellion, 6786 and the flames of Smithfield, in which he was afterwards consumed, had been kindled for the Anabaptists by the zeal of Cranmer. 6787 the nature of the tiger ys the same, but he was gradually deprived of his teeth and fangs. A spiritual and temporal kingdom was possessed by the Roman pontiff. 
the Protestant doctors were subjects of an humble rank, without revenue or jurisdiction. His decrees were consecrated by the antiquity of the Catholic Church, their arguments and disputes were submitted to the people. And their appeal to private judgment was accepted beyond their wishes, by curiosity and enthusiasm. Since the days of Luther and Calvin, a secret reformation has been silently working in the bosom of the Reformed churches. Many weeds of prejudice were eradicated, and the disciples of Erasmus 6788 diffused a spirit of freedom and moderation. The liberty of conscience has been claimed as a common benefit, an inalienable right. 6789 The free governments of Holland 6790 and England 6791 introduced the practice of toleration. And the narrow allowance of the laws has been enlarged by the prudence and humanity of the times. In the exercise, the mind has understood the limits of its powers, and the words and shadows that might amuse the child can no longer satisfy his manly reason. The volumes of controversy are overspread with cobwebs, the doctrine of a Protestant church is far removed from the knowledge or belief of its private members. And the forms of orthodoxy, the articles of faith, are subscribed with a sigh, or a smile, by the modern clergy. Yet the friends of Christianity are alarmed at the boundless impulse of inquiry and skepticism. The predictions of the Catholics are accomplished, the web of mystery is unraveled by the Arminians, Arians, and Socinians, whose number must not be computed from their separate congregations. And the pillars of revelation are shaken by those men who preserve the name without the substance of religion, who indulge the license without the temper of philosophy. 6792 6793. LV, the Bulgarians, the Hungarians, and the Russians. The Bulgarians. Origin, migrations, and settlement of the Hungarians. Their inroads in the East and West. The monarchy of Russia. Geography and trade. Wars of the Russians against the Greek Empire. Conversion of the barbarians. Under the reign of Constantine, the grandson of Heraclius, the ancient barrier of the Danube, so often violated and so often restored, was irretrievably swept away by a new deluge of barbarians. Their progress was favored by the caliphs, their unknown and accidental auxiliaries, the Roman legions were occupied in Asia. And after the loss of Syria, Egypt, and Africa, the Caesars were twice reduced to the danger and disgrace of defending their capital against the Saracens. If, in the account of this interesting people, I have deviated from the strict and original line of my undertaking, the merit of the subject will hide my transgression, or solicit my excuse. In the East, in the West, in war, in religion, in science, in their prosperity, and in their decay, the Arabians press themselves on our curiosity, the first overthrow of the Church and Empire of the Greeks may be imputed to their arms. And the disciples of Muhammad still hold the civil and religious scepter of the Oriental world. But the same labor would be unworthily bestowed on the swarms of savages, who, between the 7th and the 12th century, descended from the plains of Scythia, in transient inroad or perpetual emigration. 6794 Their names are uncouth, their origins doubtful, their actions obscure, their superstition was blind, their valor brutal, and the uniformity of their public and private lives was neither softened by innocence nor refined by policy. The majesty of the Byzantine throne repelled and survived their disorderly attacks. The greater part of these barbarians has disappeared without leaving any memorial of their existence, and the despicable remnant continues, and may long continue, to groan under the dominion of a foreign tyrant. From the Antiquities of I. Bulgarians, II. Hungarians, and, three. Russians, I shall content myself with selecting such facts as yet deserve to be remembered. The conquests of the, four. Normans, and the monarchy of the, v. Turks, will naturally terminate in the memorable crusades to the Holy Land, and the double fall of the city and empire of Constantine. I, in his march to Italy, Theodoric 6795 The Ostrogoth had trampled on the arms of the Bulgarians. After this defeat, the name and the nation are lost during a century and a half, and it may be suspected that the same or a similar appellation was revived by strange colonies from the Borysthenes, the Tanais, or the Volga. 
A king of the ancient Bulgaria 6796 bequeathed to his five sons a last lesson of moderation and concord. It was received as youth has ever received the counsels of age and experience, the five princes buried their father. Divided his subjects and cattle, forgot his advice, separated from each other, and wandered in quest of fortune till we find the most adventurous in the heart of Italy, under the protection of the Exarch of Ravenna. 6797 But the stream of emigration was directed or impelled towards the capital. The modern Bulgaria, along the southern banks of the Danube, was stamped with the name and image which it has retained to the present hour, the new conquerors successively acquired, by war or treaty, the Roman provinces of Dardania, Thessaly, and the two Epirus. 6798 The ecclesiastical supremacy was translated from the native city of Justinian, and, in their prosperous age, the obscure town of Lycnidus, or Acrida, was honored with the throne of a king and a patriarch. 6799 The unquestionable evidence of language attests the descent of the Bulgarians from the original stock of the Sclavonian, or more properly Slavonian, race, 6800 and the kindred bands of Serbians, Bosnians, Rations, Croatians, Wallachians, 6801 and followed either the standard or the example of the leading tribe. From the Euxene to the Adriatic, in the state of captives, or subjects, or allies, or enemies, of the Greek Empire, they overspread the land. And the national appellation of the slave 6802 has been degraded by chance or malice from the signification of glory to that of servitude. 6803 Among these colonies, the Crobatians 6804 or Croats, who now attend the motions of an Austrian army, are the descendants of a mighty people, the conquerors and sovereigns of Dalmatia. The maritime cities, and of these the infant Republic of Ragusa, implored the aid and instructions of the Byzantine court, they were advised by the magnanimous Basil to reserve a small acknowledgement of their fidelity to the Roman Empire. And to appease, by an annual tribute, the wrath of these irresistible barbarians. The kingdom of Croatia was shared by eleven Zupans, or feudatory lords, and their united forces were numbered at sixty thousand horse and one hundred thousand foot. A long sea coast, indented with capacious harbours, covered with a string of islands, and almost in sight of the Italian shores, disposed both the natives and strangers to the practice of navigation. The boats or brigantines of the Croats were constructed after the fashion of the old Liburnians, 180 vessels may excite the idea of a respectable navy. But our seamen will smile at the allowance of ten, or twenty, or forty, men for each of these ships of war. They were gradually converted to the more honorable service of commerce, yet the Sclavonian pirates were still frequent and dangerous. And it was not before the close of the tenth century that the freedom and sovereignty of the Gulf were effectually vindicated by the Venetian Republic. 6805 The ancestors of these Dalmatian kings were equally removed from the use and abuse of navigation, they dwelt in the white Croatia, in the inland regions of Silesia and Little Poland, thirty days' journey, according to the Greek computation. From the Sea of Darkness The glory of the Bulgarians 6806 was confined to a narrow scope both of time and place. In the ninth and tenth centuries, they reigned to the south of the Danube. But the more powerful nations that had followed their emigration repelled all return to the north and all progress to the west. Yet in the obscure catalogue of their exploits, they might boast an honour which had hitherto been appropriated to the Goths, that of slaying in battle one of the successors of Augustus and Constantine. The Emperor Nicephorus had lost his fame in the Arabian, he lost his life in the Sclavonian, war. In his first operations he advanced with boldness and success into the centre of Bulgaria, and burnt the royal court, which was probably no more than an edifice and village of timber. But while he searched the spoil and refused all offers of treaty, his enemies collected their spirits and their forces, the passes of retreat were insuperably barred, and the trembling Nicephorus was heard to exclaim, Alas, alas! Unless we could assume the wings of birds, we cannot hope to escape. Two days he waited his fate in the inactivity of despair. But, on the morning of the third, the Bulgarians surprised the camp, and the Roman prince, with the great officers of the empire, were slaughtered in their tents. The body of Valens had been saved from insult. 
but the head of Nicephorus was exposed on a spear, and his skull, enchased with gold, was often replenished in the feasts of victory. The Greeks bewailed the dishonor of the throne, but they acknowledged the just punishment of avarice and cruelty. This savage cup was deeply tinctured with the manners of the Scythian wilderness. But they were softened before the end of the same century by a peaceful intercourse with the Greeks, the possession of a cultivated region, and the introduction of the Christian worship. The nobles of Bulgaria were educated in the schools and palace of Constantinople, and Simeon 6807 a youth of the royal line, was instructed in the rhetoric of Demosthenes and the logic of Aristotle. He relinquished the profession of a monk for that of a king and warrior, and in his reign of more than forty years, Bulgaria assumed a rank among the civilized powers of the earth. The Greeks, whom he repeatedly attacked, derived a faint consolation from indulging themselves in the reproaches of perfidy and sacrilege. They purchased the aid of the pagan Turks. But Simeon, in a second battle, redeemed the loss of the first, at a time when it was esteemed a victory to elude the arms of that formidable nation. The Serbians were overthrown, made captive and dispersed. And those who visited the country before their restoration could discover no more than fifty vagrants, without women or children, who extorted a precarious subsistence from the chase. On classic ground, on the banks of Achilles, the Greeks were defeated, their horn was broken by the strength of the barbaric Hercules. 6808 he formed the siege of Constantinople. And, in a personal conference with the emperor, Simeon imposed the conditions of peace. They met with the most jealous precautions, the royal gallery was drawn close to an artificial and well-fortified platform. And the majesty of the purple was emulated by the pomp of the Bulgarian. Are you a Christian, said the humble Romanus, it is your duty to abstain from the blood of your fellow Christians. Has the thirst of riches seduced you from the blessings of peace? Sheath your sword, open your hand, and I will satiate the utmost measure of your desires. The reconciliation was sealed by a domestic alliance. The freedom of trade was granted or restored, the first honors of the court were secured to the friends of Bulgaria, above the ambassadors of enemies or strangers. 6809 and her princes were dignified with the high and invidious title of Basilius, or Emperor. But this friendship was soon disturbed, after the death of Simeon, the nations were again in arms, his feeble successors were divided and extinguished. And, in the beginning of the eleventh century, the second Basil, who was born in the purple, deserved the appellation of conqueror of the Bulgarians. His avarice was in some measure gratified by a treasure of four hundred thousand pounds sterling, ten thousand pounds weight of gold, which he found in the palace of Lycnidus. His cruelty inflicted a cool and exquisite vengeance on fifteen thousand captives who had been guilty of the defense of their country. They were deprived of sight. But to one of each hundred a single eye was left, that he might conduct his blind century to the presence of their king. Their king is said to have expired of grief and horror, the nation was awed by this terrible example. The Bulgarians were swept away from their settlements, and circumscribed within a narrow province, the surviving chiefs bequeathed to their children the advice of patience and the duty of revenge. 2. When the black swarm of Hungarians first hung over Europe, above nine hundred years after the Christian era, they were mistaken by fear and superstition for the Gog and Magog of the scriptures, the signs and forerunners of the end of the world. 6810 Since the introduction of letters, they have explored their own antiquities with a strong and laudable impulse of patriotic curiosity. 6811 Their rational criticism can no longer be amused with a vain pedigree of Attila and the Huns. But they complain that their primitive records have perished in the Tartar War, that the truth or fiction of their rustic songs is long since forgotten. And that the fragments of a rude chronicle 6812 must be painfully reconciled with the contemporary though foreign intelligence of the imperial geographer. 6813 Magyar is the national and oriental denomination of the Hungarians. But, among the tribes of Scythia, they are distinguished by the Greeks under the proper and peculiar name of Turks, as the descendants of that mighty people who had conquered and reigned from China to the Volga. The Pannonian colony preserved a correspondence of trade and amity with the eastern Turks on the confines of Persia and after a separation of 350 years. 
the missionaries of the King of Hungary discovered and visited their ancient country near the banks of the Volga. They were hospitably entertained by a people of pagans and savages who still bore the name of Hungarians. Conversed in their native tongue, recollected a tradition of their long-lost brethren, and listened with amazement to the marvelous tale of their new kingdom and religion. The zeal of conversion was animated by the interest of consanguinity. And one of the greatest of their princes had formed the generous, though fruitless, design of replenishing the solitude of Pannonia by this domestic colony from the heart of Tartary. 6814 From this primitive country they were driven to the west by the tide of war and emigration, by the weight of the more distant tribes, who at the same time were fugitives and conquerors. 6815 Reason or fortune directed their course towards the frontiers of the Roman Empire, they halted in the usual stations along the banks of the great rivers. And in the territories of Moscow, Cayo, and Moldavia, some vestiges have been discovered of their temporary residence. In this long and various peregrination, they could not always escape the dominion of the stronger. And the purity of their blood was improved or sullied by the mixture of a foreign race, from a motive of compulsion, or choice, several tribes of the Chazars were associated to the standard of their ancient vassals. Introduced the use of a second language, and obtained by their superior renown the most honorable place in the front of battle. The military force of the Turks and their allies marched in seven equal and artificial divisions. Each division was formed of 30,857 warriors, and the proportion of women, children, and servants, supposes and requires at least a million of emigrants. Their public councils were directed by seven vaivods, or hereditary chiefs, but the experience of discord and weakness recommended the more simple and vigorous administration of a single person. The scepter, which had been declined by the modest Lebedias, was granted to the birth or merit of Almas and his son Arpad, and the authority of the supreme Khan of the Chazars confirmed the engagement of the prince and people. Of the people to obey his commands, of the prince to consult their happiness and glory. With this narrative we might be reasonably content, if the penetration of modern learning had not opened a new and larger prospect of the antiquities of nations. The Hungarian language stands alone, and as it were insulated, among the Sclavonian dialects. But it bears a close and clear affinity to the idioms of the Fennec race 6816 of an obsolete and savage race, which formerly occupied the northern regions of Asia and Europe. 6817. The genuine appellation of Ogri or Igurs is found on the western confines of China, 6818 Their migration to the banks of the Irtish is attested by Tartar evidence, 6819 A similar name and language are detected in the southern parts of Siberia. 6820 And the remains of the Fennec tribes are widely, though thinly scattered from the sources of the Obi to the shores of Lapland. 6821 The consanguinity of the Hungarians and Laplanders would display the powerful energy of climate on the children of a common parent. The lively contrast between the bold adventurers who are intoxicated with the wines of the Danube, and the wretched fugitives who are immersed beneath the snows of the polar circle. Arms and freedom have ever been the ruling, though too often the unsuccessful, passion of the Hungarians, who are endowed by nature with a vigorous constitution of soul and body. 6822 Extreme cold has diminished the stature and congealed the faculties of the Laplanders, and the Arctic tribes, alone among the sons of men, are ignorant of war, and unconscious of human blood. A happy ignorance, if reason and virtue were the guardians of their peace. 6823. It is the observation of the imperial author of the tactics 6824 that all the Scythian hordes resembled each other in their pastoral and military life, that they all practiced the same means of subsistence and employed the same instruments of destruction. But he adds, that the two nations of Bulgarians and Hungarians were superior to their brethren, and similar to each other in the improvements, however rude. Of their discipline and government, their visible likeness determines Leo to confound his friends and enemies in one common description. And the picture may be heightened by some strokes from their contemporaries of the 10th century. Except the merit and fame of military prowess, all that is valued by mankind appeared vile and contemptible to these barbarians, whose native fierceness was stimulated by the consciousness of numbers and freedom. 
the tents of the Hungarians were of leather, their garments of fur, they shaved their hair, and scarified their faces, in speech they were slow, in action prompt, in treaty perfidious. And they shared the common reproach of barbarians, too ignorant to conceive the importance of truth, too proud to deny or palliate the breach of their most solemn engagements. Their simplicity has been praised. Yet they abstained only from the luxury they had never known, whatever they saw they coveted, their desires were insatiate, and their sole industry was the hand of violence and rapine. By the definition of a pastoral nation, I have recalled a long description of the economy, the warfare, and the government that prevail in that state of society. I may add, that to fishing, as well as to the chase, the Hungarians were indebted for a part of their subsistence. And since they seldom cultivated the ground, they must, at least in their new settlements, have sometimes practiced a slight and unskillful husbandry. In their emigrations, perhaps in their expeditions, the host was accompanied by thousands of sheep and oxen which increased the cloud of formidable dust, and afforded a constant and wholesale supply of milk and animal food. A plentiful command of forage was the first care of the general, and if the flocks and herds were secure of their pastures, the hardy warrior was alike insensible of danger and fatigue. The confusion of men and cattle that overspread the country exposed their camp to a nocturnal surprise, had not a still wider circuit been occupied by their light cavalry, perpetually in motion to discover and delay the approach of the enemy. After some experience of the Roman tactics, they adopted the use of the sword and spear, the helmet of the soldier, and the iron breastplate of his steed, but their native and deadly weapon was the tartar bow, from the earliest infancy their children and servants were exercised in the double science of archery and horsemanship. Their arm was strong, their aim was sure, and in the most rapid career, they were taught to throw themselves backwards, and to shoot a volley of arrows into the air. In open combat, in secret ambush, in flight, or pursuit, they were equally formidable, an appearance of order was maintained in the foremost ranks, but their charge was driven forwards by the impatient pressure of succeeding crowds. They pursued, headlong and rash, with loosened reins and horrific outcries, but, if they fled, with real or dissembled fear, the ardor of a pursuing foe was checked and chastised by the same habits of irregular speed and sudden evolution. In the abuse of victory, they astonished Europe, yet smarting from the wounds of the Saracen and the Dane, mercy they rarely asked, and more rarely bestowed, both sexes if accused is equally inaccessible to pity. And their appetite for raw flesh might countenance the popular tale, that they drank the blood, and feasted on the hearts of the slain. Yet the Hungarians were not devoid of those principles of justice and humanity, which nature has implanted in every bosom. The license of public and private injuries was restrained by laws and punishments. And in the security of an open camp, theft is the most tempting and most dangerous offense. Among the barbarians there were many, whose spontaneous virtue supplied their laws and corrected their manners, who performed the duties, and sympathized with the affections, of social life. After a long pilgrimage of flight or victory, the Turkish hordes approached the common limits of the French and Byzantine empires. Their first conquests and final settlements extended on either side of the Danube above Vienna, below Belgrade, and beyond the measure of the Roman province of Pannonia, or the modern kingdom of Hungary. 6825 That ample and fertile land was loosely occupied by the Moravians, a Sclavonian name and tribe, which were driven by the invaders into the compass of a narrow province. Charlemagne had stretched a vague and nominal empire as far as the edge of Transylvania, but, after the failure of his legitimate line, the dukes of Moravia forgot their obedience and tribute to the monarchs of Oriental France. The bastard Arnulf was provoked to invite the arms of the Turks, they rushed through the real or figurative wall, which his indiscretion had thrown open. And the king of Germany has been justly reproached as a traitor to the civil and ecclesiastical society of the Christians. During the life of Arnulf, the Hungarians were checked by gratitude or fear. But in the infancy of his son Louis they discovered and invaded Bavaria, and such was their Scythian speed, that in a single day a circuit of fifty miles was stripped and consumed. In the Battle of Augsburg the Christians maintained their advantage till the seventh hour of the day, they were deceived and vanquished by the flying stratagems of the Turkish cavalry. 
the conflagration spread over the provinces of Bavaria, Swabia, and Franconia, and the Hungarian 6826 promoted the reign of anarchy, by forcing the stoutest barons to discipline their vassals and fortify their castles. The origin of walled towns is ascribed to this calamitous period, nor could any distance be secure against an enemy, who, almost at the same instant, laid in ashes the Helvetian monastery of Asti. Gaul, and the city of Bremen, on the shores of the Northern Ocean. Above thirty years the Germanic Empire, or Kingdom, was subject to the ignominy of tribute. And resistance was disarmed by the menace, the serious and effectual menace of dragging the women and children into captivity, and of slaughtering the males above the age of ten years. I have neither power or inclination to follow the Hungarians beyond the Rhine. But I must observe with surprise, that the southern provinces of France were blasted by the tempest, and that Spain, behind her Pyrenees, was astonished at the approach of these formidable strangers. 6827 The vicinity of Italy had tempted their early inroads, but from their camp on the Brenta, they beheld with some terror the apparent strength and populousness of the new discovered country. They requested leave to retire. Their request was proudly rejected by the Italian king, and the lives of twenty thousand Christians paid the forfeit of his obstinacy and rashness. Among the cities of the West, the royal Pavia was conspicuous in fame and splendor. And the preeminence of Rome itself was only derived from the relics of the apostles. The Hungarians appeared, Pavia was in flames, forty three churches were consumed. And, after the massacre of the people, they spared about two hundred wretches who had gathered some bushels of gold and silver, a vague exaggeration, from the smoking ruins of their country. In these annual excursions from the Alps to the neighborhood of Rome and Capua, the churches, that yet escaped, resounded with a fearful litany, Oh, save and deliver us from the arrows of the Hungarians. But the saints were deaf or inexorable. And the torrent rolled forwards, till it was stopped by the extreme land of Calabria. 6828 A composition was offered and accepted for the head of each Italian subject, and ten bushels of silver were poured forth in the Turkish camp. But falsehood is the natural antagonist of violence, and the robbers were defrauded both in the numbers of the assessment and the standard of the metal. On the side of the east, the Hungarians were opposed in doubtful conflict by the equal arms of the Bulgarians, whose faith forbade an alliance with the pagans, and whose situation formed the barrier of the Byzantine Empire. The barrier was overturned, the Emperor of Constantinople beheld the waving banners of the Turks, and one of their boldest warriors presumed to strike a battle-axe into the Golden Gate. The arts and treasures of the Greeks diverted the assault. But the Hungarians might boast, in their retreat, that they had imposed a tribute on the spirit of Bulgaria and the majesty of the Caesars. 6829 The remote and rapid operations of the same campaign appear to magnify the power and numbers of the Turks. But their courage is most deserving of praise, since a light troop of three or four hundred horse would often attempt and execute the most daring inroads to the gates of Thessalonica and Constantinople. At this disastrous era of the ninth and tenth centuries, Europe was afflicted by a triple scourge from the north, the east, and the south, the Norman, the Hungarian, and the Saracen, sometimes trod the same ground of desolation. And these savage foes might have been compared by Homer to the two lions growling over the carcass of a mangled stag. 6830. The deliverance of Germany in Christendom was achieved by the Saxon princes, Henry the Fowler and Otho the Great, who, in two memorable battles, forever broke the power of the Hungarians. 6831 The valiant Henry was roused from a bed of sickness by the invasion of his country, but his mind was vigorous and his prudence successful. My companions, said he, on the morning of the combat, maintain your ranks, receive on your bucklers the first arrows of the pagans, and prevent their second discharge by the equal and rapid career of your lances. They obeyed and conquered, and the historical picture of the castle of Merseburg expressed the features, or at least the character, of Henry, who, in an age of ignorance, entrusted to the finer arts the perpetuity of his name. 6832 At the end of twenty years, the children of the Turks who had fallen by his sword invaded the empire of his son, and their force is defined, in the lowest estimate, at one hundred thousand horse. They were invited by domestic faction. 
The gates of Germany were treacherously unlocked, and they spread, far beyond the Rhine and the Meuse, into the heart of Flanders. But the vigor and prudence of Otho dispelled the conspiracy. The princes were made sensible that unless they were true to each other, their religion and country were irrecoverably lost, and the national powers were reviewed in the plains of Augsburg. They marched and fought in eight legions, according to the division of provinces and tribes, the first, second, and third, were composed of Bavarians, the fourth, of Franconians, the fifth, of Saxons, under the immediate command of the monarch. The sixth and seventh consisted of Swabians, and the eighth legion, of a thousand Bohemians, closed the rear of the host. The resources of discipline and valor were fortified by the arts of superstition, which, on this occasion, may deserve the epithets of generous and salutary. The soldiers were purified with a fast. The camp was blessed with the relics of saints and martyrs, and the Christian hero girded on his side the sword of Constantine, grasped the invincible spear of Charlemagne, and waved the banner of Saint Maurice, the prefect of the Thebian legion. But his firmest confidence was placed in the Holy Lance 6833 whose point was fashioned of the nails of the cross, and which his father had extorted from the king of Burgundy, by the threats of war, and the gift of a province. The Hungarians were expected in the front, they secretly passed the Lech, a river of Bavaria that falls into the Danube, turned the rear of the Christian army, plundered the baggage, and disordered the legion of Bohemia and Swabia. The battle was restored by the Franconians, whose duke, the valiant Conrad, was pierced with an arrow as he rested from his fatigues, the Saxons fought under the eyes of their king. And his victory surpassed, in merit and importance, the triumphs of the last two hundred years. The loss of the Hungarians was still greater in the flight than in the action, they were encompassed by the rivers of Bavaria. And their past cruelties excluded them from the hope of mercy. Three captive princes were hanged at Ratisbon, the multitude of prisoners was slain or mutilated, and the fugitives, who presumed to appear in the face of their country, were condemned to everlasting poverty and disgrace. 6834 Yet the spirit of the nation was humbled, and the most accessible passes of Hungary were fortified with a ditch and rampart. Adversity suggested the counsels of moderation and peace, the robbers of the West acquiesced in a sedentary life. And the next generation was taught, by a discerning prince, that far more might be gained by multiplying and exchanging the produce of a fruitful soil. The native race, the Turkish or Fennic blood, was mingled with new colonies of Scythian or Sclavonian origin, 6835 many thousands of robust and industrious captives had been imported from all the countries of Europe. 6836 and after the marriage of Gysa with a Bavarian princess, he bestowed honors and estates on the nobles of Germany. 6837 The son of Gysa was invested with the regal title, and the house of Arpad reigned three hundred years in the kingdom of Hungary. But the freeborn barbarians were not dazzled by the luster of the diadem, and the people asserted their indefeasible right of choosing, deposing, and punishing the hereditary servant of the state. 3. The name of Russian 6838 was first divulged, in the ninth century, by an embassy of Theophilus, Emperor of the East, to the Emperor of the West, Louis, the son of Charlemagne. The Greeks were accompanied by the envoys of the great Duke, or Chagan, or Tsar, of the Russians. In their journey to Constantinople, they had traversed many hostile nations. And they hoped to escape the dangers of their return, by requesting the French monarch to transport them by sea to their native country. A closer examination detected their origin, they were the brethren of the Swedes and Normans, whose name was already odious and formidable in France. And it might justly be apprehended, that these Russian strangers were not the messengers of peace, but the emissaries of war. They were detained, while the Greeks were dismissed. And Louis expected a more satisfactory account, that he might obey the laws of hospitality or prudence, according to the interest of both empires. 6839 This Scandinavian origin of the people, or at least the princes, of Russia, may be confirmed and illustrated by the National Annals 6840 and the general history of the North. The Normans, who had so long been concealed by a veil of impenetrable darkness, suddenly burst forth in the spirit of naval and military enterprise. 
The vast, and, as it is said, the populous regions of Denmark, Sweden, and Norway, were crowded with independent chieftains and desperate adventurers, who sighed in the laziness of peace, and smiled in the agonies of death. Piracy was the exercise, the trade, the glory, and the virtue, of the Scandinavian youth. Impatient of a bleak climate and narrow limits, they started from the banquet, grasped their arms, sounded their horn, ascended their vessels, and explored every coast that promised either spoil or settlement. The Baltic was the first scene of their naval achievements they visited the eastern shores, the silent residents of Fennec and Sclavonic tribes, and the primitive Russians of the Lake Ladiga paid a tribute, the skins of white squirrels. To these strangers, whom they saluted with the title of Varangian 6841 or Corsairs. Their superiority in arms, discipline, and renown, commanded the fear and reverence of the natives. In their wars against the more inland savages, the Varangians condescended to serve as friends and auxiliaries, and gradually, by choice or conquest, obtained the dominion of a people whom they were qualified to protect. Their tyranny was expelled, their valor was again recalled, till at length Rurik, a Scandinavian chief, became the father of a dynasty which reigned above seven hundred years. His brothers extended his influence, the example of service and usurpation was imitated by his companions in the southern provinces of Russia. And their establishments, by the usual methods of war and assassination, were cemented into the fabric of a powerful monarchy. As long as the descendants of Rurik were considered as aliens and conquerors, they ruled by the sword of the Varangians, distributed estates and subjects to their faithful captains. And supplied their numbers with fresh streams of adventurers from the Baltic coast. 6842 But when the Scandinavian chiefs had struck a deep and permanent root into the soil, they mingled with the Russians in blood, religion, and language, and the first Wladimir had the merit of delivering his country from these foreign mercenaries. They had seated him on the throne, his riches were insufficient to satisfy their demands, but they listened to his pleasing advice, that they should seek, not a more grateful, but a more wealthy, master. That they should embark for Greece, where, instead of the skins of squirrels, silk and gold would be the recompense of their service. At the same time, the Russian prince admonished his Byzantine ally to disperse and employ, to recompense and restrain, these impetuous children of the north. Contemporary writers have recorded the introduction, name, and character, of the Varangians, each day they rose in confidence and esteem, the whole body was assembled at Constantinople to perform the duty of guards. And their strength was recruited by a numerous band of their countrymen from the island of Thule. On this occasion, the vague appellation of Thule is applied to England. And the new Varangians were a colony of English and Danes who fled from the yoke of the Norman conqueror. The habits of pilgrimage and piracy had approximated the countries of the earth, these exiles were entertained in the Byzantine court. And they preserved, till the last age of the empire, the inheritance of spotless loyalty, and the use of the Danish or English tongue. With their broad and double-edged battle-axes on their shoulders, they attended the Greek emperor to the temple, the senate, and the hippodrome, he slept and feasted under their trusty guard. And the keys of the palace, the treasury, and the capital, were held by the firm and faithful hands of the Varangians. 6843. In the tenth century, the geography of Scythia was extended far beyond the limits of ancient knowledge. And the monarchy of the Russians obtains a vast and conspicuous place in the map of Constantine. 6844 The sons of Rurik were masters of the spacious province of Wladimir, or Moscow. And, if they were confined on that side by the hordes of the east, their western frontier in those early days was enlarged to the Baltic Sea and the country of the Prussians. Their northern reign ascended above the 60th degree of latitude over the Hyperborean regions, which fancy had peopled with monsters, or clouded with eternal darkness. To the south they followed the course of the Borysthenes, and approached with that river the neighborhood of the Euxine Sea. The tribes that dwelt, or wandered, in this ample circuit were obedient to the same conqueror, and insensibly blended into the same nation. The language of Russia is a dialect of the Sclavonian. But in the 10th century, these two modes of speech were different from each other. And, as the Sclavonian prevailed in the south, it may be presumed that the original Russians of the north, 
the primitive subjects of the Varangian chief, were a portion of the Fennec race. With the emigration, union, or dissolution, of the wandering tribes, the loose and indefinite picture of the Scythian desert has continually shifted. But the most ancient map of Russia affords some places which still retain their name and position. And the two capitals, Novogorod 6845 and Cayo 6846 are coeval with the first age of the monarchy. Novogorod had not yet deserved the epithet of great, nor the alliance of the Hanseatic League, which diffused the streams of opulence and the principles of freedom. Cayo could not yet boast of three hundred churches, an innumerable people, and a degree of greatness and splendor which was compared with Constantinople by those who had never seen the residence of the Caesars. In their origin, the two cities were no more than camps or fairs, the most convenient stations in which the barbarians might assemble for the occasional business of war or trade. Yet even these assemblies announced some progress in the arts of society, a new breed of cattle was imported from the southern provinces. And the spirit of commercial enterprise pervaded the sea and land, from the Baltic to the Euxine, from the mouth of the Oder to the port of Constantinople. In the days of idolatry and barbarism, the Sclavonic city of Julin was frequented and enriched by the Normans, who had prudently secured a free mart of purchase and exchange. 6847 From this harbor, at the entrance of the Oder, the corsair, or merchant, sailed in forty-three days to the eastern shores of the Baltic, the most distant nations were intermingled. And the holy groves of Curlan are said to have been decorated with Grecian and Spanish gold. 6848 Between the sea and Novogorod an easy intercourse was discovered, in the summer, through a gulf, a lake, and a navigable river, in the winter season, over the hard and level surface of boundless snows. From the neighborhood of that city, the Russians descended the streams that fall into the Borysthenes. Their canoes, of a single tree, were laden with slaves of every age, furs of every species, the spoil of their beehives, and the hides of their cattle, and the whole produce of the north was collected and discharged in the magazines of Cayo. The month of June was the ordinary season of the departure of the fleet, the timber of the canoes was framed into the oars and benches of more solid and capacious boats. And they proceeded without obstacle down the Borysthenes, as far as the seven or thirteen ridges of rocks, which traversed the bed, and precipitate the waters, of the river. At the more shallow falls it was sufficient to lighten the vessels. But the deeper cataracts were impassable, and the mariners, who dragged their vessels and their slaves six miles over land, were exposed in this toilsome journey to the robbers of the desert. 6849 At the first island below the falls, the Russians celebrated the festival of their escape, at a second, near the mouth of the river, they repaired their shattered vessels for the longer and more perilous voyage of the Black Sea. If they steered along the coast, the Danube was accessible, with a fair wind they could reach in thirty-six or forty hours the opposite shores of Anatolia, and Constantinople admitted the annual visit of the strangers of the north. They returned at the stated season with a rich cargo of corn, wine, and oil, the manufactures of Greece, and the spices of India. Some of their countrymen resided in the capital and provinces. And the national treaties protected the persons, effects, and privileges, of the Russian merchant. 6850. But the same communication which had been opened for the benefit, was soon abused for the injury, of mankind. In a period of 190 years, the Russians made four attempts to plunder the treasures of Constantinople, the event was various, but the motive, the means, and the object, were the same in these naval expeditions. 6851 The Russian traders had seen the magnificence, and tasted the luxury of the city of the Caesars. A marvelous tale, and a scanty supply, excited the desires of their savage countrymen, they envied the gifts of nature which their climate denied. They coveted the works of art, which they were too lazy to imitate and too indigent to purchase. The Varangian princes unfurled the banners of piratical adventure, and their bravest soldiers were drawn from the nations that dwelt in the northern isles of the ocean. 6852 The image of their naval armaments was revived in the last century, in the fleets of the Cossacks, which issued from the Borysthenes, to navigate the same seas for a similar purpose. 6853 The Greek appellation of Minoxila, or single canoes, might justly be applied to the bottom of their vessels. 
It was scooped out of the long stem of a beech or willow, but the slight and narrow foundation was raised and continued on either side with planks, till it attained the length of sixty, and the height of about twelve feet. These boats were built without a deck, but with two rudders and a mast, to move with sails and oars, and to contain from forty to seventy men, with their arms, and provisions of fresh water and salt fish. The first trial of the Russians was made with two hundred boats, but when the national force was exerted, they might arm against Constantinople a thousand or twelve hundred vessels. Their fleet was not much inferior to the Royal Navy of Agamemnon, but it was magnified in the eyes of fear to ten or fifteen times the real proportion of its strength and numbers. Had the Greek emperors been endowed with foresight to discern, and vigor to prevent, perhaps they might have sealed with a maritime force the mouth of the Borysthenes. Their indolence abandoned the coast of Anatolia to the calamities of a piratical war, which, after an interval of six hundred years, again infested the Euxine. But as long as the capital was respected, the sufferings of a distant province escaped the notice both of the prince and the historian. The storm which had swept along from the Phasis and Trebizond, at length burst on the Bosphorus of Thrace. A strait of fifteen miles, in which the rude vessels of the Russians might have been stopped and destroyed by a more skillful adversary. In their first enterprise 6854 under the princes of Cayo, they passed without opposition, and occupied the port of Constantinople in the absence of the Emperor Michael, the son of Theophilus. Through a crowd of perils, he landed at the palace stairs, and immediately repaired to a church of the Virgin Mary. 6855 by the advice of the patriarch, her garment, a precious relic, was drawn from the sanctuary and dipped in the sea. And a seasonable tempest, which determined the retreat of the Russians, was devoutly ascribed to the Mother of God. 6856 The silence of the Greeks may inspire some doubt of the truth, or at least of the importance, of the second attempt by Oleg, the guardian of the sons of Rurik. 6857 A strong barrier of arms and fortifications defended the Bosphorus, they were eluded by the usual expedient of drawing the boats over the isthmus. And this simple operation is described in the National Chronicles, as if the Russian fleet had sailed over dry land with a brisk and favorable gale. The leader of the third armament, Igor, the son of Rurik, had chosen a moment of weakness and decay, when the naval powers of the empire were employed against the Saracens. But if courage be not wanting, the instruments of defense are seldom deficient. Fifteen broken and decayed galleys were boldly launched against the enemy. But instead of the single tube of Greek fire usually planted on the prow, the sides and stern of each vessel were abundantly supplied with that liquid combustible. The engineers were dexterous, the weather was propitious. Many thousand Russians, who chose rather to be drowned than burnt, leaped into the sea, and those who escaped to the Thracian shore were inhumanly slaughtered by the peasants and soldiers. Yet one third of the canoes escaped into shallow water. And the next spring Igor was again prepared to retrieve his disgrace and claim his revenge. 6858 After a long peace, Yaroslaus, the great grandson of Igor, resumed the same project of a naval invasion. A fleet, under the command of his son, was repulsed at the entrance of the Bosphorus by the same artificial flames. But in the rashness of pursuit, the vanguard of the Greeks was encompassed by an irresistible multitude of boats and men. Their provision of fire was probably exhausted, and twenty-four galleys were either taken, sunk, or destroyed. 6859. Yet the threats or calamities of a Russian war were more frequently diverted by treaty than by arms. In these naval hostilities, every disadvantage was on the side of the Greeks, their savage enemy afforded no mercy his poverty promised no spoil, his impenetrable retreat deprived the conqueror of the hopes of revenge. And the pride or weakness of empire indulged an opinion, that no honor could be gained or lost in the intercourse with barbarians. At first their demands were high and inadmissible, three pounds of gold for each soldier or mariner of the fleet, the Russian youth adhered to the design of conquest and glory, but the counsels of moderation were recommended by the hoary sages. Be content, they said, with the liberal offers of Caesar, is it not far better to obtain without a combat the possession of gold, silver, silks, and all the objects of our desires? Are we sure of victory? Can we conclude a treaty with the sea? 
We do not tread on the land, we float on the abyss of water, and a common death hangs over our heads, 6860 The memory of these arctic fleets that seemed to descend from the polar circle left deep impression of terror on the imperial city. By the vulgar of every rank, it was asserted and believed, that an equestrian statue in the square of Taurus was secretly inscribed with a prophecy, how the Russians, in the last days, should become masters of Constantinople. 6861 In our own time, a Russian armament, instead of sailing from the Borysthenes, has circumnavigated the continent of Europe. And the Turkish capital has been threatened by a squadron of strong and lofty ships of war, each of which, with its naval science and thundering artillery, could have sunk or scattered a hundred canoes, such as those of their ancestors. Perhaps the present generation may yet behold the accomplishment of the prediction, of a rare prediction, of which the style is unambiguous and the date unquestionable. By land the Russians were less formidable than by sea. And as they fought for the most part on foot, their irregular legions must often have been broken and overthrown by the cavalry of the Scythian hordes. Yet their growing towns, however slight and imperfect, presented a shelter to the subject, and a barrier to the enemy, the monarchy of Cayo, till a fatal partition, assumed the dominion of the north. And the nations from the Volga to the Danube were subdued or repelled by the arms of Swatislaus 68-62 the son of Igor, the son of Oleg, the son of Rurik. The vigor of his mind and body was fortified by the hardships of a military and savage life. Wrapped in a bare skin, Swatislaus usually slept on the ground, his head reclining on a saddle, his diet was coarse and frugal, and, like the heroes of Homer 68-63 his meat, it was often horse flesh, was broiled or roasted on the coals. The exercise of war gave stability and discipline to his army, and it may be presumed, that no soldier was permitted to transcend the luxury of his chief. By an embassy from Nicephorus, the Greek emperor, he was moved to undertake the conquest of Bulgaria, and a gift of fifteen hundred pounds of gold was laid at his feet to defray the expense, or reward the toils, of the expedition. An army of sixty thousand men was assembled and embarked, they sailed from the Borysthenes to the Danube, their landing was effected on the Mesian shore. And, after a sharp encounter, the swords of the Russians prevailed against the arrows of the Bulgarian horse. The vanquished king sunk into the grave, his children were made captive. And his dominions, as far as Mount Hemus, were subdued or ravaged by the northern invaders. But instead of relinquishing his prey, and performing his engagements, the Varangian prince was more disposed to advance than to retire. And, had his ambition been crowned with success, the seat of empire in that early period might have been transferred to a more temperate and fruitful climate. Swatislaus enjoyed and acknowledged the advantages of his new position, in which he could unite, by exchange or rapine, the various productions of the earth. By an easy navigation he might draw from Russia the native commodities of furs, wax, and hydrumed, Hungary supplied him with a breed of horses and the spoils of the West. And Greece abounded with gold, silver, and the foreign luxuries, which his poverty had affected to disdain. The bands of Patsanassites, Khosars, and Turks, repaired to the standard of victory. And the ambassador of Nicephorus betrayed his trust, assumed the purple, and promised to share with his new allies the treasures of the eastern world. From the banks of the Danube the Russian prince pursued his march as far as Adrianople. A formal summons to evacuate the Roman province was dismissed with contempt, and Swatislaus fiercely replied, that Constantinople might soon expect the presence of an enemy and a master. Nicephorus could no longer expel the mischief which he had introduced, but his throne and wife were inherited by John Zymus's 6864 who, in a diminutive body, possessed the spirit and abilities of a hero. The first victory of his lieutenants deprived the Russians of their foreign allies, twenty thousand of whom were either destroyed by the sword, or provoked to revolt, or tempted to desert. Thrace was delivered, but seventy thousand barbarians were still in arms. And the legions that had been recalled from the new conquests of Syria, prepared, with the return of the spring, to march under the banners of a warlike prince, who declared himself the friend and avenger of the injured Bulgaria. The passes of Mount Hemus had been left unguarded, they were instantly occupied, 
the Roman vanguard was formed of the immortals, a proud imitation of the Persian style winky face the emperor led the main body of 10,500 foot. And the rest of his forces followed in slow and cautious array, with the baggage and military engines. The first exploit of Zymus's was the reduction of Martianopolis, or Paris Laba, 68-65 in two days, the trumpet sounded, the walls were scaled. 8,500 Russians were put to the sword, and the sons of the Bulgarian king were rescued from an ignominious prison, and invested with a nominal diadem. After these repeated losses, Swatislaus retired to the strong post of Drista, on the banks of the Danube, and was pursued by an enemy who alternately employed the arms of celerity and delay. The Byzantine galleys ascended the river, the legions completed a line of circumvallation, and the Russian prince was encompassed, assaulted, and famished, in the fortifications of the camp and city. Many deeds of valor were performed. Several desperate sallies were attempted, nor was it till after a siege of sixty-five days that Swatislaus yielded to his adverse fortune. The liberal terms which he obtained announced the prudence of the victor, who respected the valor, and apprehended the despair, of an unconquered mind. The great Duke of Russia bound himself, by solemn imprecations, to relinquish all hostile designs. A safe passage was opened for his return, the liberty of trade and navigation was restored, a measure of corn was distributed to each of his soldiers. And the allowance of twenty-two thousand measures attests the loss and the remnant of the barbarians. After a painful voyage, they again reached the mouth of the Buristhenes, but their provisions were exhausted, the season was unfavorable. They passed the winter on the ice, and, before they could prosecute their march, Swatislaus was surprised and oppressed by the neighboring tribes with whom the Greeks entertained a perpetual and useful correspondence. 6866 Far different was the return of Zymuses, who was received in his capital like Camillus or Marius, the saviors of ancient Rome. But the merit of the victory was attributed by the pious emperor to the mother of God. And the image of the Virgin Mary, with the divine infant in her arms, was placed on a triumphal car, adorned with the spoils of war, and the ensigns of Bulgarian royalty. Zymuses made his public entry on horseback. The diadem on his head, a crown of laurel in his hand, and Constantinople was astonished to applaud the martial virtues of her sovereign. 6867. Photius of Constantinople, a patriarch, whose ambition was equal to his curiosity, congratulates himself and the Greek church on the conversion of the Russians. 6868 Those fierce and bloody barbarians had been persuaded, by the voice of reason and religion, to acknowledge Jesus for their God, the Christian missionaries for their teachers, and the Romans for their friends and brethren. His triumph was transient and premature. In the various fortune of their piratical adventures, some Russian chiefs might allow themselves to be sprinkled with the waters of baptism. And a Greek bishop, with the name of Metropolitan, might administer the sacraments in the church of Cairo, to a congregation of slaves and natives. But the seed of the gospel was sown on a barren soil, many were the apostates, the converts were few. And the baptism of Olga may be fixed as the era of Russian Christianity. 6869 A female, perhaps of the basest origin, who could revenge the death, and assume the scepter, of her husband Igor, must have been endowed with those active virtues which command the fear and obedience of barbarians. In a moment of foreign and domestic peace, she sailed from Cairo to Constantinople, and the Emperor Constantine Porphyrogenitus has described, with minute diligence, the ceremonial of her reception in his capital and palace. The steps, the titles, the salutations, the banquet, the presents, were exquisitely adjusted to gratify the vanity of the stranger, with due reverence to the superior majesty of the purple. 6870 In the sacrament of baptism, she received the venerable name of the Empress Helena and her conversion might be preceded or followed by her uncle, two interpreters, sixteen damsels of a higher, and eighteen of a lower rank, twenty-two domestics, or ministers, and forty-four Russian merchants, who composed the retinue of the great Princess Olga. After her return to Cayo and Novogorod, she firmly persisted in her new religion, but her labors in the propagation of the gospel were not crowned with success. 
and both her family and nation adhered with obstinacy or indifference to the gods of their fathers. Her son Swadislaus was apprehensive of the scorn and ridicule of his companions. And her grandson Wolodomer devoted his youthful zeal to multiply and decorate the monuments of ancient worship. The savage deities of the north were still propitiated with human sacrifices, in the choice of the victim, a citizen was preferred to a stranger, a Christian to an idolater. And the father, who defended his son from the sacerdotal knife, was involved in the same doom by the rage of a fanatic tumult. Yet the lessons and example of the pious Olga had made a deep, though secret, impression in the minds of the prince and people, the Greek missionaries continued to preach, to dispute, and to baptize, and the ambassadors or merchants of Russia compared the idolatry of the woods with the elegant superstition of Constantinople. They had gazed with admiration on the dome of Saint Sophia, the lively pictures of saints and martyrs, the riches of the altar, the number and vestments of the priests, the pomp and order of the ceremonies. They were edified by the alternate succession of devout silence and harmonious song, nor was it difficult to persuade them, that a choir of angels descended each day from heaven to join in the devotion of the Christians. 6871 But the conversion of Wolodomer was determined, or hastened, by his desire of a Roman bride. At the same time, and in the city of Shersun, the rites of baptism and marriage were celebrated by the Christian pontiff, the city he restored to the Emperor Basil, the brother of his spouse. But the brazen gates were transported, as it is said, to Novogorod, and erected before the first church as a trophy of his victory and faith. 6872 At his despotic command, Perround, the god of thunder, whom he had so long adored, was dragged through the streets of Cayo. And twelve sturdy barbarians battered with clubs the misshapen image, which was indignantly cast into the waters of the Buristhenes. The Edict of Wolodomer had proclaimed, that all who should refuse the rites of baptism would be treated as the enemies of God and their prince. And the rivers were instantly filled with many thousands of obedient Russians, who acquiesced in the truth and excellence of a doctrine which had been embraced by the great duke and his boyars. In the next generation, the relics of paganism were finally extirpated, but as the two brothers of Wolodomer had died without baptism, their bones were taken from the grave, and sanctified by an irregular and posthumous sacrament. In the ninth, tenth, and eleventh centuries of the Christian era, the reign of the Gospel and of the Church was extended over Bulgaria, Hungary, Bohemia, Saxony, Denmark, Norway, Sweden, Poland, and Russia. 6873 The triumphs of apostolic zeal were repeated in the Iron Age of Christianity, and the northern and eastern regions of Europe submitted to a religion, more different in theory than in practice, from the worship of their native idols. A laudable ambition excited the monks both of Germany and Greece, to visit the tents and huts of the barbarians, poverty, hardships, and dangers, were the lot of the first missionaries, their courage was active and patient. Their motive pure and meritorious, their present reward consisted in the testimony of their conscience and the respect of a grateful people. But the fruitful harvest of their toils was inherited and enjoyed by the proud and wealthy prelates of succeeding times. The first conversions were free and spontaneous, a holy life and an eloquent tongue were the only arms of the missionaries. But the domestic fables of the pagans were silenced by the miracles and visions of the strangers, and the favorable temper of the chiefs was accelerated by the dictates of vanity and interest. The leaders of nations, who were saluted with the titles of kings and saints, 6874 held it lawful and pious to impose the Catholic faith on their subjects and neighbors. The coast of the Baltic, from Holstein to the Gulf of Finland, was invaded under the standard of the cross, and the reign of idolatry was closed by the conversion of Lithuania in the 14th century. Yet truth and candor must acknowledge, that the conversion of the North imparted many temporal benefits both to the old and the new Christians. The rage of war, inherent to the human species, could not be healed by the evangelic precepts of charity and peace, and the ambition of Catholic princes has renewed in every age the calamities of hostile contention. But the admission of the barbarians into the pale of civil and ecclesiastical society delivered Europe from the depredations, by sea and land, of the Normans, the Hungarians, and the Russians, who learned to spare their brethren and cultivate their possessions. 
6875 The establishment of law and order was promoted by the influence of the clergy, and the rudiments of art and science were introduced into the savage countries of the globe. The liberal piety of the Russian princes engaged in their service the most skillful of the Greeks, to decorate the cities and instruct the inhabitants, the dome and the paintings of Esti. Sophia were rudely copied in the churches of Cayo and Novogorod, the writings of the fathers were translated into the Sclavonic idiom, and three hundred noble youths were invited or compelled to attend the lessons of the College of Yaroslaus. It should appear that Russia might have derived an early and rapid improvement from her peculiar connection with the church and state of Constantinople, which at that age so justly despised the ignorance of the Latins. But the Byzantine nation was servile, solitary, and verging to a hasty decline, after the fall of Cayo, the navigation of the Borysthenes was forgotten, the great princes of Wladimir and Moscow were separated from the sea in Christendom. And the divided monarchy was oppressed by the ignominy and blindness of Tartar servitude. 6876 The Sclavonic and Scandinavian kingdoms, which had been converted by the Latin missionaries, were exposed, it is true, to the spiritual jurisdiction and temporal claims of the popes. 6877 But they were united in language and religious worship, with each other, and with Rome, they imbibed the free and generous spirit of the European Republic, and gradually shared the light of knowledge which arose on the Western world. LVA, the Saracens, the Franks and the Normans. The Saracens, Franks, and Greeks, in Italy. First Adventures and Settlement of the Normans. Character and Conquest of Robert Giscar, Duke of Apulia, Deliverance of Sicily by his brother Roger. Victories of Robert over the Emperors of the East and West. Roger, King of Sicily, invades Africa and Greece. The Emperor Manuel Comnus. Wars of the Greeks and Normans. Extinction of the Normans. The three great nations of the world, the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Franks, encountered each other on the theatre of Italy. 6878 The southern provinces, which now composed the Kingdom of Naples, were subject, for the most part, to the Lombard dukes and princes of Beneventum. 6879 So powerful in war, that they checked for a moment the genius of Charlemagne. So liberal in peace, that they maintained in their capital an academy of thirty-two philosophers and grammarians. The division of this flourishing state produced the rival principalities of Benevento, Salerno, and Capua. And the thoughtless ambition or revenge of the competitors invited the Saracens to the ruin of their common inheritance. During a calamitous period of two hundred years, Italy was exposed to a repetition of wounds, which the invaders were not capable of healing by the union and tranquillity of a perfect conquest. Their frequent and almost annual squadrons issued from the port of Palermo, and were entertained with too much indulgence by the Christians of Naples, the more formidable fleets were prepared on the African coast. And even the Arabs of Andalusia were sometimes tempted to assist or oppose the Moslems of an adverse sect. In the revolution of human events, a new ambuscade was concealed in the Cotting Forks, the fields of Cannae were bedewed a second time with the blood of the Africans. And the sovereign of Rome again attacked or defended the walls of Capua and Tarentum. A colony of Saracens had been planted at Bari, which commands the entrance of the Adriatic Gulf, and their impartial depredations provoked the resentment and conciliated the union of the two emperors. An offensive alliance was concluded between Basil the Macedonian, the first of his race, and Louis the great-grandson of Charlemagne, 6880 and each party supplied the deficiencies of his associate. It would have been imprudent in the Byzantine monarch to transport his stationary troops of Asia to an Italian campaign, and the Latin arms would have been insufficient if his superior navy had not occupied the mouth of the Gulf. The fortress of Bari was invested by the infantry of the Franks, and by the cavalry and galleys of the Greeks. And, after a defense of four years, the Arabian emir submitted to the clemency of Louis, who commanded in person the operations of the siege. This important conquest had been achieved by the concord of the East and West. But their recent amity was soon embittered by the mutual complaints of jealousy and pride. The Greeks assumed as their own the merit of the conquest and the pomp of the triumph extolled the greatness of their powers, and affected to deride the intemperance and sloth of the handful of barbarians who appeared under the banners of the Carlovingian prince. 
His reply is expressed with the eloquence of indignation and truth, We confess the magnitude of your preparation, says the great-grandson of Charlemagne. Your armies were indeed as numerous as a cloud of summer locusts, who darken the day, flap their wings, and, after a short flight, tumble weary and breathless to the ground. Like them, ye sunk after a feeble effort. Ye were vanquished by your own cowardice, and withdrew from the scene of action to injure and despoil our Christian subjects of the Sclavonian coast. We were few in number, and why were we few? Because, after a tedious expectation of your arrival, I had dismissed my host, and retained only a chosen band of warriors to continue the blockade of the city. If they indulged their hospitable feasts in the face of danger and death, did these feasts abate the vigor of their enterprise? Is it by your fasting that the walls of Bari have been overturned? Did not these valiant Franks, diminished as they were by languor and fatigue, intercept and vanish the three most powerful emirs of the Saracens? And did not their defeat precipitate the fall of the city? Bari is now fallen, Tarentum trembles. Calabria will be delivered, and, if we command the sea, the island of Sicily may be rescued from the hands of the infidels. My brother, accelerate, a name most offensive to the vanity of the Greek, accelerate your naval succors, respect your allies, and distrust your flatterers. 6881 these lofty hopes were soon extinguished by the death of Louis, and the decay of the Carlovingian house, and whoever might deserve the honor, the Greek emperors, Basil, and his son Leo, secured the advantage, of the reduction of Bari. The Italians of Apulia and Calabria were persuaded or compelled to acknowledge their supremacy, and an ideal line from Mount Garganus to the Bay of Salerno. Leaves the far greater part of the Kingdom of Naples under the dominion of the Eastern Empire. Beyond that line, the dukes or republics of Amalfi 6882 and Naples, who had never forfeited their voluntary allegiance, rejoiced in the neighborhood of their lawful sovereign. And Amalfi was enriched by supplying Europe with the produce and manufactures of Asia. But the Lombard princes of Benevento, Salerno, and Capua 6883 were reluctantly torn from the communion of the Latin world, and too often violated their oaths of servitude and tribute. The city of Bari rose to dignity and wealth, as the metropolis of the new theme or province of Lombardy, the title of patrician, and afterwards the singular name of Catapan 6884 was assigned to the supreme governor. And the policy both of the church and state was modeled in exact subordination to the throne of Constantinople. As long as the scepter was disputed by the princes of Italy, their efforts were feeble and adverse. And the Greeks resisted or eluded the forces of Germany, which descended from the Alps under the imperial standard of the Othos. The first and greatest of those Saxon princes was compelled to relinquish the siege of Bari, the second, after the loss of his stoutest bishops and barons, escaped with honor from the bloody field of Crotona. On that day the scale of war was turned against the Franks by the valor of the Saracens. 6885 These corsairs had indeed been driven by the Byzantine fleets from the fortresses and coasts of Italy. But a sense of interest was more prevalent than superstition or resentment, and the Caliph of Egypt had transported 40,000 Moslems to the aid of his Christian ally. The successors of Basil amused themselves with the belief, that the conquest of Lombardy had been achieved, and was still preserved by the justice of their laws, the virtues of their ministers, and the gratitude of a people whom they had rescued from anarchy and oppression. A series of rebellions might dart a ray of truth into the palace of Constantinople, and the illusions of flattery were dispelled by the easy and rapid success of the Norman adventurers. The revolution of human affairs had produced in Apulia and Calabria a melancholy contrast between the age of Pythagoras and the tenth century of the Christian era. At the former period, the coast of Great Greece, as it was then styled, was planted with free and opulent cities, these cities were peopled with soldiers, artists, and philosophers, and the military strength of Tarentum. Cyberus, or Crotona, was not inferior to that of a powerful kingdom. At the second era, these once flourishing provinces were clouded with ignorance impoverished by tyranny, and depopulated by barbarian war. Nor can we severely accuse the exaggeration of a contemporary, that a fair and ample district was reduced to the same desolation which had covered the earth after the general deluge. 
6886 Among the hostilities of the Arabs, the Franks, and the Greeks, in the southern Italy, I shall select two or three anecdotes expressive of their national manners. 1. It was the amusement of the Saracens to profane, as well as to pillage, the monasteries and churches. At the siege of Salerno, a Mussulman chief spread his couch on the communion table, and on that altar sacrificed each night the virginity of a Christian nun. As he wrestled with a reluctant maid, a beam in the roof was accidentally or dexterously thrown down on his head. And the death of the lustful emir was imputed to the wrath of Christ, which was at length awakened to the defense of his faithful spouse. 6887 2. The Saracens besieged the cities of Beneventum and Capua, after a vain appeal to the successors of Charlemagne, the Lombards implored the clemency and aid of the Greek emperor. 6888 A fearless citizen dropped from the walls, passed the entrenchments, accomplished his commission, and fell into the hands of the barbarians as he was returning with the welcome news. They commanded him to assist their enterprise, and deceive his countrymen, with the assurance that wealth and honors should be the reward of his falsehood, and that his sincerity would be punished with immediate death. He affected to yield, but as soon as he was conducted within hearing of the Christians on the rampart, friends and brethren, he cried with a loud voice, Be bold and patient, maintain the city. Your sovereign is informed of your distress, and your deliverers are at hand. I know my doom, and commit my wife and children to your gratitude. The rage of the Arabs confirmed his evidence. And the self-devoted patriot was transpierced with a hundred spears. He deserves to live in the memory of the virtuous, but the repetition of the same story in ancient and modern times, may sprinkle some doubts on the reality of this generous deed. 6889-3 The recital of a third incident may provoke a smile amidst the horrors of war. Theobald, Marquis of Camerino and Spoleto, 6890 supported the rebels of Beneventum. And his wanton cruelty was not incompatible in that age with the character of a hero. His captives of the Greek nation or party were castrated without mercy, and the outrage was aggravated by a cruel jest, that he wished to present the emperor with a supply of eunuchs, the most precious ornaments of the Byzantine court. The garrison of a castle had been defeated in a sally, and the prisoners were sentenced to the customary operation. But the sacrifice was disturbed by the intrusion of a frantic female, who, with bleeding cheeks disheveled hair, and importunate clamors, compelled the Marquis to listen to her complaint. Is it thus, she cried, ye magnanimous heroes, that ye wage war against women, against women who have never injured ye, and whose only arms are the distaff and the loom? Theobald denied the charge, and protested that, since the Amazons, he had never heard of a female war. And how, she furiously exclaimed, can you attack us more directly, how can you wound us in a more vital part, than by robbing our husbands of what we most dearly cherish, the source of our joys, and the hope of our posterity. The plunder of our flocks and herds I have endured without a murmur, but this fatal injury, this irreparable loss, subdues my patience, and calls aloud on the justice of heaven and earth. A general laugh applauded her eloquence. The savage Franks, inaccessible to pity, were moved by her ridiculous, yet rational despair, and with the deliverance of the captives, she obtained the restitution of her effects. As she returned in triumph to the castle, she was overtaken by a messenger, to inquire, in the name of Theobald, what punishment should be inflicted on her husband, were he again taken in arms. Should such, she answered without hesitation, be his guilt and misfortune, he has eyes, and a nose, and hands, and feet. These are his own, and these he may deserve to forfeit by his personal offences. But let my lord be pleased to spare what his little handmaid presumes to claim as her peculiar and lawful property. 6891. The establishment of the Normans in the kingdoms of Naples and Sicily 6892 is an event most romantic in its origin, and in its consequences most important both to Italy and the Eastern Empire. The broken provinces of the Greeks, Lombards, and Saracens, were exposed to every invader, and every sea and land were invaded by the adventurous spirit of the Scandinavian pirates. After a long indulgence of rapine and slaughter, a fair and ample territory was accepted, occupied, and named, by the Normans of France, 
they renounced their gods for the god of the Christians. 6893 And the dukes of Normandy acknowledged themselves the vassals of the successors of Charlemagne and Capet. The savage fierceness which they had brought from the snowy mountains of Norway was refined, without being corrupted, in a warmer climate. The companions of Rollo insensibly mingled with the natives, they imbibed the manners, language, 6894 and gallantry, of the French nation, and in a martial age, the Normans might claim the palm of valor and glorious achievements. Of the fashionable superstitions, they embraced with ardor the pilgrimages of Rome, Italy, and the Holy Land. 6895 In this act of devotion, the minds and bodies were invigorated by exercise, danger was the incentive, novelty the recompense. And the prospect of the world was decorated by wonder, credulity, and ambitious hope. They confederated for their mutual defense. And the robbers of the Alps, who had been allured by the garb of a pilgrim, were often chastised by the arm of a warrior. In one of these pious visits to the cavern of Mount Garganus in Apulia, which had been sanctified by the apparition of the Archangel Michael, 6896 they were accosted by a stranger in the Greek habit, but who soon revealed himself as a rebel. A fugitive, an immortal foe of the Greek Empire. His name was Melo, a noble citizen of Bari, who, after an unsuccessful revolt, was compelled to seek new allies and avengers of his country. The bold appearance of the Normans revived his hopes and solicited his confidence, they listened to the complaints, and still more to the promises, of the patriot. The assurance of wealth demonstrated the justice of his cause. And they viewed, as the inheritance of the brave, the fruitful land which was oppressed by effeminate tyrants. On their return to Normandy, they kindled a spark of enterprise, and a small but intrepid band was freely associated for the deliverance of Apulia. They passed the Alps by separate roads, and in the disguise of pilgrims. But in the neighborhood of Rome they were saluted by the chief of Bari, who supplied the more indigent with arms and horses, and instantly led them to the field of action. In the first conflict, their valor prevailed. But in the second engagement they were overwhelmed by the numbers and military engines of the Greeks, and indignantly retreated with their faces to the enemy. 6897 The unfortunate Mello ended his life a suppliant at the court of Germany, his Norman followers, excluded from their native and their promised land, wandered among the hills and valleys of Italy, and earned their daily subsistence by the sword. To that formidable sword the princes of Capua, Beneventum, Salerno, and Naples, alternately appealed in their domestic quarrels, the superior spirit and discipline of the Normans gave victory to the side which they espoused. And their cautious policy observed the balance of power, lest the preponderance of any rival state should render their aid less important, and their service less profitable. Their first asylum was a strong camp in the depth of the marshes of Campania, but they were soon endowed by the liberality of the Duke of Naples with a more plentiful and permanent seat. Eight miles from his residence, as a bulwark against Capua, the town of Aversa was built and fortified for their use, and they enjoyed as their own the corn and fruits, the meadows and groves, of that fertile district. The report of their success attracted every year new swarms of pilgrims and soldiers, the poor were urged by necessity, the rich were excited by hope, and the brave and active spirits of Normandy were impatient of ease and ambitious of renown. The independent standard of Aversa afforded shelter and encouragement to the outlaws of the province, to every fugitive who had escaped from the injustice or justice of his superiors. And these foreign associates were quickly assimilated in manners and language to the Gallic colony. The first leader of the Normans was Count Reynolf, and, in the origin of society, preeminence of rank is the reward and the proof of superior merit. 6898-6899. Since the conquest of Sicily by the Arabs, the Grecian emperors had been anxious to regain that valuable possession, but their efforts, however strenuous, had been opposed by the distance and the sea. Their costly armaments, after a gleam of success, added new pages of calamity and disgrace to the Byzantine annals, twenty thousand of their best troops were lost in a single expedition. And the victorious Moslems derided the policy of a nation which entrusted eunuchs not only with the custody of their women, but with the command of their men 6900 after a reign of 200 years, the Saracens were ruined by their divisions. 
6901 The emir disclaimed the authority of the king of Tunis, the people rose against the emir, the cities were usurped by the chiefs, each meaner rebel was independent in his village or castle. And the weaker of two rival brothers implored the friendship of the Christians. In every service of danger the Normans were prompt and useful. And five hundred knights, or warriors on horseback, were enrolled by Arduin, the agent and interpreter of the Greeks, under the standard of Manius's, governor of Lombardy. Before their landing, the brothers were reconciled. The union of Sicily and Africa was restored, and the island was guarded to the water's edge. The Normans led the van and the Arabs of Messina felt the valor of an untried foe. In a second action the emir of Syracuse was unhorsed and transpierced by the iron arm of William of Hauteville. In a third engagement, his intrepid companions discomfited the host of sixty thousand Saracens, and left the Greeks no more than the labor of the pursuit, a splendid victory. But of which the pen of the historian may divide the merit with the lance of the Normans. It is, however, true, that they essentially promoted the success of Manius's, who reduced thirteen cities, and the greater part of Sicily, under the obedience of the emperor. But his military fame was sullied by ingratitude and tyranny. In the division of the spoils, the deserts of his brave auxiliaries were forgotten, and neither their avarice nor their pride could brook this injurious treatment. They complained by the mouth of their interpreter, their complaint was disregarded. Their interpreter was scourged, the sufferings were his, the insult and resentment belonged to those whose sentiments he had delivered. Yet they dissembled till they had obtained, or stolen, a safe passage to the Italian continent, their brethren of Aversa sympathized in their indignation, and the province of Apulia was invaded as the forfeit of the debt. 6902 Above twenty years after the first emigration, the Normans took the field with no more than seven hundred horse and five hundred foot. And after the recall of the Byzantine legion 6903 from the Sicilian War, their numbers are magnified to the amount of threescore thousand men. Their herald proposed the option of battle or retreat, of battle, was the unanimous cry of the Normans. And one of their stoutest warriors, with a stroke of his fist, fell to the ground the horse of the Greek messenger. He was dismissed with a fresh horse, the insult was concealed from the imperial troops. But in two successive battles they were more fatally instructed of the prowess of their adversaries. In the plains of Cannae, the Asiatics fled before the adventurers of France, the Duke of Lombardy was made prisoner. The Apulians acquiesced in a new dominion, and the four places of Bari, Otranto, Brundusium, and Tarentum, were alone saved in the shipwreck of the Grecian fortunes. From this era we may date the establishment of the Norman power, which soon eclipsed the infant colony of Aversa. Twelve Count 6904 were chosen by the popular suffrage, and age, birth, and merit, were the motives of their choice. The tributes of their peculiar districts were appropriated to their use, and each count erected a fortress in the midst of his lands, and at the head of his vassals. In the center of the province, the common habitation of Melphi was reserved as the metropolis and citadel of the republic. A house and separate quarter was allotted to each of the twelve counts, and the national concerns were regulated by this military senate. The first of his peers, their president and general, was entitled Count of Apulia. And this dignity was conferred on William of the Iron Arm, who, in the language of the age, is styled a lion in battle, a lamb in society, and an angel in council. 6905 The manners of his countrymen are fairly delineated by a contemporary national historian. 6906 The Normans, says Malaterra, are a cunning and revengeful people. Eloquence and dissimulation appear to be their hereditary qualities, they can stoop to flatter, but unless they are curbed by the restraint of law, they indulge the licentiousness of nature and passion. Their princes affect the praises of popular munificence, the people observe the medium, or rather blond the extremes, of avarice and prodigality. And in their eager thirst of wealth and dominion, they despise whatever they possess, and hope whatever they desire. Arms and horses, the luxury of dress, the exercises of hunting and hawking 6907 are the delight of the Normans. 
but, on pressing occasions, they can endure with incredible patience the inclemency of every climate, and the toil and absence of a military life. 6908. The Normans of Apulia were seated on the verge of the two empires. And, according to the policy of the hour, they accepted the investiture of their lands, from the sovereigns of Germany or Constantinople. But the firmest title of these adventurers was the right of conquest, they neither loved nor trusted. They were neither trusted nor beloved, the contempt of the princes was mixed with fear, and the fear of the natives was mingled with hatred and resentment. Every object of desire, a horse, a woman, a garden, tempted and gratified the rapaciousness of the strangers, 6909 in the avarice of their chiefs was only colored by the more specious names of ambition and glory. The twelve counts were sometimes joined in the League of Injustice, in their domestic quarrels they disputed the spoils of the people, the virtues of William were buried in his grave. And Drogo, his brother and successor, was better qualified to lead the valor, than to restrain the violence, of his peers. Under the reign of Constantine Monomachus, the policy, rather than benevolence, of the Byzantine court, attempted to relieve Italy from this adherent mischief, more grievous than a flight of barbarians. 6910 and Argyrus, the son of Mello, was invested for this purpose with the most lofty titles 6911 and the most ample commission. The memory of his father might recommend him to the Normans. And he had already engaged their voluntary service to quell the revolt of maniuses, and to avenge their own and the public injury. It was the design of Constantine to transplant the warlike colony from the Italian provinces to the Persian War. And the son of Melo distributed among the chiefs the gold and manufactures of Greece, as the first fruits of the imperial bounty. But his arts were baffled by the sense and spirit of the conquerors of Apulia, his gifts, or at least his proposals, were rejected. And they unanimously refused to relinquish their possessions and their hopes for the distant prospect of Asiatic fortune. After the means of persuasion had failed, Argyrus resolved to compel or to destroy, the Latin powers were solicited against the common enemy, and an offensive alliance was formed of the Pope and the two emperors of the East and West. The Throne of Esti Peter was occupied by Leo IX, a simple saint 6912 of a temper most apt to deceive himself and the world, and whose venerable character would consecrate with the name of piety the measures least compatible with the practice of religion. His humanity was affected by the complaints, perhaps the calumnies, of an injured people, the impious Normans had interrupted the payment of tithes. And the temporal sword might be lawfully unsheathed against the sacrilegious robbers, who were deaf to the censures of the church. As a German of noble birth and royal kindred, Leo had free access to the court and confidence of the Emperor Henry III, and in search of arms and allies, his ardent zeal transported him from Apulia to Saxony, from the Elba to the Tiber. During these hostile preparations, Argyrus indulged himself in the use of secret and guilty weapons, a crowd of Normans became the victims of public or private revenge, and the valiant Drogo was murdered in a church. But his spirit survived in his brother Humphrey, the third Count of Apulia. The assassins were chastised. And the son of Mello, overthrown and wounded, was driven from the field, to hide his shame behind the walls of Bari, and to await the tardy succor of his allies. But the power of Constantine was distracted by a Turkish war. The mind of Henry was feeble and irresolute, and the Pope, instead of repassing the Alps with a German army, was accompanied only by a guard of seven hundred Swabians and some volunteers of Lorraine. In his long progress from Mantua to Beneventum, a vile and promiscuous multitude of Italians was enlisted under the Holy Standard. 6913 The priest and the robber slept in the same tent, the pikes and crosses were intermingled in the front. And the martial saint repeated the lessons of his youth in the order of march, of encampment, and of combat. The Normans of Apulia could muster in the field no more than three thousand horse, with a handful of infantry, the defection of the natives intercepted their provisions and retreat. And their spirit, incapable of fear, was chilled for a moment by superstitious awe. On the hostile approach of Leo, they knelt without disgrace or reluctance before their spiritual father. But the Pope was inexorable. His lofty Germans affected to deride the diminutive stature of their adversaries, 
and the Normans were informed that death or exile was their only alternative. Flight they disdained, and, as many of them had been three days without tasting food, they embraced the assurance of a more easy and honorable death. They climbed the hill of Civitella, descended into the plain, and charged in three divisions the army of the Pope. On the left, and in the center, Richard Count of Aversa, and Robert the famous Giscard, attacked, broke, routed, and pursued the Italian multitudes, who fought without discipline, and fled without shame. A harder trial was reserved for the valor of Count Humphrey, who led the cavalry of the right wing. The Germans 6914 have been described as unskillful in the management of the horse and the lance, but on foot they formed a strong and impenetrable phalanx. And neither man, nor steed, nor armor, could resist the weight of their long and two-handed swords. After a severe conflict, they were encompassed by the squadrons returning from the pursuit. And died in the ranks with the esteem of their foes, and the satisfaction of revenge. The gates of Civitella were shut against the flying Pope, and he was overtaken by the pious conquerors, who kissed his feet, to implore his blessing and the absolution of their sinful victory. The soldiers beheld in their enemy and captive the Vicar of Christ, and, though we may suppose the policy of the chiefs, it is probable that they were infected by the popular superstition. In the calm of retirement, the well-meaning Pope deplored the effusion of Christian blood, which must be imputed to his account, he felt, that he had been the author of sin and scandal. And as his undertaking had failed, the indecency of his military character was universally condemned. 6915 With these dispositions, he listened to the offers of a beneficial treaty, deserted an alliance which he had preached as the cause of God, and ratified the past and future conquests of the Normans. By whatever hands they had been usurped, the provinces of Apulia and Calabria were a part of the donation of Constantine and the patrimony of St. Peter, the grant and the acceptance confirmed the mutual claims of the pontiff and the adventurers. They promised to support each other with spiritual and temporal arms. A tribute or quit rent of twelve pence was afterward stipulated for every pluffland, and since this memorable transaction, the Kingdom of Naples has remained above seven hundred years a fief of the Holy See. 6916. The pedigree of Robert of Giscard 6917 is variously deduced from the peasants and the dukes of Normandy, from the peasants, by the pride and ignorance of a Grecian princess. 6918 from the dukes, by the ignorance and flattery of the Italian subjects. 6919 His genuine descent may be ascribed to the second or middle order of private nobility. 6920 He sprang from a race of Valvasors or Bannerets, of the Diocese of Cudences, in the Lower Normandy, the castle of Hauteville was their honorable seat, his father Tancred was conspicuous in the court and army of the duke. And his military service was furnished by ten soldiers or knights. Two marriages, of a rank not unworthy of his own, made him the father of twelve sons, who were educated at home by the impartial tenderness of his second wife. But a narrow patrimony was insufficient for this numerous and daring progeny, they saw around the neighborhood the mischiefs of poverty and discord, and resolved to seek in foreign wars a more glorious inheritance. Two only remained to perpetuate the race, and cherish their father's age, their ten brothers, as they successfully attained the vigor of manhood, departed from the castle, passed the Alps, and joined the Apulian camp of the Normans. The elder were prompted by native spirit, their success encouraged their younger brethren, and the three first in seniority, William, Drogo, and Humphrey, deserved to be the chiefs of their nation and the founders of the new republic. Robert was the eldest of the seven sons of the second marriage, and even the reluctant praise of his foes has endowed him with the heroic qualities of a soldier and a statesman. His lofty stature surpassed the tallest of his army, his limbs were cast in the true proportion of strength and gracefulness, and to the decline of life, he maintained the patient vigor of health and the commanding dignity of his form. His complexion was ruddy, his shoulders were broad, his hair and beard were long and of a flaxen color, his eyes sparkled with fire, and his voice, like that of Achilles, could impress obedience and terror amidst the tumult of battle. In the ruder ages of chivalry, such qualifications are not below the notice of the poet or historians, they may observe that Robert, at once, and with equal dexterity, could wield in the right hand his sword, 
his lance in the left. That in the battle of Civitella he was thrice unhorsed, and that in the close of that memorable day he was adjudged to have borne away the prize of valor from the warriors of the two armies. 6921 His boundless ambition was founded on the consciousness of superior worth, in the pursuit of greatness, he was never arrested by the scruples of justice, and seldom moved by the feelings of humanity, though not insensible of fame. The choice of open or clandestine means was determined only by his present advantage. The surname of Giscar 6922 was applied to this master of political wisdom, which is too often confounded with the practice of dissimulation and deceit. And Robert is praised by the Apulian poet for excelling the cunning of Ulysses and the eloquence of Cicero. Yet these arts were disguised by an appearance of military frankness, in his highest fortune, he was accessible and courteous to his fellow soldiers. And while he indulged the prejudices of his new subjects, he affected in his dress and manners to maintain the ancient fashion of his country. He grasped with a rapacious, that he might distribute with a liberal, hand, his primitive indigence had taught the habits of frugality, the gain of a merchant was not below his attention. And his prisoners were tortured with slow and unfeeling cruelty, to force a discovery of their secret treasure. According to the Greeks, he departed from Normandy with only five followers on horseback and thirty on foot. Yet even this allowance appears too bountiful, the sixth son of Tancred of Hauteville passed the Alps as a pilgrim, and his first military band was levied among the adventurers of Italy. His brothers and countrymen had divided the fertile lands of Apulia, but they guarded their shares with the jealousy of avarice. The aspiring youth was driven forwards to the mountains of Calabria, and in his first exploits against the Greeks and the natives, it is not easy to discriminate the hero from the robber. To surprise a castle or a convent, to ensnare a wealthy citizen, to plunder the adjacent villages for necessary food, were the obscure labors which formed and exercised the powers of his mind and body. The volunteers of Normandy adhered to his standard, and, under his command, the peasants of Calabria assumed the name and character of Normans. As the genius of Robert expanded with his fortune, he awakened the jealousy of his elder brother, by whom, in a transient quarrel, his life was threatened and his liberty restrained. After the death of Humphrey, the tender age of his sons excluded them from the command, they were reduced to a private estate, by the ambition of their guardian and uncle. And Giscar was exalted on a buckler, and saluted Count of Apulia and General of the Republic. With an increase of authority and of force, he resumed the conquest of Calabria, and soon aspired to a rank that should raise him forever above the heads of his equals. By some acts of rapine or sacrilege, he had incurred a papal excommunication. But Nicholas II was easily persuaded that the divisions of friends could terminate only in their mutual prejudice, that the Normans were the faithful champions of the Holy See. And it was safer to trust the alliance of a prince than the caprice of an aristocracy. A synod of one hundred bishops was convened at Melphi. And the count interrupted an important enterprise to guard the person and execute the decrees of the Roman pontiff. His gratitude and policy conferred on Robert and his posterity the ducal title 6923 with the investiture of Apulia, Calabria, and all the lands, both in Italy and Sicily, which his sword could rescue from the schismatic Greeks and the unbelieving Saracens. 6924 This apostolic sanction might justify his arms, but the obedience of a free and victorious people could not be transferred without their consent. And Giscar dissembled his elevation till the ensuing campaign had been illustrated by the conquest of Consenza and Reggio. In the hour of triumph, he assembled his troops, and solicited the Normans to confirm by their suffrage the judgment of the Vicar of Christ, the soldiers hailed with joyful acclamations their valiant duke. And the counts, his former equals, pronounced the oath of fidelity with hollow smiles and secret indignation. After this inauguration, Robert styled himself, by the grace of God and St. Peter, Duke of Apulia, Calabria, and hereafter of Sicily. And it was the labor of twenty years to deserve and realize these lofty appellations. Such sardi progress, in a narrow space, may seem unworthy of the abilities of the chief and the spirit of the nation, but the Normans were few in number. Their resources were scanty, their service was voluntary and precarious. The bravest designs of the duke were sometimes opposed by the free voice of his parliament of barons, 
the twelve counts of popular election conspired against his authority. And against their perfidious uncle, the sons of Humphrey demanded justice and revenge. By his policy and vigor, Giscard discovered their plots, suppressed their rebellions, and punished the guilty with death or exile, but in these domestic feuds, his years, and the national strength, were unprofitably consumed. After the defeat of his foreign enemies, the Greeks, Lombards, and Saracens, their broken forces retreated to the strong and populous cities of the seacoast. They excelled in the arts of fortification and defense. The Normans were accustomed to serve on horseback in the field, and their rude attempts could only succeed by the efforts of persevering courage. The resistance of Salerno was maintained above eight months. The siege or blockade of Bari lasted near four years. In these actions the Norman duke was the foremost in every danger, in every fatigue the last and most patient. As he pressed the citadel of Salerno, a huge stone from the rampart shattered one of his military engines, and by a splinter he was wounded in the breast. Before the gates of Bari, he lodged in a miserable hut or barrack, composed of dry branches, and thatched with straw, a perilous station, on all sides open to the inclemency of the winter and the spears of the enemy. 6925. The Italian conquests of Robert correspond with the limits of the present kingdom of Naples, and the countries united by his arms have not been dissevered by the revolutions of seven hundred years. 6926 The monarchy has been composed of the Greek provinces of Calabria and Apulia, of the Lombard Principality of Salerno, the Republic of Amalfi, and the inland dependencies of the large and ancient Duchy of Beneventum. Three districts only were exempted from the common law of subjection, the first forever, the two last till the middle of the succeeding century. The city and immediate territory of Benevento had been transferred, by gift or exchange, from the German emperor to the Roman pontiff, and although this holy land was sometimes invaded, the name of Asti. Peter was finally more potent than the sword of the Normans. Their first colony of Aversa subdued and held the state of Capua, and her princes were reduced to beg their bread before the palace of their fathers. The dukes of Naples, the present metropolis, maintained the popular freedom, under the shadow of the Byzantine Empire. Among the new acquisitions of Giscar, the science of Salerno 6927 and the trade of Amalfi 6928 may detain for a moment the curiosity of the reader. I. Of the learned faculties, jurisprudence implies the previous establishment of laws and property, and theology may perhaps be superseded by the full light of religion and reason. But the savage and the sage must alike implore the assistance of physic, and, if our diseases are inflamed by luxury, the mischiefs of blows and wounds would be more frequent in the ruder ages of society. The treasures of Grecian medicine had been communicated to the Arabian colonies of Africa, Spain, and Sicily. And in the intercourse of peace and war, a spark of knowledge had been kindled and cherished at Salerno, an illustrious city, in which the men were honest and the women beautiful. 6929A school, the first that arose in the darkness of Europe, was consecrated to the healing art, the conscience of monks and bishops was reconciled to that salutary and lucrative profession. And a crowd of patients, of the most eminent rank, and most distant climates, invited or visited the physicians of Salerno. They were protected by the Norman conquerors. And Giscar, though bred in arms, could discern the merit and value of a philosopher. After a pilgrimage of thirty-nine years, Constantine, an African Christian, returned from Baghdad, a master of the language and learning of the Arabians. And Salerno was enriched by the practice, the lessons, and the writings of the pupil of Avicenna. The school of medicine has long slept in the name of a university. But her precepts are abridged in a string of aphorisms, bound together in the Leonine verses, or Latin rhymes, of the 12th century. 6932. Seven miles to the west of Salerno, and thirty to the south of Naples, the obscure town of Amalfi displayed the power and rewards of industry. The land, however fertile, was of narrow extent. But the sea was accessible and open, the inhabitants first assumed the office of supplying the western world with the manufactures and productions of the east, and this useful traffic was the source of their opulence and freedom. The government was popular, 
under the administration of a duke and the supremacy of the Greek emperor. Fifty thousand citizens were numbered in the walls of Amalfi. Nor was any city more abundantly provided with gold, silver, and the objects of precious luxury. The mariners who swarmed in her port, excelled in the theory and practice of navigation and astronomy, and the discovery of the compass, which has opened the globe, is owing to their ingenuity or good fortune. Their trade was extended to the coasts, or at least to the commodities, of Africa, Arabia, and India, and their settlements in Constantinople, Antioch, Jerusalem, and Alexandria, acquired the privileges of independent colonies. 6931 After 300 years of prosperity, Amalfi was oppressed by the arms of the Normans, and sacked by the jealousy of Pisa. But the poverty of 1,6932 fishermen is yet dignified by the remains of an arsenal, a cathedral, and the palaces of royal merchants. Roger, the twelfth and last of the sons of Tancred, had been long detained in Normandy by his own and his father's age. He accepted the welcome summons, hastened to the Apulian camp, and deserved at first the esteem, and afterwards the envy, of his elder brother. Their valor and ambition were equal, but the youth, the beauty, the elegant manners, of Roger engaged the disinterested love of the soldiers and people. So scanty was his allowance for himself and forty followers, that he descended from conquest to robbery, and from robbery to domestic theft. And so loose were the notions of property, that, by his own historian, at his special command, he is accused of stealing horses from a stable at Melphi. 6933 His spirit emerged from poverty and disgrace, from these base practices he rose to the merit and glory of a holy war, and the invasion of Sicily was seconded by the zeal and policy of his brother Giscar. After the retreat of the Greeks, the idolaters, a most audacious reproach of the Catholics, had retrieved their losses and possessions. But the deliverance of the island, so vainly undertaken by the forces of the Eastern Empire, was achieved by a small and private band of adventurers. 6934 In the first attempt, Roger braved, in an open boat, the real and fabulous dangers of Scylla and Charybdis, landed with only sixty soldiers on a hostile shore. Drove the Saracens to the gates of Messina and safely returned with the spoils of the adjacent country. In the fortress of Trani, his active and patient courage were equally conspicuous. In his old age he related with pleasure, that, by the distress of the siege, himself, and the countess his wife, had been reduced to a single cloak or mantle, which they wore alternately. That in a sally his horse had been slain, and he was dragged away by the Saracens, but that he owed his rescue to his good sword, and had retreated with his saddle on his back, lest the meanest trophy might be left in the hands of the miscreants. In the siege of Trani, three hundred Normans withstood and repulsed the forces of the island. In the field of Ceramio, fifty thousand horse and foot were overthrown by one hundred and thirty-six Christian soldiers, without reckoning Esti. George, who fought on horseback in the foremost ranks. The captive banners, with four camels, were reserved for the successor of St. Peter. And had these barbaric spoils been exposed, not in the Vatican, but in the capital, they might have revived the memory of the Punic triumphs. These insufficient numbers of the Normans most probably denote their knights, the soldiers of honorable and equestrian rank, each of whom was attended by five or six followers in the field. 6935 Yet, with the aid of this interpretation, and after every fair allowance on the side of valor, arms, and reputation, the discomfiture of so many myriads will reduce the prudent reader to the alternative of a miracle or a fable. The Arabs of Sicily derived a frequent and powerful succor from their countrymen of Africa, in the siege of Palermo, the Norman cavalry was assisted by the galleys of Pisa. And, in the hour of action, the envy of the two brothers was sublimed to a generous and invincible emulation. After a war of thirty years 6936 Roger, with the title of Great Count, obtained the sovereignty of the largest and most fruitful island of the Mediterranean. And his administration displays a liberal and enlightened mind, above the limits of his age and education. The Moslems were maintained in the free enjoyment of their religion and property. 6937 A philosopher and physician of Mazara, of the race of Muhammad, harangued the conqueror, and was invited to court. His geography of the seven climates was translated into Latin, 
and Roger, after a diligent perusal, preferred the work of the Arabian to the writings of the Grecian Ptolemy. 6938 A remnant of Christian natives had promoted the success of the Normans, they were rewarded by the triumph of the cross. The island was restored to the jurisdiction of the Roman pontiff, new bishops were planted in the principal cities. And the clergy was satisfied by a liberal endowment of churches and monasteries. Yet the Catholic hero asserted the rights of the civil magistrate. Instead of resigning the investiture of benefices, he dexterously applied to his own profit the papal claims, the supremacy of the crown was secured and enlarged, by the singular bull. Which declares the princes of Sicily hereditary and perpetual legates of the Holy See. 6939 to Robert Guiscard, the conquest of Sicily was more glorious than beneficial, the possession of Apulia and Calabria was inadequate to his ambition. And he resolved to embrace or create the first occasion of invading, perhaps of subduing, the Roman Empire of the East. 6940 from his first wife, the partner of his humble fortune, he had been divorced under the pretense of consanguinity. And her son Bohemond was destined to imitate, rather than to succeed, his illustrious father. The second wife of Giscar was the daughter of the princes of Salerno, the Lombards acquiesced in the lineal succession of their son Roger. Their five daughters were given in honorable nuptials 6941 and one of them was betrothed, in a tender age, to Constantine, a beautiful youth, the son and heir of the Emperor Michael. 6942 But the throne of Constantinople was shaken by a revolution, the imperial family of Ducas was confined to the palace or the cloister, and Robert deplored, and resented, the disgrace of his daughter and the expulsion of his ally. A Greek, who styled himself the father of Constantine, soon appeared at Salerno, and related the adventures of his fall and flight. That unfortunate friend was acknowledged by the duke, and adorned with the pomp and titles of imperial dignity, in his triumphal progress through Apulia and Calabria, Michael 6943 was saluted with the tears and acclamations of the people. And Pope Gregory VII exhorted the bishops to preach, and the Catholics to fight, in the pious work of his restoration. His conversations with Robert were frequent and familiar. And their mutual promises were justified by the valor of the Normans and the treasures of the East. Yet this Michael, by the confession of the Greeks and Latins, was a pageant and an impostor. A monk who had fled from his convent, or a domestic who had served in the palace. The fraud had been contrived by the subtle Giscar. And he trusted, that after this pretender had given a decent color to his arms, he would sink, at the nod of the conqueror, into his primitive obscurity. But victory was the only argument that could determine the belief of the Greeks. And the ardor of the Latins was much inferior to their credulity, the Norman veterans wished to enjoy the harvest of their toils, and the unwarlike Italians trembled at the known and unknown dangers of a transmarine expedition. In his new levies, Robert exerted the influence of gifts and promises, the terrors of civil and ecclesiastical authority. And some acts of violence might justify the reproach, that age and infancy were pressed without distinction into the service of their unrelenting prince. After two years' incessant preparations the land and naval forces were assembled at Otranto, at the heel, or extreme promontory, of Italy. And Robert was accompanied by his wife, who fought by his side, his son Bohemond, and the representative of the Emperor Michael. 1300 Knights 6944 of Norman race or discipline, formed the sinews of the army, which might be swelled to 30,000 6945 followers of every denomination. The men, the horses, the arms, the engines, the wooden towers, covered with raw hides, were embarked on board 150 vessels, the transports had been built in the ports of Italy. And the galleys were supplied by the alliance of the Republic of Ragusa. At the mouth of the Adriatic Gulf, the shores of Italy and Epirus inclined towards each other. The space between Brundusium and Durazzo, the Roman passage, is no more than 100 miles. 6946 At the last station of Otranto, it is contracted to 50, 6947 and this narrow distance had suggested to Pyrrhus and Pompey the sublime or extravagant idea of a bridge. Before the general embarkation, 
the Norman Duke dispatched Bohemond with fifteen galleys to seize or threaten the Isle of Corfu, to survey the opposite coast, and to secure a harbour in the neighbourhood of Valona for the landing of the troops. They passed and landed without perceiving an enemy, and this successful experiment displayed the neglect and decay of the naval power of the Greeks. The islands of Epirus and the maritime towns were subdued by the arms or the name of Robert, who led his fleet and army from Corfu, I use the modern appellation, to the siege of Durazzo. That city, the western key of the empire, was guarded by ancient renown, and recent fortifications, by George Paleologus, a patrician, victorious in the Oriental Wars, and a numerous garrison of Albanians and Macedonians, who, in every age, have maintained the character of soldiers. In the prosecution of his enterprise, the courage of Giscar was assailed by every form of danger and mischance. In the most propitious season of the year, as his fleet passed along the coast, a storm of wind and snow unexpectedly arose, the Adriatic was swelled by the raging blast of the south. And a new shipwreck confirmed the old infamy of the Acroceranian rocks. 6948 The sails, the masts, and the oars, were shattered or torn away, the sea and shore were covered with the fragments of vessels, with arms and dead bodies, and the greatest part of the provisions were either drowned or damaged. The ducal galley was laboriously rescued from the waves, and Robert halted seven days on the adjacent cape, to collect the relics of his loss, and revive the drooping spirits of his soldiers. The Normans were no longer the bold and experienced mariners who had explored the ocean from Greenland to Mount Atlas, and who smiled at the petty dangers of the Mediterranean. They had wept during the tempest. They were alarmed by the hostile approach of the Venetians, who had been solicited by the prayers and promises of the Byzantine court. The first day's action was not disadvantageous to Bohemond, a beardless youth, 6949 who led the naval powers of his father. All night the galleys of the Republic lay on their anchors in the form of a crescent. And the victory of the second day was decided by the dexterity of their evolutions, the station of their archers, the weight of their javelins, and the borrowed aid of the Greek fire. The Apulian and Ragusian vessels fled to the shore, several were cut from their cables, and dragged away by the conqueror, and a sally from the town carried slaughter and dismay to the tents of the Norman duke. A seasonable relief was poured into Durazzo, and as soon as the besiegers had lost the command of the sea, the islands and maritime towns withdrew from the camp the supply of tribute and provision. That camp was soon afflicted with a pestilential disease, five hundred knights perished by an inglorious death, and the list of burials, if all could obtain a decent burial, amounted to ten thousand persons. Under these calamities, the mind of Giscar alone was firm and invincible, and while he collected new forces from Apulia and Sicily, he battered, or scaled, or sapped, the walls of Durazzo. But his industry and valour were encountered by equal valour and more perfect industry. A movable turret, of a size and capacity to contain five hundred soldiers, had been rolled forwards to the foot of the rampart, but the descent of the door or drawbridge was checked by an enormous beam. And the wooden structure was constantly consumed by artificial flames. While the Roman Empire was attacked by the Turks in the east, east, and the Normans in the west, the aged successor of Michael surrendered the scepter to the hands of Alexius, an illustrious captain, and the founder of the Comnenian dynasty. The princess Anne, his daughter and historian, observes, in her affected style, that even Hercules was unequal to a double combat. And, on this principle, she approves a hasty peace with the Turks, which allowed her father to undertake in person the relief of Durazzo. On his accession, Alexius found the camp without soldiers, and the treasury without money. Yet such were the vigor and activity of his measures, that in six months he assembled an army of seventy thousand men, sixty-nine fifty and performed a march of five hundred miles. His troops were levied in Europe and Asia, from Peloponnesus to the Black Sea. His majesty was displayed in the silver arms and rich trappings of the companies of horse guards. And the emperor was attended by a train of nobles and princes, some of whom, in rapid succession, had been clothed with the purple, and were indulged by the lenity of the times in a life of affluence and dignity. Their youthful ardor might animate the multitude, but their love of pleasure and contempt of subordination were pregnant with disorder and mischief. 
and their importunate clamors for speedy and decisive action disconcerted the prudence of Alexius, who might have surrounded and starved the besieging army. The enumeration of provinces recalls a sad comparison of the past and present limits of the Roman world, the raw levies were drawn together in haste and terror. And the garrisons of Anatolia, or Asia Minor, had been purchased by the evacuation of the cities which were immediately occupied by the Turks. The strength of the Greek army consisted in the Varangians, the Scandinavian guards, whose numbers were recently augmented by a colony of exiles and volunteers from the British island of Thule. Under the yoke of the Norman conqueror, the Danes and English were oppressed and united, a band of adventurous youths resolved to desert a land of slavery, the sea was open to their escape. And, in their long pilgrimage, they visited every coast that afforded any hope of liberty and revenge. They were entertained in the service of the Greek emperor. And their first station was in a new city on the Asiatic shore, but Alexius soon recalled them to the defense of his person and palace, and bequeathed to his successors the inheritance of their faith and valor. 6951 The name of a Norman invader revived the memory of their wrongs, they marched with alacrity against the national foe, and panted to regain in Epirus the glory which they had lost in the Battle of Hastings. The Varangians were supported by some companies of Franks or Latins, and the rebels, who had fled to Constantinople from the tyranny of Giscar, were eager to signalize their zeal and gratify their revenge. In this emergency, the emperor had not disdained the impure aid of the Politians or Manichaeans of Thrace and Bulgaria, and these heretics united with the patience of martyrdom the spirit and discipline of active valor. 6952 The treaty with the Sultan had procured a supply of some thousand Turks, and the arrows of the Scythian horse were opposed to the lances of the Norman cavalry. On the report and distant prospect of these formidable numbers, Robert assembled a council of his principal officers. You behold, said he, your danger, it is urgent and inevitable. The hills are covered with arms and standards. And the emperor of the Greeks is accustomed to wars and triumphs. Obedience and union are our only safety, and I am ready to yield the command to a more worthy leader. The vote and acclamation even of his secret enemies, assured him, in that perilous moment, of their esteem and confidence, and the duke thus continued, let us trust in the rewards of victory, and deprive cowardice of the means of escape. Let us burn our vessels and our baggage, and give battle on this spot, as if it were the place of our nativity and our burial. The resolution was unanimously approved. And, without confining himself to his lines, Giscar awaited in battle array the nearer approach of the enemy. His rear was covered by a small river, his right wing extended to the sea. His left to the hills, nor was he conscious, perhaps, that on the same ground Caesar and Pompey had formerly disputed the empire of the world. 6953 Against the advice of his wisest captains, Alexius resolved to risk the event of a general action, and exhorted the garrison of Durazzo to assist their own deliverance by a well-timed sally from the town. He marched in two columns to surprise the Normans before daybreak on two different sides, his light cavalry was scattered over the plain, the archers formed the second line, and the Varangians claimed the honors of the vanguard. In the first onset, the battle axes of the strangers made a deep and bloody impression on the army of Giscar, which was now reduced to fifteen thousand men. The Lombards and Calabrians ignominiously turned their backs. They fled towards the river and the sea, but the bridge had been broken down to check the sally of the garrison, and the coast was lined with the Venetian galleys, who played their engines among the disorderly throng. On the verge of ruin, they were saved by the spirit and conduct of their chiefs. Gaeta, the wife of Robert, is painted by the Greeks as a warlike Amazon, a second palace. Less skillful in arts, but not less terrible in arms, than the Athenian goddess, 6954 Though wounded by an arrow, she stood her ground, and strove, by her exhortation and example, to rally the flying troops. 6955 Her female voice was seconded by the more powerful voice and arm of the Norman duke, as calm in action as he was magnanimous in counsel, whither, he cried aloud, whither do ye fly? Your enemy is implacable. And death is less grievous than servitude. The moment was decisive, as the Varangians advanced before the line, 
they discovered the nakedness of their flanks, the main battle of the Duke, of eight hundred knights, stood firm and entire. They couched their lances, and the Greeks bore the furious and irresistible shock of the French cavalry. 6956 Alexius was not deficient in the duties of a soldier or a general. But he no sooner beheld the slaughter of the Varangians, and the flight of the Turks, than he despised his subjects, and despaired of his fortune. The Princess N, who drops a tear on this melancholy event, is reduced to praise the strength and swiftness of her father's horse, and his vigorous struggle when he was almost overthrown by the stroke of a lance, which had shivered the imperial helmet. His desperate valor broke through a squadron of Franks who opposed his flight, and after wandering two days and as many nights in the mountains, he found some repose, of body, though not of mind, in the walls of Lycnidus. The victorious Robert reproached the tardy and feeble pursuit which had suffered the escape of so illustrious a prize, but he consoled his disappointment by the trophies and standards of the field, the wealth and luxury of the Byzantine camp, and the glory of defeating an army five times more numerous than his own. A multitude of Italians had been the victims of their own fears, but only thirty of his knights were slain in this memorable day. In the Roman host, the loss of Greeks, Turks, and English, amounted to five or six thousand colon sixty-nine fifty-seven the plain of Durazzo was stained with noble and royal blood, and the end of the impostor Michael was more honorable than his life. It is more than probable that Giscar was not afflicted by the loss of a costly pageant, which had merited only the contempt and derision of the Greeks. After their defeat, they still persevered in the defense of Durazzo. And a Venetian commander supplied the place of George Paleologus, who had been imprudently called away from his station. The tents of the besiegers were converted into barracks, to sustain the inclemency of the winter. And in answer to the defiance of the garrison, Robert insinuated, that his patience was at least equal to their obstinacy. 6958 Perhaps he already trusted to his secret correspondence with a Venetian noble, who sold the city for a rich and honorable marriage. At the dead of night, several rope ladders were dropped from the walls, the light Calabrians ascended in silence. And the Greeks were awakened by the name and trumpets of the conqueror. Yet they defended the streets three days against an enemy already master of the rampart and near seven months elapsed between the first investment and the final surrender of the place. From Durazzo, the Norman duke advanced into the heart of Epirus or Albania, traversed the first mountains of Thessaly, surprised three hundred English in the city of Castoria, approached Thessalonica, and made Constantinople tremble. A more pressing duty suspended the prosecution of his ambitious designs. By shipwreck, pestilence, and the sword, his army was reduced to a third of the original numbers. And instead of being recruited from Italy, he was informed, by plaintive epistles, of the mischiefs and dangers which had been produced by his absence, the revolt of the cities and barons of Apulia, the distress of the Pope, and the approach or invasion of Henry King of Germany. Highly presuming that his person was sufficient for the public safety, he repassed the sea in a single brigantine, and left the remains of the army under the command of his son and the Norman counts. Exhorting Bohemian to respect the freedom of his peers, and the counts to obey the authority of their leader. The son of Giscar trod in the footsteps of his father, and the two destroyers are compared, by the Greeks, to the caterpillar and the locust, the last of whom devours whatever has escaped the teeth of the former. 6959 After winning two battles against the emperor, he descended into the plain of Thessaly, and besieged Larissa, the fabulous realm of Achilles 6960 which contained the treasure and magazines of the Byzantine camp. Yet a just praise must not be refused to the fortitude and prudence of Alexius, who bravely struggled with the calamities of the times. In the poverty of the state, he presumed to borrow the superfluous ornaments of the churches, the desertion of the Manichaeans was supplied by some tribes of Moldavia, a reinforcement of seven thousand Turks replaced and revenged the loss of their brethren. And the Greek soldiers were exercised to ride, to draw the bow, and to the daily practice of ambuscades and evolutions. Alexius had been taught by experience, that the formidable cavalry of the Franks on foot was unfit for action, and almost incapable of motion, 6961 his archers were directed to aim their arrows at the horse rather than the man. 
and a variety of spikes and snares were scattered over the ground on which he might expect an attack. In the neighborhood of Larissa the events of war were protracted and balanced. The courage of Bohemond was always conspicuous, and often successful, but his camp was pillaged by a stratagem of the Greeks, the city was impregnable. And the venal or discontented counts deserted his standard, betrayed their trusts, and enlisted in the service of the emperor. Alexius returned to Constantinople with the advantage, rather than the honor, of victory. After evacuating the conquests which he could no longer defend, the son of Giscar embarked for Italy, and was embraced by a father who esteemed his merit, and sympathized in his misfortune. Of the Latin princes, the allies of Alexius and enemies of Robert, the most prompt and powerful was Henry III or IV, King of Germany in Italy, and future Emperor of the West. The epistle of the Greek monarch 6962 to his brother is filled with the warmest professions of friendship, and the most lively desire of strengthening their alliance by every public and private tie. He congratulates Henry on his success in a just and pious war, and complains that the prosperity of his own empire is disturbed by the audacious enterprises of the Norman Robert. The lists of his presence expresses the manners of the age, a radiated crown of gold, a cross set with pearls to hang on the breast, a case of relics, with the names and titles of the saints, a vase of crystal, a vase of sardonyx, some balm. Most probably of Mecca, and one hundred pieces of purple. To these he added a more solid present, of one hundred and forty-four thousand Byzantines of gold, with a further assurance of two hundred and sixteen thousand, so soon as Henry should have entered in arms the Apulian territories. And confirmed by an oath the league against the common enemy. The German, 6963 who was already in Lombardy at the head of an army in a faction, accepted these liberal offers, and marched towards the south, his speed was checked by the sound of the Battle of Durazzo. But the influence of his arms, or name, in the hasty return of Robert, was a full equivalent for the Grecian bribe. Henry was the severe adversary of the Normans, the allies and vassals of Gregory VII, his implacable foe. The long quarrel of the throne and mitre had been recently kindled by the zeal and ambition of that haughty priest 6960 for the king and the pope had degraded each other, and each had seated a rival on the temporal or spiritual throne of his antagonist. After the defeat and death of his Swabian rebel, Henry descended into Italy, to assume the imperial crown, and to drive from the Vatican the tyrant of the church. 6965 But the Roman people adhered to the cause of Gregory, their resolution was fortified by supplies of men and money from Apulia, and the city was thrice ineffectually besieged by the king of Germany. In the fourth year he corrupted, as it is said, with Byzantine gold, the nobles of Rome, whose estates and castles had been ruined by the war. The gates, the bridges, and fifty hostages, were delivered into his hands, the anti-pope, Clement III, was consecrated in the Lateran, the grateful pontiff crowned his protector in the Vatican. And the Emperor Henry fixed his residence in the capital, as the lawful successor of Augustus and Charlemagne. The ruins of the Septizonium were still defended by the nephew of Gregory, the Pope himself was invested in the castle of St. Angelo. And his last hope was in the courage and fidelity of his Norman vassal. Their friendship had been interrupted by some reciprocal injuries and complaints. But, on this pressing occasion, Giscar was urged by the obligation of his oath, by his interest, more potent than oaths, by the love of fame, and his enmity to the two emperors. Unfurling the holy banner, he resolved to fly to the relief of the Prince of the Apostles, the most numerous of his armies, six thousand horse, and thirty thousand foot, was instantly assembled. And his march from Salerno to Rome was animated by the public applause and the promise of the divine favor. Henry, invincible in sixty-six battles, trembled at his approach recollected some indispensable affairs that required his presence in Lombardy, exhorted the Romans to persevere in their allegiance, and hastily retreated three days before the entrance of the Normans. In less than three years, the son of Tancred of Hauteville enjoyed the glory of delivering the Pope, and of compelling the two emperors, of the East and West, to fly before his victorious arms. 6966 But the triumph of Robert was clouded by the calamities of Rome. By the aid of the friends of Gregory, the walls had been perforated or scaled, 
but the imperial faction was still powerful and active. On the third day, the people rose in a furious tumult, and a hasty word of the conqueror, in his defense or revenge, was the signal of fire and pillage. 6967 The Saracens of Sicily, the subjects of Roger, and auxiliaries of his brother, embraced this fair occasion of rifling and profaning the holy city of the Christians, many thousands of the citizens, in the sight, and by the allies. Of their spiritual father were exposed to violation, captivity, or death. An a spacious quarter of the city, from the Lateran to the Colosseum, was consumed by the flames, and devoted to perpetual solitude. 6968 From a city, where he was now hated, and might be no longer feared, Gregory retired to end his days in the palace of Salerno. The artful pontiff might flatter the vanity of Giscar with the hope of a Roman or imperial crown. But this dangerous measure, which would have inflamed the ambition of the Norman, must forever have alienated the most faithful princes of Germany. The deliverer and scourge of Rome might have indulged himself in a season of repose. But in the same year of the flight of the German emperor, the indefatigable Robert resumed the design of his eastern conquests. The zeal or gratitude of Gregory had promised to his valour the kingdoms of Greece and Asia. 6969 His troops were assembled in arms, flushed with success, and eager for action. Their numbers, in the language of Homer, are compared by Anna to a swarm of bees. 6970 Yet the utmost and moderate limits of the powers of Giscar have been already defined, they were contained on this second occasion in 120 vessels. And as the season was far advanced, the harbour of Brundusium 6971 was preferred to the open road of Otranto. Alexius, apprehensive of a second attack, had assiduously laboured to restore the naval forces of the empire. And obtained from the Republic of Venice an important succour of thirty-six transports, fourteen galleys, and nine galeots or ships of extraordinary strength and magnitude. Their services were liberally paid by the license or monopoly of trade, a profitable gift of many shops and houses in the port of Constantinople, and a tribute to St. Mark, the more acceptable, as it was the produce of a tax on their rivals at Amalfi. By the union of the Greeks and Venetians, the Adriatic was covered with a hostile fleet. But their own neglect, or the vigilance of Robert, the change of a wind, or the shelter of a mist, opened a free passage, and the Norman troops were safely disembarked on the coast of Epirus. With twenty strong and well-appointed galleys, their intrepid duke immediately sought the enemy, and though more accustomed to fight on horseback, he trusted his own life, and the lives of his brother and two sons, to the event of a naval combat. The dominion of the sea was disputed in three engagements, in sight of the Isle of Corfu, in the two former, the skill and numbers of the allies were superior, but in the third, the Normans obtained a final and complete victory. 6972 The light brigantines of the Greeks were scattered in ignominious flight, the nine castles of the Venetians maintained a more obstinate conflict, seven were sunk, two were taken. 2,500 captives implored in vain the mercy of the victor, and the daughter of Alexius deplores the loss of 13,000 of his subjects or allies. The want of experience had been supplied by the genius of Giscar. And each evening, when he had sounded a retreat, he calmly explored the causes of his repulse, and invented new methods how to remedy his own defects, and to baffle the advantages of the enemy. The winter season suspended his progress, with the return of spring he again aspired to the conquest of Constantinople. But, instead of traversing the hills of Epirus, he turned his arms against Greece and the islands, where the spoils would repay the labour, and where the land and sea forces might pursue their joint operations with vigour and effect. But, in the Isle of Cephalonia, his projects were fatally blasted by an epidemical disease, Robert himself, in the seventieth year of his age, expired in his tent. And the suspicion of poison was imputed, by public rumour, to his wife, or to the Greek emperor. 6973 This premature death might allow a boundless scope for the imagination of his future exploits. And the event sufficiently declares, that the Norman greatness was founded on his life. 6974 Without the appearance of an enemy, a victorious army dispersed or retreated in disorder and consternation. And Alexius, who had trembled for his empire, rejoiced in his deliverance. 
The galley which transported the remains of Giscar was shipwrecked on the Italian shore. But the duke's body was recovered from the sea, and deposited in the sepulchre of Vinutia 6975 a place more illustrious for the birth of Horus 6976 than for the burial of the Norman heroes. Roger, his second son and successor, immediately sunk to the humble station of a duke of Apulia, the esteem or partiality of his father left the valiant Bohemond to the inheritance of his sword. The national tranquillity was disturbed by his claims, till the first crusade against the infidels of the East opened a more splendid field of glory and conquest. 6977. Of human life, the most glorious or humble prospects are alike and soon bounded by the sepulchre. The male line of Robert Giscar was extinguished, both in Apulia and at Antioch, in the second generation. But his younger brother became the father of a line of kings, and the son of the great count was endowed with the name, the conquests, and the spirit, of the first Roger. 6978 The heir of that Norman adventurer was born in Sicily. And, at the age of only four years, he succeeded to the sovereignty of the island, a lot which reason might envy, could she indulge for a moment the visionary, though virtuous wish of dominion. Had Roger been content with his fruitful patrimony, a happy and grateful people might have blessed their benefactor. And if a wise administration could have restored the prosperous times of the Greek colonies 6979 the opulence and power of Sicily alone might have equaled the widest scope that could be acquired and desolated by the sword of war. But the ambition of the great count was ignorant of these noble pursuits, it was gratified by the vulgar means of violence and artifice. He sought to obtain the undivided possession of Palermo, of which one moiety had been ceded to the elder branch struggled to enlarge his Calabrian limits beyond the measure of former treaties, and impatiently watched the declining health of his cousin William of Apulia, the grandson of Robert. On the first intelligence of his premature death, Roger sailed from Palermo with seven galleys, cast anchor in the Bay of Salerno, received, after ten days' negotiation, an oath of fidelity from the Norman capital. Commanded the submission of the barons, and extorted a legal investiture from the reluctant popes, who could not long endure either the friendship or enmity of a powerful vassal. The sacred spot of Benevento was respectfully spared, as the patrimony of St. Peter, but the reduction of Capua and Naples completed the design of his uncle Giscar. And the sole inheritance of the Norman conquests was possessed by the victorious Roger. A conscious superiority of power and merit prompted him to disdain the titles of Duke and of Count. And the Isle of Sicily, with a third perhaps of the continent of Italy, might form the basis of a kingdom 6980 which would only yield to the monarchies of France and England. The chiefs of the nation who attended his coronation at Palermo might doubtless pronounce under what name he should reign over them, but the example of a Greek tyrant or a Saracen emir was insufficient to justify his regal character. And the nine kings of the Latin world 6981 might disclaim their new associate, unless he were consecrated by the authority of the supreme pontiff. The pride of Anacletus was pleased to confer a title, which the pride of the Norman had stooped to solicit, 6982 but his own legitimacy was attacked by the adverse election of Innocent II. And while Anacletus sat in the Vatican, the successful fugitive was acknowledged by the nations of Europe. The infant monarchy of Roger was shaken, and almost overthrown, by the unlucky choice of an ecclesiastical patron. And the sword of Lothair II of Germany, the excommunications of Innocent, the fleets of Pisa, and the zeal of St. Bernard, were united for the ruin of the Sicilian robber. After a gallant resistance, the Norman prince was driven from the continent of Italy, a new duke of Apulia was invested by the Pope and the Emperor, each of whom held one end of the gonfanon, or flagstaff, as a token that they asserted their right. And suspended their quarrel. But such jealous friendship was of short and precarious duration, the German armies soon vanished in disease and desertion. 6983 The Apulian duke, with all his adherents, was exterminated by a conqueror who seldom forgave either the dead or the living. Like his predecessor Leo IX, the feeble though haughty pontiff became the captive and friend of the Normans, and their reconciliation was celebrated by the eloquence of Bernard who now revered the title and virtues of the King of Sicily. As a penance for his impious war against the successor of St. Peter, 
that monarch might have promised to display the banner of the cross, and he accomplished with ardor a vow so propitious to his interest and revenge. The recent injuries of Sicily might provoke a just retaliation on the heads of the Saracens, the Normans, whose blood had been mingled with so many subject streams, were encouraged to remember and emulate the naval trophies of their fathers. And in the maturity of their strength they contended with the decline of an African power. When the Fatimite Caliph departed for the conquest of Egypt, he rewarded the real merit and apparent fidelity of his servant Joseph with a gift of his royal mantle, and forty Arabian horses, his palace with its sumptuous furniture. And the government of the kingdoms of Tunis and Algiers. The Zayrides 6984 The descendants of Joseph, forgot their allegiance and gratitude to a distant benefactor, grasped and abused the fruits of prosperity. And after running the little course of an oriental dynasty, were now fainting in their own weakness. On the side of the land, they were pressed by the Almohades, the fanatic princes of Morocco, while the sea coast was open to the enterprises of the Greeks and Franks, who, before the close of the eleventh century, had extorted a ransom of two hundred thousand pieces of gold. By the first arms of Roger, the island or rock of Malta, which has been since ennobled by a military and religious colony, was inseparably annexed to the crown of Sicily. Tripoli, 6985 a strong and maritime city, was the next object of his attack. And the slaughter of the males, the captivity of the females, might be justified by the frequent practice of the Moslems themselves. The capital of the Zayrides was named Africa from the country, and Mahadia 6986 from the Arabian founder, it is strongly built on a neck of land, but the imperfection of the harbour is not compensated by the fertility of the adjacent plain. Mahadia was besieged by George the Sicilian Admiral, with a fleet of 150 galleys, amply provided with men and the instruments of mischief, the sovereign had fled, the Moorish governor refused to capitulate. Declined the last and irresistible assault, and secretly escaping with the Moslem inhabitants abandoned the place and its treasures to the rapacious Franks. In successive expeditions, the king of Sicily or his lieutenants reduced the cities of Tunis, Safax, Capsia, Bona, and a long tract of the sea coast. 6987 The fortresses were garrisoned, the country was tributary, and a boast that it held Africa in subjection might be inscribed with some flattery on the sword of Roger. 6988 After his death, that sword was broken. And these transmarine possessions were neglected, evacuated, or lost, under the troubled reign of his successor. 6989 The triumphs of Scipio and Belisarius have proved that the African continent is neither inaccessible nor invincible. Yet the great princes and powers of Christendom have repeatedly failed in their armaments against the Moors, who may still glory in the easy conquest and long servitude of Spain. Since the decease of Robert Giscard, the Normans had relinquished, above sixty years, their hostile designs against the Empire of the East. The policy of Roger solicited a public and private union with the Greek princes, whose alliance would dignify his regal character, he demanded in marriage a daughter of the Comnenian family. And the first steps of the treaty seemed to promise a favourable event. But the contemptuous treatment of his ambassadors exasperated the vanity of the new monarch, and the insolence of the Byzantine court was expiated, according to the laws of nations, by the sufferings of a guiltless people. 6990 With the fleet of seventy galleys, George, the admiral of Sicily, appeared before Corfu. And both the island and city were delivered into his hands by the disaffected inhabitants, who had yet to learn that a siege is still more calamitous than a tribute. In this invasion, of some moment in the annals of commerce, the Normans spread themselves by sea, and over the provinces of Greece, and the venerable age of Athens, Thebes, and Corinth, was violated by rapine and cruelty. Of the wrongs of Athens, no memorial remains. The ancient walls, which encompassed, without guarding, the opulence of Thebes, were scaled by the Latin Christians. But their sole use of the gospel was to sanctify an oath, that the lawful owners had not secreted any relic of their inheritance or industry. On the approach of the Normans, the lower town of Corinth was evacuated. The Greeks retired to the citadel, which was seated on a lofty eminence, abundantly watered by the classic fountain of Pyrene, an impregnable fortress, if the want of courage could be balanced by any advantages of art or nature. 
As soon as the besiegers had surmounted the labor, their sole labor, of climbing the hill, their general, from the commanding eminence, admired his own victory, and testified his gratitude to heaven. By tearing from the altar the precious image of Theodore, the tutelary saint. The silk weavers of both sexes, whom George transported to Sicily, composed the most valuable part of the spoil. And in comparing the skillful industry of the mechanic with the sloth and cowardice of the soldier, he was heard to exclaim that the distaff and loom were the only weapons which the Greeks were capable of using. The progress of this naval armament was marked by two conspicuous events, the rescue of the King of France, and the insult of the Byzantine capital. In his return by sea from an unfortunate crusade, Louis VII was intercepted by the Greeks, who basely violated the laws of honor and religion. The fortunate encounter of the Norman fleet delivered the royal captive. And after a free and honorable entertainment in the court of Sicily, Louis continued his journey to Rome and Paris. 6991 In the absence of the emperor, Constantinople and the Hellespont were left without defense and without the suspicion of danger. The clergy and people, for the soldiers had followed the standard of Manuel, were astonished and dismayed at the hostile appearance of a line of galleys, which boldly cast anchor in the front of the imperial city. The forces of the Sicilian admiral were inadequate to the siege or assault of an immense and populous metropolis, but George enjoyed the glory of humbling the Greek arrogance, and of marking the path of conquest to the navies of the West. He landed some soldiers to rifle the fruits of the royal gardens, and pointed with silver, or most probably with fire, the arrows which he discharged against the palace of the Caesars. 6992 This playful outrage of the pirates of Sicily, who had surprised an unguarded moment, Manuel affected to despise, while his martial spirit, and the forces of the empire, were awakened to revenge. The archipelago and Ionian Sea were covered with his squadrons and those of Venice. But I know not by what favorable allowance of transports, vittlers, and pinnaces, our reason, or even our fancy, can be reconciled to the stupendous account of fifteen hundred vessels, which is proposed by a Byzantine historian. These operations were directed with prudence and energy, in his homeward voyage George lost nineteen of his galleys, which were separated and taken, after an obstinate defense, Corfu implored the clemency of her lawful sovereign. Nor could a ship, a soldier, of the Norman prince, be found, unless as a captive, within the limits of the Eastern Empire. The prosperity and the health of Roger were already in a declining state, while he listened in his palace of Palermo to the messengers of victory or defeat, the invincible Manuel, the foremost in every assault, was celebrated by the Greeks and Latins as the Alexander or the Hercules of the age. A prince of such a temper could not be satisfied with having repelled the insolence of a barbarian. It was the right and duty, it might be the interest and glory, of Manuel to restore the ancient majesty of the empire, to recover the provinces of Italy and Sicily, and to chastise this pretended king, the grandson of a Norman vassal. 6993 The natives of Calabria were still attached to the Greek language and worship, which had been inexorably proscribed by the Latin clergy, after the loss of her dukes, Apulia was chained as a servile appendage to the crown of Sicily. The founder of the monarchy had ruled by the sword, and his death had abetted the fear, without healing the discontent, of his subjects, the feudal government was always pregnant with the seeds of rebellion. And a nephew of Roger himself invited the enemies of his family and nation. The Majesty of the Purple, and a series of Hungarian and Turkish wars, prevented Manuel from embarking his person in the Italian expedition. To the brave and noble Paleologus, his lieutenant, the Greek monarch entrusted a fleet and army, the siege of Bari was his first exploit, and, in every operation, gold as well as steel was the instrument of victory. Salerno, and some places along the western coast, maintained their fidelity to the Norman king, but he lost in two campaigns the greater part of his continental possessions. And the modest emperor, disdaining all flattery and falsehood, was content with the reduction of three hundred cities or villages of Apulia and Calabria, whose names and titles were inscribed on all the walls of the palace. The prejudices of the Latins were gratified by a genuine or fictitious donation under the seal of the German Caesars. 6994 But the successor of Constantine soon renounced this ignominious pretense, claimed the indefeasible dominion of Italy, 
and professed his design of chasing the barbarians beyond the Alps. By the artful speeches, liberal gifts, and unbounded promises, of their eastern ally. The free cities were encouraged to persevere in their generous struggle against the despotism of Frederick Barbarossa, the walls of Milan were rebuilt by the contributions of Manuel. And he poured, says the historian, a river of gold into the bosom of Ancona, whose attachment to the Greeks was fortified by the jealous enmity of the Venetians. 6995 The situation and trade of Ancona rendered it an important garrison in the heart of Italy, it was twice besieged by the arms of Frederick, the imperial forces were twice repulsed by the spirit of freedom. That spirit was animated by the ambassador of Constantinople, and the most intrepid patriots, the most faithful servants, were rewarded by the wealth and honors of the Byzantine court. 6996 The pride of Manuel disdained and rejected a barbarian colleague. His ambition was excited by the hope of stripping the purple from the German usurpers, and of establishing, in the West, as in the East, his lawful title of sole emperor of the Romans. With this view, he solicited the alliance of the people and the Bishop of Rome. Several of the nobles embraced the cause of the Greek monarch. The splendid nuptials of his niece with Odo Frangipani secured the support of that powerful family 6997 and his royal standard or image was entertained with due reverence in the ancient metropolis. 6998 During the quarrel between Frederick and Alexander III, the Pope twice received in the Vatican the ambassadors of Constantinople. They flattered his piety by the long-promised union of the two churches, tempted the avarice of his venal court, and exhorted the Roman pontiff to seize the just provocation, the favorable moment. To humble the savage insolence of the Alamanni and to acknowledge the true representative of Constantine and Augustus. 6999. But these Italian conquests, this universal reign, soon escaped from the hand of the Greek emperor. His first demands were eluded by the prudence of Alexander III, who paused on this deep and momentous revolution. 7,000 nor could the Pope be seduced by a personal dispute to renounce the perpetual inheritance of the Latin name. After the reunion with Frederick, he spoke a more peremptory language, confirmed the acts of his predecessors, excommunicated the adherents of Manuel, and pronounced the final separation of the churches, or at least the empires. Of Constantinople and Rome. 7,001 The free cities of Lombardy no longer remembered their foreign benefactor, and without preserving the friendship of Ancona, he soon incurred the enmity of Venice. 7002 By his own avarice, or the complaints of his subjects, the Greek emperor was provoked to arrest the persons, and confiscate the effects, of the Venetian merchants. This violation of the public faith exasperated a free and commercial people, 100 galleys were launched and armed in as many days. They swept the coasts of Dalmatia and Greece, but after some mutual wounds, the war was terminated by an agreement, inglorious to the empire, insufficient for the republic. And a complete vengeance of these and of fresh injuries was reserved for the succeeding generation. The lieutenant of Manuel had informed his sovereign that he was strong enough to quell any domestic revolt of Apulia and Calabria. But that his forces were inadequate to resist the impending attack of the king of Sicily. His prophecy was soon verified the death of Paleologus devolved the command on several chiefs, alike eminent in rank, alike defective in military talents. The Greeks were oppressed by land and sea, and a captive remnant that escaped the swords of the Normans and Saracens, abjured all future hostility against the person or dominions of their conqueror. 7003 Yet the king of Sicily esteemed the courage and constancy of Manuel, who had landed a second army on the Italian shore he respectfully addressed the new Justinian, solicited a peace or truce of thirty years, accepted as a gift the regal title, and acknowledged himself the military vassal of the Roman Empire. Point seven thousand and four the Byzantine Caesars acquiesced in this shadow of dominion, without expecting, perhaps without desiring, the service of a Norman army. And the truce of thirty years was not disturbed by any hostilities between Sicily and Constantinople. About the end of that period, the throne of Manuel was usurped by an inhuman tyrant, who had deserved the abhorrence of his country and mankind, the sword of William II, the grandson of Roger, was drawn by a fugitive of the Comnenian race. 
and the subjects of Andronicus might salute the strangers as friends, since they detested their sovereign as the worst of enemies. The Latin historians 7005 expatiate on the rapid progress of the four counts who invaded Romania with a fleet and army, and reduced many castles and cities to the obedience of the king of Sicily. The Greek 7006 accuse and magnify the wanton and sacrilegious cruelties that were perpetrated in the sack of Thessalonica, the second city of the empire. The former deplore the fate of those invincible but unsuspecting warriors who were destroyed by the arts of a vanquished foe. The latter applaud, in songs of triumph, the repeated victories of their countrymen on the Sea of Marmora or Propontis, on the banks of the Strymon, and under the walls of Durazzo. A revolution which punished the crimes of Andronicus, had united against the Franks the zeal and courage of the successful insurgents, ten thousand were slain in battle, and Isaac Angelus, the new emperor, might indulge his vanity or vengeance in the treatment of four thousand captives. Such was the event of the last contest between the Greeks and Normans, before the expiration of twenty years, the rival nations were lost or degraded in foreign servitude. And the successors of Constantine did not long survive to insult the fall of the Sicilian monarchy. The scepter of Roger successively devolved to his son and grandson, they might be confounded under the name of William, they are strongly discriminated by the epithets of the bad and the good. But these epithets, which appear to describe the perfection of vice and virtue, cannot strictly be applied to either of the Norman princes. When he was roused to arms by danger and shame, the first William did not degenerate from the valour of his race, but his temper was slothful, his manners were dissolute, his passions headstrong and mischievous. And the monarch is responsible, not only for his personal vices, but for those of Majo, the great admiral, who abused the confidence, and conspired against the life, of his benefactor. From the Arabian conquest, Sicily had imbibed a deep tincture of oriental manners, the despotism, the pomp, and even the harem, of a sultan. And a Christian people was oppressed and insulted by the ascendant of the eunuchs, who openly professed, or secretly cherished, the religion of Muhammad. An eloquent historian of the time 7007 has delineated the misfortunes of his country, 7008 the ambition and fall of the ungrateful Majo, the revolt and punishment of his assassins, the imprisonment and deliverance of the king himself. The private feuds that arose from the public confusion, and the various forms of calamity and discord which afflicted Palermo, the island, and the continent, during the reign of William I, and the minority of his son. The youth, innocence, and beauty of William II 7009 endeared him to the nation, the factions were reconciled, the laws were revived. And from the manhood to the premature death of that amiable prince, Sicily enjoyed a short season of peace, justice, and happiness, whose value was enhanced by the remembrance of the past and the dread of futurity. The legitimate male posterity of Tancred of Hauteville was extinct in the person of the second William, but his aunt, the daughter of Roger, had married the most powerful prince of the age. And Henry VI, the son of Frederick Barbarossa, descended from the Alps to claim the imperial crown and the inheritance of his wife. Against the unanimous wish of a free people, this inheritance could only be acquired by arms. And I am pleased to transcribe the style and sense of the historian Falcandus, who writes at the moment, and on the spot, with the feelings of a patriot, and the prophetic eye of a statesman. Constantia, the daughter of Sicily, nursed from her cradle in the pleasures and plenty, and educated in the arts and manners, of this fortunate isle, departed long since to enrich the barbarians with our treasures, and now returns with her savage allies, to contaminate the beauties of her venerable parent. Already I behold the swarms of angry barbarians, our opulent cities, the places flourishing in a long peace, are shaken with fear, desolated by slaughter, consumed by rapine, and polluted by intemperance and lust. I see the massacre or captivity of our citizens, the rapes of our virgins and matrons. Point seventy ten. in this extremity, he interrogates a friend, how must the Sicilians act? By the unanimous election of a king of valour and experience, Sicily and Calabria might yet be preserved, 7011 for in the levity of the Apulians, ever eager for new revolutions, I can repose neither confidence nor hope. 7012 should Calabria be lost, the lofty towers, the numerous youth, 
and the naval strength, of Messina, 7013 might guard the passage against a foreign invader. If the savage Germans coalesce with the pirates of Messina. If they destroy with fire the fruitful region, so often wasted by the fires of Mount Etna, 7014 what resource will be left for the interior parts of the island? These noble cities which should never be violated by the hostile footsteps of a barbarian? 7015 Catana has again been overwhelmed by an earthquake, the ancient virtue of Syracuse expires in poverty and solitude. 7016 But Palermo is still crowned with a diadem, and her triple walls enclose the active multitudes of Christians and Saracens. If the two nations, under one king, can unite for their common safety, they may rush on the barbarians with invincible arms. But if the Saracens, fatigued by a repetition of injuries, should now retire and rebel. If they should occupy the castles of the mountains and sea coast, the unfortunate Christians, exposed to a double attack, and placed as it were between the hammer and the anvil, must resign themselves to hopeless and inevitable servitude. 7017 We must not forget, that a priest here prefers his country to his religion, and that the Moslems, whose alliance he seeks, were still numerous and powerful in the state of Sicily. The hopes, or at least the wishes, of Falcandus were at first gratified by the free and unanimous election of Tancred, the grandson of the first king, whose birth was illegitimate, but whose civil and military virtues shone without a blemish. During four years, the term of his life and reign, he stood in arms on the farthest verge of the Apulian frontier, against the powers of Germany. And the restitution of a royal captive, of Constantia herself, without injury or ransom, may appear to surpass the most liberal measure of policy or reason. After his decease, the kingdom of his widow and infant son fell without a struggle. And Henry pursued his victorious march from Capua to Palermo. The political balance of Italy was destroyed by his success. And if the Pope and the free cities had consulted their obvious and real interest, they would have combined the powers of earth and heaven to prevent the dangerous union of the German Empire with the Kingdom of Sicily. But the subtle policy, for which the Vatican has so often been praised or arraigned, was on this occasion blind and inactive. And if it were true that Celestine III had kicked away the imperial crown from the head of the prostrate Henry, 7018 such an act of impotent pride could serve only to cancel an obligation and provoke an enemy. The Genoese, who enjoyed a beneficial trade and establishment in Sicily, listened to the promise of his boundless gratitude and speedy departure, 7019 their fleet commanded the Straits of Messina, and opened the harbour of Palermo. And the first act of his government was to abolish the privileges, and to seize the property, of these imprudent allies. The last hope of Falcandus was defeated by the discord of the Christians and Mohammedans, they fought in the capital. Several thousands of the latter were slain, but their surviving brethren fortified the mountains, and disturbed above thirty years the peace of the island. By the policy of Frederick II, sixty thousand Saracens were transplanted to Nasera in Apulia. In their wars against the Roman Church, the Emperor and his son Mainfroy were strengthened and disgraced by the service of the enemies of Christ. And this national colony maintained their religion and manners in the heart of Italy, till they were extirpated, at the end of the thirteenth century, by the zeal and revenge of the House of Anjou. Seventy twenty all the calamities which the prophetic order had deplored were surpassed by the cruelty and avarice of the German conqueror. He violated the royal sepulchres, 7021 and explored the secret treasures of the palace, Palermo, and the whole kingdom, the pearls and jewels, however precious, might be easily removed. But 160 horses were laden with the gold and silver of Sicily. 7022 The young king, his mother and sisters, and the nobles of both sexes, were separately confined in the fortresses of the Alps. And, on the slightest rumor of rebellion, the captives were deprived of life, of their eyes, or of the hope of posterity. Constantia herself was touched with sympathy for the miseries of her country. And the heiress of the Norman line might struggle to check her despotic husband, and to save the patrimony of her newborn son, of an emperor so famous in the next age under the name of Frederick II. Ten years after this revolution, the French monarchs annexed to their crown the Duchy of Normandy, the scepter of her ancient dukes had been transmitted, by a granddaughter of William the Conqueror, to the house of Plantagenet. 
and the adventurous Normans, who had raised so many trophies in France, England, and Ireland, in Apulia, Sicily, and the East, were lost either in victory or servitude among the vanquished nations. LV, the Turks. The Turks of the House of Seljuk. Their revolt against Mahmud, conqueror of Hindustan. Togrul subdues Persia and protects the caliphs. Defeat and captivity of the Emperor Romanus Diogenes by Alp Arslan. Power and magnificence of Malek Shah. Conquest of Asia Minor and Syria. State and oppression of Jerusalem. Pilgrimages to the Holy Sepulchre. From the Isle of Sicily, the reader must transport himself beyond the Caspian Sea, to the original seat of the Turks or Turkmens, against whom the First Crusade was principally directed. Their Scythian Empire of the 6th century was long since dissolved, but the name was still famous among the Greeks and Orientals. And the fragments of the nation, each a powerful and independent people, were scattered over the desert from China to the Oxus and the Danube, the colony of Hungarians was admitted into the Republic of Europe. And the thrones of Asia were occupied by slaves and soldiers of Turkish extraction. While Apulia and Sicily were subdued by the Norman lance, a swarm of these northern shepherds overspread the kingdoms of Persia. Their princes of the race of Seljuk erected a splendid and solid empire from Samarkand to the confines of Greece and Egypt, and the Turks have maintained their dominion in Asia Minor, till the victorious crescent has been planted on the dome of Asti. Sophia one of the greatest of the Turkish princes was Mahmud or Mahmud, 723 the Ghaznavide, who reigned in the eastern provinces of Persia, 1000 years after the birth of Christ. His father Sebektiji was the slave of the slave of the slave of the commander of the faithful. But in this descent of servitude, the first degree was merely titular, since it was filled by the sovereign of Transoxiana and Khorasan, who still paid a nominal allegiance to the Caliph of Baghdad. The second rank was that of a minister of state, a lieutenant of the Samanides, 7024 who broke, by his revolt, the bonds of political slavery. But the third step was a state of real and domestic servitude in the family of that rebel. From which Sebektiji, by his courage and dexterity, ascended to the supreme command of the city and provinces of Ghazna, 7025 as the son-in-law and successor of his grateful master. The falling dynasty of the Samanides was at first protected, and at last overthrown, by their servants, and, in the public disorders, the fortune of Mahmud continually increased. From him the title of Sultan 726 was first invented. And his kingdom was enlarged from Transoxiana to the neighborhood of Ispahan, from the shores of the Caspian to the mouth of the industry. But the principal source of his fame and riches was the holy war which he waged against the Gentus of Hindostan. In this foreign narrative I may not consume a page, and a volume would scarcely suffice to recapitulate the battles and sieges of his twelve expeditions. Never was the Mussulman hero dismayed by the inclemency of the seasons, the height of the mountains, the breadth of the rivers, the barrenness of the desert, the multitudes of the enemy, or the formidable array of their elephants of war. 7027 The Sultan of Ghazna surpassed the limits of the conquests of Alexander, after a march of three months, over the hills of Kashmir and Thibet, he reached the famous city of Kinaji, 7028 on the upper Ganges. And, in a naval combat on one of the branches of the Indus, he fought and vanquished four thousand boats of the natives. Delhi, Lahir, and Multan, were compelled to open their gates, the fertile kingdom of Gujarat attracted his ambition and tempted his stay and his avarice indulged the fruitless project of discovering the golden and aromatic isles of the southern ocean. On the payment of a tribute, the Rajas preserved their dominions, the people, their lives and fortunes. But to the religion of Hindustan the zealous Muslim was cruel and inexorable, many hundred temples, or pagodas, were leveled with the ground, many thousand idols were demolished and the servants of the Prophet were stimulated and rewarded by the precious materials of which they were composed. The pagoda of Sumnat was situate on the promontory of Guzarat, in the neighborhood of Jo, one of the last remaining possessions of the Portuguese. 7029 It was endowed with the revenue of 2,000 villages. 2,000 Brahmins were consecrated to the service of the deity, whom they washed each morning and evening in water from the distant Ganges, the subordinate ministers consisted of 300 musicians, 300 barbers. 
and five hundred dancing girls, conspicuous for their birth or beauty. Three sides of the temple were protected by the ocean, the narrow isthmus was fortified by a natural or artificial precipice, and the city and adjacent country were peopled by a nation of fanatics. They confessed the sins and the punishment of Kinaji in Delhi, but if the impious stranger should presume to approach their holy precincts, he would surely be overwhelmed by a blast of the divine vengeance. By this challenge, the faith of Mahmud was animated to a personal trial of the strength of this Indian deity. Fifty thousand of his worshippers were pierced by the spear of the Moslems, the walls were scaled, the sanctuary was profaned. And the conqueror aimed a blow of his iron mace at the head of the idol. The trembling Brahmins are said to have offered ten million seventy thirty sterling for his ransom. And it was urged by the wisest counsellors, that the destruction of a stone image would not change the hearts of the Gentus, and that such a sum might be dedicated to the relief of the true believers. Your reasons, replied the Sultan, are specious and strong, but never in the eyes of posterity shall Mahmud appear as a merchant of idols. 7031 He repeated his blows, and a treasure of pearls and rubies, concealed in the belly of the statue, explained in some degree the devout prodigality of the Brahmins. The fragments of the idol were distributed to Ghazna, Mecca, and Medina. Baghdad listened to the edifying tale, and Mahmud was saluted by the Caliph with the title of Guardian of the Fortune and Faith of Muhammad. From the paths of blood, and such is the history of nations, I cannot refuse to turn aside to gather some flowers of science or virtue. The name of Mahmud the Ghaznavide is still venerable in the East, his subjects enjoyed the blessings of prosperity and peace, his vices were concealed by the veil of religion, and two familiar examples will testify his justice and magnanimity. I. As he sat in the divan, an unhappy subject bowed before the throne to accuse the insolence of a Turkish soldier who had driven him from his house and bed. Suspend your clamors, said Mahmud. Inform me of his next visit, and ourself in person will judge and punish the offender. The Sultan followed his guide, invested the house with his guards, and extinguishing the torches, pronounced the death of the criminal, who had been seized in the act of rapine and adultery. After the execution of his sentence, the lights were rekindled, Mahmud fell prostrate in prayer, and rising from the ground, demanded some homely fare, which he devoured with the voraciousness of hunger. The poor man, whose injury he had avenged, was unable to suppress his astonishment and curiosity, and the courteous monarch condescended to explain the motives of this singular behavior. I had reason to suspect that none, except one of my sons, could dare to perpetrate such an outrage, and I extinguished the lights, that my justice might be blind and inexorable. My prayer was a thanksgiving on the discovery of the offender. And so painful was my anxiety, that I had passed three days without food since the first moment of your complaint. 2. The Sultan of Ghazna had declared war against the dynasty of the Boides, the sovereigns of the western Persia, he was disarmed by an epistle of the Sultana mother, and delayed his invasion till the manhood of her son. 7032 During the life of my husband, said the artful regent, I was ever apprehensive of your ambition, he was a prince and a soldier worthy of your arms. He is now no more. His scepter has passed to a woman and a child, and you dare not attack their infancy and weakness. How inglorious would be your conquest, how shameful your defeat! And yet the event of war is in the hand of the Almighty. Avarice was the only defect that tarnished the illustrious character of Mahmud, and never has that passion been more richly satiated. 7033 The Orientals exceed the measure of credibility in the account of millions of gold and silver, such as the avidity of man has never accumulated. In the magnitude of pearls, diamonds, and rubies, such as have never been produced by the workmanship of nature. 7034 Yet the soil of Hindostan is impregnated with precious minerals, her trade, in every age, has attracted the gold and silver of the world, and her virgin spoils were rifled by the first of the Mahometan conquerors. His behavior, in the last days of his life, evinces the vanity of these possessions, so laboriously won, so dangerously held, and so inevitably lost. He surveyed the vast and various chambers of the treasury of Ghazna, burst into tears, and again closed the doors, without bestowing any portion of the wealth which he could no longer hope to preserve. 
The following day he reviewed the state of his military force, 100,000 foot, 55,000 horse, and 1,300 elephants of battle. 7035 he again wept the instability of human greatness. And his grief was embittered by the hostile progress of the Turkmens, whom he had introduced into the heart of his Persian kingdom. In the modern depopulation of Asia, the regular operation of government and agriculture is confined to the neighborhood of cities, and the distant country is abandoned to the pastoral tribes of Arabs, Kurds, and Turkmens. 7036 of the last mentioned people, two considerable branches extend on either side of the Caspian Sea, the western colony can muster 40,000 soldiers. The eastern, less obvious to the traveler, but more strong and populous, has increased to the number of 100,000 families. In the midst of civilized nations, they preserve the manners of the Scythian desert, remove their encampments with a change of seasons, and feed their cattle among the ruins of palaces and temples. Their flocks and herds are their only riches. Their tents, either black or white, according to the color of the banner, are covered with felt, and of a circular form, their winter apparel is a sheepskin. A robe of cloth or cotton their summer garment, the features of the men are harsh and ferocious, the countenance of their women is soft and pleasing. Their wandering life maintains the spirit and exercise of arms, they fight on horseback. And their courage is displayed in frequent contests with each other and with their neighbors. For the license of pasture they pay a slight tribute to the sovereign of the land, but the domestic jurisdiction is in the hands of the chiefs and elders. The first emigration of the eastern Turkmens, the most ancient of the race, may be ascribed to the 10th century of the Christian era. 7037 In the decline of the caliphs, and the weakness of their lieutenants, the barrier of the Jaxarts was often violated. In each invasion, after the victory or retreat of their countrymen, some wandering tribe, embracing the Mahometan faith, obtained a free encampment in the spacious plains and pleasant climate of Transoxiana and Chorism. The Turkish slaves who aspired to the throne encouraged these emigrations which recruited their armies, awed their subjects and rivals, and protected the frontier against the wilder natives of Turkestan. And this policy was abused by Mahmud the Ghaznavide beyond the example of former times. He was admonished of his error by the chief of the race of Seljuk, who dwelt in the territory of Bakra. The Sultan had inquired what supply of men he could furnish for military service. If you send, replied Ismail, one of these arrows into our camp, fifty thousand of your servants will mount on horseback. And if that number, continued Mahmud, should not be sufficient. Send this second arrow to the horde of Balak, and you will find fifty thousand more. But, said the Ghaznavide, dissembling his anxiety, if I should stand in need of the whole force of your kindred tribes? Dispatch my bow, was the last reply of Ismail, and as it is circulated around, the summons will be obeyed by two hundred thousand horse. The apprehension of such formidable friendship induced Mahmud to transport the most obnoxious tribes into the heart of Khorasan, where they would be separated from their brethren of the river Oxus. And enclosed on all sides by the walls of obedient cities. But the face of the country was an object of temptation rather than terror, and the vigor of government was relaxed by the absence and death of the Sultan of Ghazna. The shepherds were converted into robbers. The bands of robbers were collected into an army of conquerors, as far as Ispahan and the Tigris, Persia was afflicted by their predatory inroads. And the Turkmens were not ashamed or afraid to measure their courage and numbers with the proudest sovereigns of Asia. Masoud, the son and successor of Mahmud, had too long neglected the advice of his wisest Amras. Your enemies, they repeatedly urged, were in their origin a swarm of ants, they are now little snakes, and, unless they be instantly crushed, they will acquire the venom and magnitude of serpents. After some alternatives of truce and hostility, after the repulse or partial success of his lieutenants, the Sultan marched in person against the Turkmens, who attacked him on all sides with barbarous shouts and irregular onset. Masoud, says the Persian historian, 7038, plunged singly to oppose the torrent of gleaming arms, exhibiting such acts of gigantic force and valor as never king had before displayed. A few of his friends, roused by his words and actions, and that innate honor which inspires the brave, seconded their lord so well, that wheresoever he turned his fatal sword, 
the enemies were mowed down, or retreated before him. But now, when victory seemed to blow on his standard, misfortune was active behind it, for when he looked round, be beheld almost his whole army, excepting that body he commanded in person, devouring the paths of flight. The Ghaznavide was abandoned by the cowardice or treachery of some generals of Turkish race, and this memorable day of Zendikan 739 founded in Persia the dynasty of the shepherd kings. 7040 The victorious Turkmens immediately proceeded to the election of a king, and, if the probable tale of a Latin historian 7041 deserves any credit, they determined by lot the choice of their new master. A number of arrows were successively inscribed with the name of a tribe, a family, and a candidate, they were drawn from the bundle by the hand of a child. And the important prize was obtained by Togrul Beg, the son of Michael the son of Seljuk, whose surname was immortalized in the greatness of his posterity. The Sultan Mahmud, who valued himself on his skill in national genealogy, professed his ignorance of the family of Seljuk, yet the father of that race appears to have been a chief of power and renown. 7042 For a daring intrusion into the harem of his prince, Seljuk was banished from Turkestan, with a numerous tribe of his friends and vassals, he passed the Jaxarts, encamped in the neighborhood of Samarkand, embraced the religion of Muhammad, and acquired the crown of martyrdom in a war against the infidels. His age, of a hundred and seven years, surpassed the life of his son, and Seljuk adopted the care of his two grandsons, Togrul and Jaffer the eldest of whom, at the age of forty-five, was invested with the title of sultan, in the royal city of Nishabur. The blind determination of chance was justified by the virtues of the successful candidate. It would be superfluous to praise the valor of a Turk, and the ambition of Togrul 7043 was equal to his valor. By his arms, the Ghasnavides were expelled from the eastern kingdoms of Persia, and gradually driven to the banks of the Indus, in search of a softer and more wealthy conquest. In the west he annihilated the dynasty of the Boides. And the scepter of Iraq passed from the Persian to the Turkish nation. The princes who had felt, or who feared, the Seljukian arrows, bowed their heads in the dust, by the conquest of Aderbejan, or Media, he approached the Roman confines. And the shepherd presumed to dispatch an ambassador, or herald, to demand the tribute and obedience of the Emperor of Constantinople. 7044 In his own dominions, Togrul was the father of his soldiers and people. By a firm and equal administration, Persia was relieved from the evils of anarchy, and the same hands which had been imbrued in blood became the guardians of justice and the public peace. The more rustic, perhaps the wisest, portion of the Turkmen 7045 continued to dwell in the tents of their ancestors, and, from the Oxus to the Euphrates, these military colonies were protected and propagated by their native princes. But the Turks of the court and city were refined by business and softened by pleasure, they imitated the dress, language, and manners of Persia, and the royal palaces of Nishabur and Ray displayed the order and magnificence of a great monarchy. The most deserving of the Arabians and Persians were promoted to the honors of the state, and the whole body of the Turkish nation embraced, with fervor and sincerity, the religion of Muhammad. The northern swarms of barbarians, who overspread both Europe and Asia, have been irreconcilably separated by the consequences of a similar conduct. Among the Moslems, as among the Christians, their vague and local traditions have yielded to the reason and authority of the prevailing system, to the fame of antiquity, and the consent of nations. But the triumph of the Quran is more pure and meritorious, as it was not assisted by any visible splendor of worship which might allure the pagans by some resemblance of idolatry. The first of the Seljukian sultans was conspicuous by his zeal and faith, each day he repeated the five prayers which are enjoined to the true believers, of each week, the two first days were consecrated by an extraordinary fast. And in every city a mosh was completed, before Togrul presumed to lay the foundations of a palace. 7046. With the belief of the Quran, the son of Seljuk imbibed a lively reverence for the successor of the Prophet. But that sublime character was still disputed by the caliphs of Baghdad and Egypt, and each of the rivals was solicitous to prove his title in the judgment of the strong, though illiterate barbarians. Mahmud the Ghaznavide had declared himself in favor of the line of Abbas, and had treated with indignity the robe of honor which was presented by the Fatimite ambassador. 
Yet the ungrateful Hashemite had changed with the change of fortune. He applauded the victory of Zendikan, and named the Seljukian Sultan his temporal vicegerent over the Moslem world. As Togril executed and enlarged this important trust, he was called to the deliverance of the Caliph Kaim, and obeyed the holy summons, which gave a new kingdom to his arms. 7047 In the palace of Baghdad, the commander of the faithful still slumbered, a venerable phantom. His servant or master, the prince of the Boides, could no longer protect him from the insolence of meaner tyrants. And the Euphrates and Tigris were oppressed by the revolt of the Turkish and Arabian emirs. The presence of a conqueror was implored as a blessing. And the transient mischiefs of fire and sword were excused as the sharp but salutary remedies which alone could restore the health of the Republic. At the head of an irresistible force, the Sultan of Persia marched from Hamadan, the proud were crushed, the prostrate were spared, the prince of the Boides disappeared, the heads of the most obstinate rebels were laid at the feet of Togril. And he inflicted a lesson of obedience on the people of Mosul and Baghdad. After the chastisement of the guilty, and the restoration of peace, the royal shepherd accepted the reward of his labors. And a solemn comedy represented the triumph of religious prejudice over barbarian power. 748 The Turkish Sultan embarked on the Tigris, landed at the gate of Raqqa, and made his public entry on horseback. At the palace gate he respectfully dismounted, and walked on foot, preceded by his emirs without arms. The caliph was seated behind his black veil, the black garment of the Abbasides was cast over his shoulders, and he held in his hand the staff of the Apostle of God. The conqueror of the East kissed the ground, stood some time in a modest posture, and was led towards the throne by the vizier and interpreter. After Togrul had seated himself on another throne, his commission was publicly read, which declared him the temporal lieutenant of the vicar of the Prophet. He was successively invested with seven robes of honor, and presented with seven slaves, the natives of the seven climates of the Arabian Empire. His mystic veil was perfumed with musk, two crowns 7049 were placed on his head. Two scimitars were girded to his side, as the symbols of a double reign over the east and west. After this inauguration, the Sultan was prevented from prostrating himself a second time. But he twice kissed the hand of the commander of the faithful, and his titles were proclaimed by the voice of heralds and the applause of the Moslems. In a second visit to Baghdad, the Seljukian prince again rescued the caliph from his enemies and devoutly, on foot, led the bridle of his mule from the prison to the palace. Their alliance was cemented by the marriage of Togrul's sister with the successor of the prophet. Without reluctance he had introduced a Turkish virgin into his harem. But Kayim proudly refused his daughter to the sultan, Disdain to mingle the blood of the Hashemites with the blood of a Scythian shepherd. And protracted the negotiation many months, till the gradual diminution of his revenue admonished him that he was still in the hands of a master. The royal nuptials were followed by the death of Togrul himself. 7050 As he left no children, his nephew Alp Arslan succeeded to the title and prerogatives of Sultan, and his name, after that of the Caliph, was pronounced in the public prayers of the Moslems. Yet in this revolution, the Abbasides acquired a larger measure of liberty and power. On the throne of Asia, the Turkish monarchs were less jealous of the domestic administration of Baghdad. And the commanders of the faithful were relieved from the ignominious vexations to which they had been exposed by the presence and poverty of the Persian dynasty. Since the fall of the caliphs, the discord and degeneracy of the Saracens respected the Asiatic provinces of Rome which, by the victories of Nicephorus, Zymuses, and Basil, had been extended as far as Antioch and the eastern boundaries of Armenia. Twenty-five years after the death of Basil, his successors were suddenly assaulted by an unknown race of barbarians, who united the Scythian valor with the fanaticism of new proselytes, and the art and riches of a powerful monarchy. 7051 The myriads of Turkish horse overspread a frontier of 600 miles from Taurus to Arsram, and the blood of 130,000 Christians was a grateful sacrifice to the Arabian prophet. Yet the arms of Togrul did not make any deep or lasting impression on the Greek empire. The torrent rolled away from the open country, the sultan retired without glory or success from the siege of an Armenian city. 
The obscure hostilities were continued or suspended with a vicissitude of events, and the bravery of the Macedonian legions renewed the fame of the conqueror of Asia. 7052 The name of Alp Arslan, the valiant lion, is expressive of the popular idea of the perfection of man, and the successor of Togrul displayed the fierceness and generosity of the royal animal. He passed the Euphrates at the head of the Turkish cavalry, and entered Caesarea, the metropolis of Cappadocia, to which he had been attracted by the fame and wealth of the Temple of St. Basil. The solid structure resisted the destroyer, but he carried away the doors of the shrine encrusted with gold and pearls, and profaned the relics of the tutelar saint, whose mortal frailties were now covered by the venerable rust of antiquity. The final conquest of Armenia and Georgia was achieved by Alp Arslan. In Armenia, the title of a kingdom, and the spirit of a nation, were annihilated, the artificial fortifications were yielded by the mercenaries of Constantinople. By strangers without faith, veterans without pay or arms, and recruits without experience or discipline. The loss of this important frontier was the news of a day. And the Catholics were neither surprised nor displeased, that a people so deeply infected with the Nestorian and Eutychian errors had been delivered by Christ and his mother into the hands of the infidels. 7053 The woods and valleys of Mount Caucasus were more strenuously defended by the native Georgians 7054 or Iberians. But the Turkish Sultan and his son Malek were indefatigable in this holy war, their captives were compelled to promise a spiritual, as well as temporal, obedience. And, instead of their collars and bracelets, an iron horseshoe, a badge of ignominy, was imposed on the infidels who still adhered to the worship of their fathers. The change, however, was not sincere or universal. And, through ages of servitude, the Georgians have maintained the succession of their princes and bishops. But a race of men, whom nature has cast in her most perfect mold, is degraded by poverty, ignorance, and vice. Their profession, and still more their practice, of Christianity is an empty name, and if they have emerged from heresy, it is only because they are too illiterate to remember a metaphysical creed. 7055. The false or genuine magnanimity of Mahmud the Ghaznavide was not imitated by Alp Arslan, and he attacked without scruple the Greek Empress Eudocha and her children. His alarming progress compelled her to give herself and her scepter to the hand of a soldier, and Romanus Diogenes was invested with the imperial purple. His patriotism, and perhaps his pride, urged him from Constantinople within two months after his accession, and the next campaign he most scandalously took the field during the holy festival of Easter. In the palace, Diogenes was no more than the husband of Eudocha, in the camp, he was the emperor of the Romans, and he sustained that character with feeble resources and invincible courage. By his spirit and success the soldiers were taught to act, the subjects to hope, and the enemies to fear. The Turks had penetrated into the heart of Phrygia, but the Sultan himself had resigned to his emirs the prosecution of the war. And their numerous detachments were scattered over Asia in the security of conquest. Laden with spoil, and careless of discipline, they were separately surprised and defeated by the Greeks, the activity of the emperor seemed to multiply his presence, and while they heard of his expedition to Antioch. The enemy felt his sword on the hills of Trebizond. In three laborious campaigns, the Turks were driven beyond the Euphrates, in the fourth and last, Romanus undertook the deliverance of Armenia. The desolation of the land obliged him to transport a supply of two months' provisions. And he marched forwards to the siege of Malaskard 7056 an important fortress in the midway between the modern cities of Arzurum and Van. His army amounted, at the least, to 100,000 men. The troops of Constantinople were reinforced by the disorderly multitudes of Phrygia and Cappadocia, but the real strength was composed of the subjects and allies of Europe, the legions of Macedonia, and the squadrons of Bulgaria. The Uzi, a Moldavian horde, who were themselves of the Turkish race, 7057 and, above all, the mercenary and adventurous bands of French and Normans. Their lances were commanded by the valiant Ursul of Balliol, the kinsman or father of the Scottish kings 7058 and were allowed to excel in the exercise of arms, or, according to the Greek style, in the practice of the Pyrrhic dance. On the report of this bold invasion, which threatened his hereditary dominions, 
Alp Arslan flew to the scene of action at the head of 40,000 horse. 7059 His rapid and skillful evolutions distressed and dismayed the superior numbers of the Greeks, and in the defeat of Basilatius, one of their principal generals, he displayed the first example of his valor and clemency. The imprudence of the emperor had separated his forces after the reduction of Malaskard. It was in vain that he attempted to recall the mercenary Franks, they refused to obey his summons. He disdained to await their return. The desertion of the Uzi filled his mind with anxiety and suspicion, and against the most salutary advice he rushed forwards to speedy and decisive action. Had he listened to the fair proposals of the Sultan, Romanus might have secured a retreat, perhaps a peace, but in these overtures he supposed the fear or weakness of the enemy, and his answer was conceived in the tone of insult and defiance. If the barbarian wishes for peace, let him evacuate the ground which he occupies for the encampment of the Romans, and surrender his city and palace of Ray as a pledge of his sincerity. Alp Arslan smiled at the vanity of the demand, but he wept the death of so many faithful Moslems, and, after a devout prayer, proclaimed a free permission to all who were desirous of retiring from the field. With his own hands he tied up his horse's tail, exchanged his bow and arrows for a mace and scimitar, clothed himself in a white garment, perfumed his body with musk, and declared that if he were vanquished, that spot should be the place of his burial. 7060 The Sultan himself had affected to cast away his missile weapons, but his hopes of victory were placed in the arrows of the Turkish cavalry, whose squadrons were loosely distributed in the form of a crescent. Instead of the successive lines and reserves of the Grecian tactics, Romulus led his army in a single and solid phalanx, and pressed with vigor and impatience the artful and yielding resistance of the barbarians. In this desultory and fruitless combat he spent the greater part of a summer's day, till prudence and fatigue compelled him to return to his camp. But a retreat is always perilous in the face of an active foe. And no sooner had the standard been turned to the rear than the phalanx was broken by the base cowardice, or the baser jealousy, of Andronicus, a rival prince, who disgraced his birth and the purple of the Caesars. 7061 The Turkish squadrons poured a cloud of arrows on this moment of confusion and lassitude, and the horns of their formidable crescent were closed in the rear of the Greeks. In the destruction of the army and pillage of the camp, it would be needless to mention the number of the slain or captives. The Byzantine writers deplore the loss of an inestimable pearl, they forgot to mention, that in this fatal day the Asiatic provinces of Rome were irretrievably sacrificed. As long as a hope survived, Romanus attempted to rally and save the relics of his army. When the center, the imperial station, was left naked on all sides, and encompassed by the victorious Turks, he still, with desperate courage, maintained the fight till the close of day at the head of the brave and faithful subjects who adhered to his standard. They fell around him, his horse was slain, the emperor was wounded, yet he stood alone and intrepid, till he was oppressed and bound by the strength of multitudes. The glory of this illustrious prize was disputed by a slave and a soldier. A slave who had seen him on the throne of Constantinople, and a soldier whose extreme deformity had been excused on the promise of some signal service. Despoiled of his arms, his jewels, and his purple, Romanus spent a dreary and perilous night on the field of battle, amidst a disorderly crowd of the meaner barbarians. In the morning the royal captive was presented to Alp Arslan, who doubted of his fortune, till the identity of the person was ascertained by the report of his ambassadors, and by the more pathetic evidence of Basilatius, who embraced with tears the feet of his unhappy sovereign. The successor of Constantine, in a plebeian habit, was led into the Turkish divan, and commanded to kiss the ground before the lord of Asia. He reluctantly obeyed. And Alp Arslan, starting from his throne, is said to have planted his foot on the neck of the Roman emperor. 7062 But the fact is doubtful. And if, in this moment of insolence, the sultan complied with the national custom, the rest of his conduct has extorted the praise of his bigoted foes, and may afford a lesson to the most civilized ages. He instantly raised the royal captive from the ground. And thrice clasping his hand with tender sympathy, assured him, that his life and dignity should be inviolate in the hands of a prince who had learned to respect the majesty of his equals and the vicissitudes of fortune. 
From the divan, Romanus was conducted to an adjacent tent, where he was served with pomp and reverence by the officers of the sultan, who, twice each day, seated him in the place of honor at his own table. In a free and familiar conversation of eight days, not a word, not a look, of insult escaped from the conqueror. But he severely censured the unworthy subjects who had deserted their valiant prince in the hour of danger, and gently admonished his antagonist of some errors which he had committed in the management of the war. In the preliminaries of negotiation, Alp Arslan asked him what treatment he expected to receive, and the calm indifference of the emperor displays the freedom of his mind. If you are cruel, said he, you will take my life. If you listen to pride, you will drag me at your chariot wheels, if you consult your interest, you will accept a ransom, and restore me to my country. And what, continued the sultan, would have been your own behavior, had fortune smiled on your arms? The reply of the Greek betrays a sentiment, which prudence, and even gratitude, should have taught him to suppress. Had I vanquished, he fiercely said, I would have inflicted on thy body many a stripe. The Turkish conqueror smiled at the insolence of his captive, observed that the Christian law inculcated the love of enemies and forgiveness of injuries. And nobly declared, that he would not imitate an example which he condemned. After mature deliberation, Alp Arslan dictated the terms of liberty and peace, a ransom of a million, seventy sixty three an annual tribute of three hundred and sixty thousand pieces of gold, seventy sixty for the marriage of the royal children. And the deliverance of all the Moslems, who were in the power of the Greeks. Romanus, with a sigh, subscribed this treaty, so disgraceful to the majesty of the empire, he was immediately invested with a Turkish robe of honor, his nobles and patricians were restored to their sovereign. And the sultan, after a courteous embrace, dismissed him with rich presents and a military guard. No sooner did he reach the confines of the empire, than he was informed that the palace and provinces had disclaimed their allegiance to a captive, a sum of two hundred thousand pieces was painfully collected. And the fallen monarch transmitted this part of his ransom, with a sad confession of his impotence and disgrace. The generosity, or perhaps the ambition, of the sultan, prepared to espouse the cause of his ally. But his designs were prevented by the defeat, imprisonment, and death, of Romanus Diogenes.7065. In the Treaty of Peace, it does not appear that Alp Arslan extorted any province or city from the captive emperor. And his revenge was satisfied with the trophies of his victory, and the spoils of Anatolia, from Antioch to the Black Sea. The fairest part of Asia was subject to his laws, twelve hundred princes, or the sons of princes, stood before his throne. And two hundred thousand soldiers marched under his banners. The sultan disdained to pursue the fugitive Greeks, but he meditated the more glorious conquest of Turkestan, the original seat of the house of Seljuk. He moved from Baghdad to the banks of the Oxus, a bridge was thrown over the river, and twenty days were consumed in the passage of his troops. But the progress of the great king was retarded by the governor of Burzum. And Joseph the Charismian presumed to defend his fortress against the powers of the east. When he was produced a captive in the royal tent, the sultan, instead of praising his valor, severely reproached his obstinate folly, and the insolent replies of the rebel provoked a sentence, that he should be fastened to four stakes. And left to expire in that painful situation. At this command, the desperate Charismian, drawing a dagger, rushed headlong towards the throne, the guards raised their battle axes. Their zeal was checked by Alp Arslan, the most skillful archer of the age, he drew his bow, but his foot slipped, the arrow glanced aside, and he received in his breast the dagger of Joseph, who was instantly cut in pieces. The wound was mortal. And the Turkish prince bequeathed a dying admonition to the pride of kings. In my youth, said Alp Arslan, I was advised by a sage to humble myself before God, to distrust my own strength, and never to despise the most contemptible foe. I have neglected these lessons, and my neglect has been deservedly punished. Yesterday, as from an eminence I beheld the numbers, the discipline, and the spirit, of my armies, the earth seemed to tremble under my feet. And I said in my heart, Surely thou art the king of the world, the greatest and most invincible of warriors. These armies are no longer mine, and, in the confidence of my personal strength, 
I now fall by the hand of an assassin. 7066 Alp Arslan possessed the virtues of a Turk and a Muslim, his voice and stature commanded the reverence of mankind, his face was shaded with long whiskers, and his ample turban was fashioned in the shape of a crown. The remains of the Sultan were deposited in the tomb of the Seljukian dynasty. And the passenger might read and meditate this useful inscription, 7067, O ye who have seen the glory of Alp Arslan exalted to the heavens, repair to Maru, and you will behold it buried in the dust. The annihilation of the inscription, and the tomb itself, more forcibly proclaims the instability of human greatness. During the life of Alp Arslan, his eldest son had been acknowledged as the future Sultan of the Turks. On his father's death the inheritance was disputed by an uncle, a cousin, and a brother, they drew their scimitars, and assembled their followers, and the triple victory of Malek Shah 7068 established his own reputation and the right of primogeniture. In every age, and more especially in Asia, the thirst of power has inspired the same passions, and occasioned the same disorders. But, from the long series of civil war, it would not be easy to extract a sentiment more pure and magnanimous than is contained in the saying of the Turkish prince. On the eve of the battle, he performed his devotions at Thaus, before the tomb of the Imam Riza. As the Sultan rose from the ground, he asked his vizier Nizam, who had knelt beside him, what had been the object of his secret petition, that your arms may be crowned with victory, was the prudent, and most probably the sincere. Answer of the Minister For my part, replied the generous Malek, I implored the Lord of Hosts that he would take from me my life and crown, if my brother be more worthy than myself to reign over the Moslems. The favorable judgment of heaven was ratified by the Caliph. And for the first time, the sacred title of commander of the faithful was communicated to a barbarian. But this barbarian, by his personal merit, and the extent of his empire, was the greatest prince of his age. After the settlement of Persia and Syria, he marched at the head of innumerable armies to achieve the conquest of Turkestan, which had been undertaken by his father. In his passage of the Oxus, the boatmen, who had been employed in transporting some troops, complained, that their payment was assigned on the revenues of Antioch. The Sultan frowned at this preposterous choice. But he mild at the artful flattery of his vizier. It was not to postpone their reward, that I selected those remote places, but to leave a memorial to posterity, that, under your reign, Antioch and the Oxus were subject to the same sovereign. But this description of his limits was unjust and parsimonious, beyond the Oxus, he reduced to his obedience the cities of Bakra, Chorizm, and Samarkand, and crushed each rebellious slave, or independent savage, who dared to resist. Malek passed the Sion or Jaxarts, the last boundary of Persian civilization, the hordes of Turkestan yielded to his supremacy, his name was inserted on the coins, and in the prayers of Kashgar, a Tartar kingdom on the extreme borders of China. From the Chinese frontier, he stretched his immediate jurisdiction or feudatory sway to the west and south, as far as the mountains of Georgia, the neighborhood of Constantinople, the holy city of Jerusalem, and the spicy groves of Arabia Felix. Instead of resigning himself to the luxury of his harem, the shepherd king, both in peace and war, was in action and in the field. By the perpetual motion of the royal camp, each province was successively blessed with his presence. And he is said to have perambulated twelve times the wide extent of his dominions, which surpassed the Asiatic reign of Cyrus and the Caliphs. Of these expeditions, the most pious and splendid was the pilgrimage of Mecca, the freedom and safety of the caravans were protected by his arms, the citizens and pilgrims were enriched by the profusion of his alms. And the desert was cheered by the places of relief and refreshment, which he instituted for the use of his brethren. Hunting was the pleasure, and even the passion, of the Sultan, and his train consisted of forty-seven thousand horses. But after the massacre of a Turkish chase, for each piece of game, he bestowed a piece of gold on the poor, a slight atonement, at the expense of the people, for the cost and mischief of the amusement of kings. In the peaceful prosperity of his reign, the cities of Asia were adorned with palaces and hospitals with mashas and colleges, few departed from his divan without reward, and none without justice. The language and literature of Persia revived under the house of Seljuk, 
7069 and if Malek emulated the liberality of a Turk less potent than himself, 7070 his palace might resound with the songs of a hundred poets. The Sultan bestowed a more serious and learned care on the reformation of the calendar, which was effected by a general assembly of the astronomers of the East. By a law of the Prophet, the Moslems are confined to the irregular course of the lunar months, in Persia, since the age of Zoroaster, the revolution of the sun has been known and celebrated as an annual festival. 7071 But after the fall of the Magian Empire, the intercalation had been neglected, the fractions of minutes and hours were multiplied into days, and the date of the springs was removed from the sign of Aries to that of Pisces. The reign of Malek was illustrated by the Jelalian era, and all errors, either past or future, were corrected by a computation of time, which surpasses the Julian, and approaches the accuracy of the Gregorian, style. 7072. In a period when Europe was plunged in the deepest barbarism, the light and splendor of Asia may be ascribed to the docility rather than the knowledge of the Turkish conquerors. An ample share of their wisdom and virtue is due to a Persian vizier, who ruled the empire under the reigns of Alp Arslan and his son. Nizam, one of the most illustrious ministers of the East, was honored by the Caliph as an oracle of religion and science, he was trusted by the Sultan as the faithful vicegerent of his power and justice. After an administration of thirty years, the fame of the vizier, his wealth, and even his services, were transformed into crimes. He was overthrown by the insidious arts of a woman and a rival. And his fall was hastened by a rash declaration, that his cap and inkhorn, the badges of his office, were connected by the divine decree with the throne and diadem of the Sultan. At the age of ninety-three years, the venerable statesman was dismissed by his master, accused by his enemies, and murdered by a fanatic. 7073 The last words of Nizam attested his innocence, and the remainder of Malek's life was short and inglorious. From Ispahan, the scene of this disgraceful transaction, the Sultan moved to Baghdad, with the design of transplanting the caliph, and of fixing his own residence in the capital of the Moslem world. The feeble successor of Muhammad obtained a respite of ten days, and before the expiration of the term, the barbarian was summoned by the angel of death. His ambassadors at Constantinople had asked in marriage a Roman princess. But the proposal was decently eluded, and the daughter of Alexius, who might herself have been the victim, expresses her abhorrence of his unnatural conjunction. 7074 The daughter of the Sultan was bestowed on the Caliph Maktadi, with the imperious condition, that, renouncing the society of his wives and concubines, he should forever confine himself to this honorable alliance. The greatness and unity of the Turkish Empire expired in the person of Malik Shah. His vacant throne was disputed by his brother and his four sons. 7075 And, after a series of civil wars, the treaty which reconciled the surviving candidates confirmed a lasting separation in the Persian dynasty, the eldest and principal branch of the House of Seljuk. The three younger dynasties were those of Kerman, of Syria, and of Rum, the first of these commanded an extensive, though obscure, 7076 dominion on the shores of the Indian Ocean, 7077 the second expelled the Arabian princes of Aleppo and Damascus. And the third, our peculiar care, invaded the Roman provinces of Asia Minor. The generous policy of Malek contributed to their elevation, he allowed the princes of his blood, even those whom he had vanquished in the field, to seek new kingdoms worthy of their ambition. Nor was he displeased that they should draw away the more ardent spirits, who might have disturbed the tranquility of his reign. As the supreme head of his family and nation, the great Sultan of Persia commanded the obedience and tribute of his royal brethren, the thrones of Kerman and Nice, of Aleppo and Damascus. The Atabeks, and emirs of Syria and Mesopotamia, erected their standards under the shadow of his scepter, 7078 and the hordes of Turkmens overspread the plains of the western Asia. After the death of Malek, the bands of union and subordination were relaxed and finally dissolved, the indulgence of the House of Seljuk invested their slaves with the inheritance of kingdoms. And, in the Oriental style, a crowd of princes arose from the dust of their feet. 7079. A prince of the royal line, Cuttlemish 7080 the son of Israel, the son of Seljuk, 
had fallen in a battle against Alp Arslan and the humane victor had dropped a tear over his grave. His five sons, strong in arms, ambitious of power, and eager for revenge, unsheathed their scimitars against the son of Alp Arslan. The two armies expected the signal when the caliph, forgetful of the majesty which secluded him from vulgar eyes, interposed his venerable mediation. Instead of shedding the blood of your brethren, your brethren both in descent and faith, unite your forces in a holy war against the Greeks, the enemies of God and his apostle. They listened to his voice. The sultan embraced his rebellious kinsmen. And the eldest, the valiant Solomon, accepted the royal standard, which gave him the free conquest and hereditary command of the provinces of the Roman Empire, from Arzurum to Constantinople, and the unknown regions of the West. 7081 Accompanied by his four brothers, he passed the Euphrates, the Turkish camp was soon seated in the neighborhood of Kataya in Phrygia, and his flying cavalry laid waste the country as far as the Hellespont and the Black Sea. Since the decline of the empire, the peninsula of Asia Minor had been exposed to the transient, though destructive, inroads of the Persians and Saracens, but the fruits of a lasting conquest were reserved for the Turkish Sultan. And his arms were introduced by the Greeks, who aspired to reign on the ruins of their country. Since the captivity of Romanus, six years the feeble son of Eudocia had trembled under the weight of the imperial crown. Till the provinces of the east and west were lost in the same month by a double rebellion, of either chief Nicephorus was the common name. But the surnames of Bryennius and Batoniates distinguished the European and Asiatic candidates. Their reasons, or rather their promises, were weighed in the divan. And, after some hesitation, Solomon declared himself in favor of Batoniates, opened a free passage to his troops in their march from Antioch to Nice, and joined the banner of the Crescent to that of the Cross. After his ally had ascended the throne of Constantinople, the Sultan was hospitably entertained in the suburb of Chrysopolis or Scutari. And a body of two thousand Turks was transported into Europe, to whose dexterity and courage the new emperor was indebted for the defeat and captivity of his rival, Bryennius. But the conquest of Europe was dearly purchased by the sacrifice of Asia, Constantinople was deprived of the obedience and revenue of the provinces beyond the Bosphorus and Hellespont. And the regular progress of the Turks, who fortified the passes of the rivers and mountains, left not a hope of their retreat or expulsion. Another candidate implored the aid of the Sultan, Melissinus, in his purple robes and red buskins, attended the motions of the Turkish camp. And the desponding cities were tempted by the summons of a Roman prince, who immediately surrendered them into the hands of the barbarians. These acquisitions were confirmed by a treaty of peace with the Emperor Alexius, his fear of Robert compelled him to seek the friendship of Solomon. And it was not till after the Sultan's death that he extended as far as Nicomedia, about sixty miles from Constantinople, the eastern boundary of the Roman world. Trebizond alone, defended on either side by the sea and mountains, preserved at the extremity of the Euxine the ancient character of a Greek colony, and the future destiny of a Christian empire. Since the first conquests of the caliphs, the establishment of the Turks in Anatolia or Asia Minor was the most deplorable loss which the church and empire had sustained. By the propagation of the Moslem faith, Solomon deserved the name of Gatsi, a holy champion, and his new kingdoms, of the Romans, or of Rome, was added to the tables of Oriental geography. It is described as extending from the Euphrates to Constantinople, from the Black Sea to the confines of Syria, pregnant with mines of silver and iron, of alum and copper, fruitful in corn and wine, and productive of cattle and excellent horses. 7082 The wealth of Lydia, the arts of the Greeks, the splendor of the Augustan age, existed only in books and ruins, which were equally obscure in the eyes of the Scythian conquerors. Yet, in the present decay, Anatolia still contains some wealthy and populous cities, and, under the Byzantine Empire, they were far more flourishing in numbers, size, and opulence. By the choice of the Sultan, Nice, the metropolis of Bithynia, was preferred for his palace and fortress, the seat of the Seljukian dynasty of Rome was planted 100 miles from Constantinople. And the divinity of Christ was denied and derided in the same temple in which it had been pronounced by the first general synod of the Catholics. The unity of God, and the mission of Muhammad, were preached in the Mashas. 
The Arabian learning was taught in the schools, the cat is judged according to the law of the Quran, the Turkish manners and language prevailed in the cities, and Turkmen camps were scattered over the plains and mountains of Anatolia. On the hard conditions of tribute and servitude, the Greek Christians might enjoy the exercise of their religion, but their most holy churches were profaned, their priests and bishops were insulted. 783 They were compelled to suffer the triumph of the pagans, and the apostasy of their brethren, many thousand children were marked by the knife of circumcision. And many thousand captives were devoted to the service or the pleasures of their masters. 784 After the loss of Asia, Antioch still maintained her primitive allegiance to Christ and Caesar. But the solitary province was separated from all Roman aid, and surrounded on all sides by the Mahometan powers. The despair of Philaretus the governor prepared the sacrifice of his religion and loyalty, had not his guilt been prevented by his son, who hastened to the Nicene palace, and offered to deliver this valuable prize into the hands of Solomon. The ambitious sultan mounted on horseback, and in twelve nights, for he reposed in the day, performed a march of six hundred miles. Antioch was oppressed by the speed and secrecy of his enterprise. And the dependent cities, as far as Laodicea and the confines of Aleppo, 7085 obeyed the example of the metropolis. From Laodicea to the Thracian Bosphorus, or Arm of Asti. George, the conquests and reign of Solomon extended thirty days' journey in length, and in breadth about ten or fifteen, between the rocks of Lycia and the Black Sea. 7086 The Turkish ignorance of navigation protected, for a while, the inglorious safety of the emperor. But no sooner had a fleet of two hundred ships been constructed by the hands of the captive Greeks, than Alexius trembled behind the walls of his capital. His plaintive epistles were dispersed over Europe, to excite the compassion of the Latins, and to paint the danger, the weakness, and the riches of the city of Constantine. 7087 but the most interesting conquest of the Seljukian Turks was that of Jerusalem, 7088 which soon became the theater of nations. In their capitulation with Omar, the inhabitants had stipulated the assurance of their religion and property. But the articles were interpreted by a master against whom it was dangerous to dispute, and in the four hundred years of the reign of the caliphs, the political climate of Jerusalem was exposed to the vicissitudes of storm and sunshine. 7089 By the increase of proselytes and population, the Mohammedans might excuse the usurpation of three-fourths of the city, but a peculiar quarter was resolved for the patriarch with his clergy and people. A tribute of two pieces of gold was the price of protection, and the sepulchre of Christ, with the Church of the Resurrection, was still left in the hands of his votaries. Of these votaries, the most numerous and respectable portion were strangers to Jerusalem, the pilgrimages to the Holy Land had been stimulated, rather than suppressed, by the conquest of the Arabs. And the enthusiasm which had always prompted these perilous journeys, was nourished by the congenial passions of grief and indignation. A crowd of pilgrims from the East and West continued to visit the Holy Sepulchre, and the adjacent sanctuaries, more especially at the festival of Easter. And the Greeks and Latins, the Nestorians and Jacobites, the Copts and Abyssinians, the Armenians and Georgians, maintained the chapels, the clergy, and the poor of their respective communions. The harmony of prayer in so many various tongues, the worship of so many nations in the common temple of their religion, might have afforded a spectacle of edification and peace. But the zeal of the Christian sects was embittered by hatred and revenge, and in the kingdom of a suffering Messiah, who had pardoned his enemies, they aspired to command and persecute their spiritual brethren. The preeminence was asserted by the spirit and numbers of the Franks, and the greatness of Charlemagne 7090 protected both the Latin pilgrims and the Catholics of the East. The poverty of Carthage, Alexandria, and Jerusalem, was relieved by the alms of that pious emperor, In many monasteries of Palestine were founded or restored by his liberal devotion. Harun al-Rashid, the greatest of the Abbasids, esteemed in his Christian brother a similar supremacy of genius and power, their friendship was cemented by a frequent intercourse of gifts and embassies. And the Caliph, without resigning the substantial dominion, presented the Emperor with the keys of the Holy Sepulchre, and perhaps of the city of Jerusalem. In the decline of the Carlovingian monarchy, the Republic of Amalfi promoted the interest of trade and religion in the East. 
her vessels transported the Latin pilgrims to the coasts of Egypt and Palestine, and deserved, by their useful imports. The favor and alliance of the Fatimite caliphs 7091 an annual fair was instituted on Mount Calvary, and the Italian merchants founded the convent and hospital of Asti. John of Jerusalem, the cradle of the monastic and military order, which has since reigned in the Isles of Rhodes and of Malta. Had the Christian pilgrims been content to revere the tomb of a prophet, the disciples of Muhammad, instead of blaming, would have imitated, their piety, but these rigid Unitarians were scandalized by a worship which represents the birth, death, and resurrection, of a god. The Catholic images were branded with the name of idols, and the Moslems smiled with indignation 7092 at the miraculous flame which was kindled on the eve of Easter in the Holy Sepulchre. 7093 This pious fraud, first devised in the 9th century, 7094 was devoutly cherished by the Latin Crusaders, and is annually repeated by the clergy of the Greek, Armenian, and Coptic sects. 7095 Who impose on the credulous spectators 7096 for their own benefit, and that of their tyrants. In every age, a principle of toleration has been fortified by a sense of interest, and the revenue of the prince and his emir was increased each year, by the expense and tribute of so many thousand strangers. The revolution which transferred the scepter from the Abbasides to the Fatimites was a benefit, rather than an injury, to the Holy Land. A sovereign resident in Egypt was more sensible of the importance of Christian trade. And the emirs of Palestine were less remote from the justice and power of the throne. But the third of these Fatimite caliphs was the famous Hakim, 7097 a frantic youth, who was delivered by his impiety and despotism from the fear either of God or man, and whose reign was a wild mixture of vice and folly. Regardless of the most ancient customs of Egypt, he imposed on the women an absolute confinement, the restraint excited the clamors of both sexes, their clamors provoked his fury. A part of old Cairo was delivered to the flames and the guards and citizens were engaged many days in a bloody conflict. At first the caliph declared himself a zealous Muslim, the founder or benefactor of mashas and colleges, 1290 copies of the Quran were transcribed at his expense in letters of gold. And his edict extirpated the vineyards of the Upper Egypt. But his vanity was soon flattered by the hope of introducing a new religion. He aspired above the fame of a prophet, and styled himself the visible image of the Most High God, who, after nine apparitions on earth, was at length manifest in his royal person. At the name of Hakim, the Lord of the living and the dead, every knee was bent in religious adoration, his mysteries were performed on a mountain near Cairo, sixteen thousand converts had signed his profession of faith. And at the present hour, a free and warlike people, the Druzes of Mount Libanus, are persuaded of the life and divinity of a madman and tyrant. 7098 In his divine character, Hakim hated the Jews and Christians, as the servants of his rivals. While some remains of prejudice or prudence still pleaded in favor of the law of Muhammad. Both in Egypt and Palestine, his cruel and wanton persecution made some martyrs and many apostles, the common rights and special privileges of the sectaries were equally disregarded. And a general interdict was laid on the devotion of strangers and natives. The temple of the Christian world, the Church of the Resurrection, was demolished to its foundations. The luminous prodigy of Easter was interrupted, and much profane labor was exhausted to destroy the cave in the rock which properly constitutes the Holy Sepulchre. At the report of this sacrilege, the nations of Europe were astonished and afflicted, but instead of arming in the defense of the Holy Land, they contented themselves with burning, or banishing, the Jews. As the secret advisers of the impious barbarian. 7099 Yet the calamities of Jerusalem were in some measure alleviated by the inconstancy or repentance of Hakim himself. And the royal mandate was sealed for the restitution of the churches, when the tyrant was assassinated by the emissaries of his sister. The succeeding caliphs resumed the maxims of religion and policy, a free toleration was again granted. With the pious aid of the Emperor of Constantinople, the Holy Sepulchre arose from its ruins, and, after a short abstinence, the pilgrims returned with an increase of appetite to the spiritual feast. 7100 In the sea voyage of Palestine, the dangers were frequent, and the opportunities rare 
but the conversion of Hungary opened a safe communication between Germany and Greece. The Charity of Esti Stephen, the apostle of his kingdom, relieved and conducted his itinerant brethren, 7101 and from Belgrade to Antioch, they traversed 1500 miles of a Christian empire. Among the Franks, the zeal of pilgrimage prevailed beyond the example of former times, and the roads were covered with multitudes of either sex, and of every rank, who professed their contempt of life. So soon as they should have kissed the tomb of their Redeemer. Princes and prelates abandoned the care of their dominions, and the numbers of these pious caravans were a prelude to the armies which marched in the ensuing age under the banner of the cross. About thirty years before the First Crusade, the Archbishop of Mentz, with the bishops of Utrecht, Bamberg, and Ratisbon, undertook this laborious journey from the Rhine to the Jordan. And the multitude of their followers amounted to seven thousand persons. At Constantinople, they were hospitably entertained by the emperor. But the ostentation of their wealth provoked the assault of the wild Arabs, they drew their swords with scrupulous reluctance, and sustained siege in the village of Capernaum, till they were rescued by the venal protection of the Fatimite emir. After visiting the holy places, they embarked for Italy, but only a remnant of two thousand arrived in safety in their native land. In Gulfus, a secretary of William the Conqueror, was a companion of this pilgrimage, he observes that they sailed from Normandy, thirty stout and well-appointed horsemen. But that they repassed the Alps, twenty miserable palmers, with the staff in their hand, and the wallet at their back point seventy-one o two. After the defeat of the Romans, the tranquillity of the Fatimite caliphs was invaded by the Turks. 7103 One of the lieutenants of Malek Shah, Atsiz the Charismian, marched into Syria at the head of a powerful army, and reduced Damascus by famine and the sword. Hems, and the other cities of the province, acknowledged the Caliph of Baghdad and the Sultan of Persia, and the victorious Emir advanced without resistance to the banks of the Nile, the Fatimite was preparing to fly into the heart of Africa. But the Negroes of his guard and the inhabitants of Cairo made a desperate sally, and repulsed the Turk from the confines of Egypt. In his retreat he indulged the license of slaughter and rapine, the judge and notaries of Jerusalem were invited to his camp, and their execution was followed by the massacre of three thousand citizens. The cruelty or the defeat of Atsais was soon punished by the Sultan Tukish, the brother of Malek Shah, who, with a higher title and more formidable powers, asserted the dominion of Syria and Palestine. The House of Seljuk reigned about twenty years in Jerusalem. 7104 But the hereditary command of the holy city and territory was entrusted or abandoned to the Emir Ortak, the chief of a tribe of Turkmens, whose children, after their expulsion from Palestine, formed two dynasties on the borders of Armenia and Assyria. 7105 The Oriental Christians and the Latin pilgrims deplored a revolution, which, instead of the regular government and old alliance of the caliphs, imposed on their necks the iron yoke of the strangers of the north. 7106 In his court and camp the great sultan had adopted in some degree the arts and manners of Persia, but the body of the Turkish nation, and more especially the pastoral tribes, still breathed the fierceness of the desert. From Nice to Jerusalem, the western countries of Asia were a scene of foreign and domestic hostility. And the shepherds of Palestine, who held a precarious sway on a doubtful frontier, had neither leisure nor capacity to await the slow profits of commercial and religious freedom. The pilgrims, who, through innumerable perils, had reached the gates of Jerusalem, were the victims of private rapine or public oppression, and often sunk under the pressure of famine and disease. Before they were permitted to salute the Holy Sepulchre. A spirit of native barbarism, or recent zeal, prompted the Turkmens to insult the clergy of every sect, the patriarch was dragged by the hair along the pavement, and cast into a dungeon, to extort a ransom from the sympathy of his flock. And the divine worship in the Church of the Resurrection was often disturbed by the savage rudeness of its masters. The pathetic tale excited the millions of the West to march under the standard of the cross to the relief of the Holy Land. And yet how trifling is the sum of these accumulated evils, if compared with the single act of the sacrilege of Hakim, which had been so patiently endured by the Latin Christians. A slighter provocation inflamed the more irascible temper of their descendants, a new spirit had arisen of religious chivalry in papal dominion, 
a nerve was touched of exquisite feeling, and the sensation vibrated to the heart of Europe. LVA, the First Crusade Origin and numbers of the First Crusade. Characters of the Latin princes. Their march to Constantinople. Policy of the Greek Emperor Alexius. Conquest of Nice, Antioch, and Jerusalem, by the Franks. Deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre. Godfrey of Bouillon, first king of Jerusalem. Institutions of the French or Latin Kingdom. About twenty years after the conquest of Jerusalem by the Turks, the Holy Sepulchre was visited by a hermit of the name of Peter, a native of Amiens, in the province of Picardy 7107 in France. His resentment and sympathy were excited by his own injuries and the oppression of the Christian name. He mingled his tears with those of the Patriarch, and earnestly inquired, if no hopes of relief could be entertained from the Greek emperors of the East. The Patriarch exposed the vices and weakness of the successors of Constantine. I will rouse, exclaimed the hermit, the martial nations of Europe in your cause, and Europe was obedient to the call of the hermit. The astonished Patriarch dismissed him with epistles of credit and complaint. And no sooner did he land at Bari, than Peter hastened to kiss the feet of the Roman Pontiff. His stature was small, his appearance contemptible, but his eye was keen and lively. And he possessed that vehemence of speech, which seldom fails to impart the persuasion of the soul. 7108 He was born of a gentleman's family, for we must now adopt a modern idiom, and his military service was under the neighboring counts of Boulogne, the heroes of the First Crusade. But he soon relinquished the sword and the world. And if it be true, that his wife, however noble, was aged and ugly, he might withdraw, with the less reluctance, from her bed to a convent, and at length to a hermitage. 7109 In this austere solitude, his body was emaciated, his fancy was inflamed. Whatever he wished, he believed, whatever he believed, he saw in dreams and revelations. From Jerusalem the pilgrim returned an accomplished fanatic. But as he excelled in the popular madness of the times, Pope Urban II received him as a prophet, applauded his glorious design, promised to support it in a general council, and encouraged him to proclaim the deliverance of the Holy Land. Invigorated by the approbation of the pontiff, his zealous missionary traversed. With speed and success, the provinces of Italy and France. His diet was abstemious, his prayers long and fervent, and the alms which he received with one hand, he distributed with the other, his head was bare, his feet naked, his meager body was wrapped in a coarse garment. He bore and displayed a weighty crucifix, and the ass on which he rode was sanctified, in the public eye, by the service of the man of God. He preached to innumerable crowds in the churches, the streets, and the highways, the hermit entered with equal confidence the palace and the cottage, and the people, for all was people, was impetuously moved by his call to repentance and arms. When he painted the sufferings of the natives and pilgrims of Palestine, every heart was melted to compassion. Every breast glowed with indignation, when he challenged the warriors of the age to defend their brethren, and rescue their saviour, his ignorance of art and language was compensated by sighs, and tears, and ejaculations. And Peter supplied the deficiency of reason by loud and frequent appeals to Christ and his mother, to the saints and angels of paradise, with whom he had personally conversed. 7110 The most perfect orator of Athens might have envied the success of his eloquence, the rustic enthusiast inspired the passions which he felt, and Christendom expected with impatience the counsels and decrees of the supreme pontiff. The magnanimous spirit of Gregory VII had already embraced the design of arming Europe against Asia. The ardor of his zeal and ambition still breathes in his epistles, from either side of the Alps, fifty thousand Catholics had enlisted under the banner of St. Peter. 7111 and his successor reveals his intention of marching at their head against the impious sectaries of Muhammad. But the glory or reproach of executing, though not in person, this holy enterprise, was reserved for Urban II, 7112 the most faithful of his disciples. He undertook the conquest of the East, whilst the larger portion of Rome was possessed and fortified by his rival Guibert of Ravenna, who contended with Urban for the name and honours of the pontificate. He attempted to unite the powers of the West, at a time when the princes were separated from the Church, and the people from their princes. 
by the excommunication which himself and his predecessors had thundered against the Emperor and the King of France. Philip I, of France, supported with patience the censures which he had provoked by his scandalous life and adulterous marriage. Henry IV, of Germany, asserted the right of investitures, the prerogative of confirming his bishops by the delivery of the ring in crozier. But the Emperor's party was crushed in Italy by the arms of the Normans and the Countess Matilda. And the long quarrel had been recently envenomed by the revolt of his son Conrad and the shame of his wife, 7113 who, in the synods of Constance and Placentia, confessed the manifold prostitutions to which she had been exposed by a husband regardless of her honour and his own. 7114 So popular was the cause of Urban, so weighty was his influence, that the council which he summoned at Placentia 7115 was composed of 200 bishops of Italy, France, Burgundy, Swabia, and Bavaria. 4,000 of the clergy, and 30,000 of the laity, attended this important meeting, and, as the most spacious cathedral would have been inadequate to the multitude, the session of seven days was held in a plain adjacent to the city. The ambassadors of the Greek emperor, Alexius Comnus, were introduced to plead the distress of their sovereign, and the danger of Constantinople, which was divided only by a narrow sea from the victorious Turks. The Common Enemies of the Christian Name In their suppliant address they flattered the pride of the Latin princes, and, appealing at once to their policy and religion, exhorted them to repel the barbarians on the confines of Asia, rather than to expect them in the heart of Europe. At the sad tale of the misery and perils of their eastern brethren, the assembly burst into tears, the most eager champions declared their readiness to march. And the Greek ambassadors were dismissed with the assurance of a speedy and powerful succor. The relief of Constantinople was included in the larger and most distant project of the deliverance of Jerusalem. But the prudent Urban adjourned the final decision to a second synod, which he proposed to celebrate in some city of France in the autumn of the same year. The short delay would propagate the flame of enthusiasm. And his firmest hope was in a nation of soldiers 7116 still proud of the preeminence of their name, and ambitious to emulate their hero Charlemagne 7117 who, in the popular romance of Turpin 7118 had achieved the conquest of the Holy Land. A latent motive of affection or vanity might influence the choice of Urban, he was himself a native of France, a monk of Clugny, and the first of his countrymen who ascended the throne of St. Peter. The Pope had illustrated his family and province. Nor is there perhaps a more exquisite gratification than to revisit, in a conspicuous dignity, the humble and laborious scenes of our youth. It may occasion some surprise that the Roman pontiff should erect, in the heart of France, the tribunal from whence he hurled his anathemas against the king. But our surprise will vanish so soon as we form a just estimate of a king of France of the eleventh century. 7119 Philip I was the great-grandson of Hugh Capet, the founder of the present race, who, in the decline of Charlemagne's posterity, added the regal title to his patrimonial estates of Paris and Orleans. In this narrow compass, he was possessed of wealth and jurisdiction. But in the rest of France, Hugh and his first descendants were no more than the feudal lords of about sixty dukes and counts, of independent and hereditary power, 7120 who disdained the control of laws and legal assemblies, and whose disregard of their sovereign was revenged by the disobedience of their inferior vassals. At Clermont, in the territories of the Count of Auvergne, 7121 the Pope might brave with impunity the resentment of Philip, and the council which he convened in that city was not less numerous or respectable than the Synod of Placentia. 7122 Besides his court and council of Roman cardinals, he was supported by thirteen archbishops and two hundred and twenty-five bishops, the number of mitred prelates was computed at four hundred. And the fathers of the church were blessed by the saints and enlightened by the doctors of the age. From the adjacent kingdoms, a martial train of lords and knights of power and renown attended the council, 7123 in high expectation of its resolves. And such was the ardor of zeal and curiosity, that the city was filled, and many thousands, in the month of November, erected their tents or huts in the open field. A session of eight days produced some useful or edifying canons for the reformation of manners, a severe censure was pronounced against the license of private war. The truce of God 7124 was confirmed, 
a suspension of hostilities during four days of the week, women and priests were placed under the safeguard of the church. And a protection of three years was extended to husbandmen and merchants, the defenseless victims of military rapine. But a law, however venerable be the sanction, cannot suddenly transform the temper of the times. And the benevolent efforts of Urban deserve the less praise, since he labored to appease some domestic quarrels that he might spread the flames of war from the Atlantic to the Euphrates. From the Synod of Placentia, the rumor of his great design had gone forth among the nations, the clergy on their return had preached in every diocese the merit and glory of the deliverance of the Holy Land. And when the Pope ascended a lofty scaffold in the marketplace of Clermont, his eloquence was addressed to a well-prepared and impatient audience. His topics were obvious, his exhortation was vehement, his success inevitable. The orator was interrupted by the shout of thousands, who with one voice, and in their rustic idiom, exclaimed aloud, God wills it, God wills it, 7125, it is indeed the will of God, replied the Pope. And let this memorable word, the inspiration surely of the Holy Spirit, be forever adopted as your cry of battle, to animate the devotion and courage of the champions of Christ. His cross is the symbol of your salvation. Wear it, a red, a bloody cross, as an external mark, on your breasts or shoulders, as a pledge of your sacred and irrevocable engagement. The proposal was joyfully accepted. Great numbers, both of the clergy and laity, impressed on their garments the sign of the cross 7126 and solicited the Pope to march at their head. This dangerous honor was declined by the more prudent successor of Gregory, who alleged the schism of the Church, and the duties of his pastoral office, recommending to the faithful, who were disqualified by sex or profession, by age or infirmity. To aid, with their prayers and alms, the personal service of their robust brethren. The name and powers of his legate he devolved on Adhemer Bishop of Puy, the first who had received the cross at his hands. The foremost of the temporal chiefs was Raymond Count of Tholaus, whose ambassadors in the council excused the absence, and pledged the honor, of their master. After the confession and absolution of their sins, the champions of the cross were dismissed with a superfluous admonition to invite their countrymen and friends. And their departure for the Holy Land was fixed to the festival of the Assumption, the 15th of August, of the ensuing year. 7127. So familiar, and as it were so natural to man, is the practice of violence, that our indulgence allows the slightest provocation, the most disputable right, as a sufficient ground of national hostility. But the name and nature of a holy war demands a more rigorous scrutiny. Nor can we hastily believe, that the servants of the Prince of Peace would unsheathe the sword of destruction, unless the motive were pure, the quarrel legitimate, and the necessity inevitable. The policy of an action may be determined from the tardy lessons of experience, but, before we act, our conscience should be satisfied of the justice and propriety of our enterprise. In the age of the Crusades, the Christians, both of the East and West, were persuaded of their lawfulness and merit, their arguments are clouded by the perpetual abuse of scripture and rhetoric. But they seem to insist on the right of natural and religious defense, their peculiar title to the Holy Land, and the impiety of their pagan and Mahometan foes. 7128. I. The right of a just defense may fairly include our civil and spiritual allies, it depends on the existence of danger, and that danger must be estimated by the twofold consideration of the malice, and the power, of our enemies. A pernicious tenet has been imputed to the Mohammedans, the duty of extirpating all other religions by the sword. This charge of ignorance and bigotry is refuted by the Quran, by the history of the Muslim conquerors, and by their public and legal toleration of the Christian worship. But it cannot be denied, that the Oriental churches are depressed under their iron yoke, that, in peace and war, they assert a divine and indefeasible claim of universal empire. And that, in their orthodox creed, the unbelieving nations are continually threatened with the loss of religion or liberty. In the eleventh century, the victorious arms of the Turks presented a real and urgent apprehension of these losses. They had subdued, in less than thirty years, the kingdoms of Asia, as far as Jerusalem and the Hellespont, and the Greek Empire tottered on the verge of destruction. Besides an honest sympathy for their brethren, 
the Latins had a right and interest in the support of Constantinople, the most important barrier of the West. And the privilege of defense must reach to prevent, as well as to repel, an impending assault. But this salutary purpose might have been accomplished by a moderate succor. And our calmer reason must disclaim the innumerable hosts, and remote operations, which overwhelmed Asia and depopulated Europe. 7129. 2. Palestine could add nothing to the strength or safety of the Latins. And fanaticism alone could pretend to justify the conquest of that distant and narrow province. The Christians affirmed that their inalienable title to the promised land had been sealed by the blood of their divine Saviour. It was their right and duty to rescue their inheritance from the unjust possessors, who profaned his sepulchre, and oppressed the pilgrimage of his disciples. Vainly would it be alleged that the preeminence of Jerusalem, and the sanctity of Palestine, have been abolished with the Mosaic Law. That the God of the Christians is not a local deity, and that the recovery of Bethlehem or Calvary, his cradle or his tomb, will not atone for the violation of the moral precepts of the Gospel. Such arguments glance aside from the leaden shield of superstition, and the religious mind will not easily relinquish its hold on the sacred ground of mystery and miracle. 3. But the holy wars which have been waged in every climate of the globe, from Egypt to Livonia, and from Peru to Hindostan, require the support of some more general and flexible tenet. It has been often supposed, and sometimes affirmed, that a difference of religion is a worthy cause of hostility, that obstinate unbelievers may be slain or subdued by the champions of the cross. And that grace is the sole fountain of dominion as well as of mercy. 7130 Above 400 years before the First Crusade, the eastern and western provinces of the Roman Empire had been acquired about the same time, and in the same manner, by the barbarians of Germany and Arabia. Time and treaties had legitimated the conquest of the Christian Franks. But in the eyes of their subjects and neighbors, the Mahometan princes were still tyrants and usurpers, who, by the arms of war or rebellion, might be lawfully driven from their unlawful possession. 7131. As the manners of the Christians were relaxed, their discipline of penance 7132 was enforced, and with the multiplication of sins, the remedies were multiplied. In the primitive church, a voluntary and open confession prepared the work of atonement. In the Middle Ages, the bishops and priests interrogated the criminal, compelled him to account for his thoughts, words, and actions, and prescribed the terms of his reconciliation with God. But as this discretionary power might alternately be abused by indulgence and tyranny, a rule of discipline was framed, to inform and regulate the spiritual judges. This mode of legislation was invented by the Greeks, their penitential 7133 were translated, or imitated, in the Latin Church. And, in the time of Charlemagne, the clergy of every diocese were provided with a code, which they prudently concealed from the knowledge of the vulgar. In this dangerous estimate of crimes and punishments, each case was supposed, each difference was remarked, by the experience or penetration of the monks. Some sins are enumerated which innocence could not have suspected, and others which reason cannot believe. And the more ordinary offenses of fornication and adultery, of perjury and sacrilege, of rapine and murder, were expiated by a penance, which, according to the various circumstances, was prolonged from forty days to seven years. During this term of mortification, the patient was healed, the criminal was absolved, by a salutary regimen of fasts and prayers, the disorder of his dress was expressive of grief and remorse. And he humbly abstained from all the business and pleasure of social life. But the rigid execution of these laws would have depopulated the palace, the camp, and the city, the barbarians of the West believed and trembled. But nature often rebelled against principle, and the magistrate labored without effect to enforce the jurisdiction of the priest. A literal accomplishment of penance was indeed impracticable, the guilt of adultery was multiplied by daily repetition. That of homicide might involve the massacre of a whole people, each act was separately numbered, and, in those times of anarchy and vice, a modest sinner might easily incur a debt of three hundred years. His insolvency was relieved by a commutation, or indulgence, a year of penance was appreciated at twenty-six solidi seventy-one thirty-four of silver, about four pounds sterling, 
for the rich. At three solidi, or nine shillings, for the indigent, and these alms were soon appropriated to the use of the church, which derived, from the redemption of sins, an inexhaustible source of opulence and dominion. A debt of three hundred years, or twelve hundred pounds, was enough to impoverish a plentiful fortune, the scarcity of gold and silver was supplied by the alienation of land. And the princely donations of Pepin and Charlemagne are expressly given for the remedy of their soul. It is a maxim of the civil law, that whosoever cannot pay with his purse, must pay with his body. And the practice of flagellation was adopted by the monks, a cheap, though painful equivalent. By a fantastic arithmetic, a year of penance was taxed at three thousand lashes. 7135 And such was the skill and patience of a famous hermit, St. Dominic of the Iron Cuirass, 7136 that in six days he could discharge an entire century, by a whipping of three hundred thousand stripes. His example was followed by many penitents of both sexes. And, as a vicarious sacrifice was accepted, a sturdy disciplinarian might expiate on his own back the sins of his benefactors. 7137 These compensations of the purse and the person introduced, in the eleventh century, a more honorable mode of satisfaction. The merit of military service against the Saracens of Africa and Spain had been allowed by the predecessors of Urban II. In the Council of Clermont, that Pope proclaimed a plenary indulgence to those who should enlist under the banner of the cross, the absolution of all their sins, and a full receipt for all that might be due of canonical penance. 7138 The cold philosophy of modern times is incapable of feeling the impression that was made on a sinful and fanatic world. At the voice of their pastor, the robber, the incendiary, the homicide, arose by thousands to redeem their souls, by repeating on the infidels the same deeds which they had exercised against their Christian brethren. And the terms of atonement were eagerly embraced by offenders of every rank and denomination. None were pure, none were exempt from the guilt and penalty of sin. And those who were the least amenable to the justice of God and the Church were the best entitled to the temporal and eternal recompense of their pious courage. If they fell, the spirit of the Latin clergy did not hesitate to adorn their tomb with the crown of martyrdom, 7139 and should they survive, they could expect without impatience the delay and increase of their heavenly reward. They offered their blood to the Son of God, who had laid down his life for their salvation, they took up the cross, and entered with confidence into the way of the Lord. His providence would watch over their safety. Perhaps his visible and miraculous power would smooth the difficulties of their holy enterprise. The cloud and pillar of Jehovah had marched before the Israelites into the promised land. Might not the Christians more reasonably hope that the rivers would open for their passage, that the walls of their strongest cities would fall at the sound of their trumpets? And that the sun would be arrested in his mid-career, to allow them time for the destruction of the infidels? Of the chiefs and soldiers who marched to the Holy Sepulchre, I will dare to affirm, that all were prompted by the spirit of enthusiasm. The belief of merit, the hope of reward, and the assurance of divine aid. But I am equally persuaded, that in many it was not the soul, that in some it was not the leading, principle of action. The use and abuse of religion are feeble to stem, they are strong and irresistible to impel, the stream of national manners. Against the private wars of the barbarians, their bloody tournaments, licentious love, and judicial duels, the popes and synods might ineffectually thunder. It is a more easy task to provoke the metaphysical disputes of the Greeks, to drive into the cloister the victims of anarchy or despotism, to sanctify the patience of slaves and cowards. Or to assume the merit of the humanity and benevolence of modern Christians. War and exercise were the reigning passions of the Franks or Latins, they were enjoined, as a penance, to gratify those passions, to visit distant lands, and to draw their swords against the nation of the East. Their victory, or even their attempt, would immortalize the names of the intrepid heroes of the cross, and the purest piety could not be insensible to the most splendid prospect of military glory. In the petty quarrels of Europe, they shed the blood of their friends and countrymen, for the acquisition perhaps of a castle or a village. They could march with alacrity against the distant and hostile nations who were devoted to their arms. 
Their fancy already grasped the golden scepters of Asia, and the conquest of Apulia and Sicily by the Normans might exalt to royalty the hopes of the most private adventurer. Christendom, in her rudest state, must have yielded to the climate and cultivation of the Mahometan countries, and their natural and artificial wealth had been magnified by the tales of pilgrims, and the gifts of an imperfect commerce. The vulgar, both the great and small, were taught to believe every wonder, of lands flowing with milk and honey, of mines and treasures, of gold and diamonds, of palaces of marble and jasper, and of odoriferous groves of cinnamon and frankincense. In this earthly paradise, each warrior depended on his sword to carve a plenteous and honorable establishment, which he measured only by the extent of his wishes. 7140 Their vassals and soldiers trusted their fortunes to God and their master, the spoils of a Turkish emir might enrich the meanest follower of the camp. And the flavor of the wines, the beauty of the Grecian women, 7141 were temptations more adapted to the nature, than to the profession, of the champions of the cross. The love of freedom was a powerful incitement to the multitudes who were oppressed by feudal or ecclesiastical tyranny. Under this holy sign, the peasants and burghers, who were attached to the servitude of the glebe, might escape from a haughty lord, and transplant themselves and their families to a land of liberty. The monk might release himself from the discipline of his convent, the debtor might suspend the accumulation of usury, and the pursuit of his creditors. And outlaws and malefactors of every caste might continue to brave the laws and elude the punishment of their crimes. 7142. These motives were potent and numerous, when we have singly computed their weight on the mind of each individual, we must add the infinite series, the multiplying powers, of example and fashion. The first proselytes became the warmest and most effectual missionaries of the cross, among their friends and countrymen they preached the duty, the merit, and the recompense, of their holy vow. And the most reluctant hearers were insensibly drawn within the whirlpool of persuasion and authority. The martial youths were fired by the reproach or suspicion of cowardice. The opportunity of visiting with an army the sepulchre of Christ was embraced by the old and infirm, by women and children, who consulted rather their zeal than their strength. And those who in the evening had derided the folly of their companions, were the most eager, the ensuing day, to tread in their footsteps. The ignorance, which magnified the hopes, diminished the perils, of the enterprise. Since the Turkish conquest, the paths of pilgrimage were obliterated, the chiefs themselves had an imperfect notion of the length of the way and the state of their enemies. And such was the stupidity of the people, that, at the sight of the first city or castle beyond the limits of their knowledge, they were ready to ask whether that was not the Jerusalem, the term and object of their labors. Yet the more prudent of the crusaders, who were not sure that they should be fed from heaven with a shower of quails or manna, provided themselves with those precious metals, which, in every country, are the representatives of every commodity. To defray, according to their rank, the expenses of the road, princes alienated their provinces, nobles their lands and castles, peasants their cattle and the instruments of husbandry. The value of property was depreciated by the eager competition of multitudes, while the price of arms and horses was raised to an exorbitant height by the wants and impatience of the buyers. 7143 Those who remained at home, with sense and money, were enriched by the epidemical disease, the sovereigns acquired at a cheap rate the domains of their vassals. And the ecclesiastical purchasers completed the payment by the assurance of their prayers. The cross, which was commonly sewed on the garment, in cloth or silk, was inscribed by some zealots on their skin, a hot iron, or indelible liquor, was applied to perpetuate the mark. And a crafty monk, who showed the miraculous impression on his breast was repaid with the popular veneration and the richest benefices of Palestine. 7144. The 15th of August had been fixed in the Council of Clermont for the departure of the pilgrims. But the day was anticipated by the thoughtless and needy crowd of plebeians, and I shall briefly dispatch the calamities which they inflicted and suffered, before I enter on the more serious and successful enterprise of the chiefs. Early in the spring, from the confines of France and Lorraine, above sixty thousand of the populace of both sexes flocked round the first missionary of the crusade, and pressed him with clamorous importunity to lead them to the holy sepulchre. The hermit, assuming the character, 
without the talents or authority, of a general, impelled or obeyed the forward impulse of his votaries along the banks of the Rhine and Danube. Their wants and numbers soon compelled them to separate, and his lieutenant, Walter the Penniless, a valiant though needy soldier, conducted a vanguard of pilgrims. Whose condition may be determined from the proportion of eight horsemen to fifteen thousand foot. The example and footsteps of Peter were closely pursued by another fanatic, the monk Odeskal, whose sermons had swept away fifteen or twenty thousand peasants from the villages of Germany. Their rear was again pressed by a herd of two hundred thousand, the most stupid and savage refuse of the people, who mingled with their devotion a brutal license of rapine, prostitution, and drunkenness. Some counts and gentlemen, at the head of three thousand horse, attended the motions of the multitude to partake in the spoil, but their genuine leaders, may we credit such folly? Were a goose and a goat, who were carried in the front, and to whom these worthy Christians ascribed an infusion of the divine spirit. Seventy-one forty-five of these, and of other bands of enthusiasts, the first and most easy warfare was against the Jews, the murderers of the Son of God. In the trading cities of the Moselle and the Rhine, their colonies were numerous and rich. And they enjoyed, under the protection of the emperor and the bishops, the free exercise of their religion. 7146 at Verdun, Treves, Mentz, Spires, Worms, many thousands of that unhappy people were pillaged and massacred, 7147 nor had they felt a more bloody stroke since the persecution of Hadrian. A remnant was saved by the firmness of their bishops, who accepted a feigned and transient conversion. But the more obstinate Jews opposed their fanaticism to the fanaticism of the Christians, barricadoed their houses, and precipitating themselves, their families, and their wealth, into the rivers or the flames, disappointed the malice, or at least the avarice, of their implacable foes. Between the frontiers of Austria and the seat of the Byzantine monarchy, the Crusaders were compelled to traverse as interval of six hundred miles, the wild and desolate countries of Hungary 7148 and Bulgaria. The soil is fruitful, and intersected with rivers, but it was then covered with morasses and forests, which spread to a boundless extent, whenever man has ceased to exercise his dominion over the earth. Both nations had imbibed the rudiments of Christianity, the Hungarians were ruled by their native princes, the Bulgarians by a lieutenant of the Greek emperor. But, on the slightest provocation, their ferocious nature was rekindled, and ample provocation was afforded by the disorders of the first pilgrims' agriculture must have been unskillful and languid among a people, whose cities were built of reeds and timber, which were deserted in the summer season for the tents of hunters and shepherds. A scanty supply of provisions was rudely demanded, forcibly seized, and greedily consumed, and on the first quarrel, the crusaders gave a loose to indignation and revenge. But their ignorance of the country, of war, and of discipline, exposed them to every snare. The Greek prefect of Bulgaria commanded a regular force. 7149 At the trumpet of the Hungarian king, the eighth or the tenth of his martial subjects bent their bows and mounted on horseback, their policy was insidious, and their retaliation on these pious robbers was unrelenting and bloody. 7150 About a third of the naked fugitives, and the hermit Peter was of the number, escaped to the Thracian mountains. And the emperor, who respected the pilgrimage and succor of the Latins, conducted them by secure and easy journeys to Constantinople, and advised them to await the arrival of their brethren. For a while they remembered their faults and losses. But no sooner were they revived by the hospitable entertainment, than their venom was again inflamed, they stung their benefactor, and neither gardens, nor palaces, nor churches, were safe from their depredations. For his own safety, Alexius allured them to pass over to the Asiatic side of the Bosphorus. But their blind impetuosity soon urged them to desert the station which he had assigned, and to rush headlong against the Turks, who occupied the road to Jerusalem. The hermit, conscious of his shame, had withdrawn from the camp to Constantinople. And his lieutenant, Walter the Penniless, who was worthy of a better command, attempted without success to introduce some order and prudence among the herd of savages. They separated in quest of prey, and themselves fell an easy prey to the arts of the sultan. 
By a rumor that their foremost companions were rioting in the spoils of his capital, Solomon 7151 tempted the main body to descend into the plain of Nice, they were overwhelmed by the Turkish arrows. And a pyramid of bones 7152 informed their companions of the place of their defeat. Of the first crusaders, 300,000 had already perished, before a single city was rescued from the infidels, before their graver and more noble brethren had completed the preparations of their enterprise. None of the great sovereigns of Europe embarked their persons in the First Crusade. The Emperor Henry IV was not disposed to obey the summons of the Pope, Philip I of France was occupied by his pleasures. William Rufus of England by a recent conquest, the kings of Spain were engaged in a domestic war against the Moors. And the northern monarchs of Scotland, Denmark, 7153 Sweden, and Poland, were yet strangers to the passions and interests of the South. The religious ardor was more strongly felt by the princes of the Second Order, who held an important place in the feudal system. Their situation will naturally cast under four distinct heads the review of their names and characters. But I may escape some needless repetition, by observing at once, that courage and the exercise of arms are the common attribute of these Christian adventurers. I, the first rank both in war and council is justly due to Godfrey of Bouillon. And happy would it have been for the Crusaders, if they had trusted themselves to the sole conduct of that accomplished hero, a worthy representative of Charlemagne, from whom he was descended in the female line. His father was of the noble race of the Counts of Boulogne, Brabant, the lower province of Lorraine, 7154 was the inheritance of his mother. And by the emperor's bounty he was himself invested with that ducal title, which has been improperly transferred to his lordship of Bouillon in the Ardennes. 7155 In the service of Henry IV, he bore the great standard of the empire, and pierced with his lance the breast of Rodolf, the rebel king, Godfrey was the first who ascended the walls of Rome. And his sickness, his vow, perhaps his remorse for bearing arms against the Pope, confirmed an early resolution of visiting the Holy Sepulchre, not as a pilgrim, but a deliverer. His valor was matured by prudence and moderation. His piety, though blind, was sincere, and, in the tumult of a camp, he practiced the real and fictitious virtues of a convent. Superior to the private factions of the chiefs, he reserved his enmity for the enemies of Christ. And though he gained a kingdom by the attempt, his pure and disinterested zeal was acknowledged by his rivals. Godfrey of Bouillon 7156 was accompanied by his two brothers, by Eustace the Elder, who had succeeded to the county of Boulogne, and by the younger, Baldwin, a character of more ambiguous virtue. The Duke of Lorraine, was alike celebrated on either side of the Rhine, from his birth and education, he was equally conversant with the French and Teutonic languages, the barons of France, Germany, and Lorraine, assembled their vassals. And the confederate force that marched under his banner was composed of fourscore thousand foot and about ten thousand horse. 2. In the parliament that was held at Paris, in the king's presence, about two months after the Council of Clermont, Hugh, Count of Vermandois, was the most conspicuous of the princes who assumed the cross. But the appellation of the great was applied, not so much to his merit or possessions, though neither were contemptible, as to the royal birth of the brother of the King of France. 7157 Robert, Duke of Normandy, was the eldest son of William the Conqueror, but on his father's death he was deprived of the Kingdom of England, by his own indolence and the activity of his brother Rufus. The worth of Robert was degraded by an excessive levity and easiness of temper, his cheerfulness seduced him to the indulgence of pleasure, his profuse liberality impoverished the prince and people. His indiscriminate clemency multiplied the number of offenders, and the amiable qualities of a private man became the essential defects of a sovereign. For the trifling sum of ten thousand marks, he mortgaged Normandy during his absence to the English usurper. 7158 But his engagement and behavior in the Holy War announced in Robert a reformation of manners, and restored him in some degree to the public esteem. Another Robert was Count of Flanders, a royal province, which, in this century, gave three queens to the thrones of France, England, and Denmark, he was surnamed the Sword and Lance of the Christians. But in the exploits of a soldier he sometimes forgot the duties of a general. Stephen, Count of Chartres, 
of Blois, and of Troyes, was one of the richest princes of the age. And the number of his castles has been compared to the 365 days of the year. His mind was improved by literature. And, in the Council of the Chiefs, the eloquent Stephen 7159 was chosen to discharge the office of their president. These four were the principal leaders of the French, the Normans, and the pilgrims of the British Isles, but the list of the barons who were possessed of three or four towns would exceed, says a contemporary, the catalogue of the Trojan War. 7163. In the south of France, the command was assumed by Edhemer Bishop of Puy, the Pope Egget, and by Raymond Count of St. Giles and Thulaus, who added the prouder titles of Duke of Narbonne and Marquis of Provence. The former was a respectable prelate, alike qualified for this world and the next. The latter was a veteran warrior, who had fought against the Saracens of Spain, and who consecrated his declining age, not only to the deliverance, but to the perpetual service, of the Holy Sepulchre. His experience and riches gave him a strong ascendant in the Christian camp, whose distress he was often able, and sometimes willing, to relieve. But it was easier for him to extort the praise of the infidels, than to preserve the love of his subjects and associates. His eminent qualities were clouded by a temper haughty, envious, and obstinate. And, though he resigned an ample patrimony for the cause of God, his piety, in the public opinion, was not exempt from avarice and ambition. 7161 A mercantile, rather than a martial, spirit prevailed among his provincials. 7162 A common name, which included the natives of Auvergne and Languedoc. 7163 The vassals of the kingdom of Burgundy or Aulles. From the adjacent frontier of Spain he drew a band of hardy adventurers, as he marched through Lombardy, a crowd of Italians flocked to his standard, and his united force consisted of 100,000 horse and foot. If Raymond was the first to enlist and the last to depart, the delay may be excused by the greatness of his preparation and the promise of an everlasting farewell. 4. The name of Bohemond, the son of Robert Giscard, was already famous by his double victory over the Greek emperor. But his father's will had reduced him to the principality of Tarentum, and the remembrance of his eastern trophies, till he was awakened by the rumor and passage of the French pilgrims. It is in the person of this Norman chief that we may seek for the coolest policy and ambition, with a small allay of religious fanaticism. His conduct may justify a belief that he had secretly directed the design of the Pope, which he affected to second with astonishment and zeal, at the siege of Amalfi, his example and discourse inflamed the passions of a confederate army. He instantly tore his garment to supply crosses for the numerous candidates, and prepared to visit Constantinople and Asia at the head of 10,000 horse and 20,000 foot. Several princes of the Norman race accompanied this veteran general, and his cousin Tancred 7164 was the partner, rather than the servant, of the war. In the accomplished character of Tancred we discover all the virtues of a perfect knight, 7165 the true spirit of chivalry, which inspired the generous sentiments and social offices of man far better than the base philosophy, or the baser religion. Of the times. Between the age of Charlemagne and that of the Crusades, a revolution had taken place among the Spaniards, the Normans, and the French, which was gradually extended to the rest of Europe. The service of the infantry was degraded to the plebeians. The cavalry formed the strength of the armies, and the honorable name of Miles, or soldier, was confined to the gentlemen 7166 who served on horseback, and were invested with the character of knighthood. The dukes and counts, who had usurped the rights of sovereignty, divided the provinces among their faithful barons, the barons distributed among their vassals the fiefs or benefices of their jurisdiction. And these military tenants, the peers of each other and of their lord, composed the noble or equestrian order, which disdained to conceive the peasant or burgher as of the same species with themselves. The dignity of their birth was preserved by pure and equal alliances, their sons alone, who could produce four quarters or lines of ancestry without spot or reproach, might legally pretend to the honor of knighthood. But a valiant plebeian was sometimes enriched and ennobled by the sword, and became the father of a new race. A single knight could impart, according to his judgment, the character which he received. 
and the warlike sovereigns of Europe derived more glory from this personal distinction than from the luster of their diadem. This ceremony, of which some traces may be found in Tacitus and the woods of Germany 7167 was in its origin simple and profane, the candidate, after some previous trial, was invested with the sword and spurs. And his cheek or shoulder was touched with a slight blow, as an emblem of the last affront which it was lawful for him to endure. But superstition mingled in every public and private action of life, in the holy wars, it sanctified the profession of arms, and the order of chivalry was assimilated in its rights and privileges to the sacred orders of priesthood. The bath and white garment of the novice were an indecent copy of the regeneration of baptism, his sword, which he offered on the altar, was blessed by the ministers of religion, his solemn reception was preceded by fasts and vigils. And he was created a knight in the name of God, of St. George, and of St. Michael the Archangel. He swore to accomplish the duties of his profession, in education, example, and the public opinion, were the inviolable guardians of his oath. As the champion of God and the ladies, I blush to unite such discordant names, he devoted himself to speak the truth, to maintain the right, to protect the distressed, to practice courtesy, a virtue less familiar to the ancients. To pursue the infidels, to despise the allurements of ease and safety, and to vindicate in every perilous adventure the honor of his character. The abuse of the same spirit provoked the illiterate knight to disdain the arts of industry and peace. To esteem himself the sole judge and avenger of his own injuries, and proudly to neglect the laws of civil society and military discipline. Yet the benefits of this institution, to refine the temper of barbarians, and to infuse some principles of faith, justice, and humanity, were strongly felt, and have been often observed. The asperity of national prejudice was softened. And the community of religion and arms spread a similar color and generous emulation over the face of Christendom. Abroad in enterprise and pilgrimage, at home in martial exercise, the warriors of every country were perpetually associated. An impartial taste must prefer a Gothic tournament to the Olympic Games of classic antiquity. 7168 Instead of the naked spectacles which corrupted the manners of the Greeks, and banished from the stadium the virgins and matrons, the pompous decoration of the lists was crowned with the presence of chaste and highborn beauty. From whose hands the conqueror received the prize of his dexterity and courage. The skill and strength that were exerted in wrestling and boxing bear a distant and doubtful relation to the merit of a soldier. But the tournaments, as they were invented in France, and eagerly adopted both in the East and West, presented a lively image of the business of the field. The single combats, the general skirmish, the defense of a pass, or castle, were rehearsed as an actual service, and the contest, both in real and mimic war, was decided by the superior management of the horse and lance. The lance was the proper and peculiar weapon of the knight, his horse was of a large and heavy breed. But this charger, till he was roused by the approaching danger, was usually led by an attendant, and he quietly rode a pad or palfrey of a more easy pace. His helmet and sword, his greaves and buckler, it would be superfluous to describe. But I may remark, that, at the period of the Crusades, the armor was less ponderous than in later times, and that, instead of a massy cuirass, his breast was defended by a hauberk or coat of mail. When their long lances were fixed in the rest, the warriors furiously spurred their horses against the foe, and the light cavalry of the Turks and Arabs could seldom stand against the direct and impetuous weight of their charge. Each knight was attended to the field by his faithful squire, a youth of equal birth and similar hopes, he was followed by his archers and men at arms, and four, or five, or six soldiers were computed as the furniture of a complete lance. In the expeditions to the neighboring kingdoms or the Holy Land, the duties of the feudal tenure no longer subsisted. The voluntary service of the knights and their followers were either prompted by zeal or attachment, or purchased with rewards and promises. And the numbers of each squadron were measured by the power, the wealth, and the fame, of each independent chieftain. They were distinguished by his banner, his armorial coat, and his cry of war. And the most ancient families of Europe must seek in these achievements the origin and proof of their nobility. 
In this rapid portrait of chivalry I have been urged to anticipate on the story of the Crusades, at once an effect and a cause, of this memorable institution. 7169. Such were the troops, and such the leaders, who assumed the cross for the deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre. As soon as they were relieved by the absence of the plebeian multitude, they encouraged each other, by interviews and messages, to accomplish their vow, and hasten their departure. Their wives and sisters were desirous of partaking the danger and merit of the pilgrimage, their portable treasures were conveyed in bars of silver and gold. And the princes and barons were attended by their equipage of hounds and hawks to amuse their leisure and to supply their table. The difficulty of procuring subsistence for so many myriads of men and horses engaged them to separate their forces, their choice or situation determined the road. And it was agreed to meet in the neighborhood of Constantinople, and from thence to begin their operations against the Turks. From the banks of the Meuse and the Moselle, Godfrey of Bouillon followed the direct way of Germany, Hungary, and Bulgaria. And, as long as he exercised the sole command every step afforded some proof of his prudence and virtue. On the confines of Hungary he was stopped three weeks by a Christian people, to whom the name, or at least the abuse, of the cross was justly odious. The Hungarians still smarted with the wounds which they had received from the first pilgrims, in their turn they had abused the right of defence and retaliation. And they had reason to apprehend a severe revenge from a hero of the same nation, and who was engaged in the same cause. But, after weighing the motives and the events, the virtuous duke was content to pity the crimes and misfortunes of his worthless brethren, and his twelve deputies, the messengers of peace, requested in his name a free passage and an equal market. To remove their suspicions, Godfrey trusted himself, and afterwards his brother, to the faith of Carloman 7170 King of Hungary, who treated them with a simple but hospitable entertainment, the treaty was sanctified by their common gospel. And a proclamation, under pain of death, restrained the animosity and license of the Latin soldiers. From Austria to Belgrade, they traversed the plains of Hungary, without enduring or offering an injury. And the proximity of Carloman, who hovered on their flanks with his numerous cavalry, was a precaution not less useful for their safety than for his own. They reached the banks of the Save. And no sooner had they passed the river, than the King of Hungary restored the hostages, and saluted their departure with the fairest wishes for the success of their enterprise. With the same conduct and discipline, Godfrey pervaded the woods of Bulgaria and the frontiers of Thrace. And might congratulate himself that he had almost reached the first term of his pilgrimage, without drawing his sword against a Christian adversary. After an easy and pleasant journey through Lombardy, from Turin to Aquileia, Raymond and his provincials marched forty days through the savage country of Dalmatia 7171 in Sclavonia. The weather was a perpetual fog. The land was mountainous and desolate, the natives were either fugitive or hostile, loose in their religion and government, they refused to furnish provisions or guides, murdered the stragglers. And exercised by night and day the vigilance of the count, who derived more security from the punishment of some captive robbers than from his interview and treaty with the Prince of Skadra. 7172 His march between Durazzo and Constantinople was harassed, without being stopped, by the peasants and soldiers of the Greek Emperor. And the same faint and ambiguous hostility was prepared for the remaining chiefs, who passed the Adriatic from the coast of Italy. Bohemian had arms and vessels, and foresight and discipline. And his name was not forgotten in the provinces of Epirus and Thessaly. Whatever obstacles he encountered were surmounted by his military conduct and the valor of Tancred. And if the Norman prince affected to spare the Greeks, he gorged his soldiers with the full plunder of an heretical castle. 7173 The nobles of France pressed forwards with the vain and thoughtless ardor of which their nation has been sometimes accused. From the Alps to Apulia the march of Hugh the Great, of the two Roberts, and of Stephen of Chartres, through a wealthy country, and amidst the applauding Catholics, was a devout or triumphant progress, they kissed the feet of the Roman pontiff. And the golden standard of St. Peter was delivered to the brother of the French monarch. 7174 But in this visit of piety and pleasure, they neglected to secure the season, and the means of their embarkation, the winter was insensibly lost, 
their troops were scattered and corrupted in the towns of Italy. They separately accomplished their passage, regardless of safety or dignity, and within nine months from the Feast of the Assumption, the day appointed by Urban, all the Latin princes had reached Constantinople. But the Count of Vermandois was produced as a captive, his foremost vessels were scattered by a tempest, and his person, against the law of nations, was detained by the lieutenants of Alexius. Yet the arrival of Hugh had been announced by four and twenty knights in golden armor, who commanded the emperor to revere the general of the Latin Christians, the brother of the King of Kings. 7175-7176. In some oriental tale I have read the fable of a shepherd, who was ruined by the accomplishment of his own wishes, he had prayed for water. The Ganges was turned into his grounds, and his flock and cottage were swept away by the inundation. Such was the fortune, or at least the apprehension of the Greek emperor Alexius Comnus, whose name has already appeared in this history, and whose conduct is so differently represented by his daughter in 7177 and by the Latin writers. 7178 in the Council of Placentia, his ambassadors had solicited a moderate succor, perhaps of ten thousand soldiers, but he was astonished by the approach of so many potent chiefs and fanatic nations. The emperor fluctuated between hope and fear, between timidity and courage, but in the crooked policy which he mistook for wisdom, I cannot believe, I cannot discern, that he maliciously conspired against the life or honor of the French heroes. The promiscuous multitudes of Peter the Hermit were savage beasts, alike destitute of humanity and reason, nor was it possible for Alexius to prevent or deplore their destruction. The troops of Godfrey and his peers were less contemptible, but not less suspicious, to the Greek emperor. Their motives might be pure and pious, but he was equally alarmed by his knowledge of the ambitious Bohemond 7179 in his ignorance of the Transalpine chiefs, the courage of the French was blind and headstrong. They might be tempted by the luxury and wealth of Greece, and elated by the view and opinion of their invincible strength, and Jerusalem might be forgotten in the prospect of Constantinople. After a long march and painful abstinence, the troops of Godfrey encamped in the plains of Thrace, they heard with indignation, that their brother, the Count of Vermandois, was imprisoned by the Greeks. And their reluctant duke was compelled to indulge them in some freedom of retaliation and rapine. They were appeased by the submission of Alexius, he promised to supply their camp. And as they refused, in the midst of winter, to pass the Bosphorus, their quarters were assigned among the gardens and palaces on the shores of that narrow sea. But an incurable jealousy still rankled in the minds of the two nations, who despised each other as slaves and barbarians. Ignorance is the ground of suspicion, and suspicion was inflamed into daily provocations, prejudice is blind, hunger is deaf. And Alexius is accused of a design to starve or assault the Latins in a dangerous post, on all sides encompassed with the waters. 7180 Godfrey sounded his trumpets, burst the net, overspread the plain, and insulted the suburbs. But the gates of Constantinople were strongly fortified, the ramparts were lined with archers, and, after a doubtful conflict, both parties listened to the voice of peace and religion. The gifts and promises of the emperor insensibly soothed the fierce spirit of the western strangers. As a Christian warrior, he rekindled their zeal for the prosecution of their holy enterprise, which he engaged to second with his troops and treasures. On the return of spring, Godfrey was persuaded to occupy a pleasant and plentiful camp in Asia. And no sooner had he passed the Bosphorus, than the Greek vessels were suddenly recalled to the opposite shore. The same policy was repeated with the succeeding chiefs, who were swayed by the example, and weakened by the departure, of their foremost companions. By his skill and diligence, Alexius prevented the union of any two of the confederate armies at the same moment under the walls of Constantinople, and before the feast of the Pentecost not a Latin pilgrim was left on the coast of Europe. The same arms which threatened Europe might deliver Asia, and repel the Turks from the neighboring shores of the Bosphorus and Hellespont. The fair provinces from Nice to Antioch were the recent patrimony of the Roman Emperor. And his ancient and perpetual claim still embraced the kingdoms of Syria and Egypt. In his enthusiasm, Alexius indulged, or affected, the ambitious hope of leading his new allies to subvert the thrones of the East. 
but the calmer dictates of reason and temper dissuaded him from exposing his royal person to the faith of unknown and lawless barbarians. His prudence, or his pride, was content with extorting from the French princes an oath of homage and fidelity, and a solemn promise, that they would either restore, or hold their Asiatic conquests as the humble and loyal vassals of the Roman Empire. Their independent spirit was fired at the mention of this foreign and voluntary servitude, they successively yielded to the dexterous application of gifts and flattery. And the first proselytes became the most eloquent and effectual missionaries to multiply the companions of their shame. The pride of Hugh of Vermandois was soothed by the honours of his captivity. And in the brother of the French king, the example of submission was prevalent and weighty. In the mind of Godfrey of Bouillon every human consideration was subordinate to the glory of God and the success of the crusade. He had firmly resisted the temptations of Bohemond and Raymond, who urged the attack and conquest of Constantinople. Alexius esteemed his virtues, deservedly named him the champion of the empire, and dignified his homage with the filial name and the rights of adoption. 7181 The hateful Bohemond was received as a true and ancient ally. And if the emperor reminded him of former hostilities, it was only to praise the valor that he had displayed, and the glory that he had acquired, in the fields of Durazzo and Larissa. The son of Giscar was lodged and entertained, and served with imperial pomp. One day, as he passed through the gallery of the palace, a door was carelessly left open to expose a pile of gold and silver, of silk and gems, of curious and costly furniture, that was heaped, in seeming disorder, from the floor to the roof of the chamber. What conquests, exclaimed the ambitious miser, might not be achieved by the possession of such a treasure? It is your own, replied a Greek attendant, who watched the motions of his soul. And Bohemond, after some hesitation, condescended to accept this magnificent present. The Norman was flattered by the assurance of an independent principality. And Alexius eluded, rather than denied, his daring demand of the office of great domestic, or general of the East. The two Roberts, the son of the conqueror of England, and the kinsman of three queens, 7182 bowed in their turn before the Byzantine throne. A private letter of Stephen of Chartres attests his admiration of the emperor, the most excellent and liberal of men, who taught him to believe that he was a favorite, and promised to educate and establish his youngest son. In his southern province, the Count of St. Giles and Tholaus faintly recognized the supremacy of the King of France, a prince of a foreign nation and language. At the head of a hundred thousand men, he declared that he was the soldier and servant of Christ alone, and that the Greek might be satisfied with an equal treaty of alliance and friendship. His obstinate resistance enhanced the value and the price of his submission, and he shone, says the princess Anne, among the barbarians, as the sun amidst the stars of heaven. His disgust of the noise and insolence of the French, his suspicions of the designs of Bohemond, the emperor imparted to his faithful Raymond. And that aged statesman might clearly discern, that however false in friendship, he was sincere in his enmity. 7183 The spirit of chivalry was last subdued in the person of Tancred. And none could deem themselves dishonored by the imitation of that gallant knight. He disdained the gold and flattery of the Greek monarch, assaulted in his presence an insolent patrician, escaped to Asia in the habit of a private soldier. And yielded with a sigh to the authority of Bohemond, and the interest of the Christian cause. The best and most ostensible reason was the impossibility of passing the sea and accomplishing their vow, without the license and the vessels of Alexius. But they cherished a secret hope, that as soon as they trod the continent of Asia, their swords would obliterate their shame, and dissolve the engagement, which on his side might not be very faithfully performed. The ceremony of their homage was grateful to a people who had long since considered pride as the substitute of power. High on his throne, the emperor sat mute and immovable, his majesty was adored by the Latin princes. And they submitted to kiss either his feet or his knees, an indignity which their own writers are ashamed to confess and unable to deny. 7184. Private or public interest suppressed the murmurs of the dukes and counts. But a French baron, he is supposed to be Robert of Paris 7185 presumed to ascend the throne, and to place himself by the side of Alexius. The sage reproof of Baldwin provoked him to exclaim, 
in his barbarous idiom, who is this rustic, that keeps his seat, while so many valiant captains are standing round him? The emperor maintained his silence, dissembled his indignation, and questioned his interpreter concerning the meaning of the words, which he partly suspected from the universal language of gesture and countenance. Before the departure of the pilgrims, he endeavored to learn the name and condition of the audacious baron. I am a Frenchman, replied Robert, of the purest and most ancient nobility of my country. All that I know is, that there is a church in my neighborhood, 7186 the resort of those who are desirous of approving their valor in single combat. Till an enemy appears, they address their prayers to God and his saints. That church I have frequently visited. But never have I found an antagonist who dared to accept my defiance. Alexius dismissed the challenger with some prudent advice for his conduct in the Turkish warfare. And history repeats with pleasure this lively example of the manners of his age and country. The conquest of Asia was undertaken and achieved by Alexander, with 35,000 Macedonians and Greeks. 7187 and his best hope was in the strength and discipline of his phalanx of infantry. The principal force of the crusaders consisted in their cavalry. And when that force was mustered in the plains of Bithynia, the knights and their martial attendants on horseback amounted to 100,000 fighting men, completely armed with the helmet and coat of mail. The value of these soldiers deserved a strict and authentic account, and the flower of European chivalry might furnish, in a first effort, this formidable body of heavy horse. A part of the infantry might be enrolled for the service of scouts, pioneers, and archers, but the promiscuous crowd were lost in their own disorder. And we depend not on the eyes and knowledge, but on the belief and fancy, of a chaplain of Count Baldwin, 7188 in the estimate of 600,000 pilgrims able to bear arms, besides the priests and monks. The women and children of the Latin camp. The reader starts, and before he is recovered from his surprise, I shall add, on the same testimony, that if all who took the cross had accomplished their vow, above six millions would have migrated from Europe to Asia. Under this oppression of faith, I derive some relief from a more sagacious and thinking writer, 7189 who, after the same review of the cavalry, accuses the credulity of the priest of Chartres. And even doubts whether the Cisalpine regions, in the geography of a Frenchman, were sufficient to produce and pour forth such incredible multitudes. The coolest skepticism will remember, that of these religious volunteers great numbers never beheld Constantinople and Nice. Of enthusiasm the influence is irregular and transient, many were detained at home by reason or cowardice, by poverty or weakness. And many were repulsed by the obstacles of the way, the more insuperable as they were unforeseen, to these ignorant fanatics. The savage countries of Hungary and Bulgaria were whitened with their bones, their vanguard was cut in pieces by the Turkish sultan. And the loss of the first adventure, by the sword, or climate, or fatigue, has already been stated at 300,000 men. Yet the myriads that survived, that marched, that pressed forwards on the holy pilgrimage, were a subject of astonishment to themselves and to the Greeks. The copious energy of her language sinks under the efforts of the princess and, 7190 the images of locusts, of leaves and flowers, of the sands of the sea, or the stars of heaven, imperfectly represent what she had seen and heard. And the daughter of Alexius exclaims, that Europe was loosened from its foundations, and hurled against Asia. The ancient hosts of Darius and Xerxes labor under the same doubt of a vague and indefinite magnitude. But I am inclined to believe, that a larger number has never been contained within the lines of a single camp, than at the siege of Nice, the first operation of the Latin princes. Their motives, their characters, and their arms, have been already displayed. Of their troops the most numerous portion were natives of France, the Low Countries, the banks of the Rhine, and Apulia, sent a powerful reinforcement, some bands of adventurers were drawn from Spain, Lombardy, and England. 7191 and from the distant bogs and mountains of Ireland or Scotland 7192 issued some naked and savage fanatics, ferocious at home but unwarlike abroad. Had not superstition condemned the sacrilegious prudence of depriving the poorest or weakest Christian of the merit of the pilgrimage, the useless crowd, with mouths but without hands, might have been stationed in the Greek Empire. 
till their companions had opened and secured the way of the Lord. A small remnant of the pilgrims, who passed the Bosphorus, was permitted to visit the Holy Sepulchre. Their northern constitution was scorched by the rays, and infected by the vapors, of a Syrian sun. They consumed, with heedless prodigality, their stores of water and provision, their numbers exhausted the inland country, the sea was remote, the Greeks were unfriendly. And the Christians of every sect fled before the voracious and cruel rapine of their brethren. In the dire necessity of famine, they sometimes roasted and devoured the flesh of their infant or adult captives. Among the Turks and Saracens, the idolaters of Europe were rendered more odious by the name and reputation of cannibals. The spies, who introduced themselves into the kitchen of Bohemond, were shown several human bodies turning on the spit, and the artful Norman encouraged a report, which increased at the same time the abhorrence and the terror of the infidels. 7193. I have expiated with pleasure on the first steps of the Crusaders, as they paint the manners and character of Europe, but I shall abridge the tedious and uniform narrative of their blind achievements, which were performed by strength and are described by ignorance. From their first station in the neighborhood of Nicomedia, they advanced in successive divisions, passed the contracted limit of the Greek Empire, opened a road through the hills, and commenced, by the siege of his capital, their pious warfare against the Turkish Sultan. His kingdom of Rome extended from the Hellespont to the confines of Syria, and barred the pilgrimage of Jerusalem, his name was Kilajarslan, or Solomon, 7194 of the race of Seljuk, and son of the first conqueror. And in the defense of a land which the Turks considered as their own, he deserved the praise of his enemies, by whom alone he is known to posterity. Yielding to the first impulse of the torrent, he deposited his family in treasure in Nice retired to the mountains with fifty thousand horse, and twice descended to assault the camps or quarters of the Christian besiegers, which formed an imperfect circle of above six miles. The lofty and solid walls of Nice were covered by a deep ditch, and flanked by three hundred and seventy towers, and on the verge of Christendom, the Moslems were trained in arms, and inflamed by religion. Before this city, the French princes occupied their stations, and prosecuted their attacks without correspondence or subordination, emulation prompted their valor. But their valor was sullied by cruelty, and their emulation degenerated into envy and civil discord. In the siege of Nice, the arts and engines of antiquity were employed by the Latins. The mine and the battering ram, the tortoise, and the belfry or movable turret, artificial fire, and the catapult and ballast, the sling, and the crossbow for the casting of stones and darts. 7195 In the space of seven weeks much labor and blood were expended, and some progress, especially by Count Raymond, was made on the side of the besiegers. But the Turks could protract their resistance and secure their escape, as long as they were masters of the lake 7196 Ascanius, which stretches several miles to the westward of the city. The means of conquest were supplied by the prudence and industry of Alexius, a great number of boats was transported on sledges from the sea to the lake, they were filled with the most dexterous of his archers. The flight of the Sultana was intercepted, Nice was invested by land and water, and a Greek emissary persuaded the inhabitants to accept his master's protection, and to save themselves, by a timely surrender, from the rage of the savages of Europe. In the moment of victory, or at least of hope, the crusaders, thirsting for blood and plunder, were awed by the imperial banner that streamed from the citadel, 7197 and Alexius guarded with jealous vigilance this important conquest. The murmurs of the chiefs were stifled by honor or interest, and after a halt of nine days, they directed their march towards Phrygia under the guidance of a Greek general, whom they suspected of a secret connivance with the sultan. The consort and the principal servants of Solomon had been honorably restored without ransom, and the emperor's generosity to the miscreant 7198 was interpreted as treason to the Christian cause. Solomon was rather provoked than dismayed by the loss of his capital, he admonished his subjects and allies of this strange invasion of the western barbarians, the Turkish emirs obeyed the call of loyalty or religion. The Turkmen hordes encamped round his standard and his whole force is loosely stated by the Christians at 200, or even 360,000 horse. 
Yet he patiently waited till they had left behind them the sea and the Greek frontier, and hovering on the flanks, observed their careless and confident progress in two columns beyond the view of each other. Some miles before they could reach Dorylium in Phrygia, the left, and least numerous, division was surprised, and attacked, and almost oppressed, by the Turkish cavalry. 7199 The heat of the weather, the clouds of arrows, and the barbarous onset, overwhelmed the crusaders. They lost their order and confidence, and the fainting fight was sustained by the personal valor, rather than by the military conduct, of Bohemond, Tancred, and Robert of Normandy. They were revived by the welcome banners of Duke Godfrey, who flew to their succor, with the Count of Vermandois, and sixty thousand horse, and was followed by Raymond of Thales, the Bishop of Puy, and the remainder of the sacred army. Without a moment's pause, they formed in new order, and advanced to a second battle. They were received with equal resolution. And, in their common disdain for the unwarlike people of Greece and Asia, it was confessed on both sides, that the Turks and the Franks were the only nations entitled to the appellation of soldiers. 7200 Their encounter was varied, and balanced by the contrast of arms and discipline, of the direct charge and wheeling evolutions, of the couched lance and the brandished javelin, of a weighty broadsword and a crooked saber, of cumbrous armor and thin flowing robes, and of the long tartar bow and the arbalist or crossbow, a deadly weapon yet unknown to the Orientals. 7201 As long as the horses were fresh and the quivers full, Solomon maintained the advantage of the day, and four thousand Christians were pierced by the Turkish arrows. In the evening, swiftness yielded to strength, on either side, the numbers were equal or at least as great as any ground could hold, or any generals could manage. But in turning the hills, the last division of Raymond and his provincials was led, perhaps without design on the rear of an exhausted enemy, and the long contest was determined. Besides a nameless and unaccounted multitude, three thousand pagan knights were slain in the battle and pursuit, the camp of Solomon was pillaged. And in the variety of precious spoil, the curiosity of the Latins was amused with foreign arms and apparel, and the new aspect of dromedaries and camels. The importance of the victory was proved by the hasty retreat of the Sultan, reserving ten thousand guards of the relics of his army, Solomon evacuated the kingdom of Rome, and hastened to implore the aid, and kindle the resentment of his eastern brethren. In a march of five hundred miles, the crusaders traversed the lesser Asia, through a wasted land and deserted towns, without finding either a friend or an enemy. The geographer 7202 may trace the position of Dorylium, Antioch of Pisidia, Iconium, Archelais, and Germanicia, and may compare those classic appellations with the modern names of Eskishert the Old City, Oksher the White City, Cogni, Berekli, and Marash. As the pilgrims passed over a desert, where a draught of water is exchanged for silver, they were tormented by intolerable thirst. And on the banks of the first rivulet, their haste and intemperance were still more pernicious to the disorderly throng. They climbed with toil and danger the steep and slippery sides of Mount Taurus. Many of the soldiers cast away their arms to secure their footsteps, and had not terror preceded their van, the long and trembling file might have been driven down the precipice by a handful of resolute enemies. Two of their most respectable chiefs, the Duke of Lorraine and the Count of Thales, were carried in litters, Raymond was raised, as it is said by miracle, from a hopeless malady. And Godfrey had been torn by a bear, as he pursued that rough and perilous chase in the mountains of Pisidia. To improve the general consternation, the cousin of Bohemond and the brother of Godfrey were detached from the main army with their respective squadrons of five, and of seven, hundred knights. They overran in a rapid career the hills and sea coast of Cilicia, from Cogni to the Syrian gates, the Norman standard was first planted on the walls of Tarsus and Malmistra. But the proud injustice of Baldwin at length provoked the patient and generous Italian, and they turned their consecrated swords against each other in a private and profane quarrel. Honor was the motive, and fame the reward, of Tancred. But fortune smiled on the more selfish enterprise of his rival. 7203 He was called to the assistance of a Greek or Armenian tyrant, who had been suffered under the Turkish yoke to reign over the Christians of Edessa. Baldwin accepted the character of his son and champion, 
but no sooner was he introduced into the city, than he inflamed the people to the massacre of his father, occupied the throne and treasure. Extended his conquests over the hills of Armenia and the plain of Mesopotamia, and founded the first principality of the Franks or Latins, which subsisted fifty-four years beyond the Euphrates. 7204. Before the Franks could enter Syria, the summer, and even the autumn, were completely wasted, the siege of Antioch, or the separation and repose of the army during the winter season. Was strongly debated in their council, the love of arms and the holy sepulchre urged them to advance. And reason perhaps was on the side of resolution, since every hour of delay abates the fame and force of the invader, and multiplies the resources of defensive war. The capital of Syria was protected by the river Orontes. And the Iron Bridge, 7205 of nine arches, derives its name from the massy gates of the two towers which are constructed at either end. They were opened by the sword of the Duke of Normandy, his victory gave entrance to 300,000 crusaders, an account which may allow some scope for losses and desertion, but which clearly detects much exaggeration in the review of Nice. In the description of Antioch 7206 it is not easy to define a middle term between her ancient magnificence, under the successors of Alexander and Augustus, and the modern aspect of Turkish desolation. The Tetrapolis, or four cities, if they retained their name and position, must have left a large vacuity in a circumference of twelve miles. And that measure, as well as the number of four hundred towers, are not perfectly consistent with the five gates, so often mentioned in the history of the siege. Yet Antioch must have still flourished as a great and populous capital. At the head of the Turkish emirs, Begizhan, a veteran chief, commanded in the place, his garrison was composed of six or seven thousand horse, and fifteen or twenty thousand foot, one hundred thousand Moslems are said to have fallen by the sword. And their numbers were probably inferior to the Greeks, Armenians, and Syrians, who had been no more than fourteen years the slaves of the house of Seljuk. From the remains of a solid and stately wall, it appears to have arisen to the height of threescore feet in the valleys. And wherever less art and labor had been applied, the ground was supposed to be defended by the river, the morass, and the mountains. Notwithstanding these fortifications, the city had been repeatedly taken by the Persians, the Arabs, the Greeks, and the Turks, so large a circuit must have yielded many pervious points of attack. And in a siege that was formed about the middle of October, the vigor of the execution could alone justify the boldness of the attempt. Whatever strength and valor could perform in the field was abundantly discharged by the champions of the cross, in the frequent occasions of sallies, of forage, of the attack and defense of convoys, they were often victorious. And we can only complain, that their exploits are sometimes enlarged beyond the scale of probability and truth. The sword of Godfrey 7207 divided a Turk from the shoulder to the haunch. And one half of the infidel fell to the ground, while the other was transported by his horse to the city gate. As Robert of Normandy rode against his antagonist, I devote thy head, he piously exclaimed, to the demons of hell. And that head was instantly cloven to the breast by the resistless stroke of his descending falchion. But the reality or the report of such gigantic prowess 7208 must have taught the Moslems to keep within their walls, and against those walls of earth or stone, the sword and the lance were unavailing weapons. In the slow and successive labors of a siege, the crusaders were supine and ignorant, without skill to contrive, or money to purchase, or industry to use, the artificial engines and implements of assault. In the conquest of Nice, they had been powerfully assisted by the wealth and knowledge of the Greek emperor, his absence was poorly supplied by some Genoese and Pisan vessels. That were attracted by religion or trade to the coast of Syria, the stores were scanty, the return precarious, and the communication difficult and dangerous. Indolence or weakness had prevented the Franks from investing the entire circuit, and the perpetual freedom of two gates relieved the wants and recruited the garrison of the city. At the end of seven months, after the ruin of their cavalry, and an enormous loss by famine, desertion and fatigue, the progress of the crusaders was imperceptible, and their success remote, if the Latin Ulysses, the artful and ambitious Bohemian, had not employed the arms of cunning and deceit. The Christians of Antioch were numerous and discontented, 
Firaus, a Syrian renegado, had acquired the favor of the emir and the command of three towers. And the merit of his repentance disguised to the Latins, and perhaps to himself, the foul design of perfidy and treason. A secret correspondence, for their mutual interest, was soon established between Firaus and the Prince of Tarento. And Bohemond declared in the council of the chiefs, that he could deliver the city into their hands. 7209, but he claimed the sovereignty of Antioch as the reward of his service. And the proposal which had been rejected by the envy, was at length extorted from the distress, of his equals. The nocturnal surprise was executed by the French and Norman princes, who ascended in person the scaling ladders that were thrown from the walls, their new proselyte, after the murder of his too scrupulous brother. Embraced and introduced the servants of Christ. The army rushed through the gates, and the Moslems soon found, that although mercy was hopeless, resistance was impotent. But the citadel still refused to surrender. And the victims themselves were speedily encompassed and besieged by the innumerable forces of Kerboga, prince of Mosul, who, with twenty-eight Turkish emirs, advanced to the deliverance of Antioch. Five and twenty days the Christians spent on the verge of destruction, and the proud lieutenant of the caliph and the sultan left them only the choice of servitude or death. Seventy-two ten in this extremity they collected the relics of their strength, sallied from the town, and in a single memorable day, annihilated or dispersed the host of Turks and Arabians. Which they might safely report to have consisted of six hundred thousand men. Seventy-two eleven their supernatural allies I shall proceed to consider, the human causes of the victory of Antioch were the fearless despair of the Franks, and the surprise, the discord, perhaps the errors, of their unskillful and presumptuous adversaries. The battle is described with as much disorder as it was fought, but we may observe the tent of Kerboga, a movable and spacious palace, enriched with the luxury of Asia, and capable of holding above two thousand persons. We may distinguish his three thousand guards, who were cased, the horse as well as the men, in complete steel. In the eventful period of the siege and defense of Antioch, the crusaders were alternately exalted by victory or sunk in despair. Either swelled with plenty or emaciated with hunger. A speculative reasoner might suppose that their faith had a strong and serious influence on their practice. And that the soldiers of the cross, the deliverers of the holy sepulchre, prepared themselves by a sober and virtuous life for the daily contemplation of martyrdom. Experience blows away this charitable illusion. And seldom does the history of profane war display such scenes of intemperance and prostitution as were exhibited under the walls of Antioch. The grove of Daphne no longer flourished, but the Syrian air was still impregnated with the same vices. The Christians were seduced by every temptation 7212 that nature either prompts or reprobates, the authority of the chiefs was despised. And sermons and edicts were alike fruitless against those scandalous disorders, not less pernicious to military discipline, than repugnant to evangelic purity. In the first days of the siege and the possession of Antioch, the Franks consumed with wanton and thoughtless prodigality the frugal subsistence of weeks and months, the desolate country no longer yielded a supply. And from that country they were at length excluded by the arms of the besieging Turks. Disease, the faithful companion of want, was envenomed by the rains of the winter, the summer heats, unwholesome food, and the close imprisonment of multitudes. The pictures of famine and pestilence are always the same, and always disgustful, and our imagination may suggest the nature of their sufferings and their resources. The remains of treasure or spoil were eagerly lavished in the purchase of the vilest nourishment. And dreadful must have been the calamities of the poor, since, after paying three marks of silver for a goat and fifteen for a lean camel, seventy-two thirteen the Count of Flanders was reduced to beg a dinner, and Duke Godfrey to borrow a horse. Sixty thousand horse had been reviewed in the camp, before the end of the siege they were diminished to two thousand, and scarcely two hundred fit for service could be mustered on the day of battle. Weakness of body and terror of mind extinguished the ardent enthusiasm of the pilgrims, and every motive of honor and religion was subdued by the desire of life. 7214 Among the chiefs, three heroes may be found without fear or reproach, Godfrey of Bouillon was supported by his magnanimous piety, Bohemond by ambition and interest. And Tancred declared, in the true spirit of chivalry, 
that as long as he was at the head of forty knights, he would never relinquish the enterprise of Palestine. But the Count of Thales and Provence was suspected of a voluntary indisposition. The Duke of Normandy was recalled from the seashore by the censures of the Church. Hugh the Great, though he led the vanguard of the battle, embraced an ambiguous opportunity of returning to France and Stephen, Count of Chartres. Basely deserted the standard which he bore, and the council in which he presided. The soldiers were discouraged by the flight of William, Viscount of Mellon, surnamed the Carpenter, from the weighty strokes of his axe. And the saints were scandalized by the fall 7215 of Peter the Hermit, who, after arming Europe against Asia, attempted to escape from the penance of a necessary fast. Of the multitude of recreant warriors, the names, says an historian, are blotted from the Book of Life, and the opprobrious epithet of the rope dancers was applied to the deserters who dropped in the night from the walls of Antioch. The Emperor Alexius 7216 who seemed to advance to the succor of the Latins, was dismayed by the assurance of their hopeless condition. They expected their fate in silent despair, oaths and punishments were tried without effect. And to rouse the soldiers to the defense of the walls, it was found necessary to set fire to their quarters. For their salvation and victory, they were indebted to the same fanaticism which had led them to the brink of ruin. In such a cause, and in such an army, visions, prophecies, and miracles, were frequent and familiar. In the distress of Antioch, they were repeated with unusual energy and success, st. Ambrose had assured a pious ecclesiastic, that two years of trial must precede the season of deliverance and grace, the deserters were stopped by the presence and reproaches of Christ himself. The dead had promised to arise and combat with their brethren, the virgin had obtained the pardon of their sins, and their confidence was revived by a visible sign, the seasonable and splendid discovery of the Holy Lance. The policy of their chiefs has on this occasion been admired, and might surely be excused, but a pious fraud is seldom produced by the cool conspiracy of many persons. And a voluntary impostor might depend on the support of the wise and the credulity of the people. Of the diocese of Marseilles, there was a priest of low cunning and loose manners, and his name was Peter Bartholomew. He presented himself at the door of the council chamber, to disclose an apparition of St. Andrew, which had been thrice reiterated in his sleep with a dreadful menace, if he presumed to suppress the commands of heaven. At Antioch, said the Apostle, in the church of my brother St. Peter, near the high altar, is concealed the steel head of the lance that pierced the side of our Redeemer. In three days that instrument of eternal, and now of temporal, salvation, will be manifested to his disciples. Search, and ye shall find, bear it aloft in battle, and that mystic weapon shall penetrate the souls of the miscreants. The Pope's legate, the Bishop of Puy, affected to listen with coldness and distrust, but the revelation was eagerly accepted by Count Raymond, whom his faithful subject, in the name of the Apostle, had chosen for the guardian of the Holy Lance. The experiment was resolved, and on the third day after a due preparation of prayer and fasting, the priest of Marseilles introduced twelve trusty spectators, among whom were the Count and his chaplain. And the church doors were barred against the impetuous multitude. The ground was opened in the appointed place, but the workmen, who relieved each other, dug to the depth of twelve feet without discovering the object of their search. In the evening, when Count Raymond had withdrawn to his post, and the weary assistants began to murmur, Bartholomew, in his shirt, and without his shoes, boldly descended into the pit. The darkness of the hour and of the place enabled him to secrete and deposit the head of a Saracen lance, and the first sound, the first gleam, of the steel was saluted with a devout rapture. The holy lance was drawn from its recess, wrapped in a veil of silk and gold, and exposed to the veneration of the crusaders. Their anxious suspense burst forth in a general shout of joy and hope, and the desponding troops were again inflamed with the enthusiasm of valor. Whatever had been the arts, and whatever might be the sentiments of the chiefs, they skillfully improved this fortunate revolution by every aid that discipline and devotion could afford. The soldiers were dismissed to their quarters with an injunction to fortify their minds and bodies for the approaching conflict, freely to bestow their last pittance on themselves and their horses and to expect with the dawn of day the signal of victory. On the festival of St. Peter and St. Paul, the gates of Antioch were thrown open, 
a martial psalm, Let the Lord arise, and let his enemies be scattered, was chanted by a procession of priests and monks. The battle array was marshaled in twelve divisions, in honor of the twelve apostles, and the holy lance, in the absence of Raymond, was entrusted to the hands of his chaplain. The influence of his relic or trophy, was felt by the servants, and perhaps by the enemies, of Christ, 7217 and its potent energy was heightened by an accident, a stratagem, or a rumor, of a miraculous complexion. Three knights, in white garments and resplendent arms, either issued, or seemed to issue, from the hills, the voice of Adhemer, the Pope's legate, proclaimed them as the martyrs St. George, St. Theodore, and St. Maurice. The tumult of battle allowed no time for doubt or scrutiny, and the welcome apparition dazzled the eyes or the imagination of a fanatic army. 7218 In the season of danger and triumph, the revelation of Bartholomew of Marseilles was unanimously asserted. But as soon as the temporary service was accomplished, the personal dignity and liberal arms which the Count of Thales derived from the custody of the Holy Lance, provoked the envy, and awakened the reason, of his rivals. A Norman clerk presumed to sift, with a philosophic spirit, the truth of the legend, the circumstances of the discovery, and the character of the prophet. And the pious Bohemian ascribed their deliverance to the merits and intercession of Christ alone. For a while, the provincials defended their national palladium with clamors and arms and new visions condemned to death and hell the profane skeptics who presumed to scrutinize the truth and merit of the discovery. The prevalence of incredulity compelled the author to submit his life and veracity to the judgment of God. A pile of dry faggots, four feet high and fourteen long, was erected in the midst of the camp. The flames burnt fiercely to the elevation of thirty cubits, and a narrow path of twelve inches was left for the perilous trial. The unfortunate priest of Marseilles traversed the fire with dexterity and speed. But the thighs and belly were scorched by the intense heat. He expired the next day, 7219 and the logic of believing minds will pay some regard to his dying protestations of innocence and truth. Some efforts were made by the provincials to substitute a cross, a ring, or a tabernacle, in the place of the holy lance, which soon vanished in contempt and oblivion. 7220 Yet the revelation of Antioch is gravely asserted by succeeding historians, and such is the progress of credulity, that miracles most doubtful on the spot, and at the moment, will be received with implicit faith at a convenient distance of time and space. The prudence or fortune of the Franks had delayed their invasion till the decline of the Turkish Empire. 7221 Under the manly government of the three first sultans, the kingdoms of Asia were united in peace and justice. And the innumerable armies which they led in person were equal in courage, and superior in discipline, to the barbarians of the West. But at the time of the Crusade, the inheritance of Malek Shah was disputed by his four sons. Their private ambition was insensible of the public danger, and, in the vicissitudes of their fortune, the royal vassals were ignorant, or regardless, of the true object of their allegiance. The twenty-eight emirs who marched with the standard or kerboga were his rivals or enemies, their hasty levies were drawn from the towns and tents of Mesopotamia and Syria. And the Turkish veterans were employed or consumed in the civil wars beyond the Tigris. The Caliph of Egypt embraced this opportunity of weakness and discord to recover his ancient possessions. And his Sultan Abdul besieged Jerusalem and Tyre, expelled the children of Ortak, and restored in Palestine the civil and ecclesiastical authority of the Fatimites. 7222 They heard with astonishment of the vast armies of Christians that had passed from Europe to Asia, and rejoiced in the sieges and battles which broke the power of the Turks, the adversaries of their sect and monarchy. But the same Christians were the enemies of the Prophet, and from the overthrow of Nice and Antioch, the motive of their enterprise, which was gradually understood, would urge them forwards to the banks of the Jordan, or perhaps of the Nile. An intercourse of epistles and embassies, which rose and fell with the events of war, was maintained between the throne of Cairo and the camp of the Latins, and their adverse pride was the result of ignorance and enthusiasm. The ministers of Egypt declared in a haughty, or insinuated in a milder, tone, that their sovereign, the true and lawful commander of the faithful, had rescued Jerusalem from the Turkish yoke. 
and that the pilgrims, if they would divide their numbers, and lay aside their arms, should find a safe and hospitable reception at the sepulchre of Jesus. In the belief of their lost condition, the Caliph Most Ali despised their arms and imprisoned their deputies, the conquest and victory of Antioch prompted him to solicit those formidable champions with gifts of horses and silk robes, of vases, and purses of gold and silver. And in his estimate of their merit or power, the first place was assigned to Bohemond, and the second to Godfrey. In either fortune, the answer of the crusaders was firm and uniform, they disdained to inquire into the private claims or possessions of the followers of Muhammad, whatsoever was his name or nation, the usurper of Jerusalem was their enemy. And instead of prescribing the mode and terms of their pilgrimage, it was only by a timely surrender of the city and province, their sacred right, that he could deserve their alliance, or deprecate their impending and irresistible attack. 7223. Yet this attack, when they were within the view and reach of their glorious prize, was suspended above ten months after the defeat of Kerboga. The zeal and courage of the crusaders were chilled in the moment of victory. And instead of marching to improve the consternation, they hastily dispersed to enjoy the luxury, of Syria. The causes of this strange delay may be found in the want of strength and subordination. In the painful and various service of Antioch, the cavalry was annihilated, many thousands of every rank had been lost by famine, sickness, and desertion, the same abuse of plenty had been productive of a third famine. And the alternative of intemperance and distress had generated a pestilence, which swept away above fifty thousand of the pilgrims. Few were able to command, and none were willing to obey. The domestic feuds, which had been stifled by common fear, were again renewed in acts, or at least in sentiments, of hostility, the fortune of Baldwin and Bohemond excited the envy of their companions. The bravest knights were enlisted for the defense of their new principalities, and Count Raymond exhausted his troops and treasures in an idle expedition into the heart of Syria. 7224 The winter was consumed in discord and disorder. A sense of honor and religion was rekindled in the spring, and the private soldiers, less susceptible of ambition and jealousy, awakened with angry clamors the indolence of their chiefs. In the month of May, the relics of this mighty host proceeded from Antioch to Laodicea, about forty thousand Latins, of whom no more than fifteen hundred horse, and twenty thousand foot, were capable of immediate service. Their easy march was continued between Mount Libanus and the seashore, their wants were liberally supplied by the coasting traders of Genoa and Pisa. And they drew large contributions from the emirs of Tripoli, Tyre, Sidon, Acre, and Caesarea, who granted a free passage, and promised to follow the example of Jerusalem. From Caesarea they advanced into the Midland country. Their clerks recognized the sacred geography of Lydda, Ramla, Emmaus, and Bethlehem 7225 and as soon as they described the holy city, the crusaders forgot their toils and claimed their reward. 7226 Jerusalem has derived some reputation from the number and importance of her memorable sieges. It was not till after a long and obstinate contest that Babylon and Rome could prevail against the obstinacy of the people, the craggy ground that might supersede the necessity of fortifications. And the walls and towers that would have fortified the most accessible plain. 7227 These obstacles were diminished in the age of the Crusades. The bulwarks had been completely destroyed and imperfectly restored, the Jews, their nation, and worship, were forever banished. But nature is less changeable than man, and the sight of Jerusalem, though somewhat softened and somewhat removed, was still strong against the assaults of an enemy. By the experience of a recent siege, and a three years' possession, the Saracens of Egypt had been taught to discern, and in some degree to remedy, the defects of a place, which religion as well as honor forbade them to resign. Aladdin, or Iftikar, the Caliph's lieutenant, was entrusted with the defense, his policy strove to restrain the native Christians by the dread of their own ruin and that of the Holy Sepulchre. To animate the Moslems by the assurance of temporal and eternal rewards. His garrison is said to have consisted of 40,000 Turks and Arabians. And if he could muster 20,000 of the inhabitants, it must be confessed that the besieged were more numerous than the besieging army. 
7228 had the diminished strength and numbers of the Latins allowed them to grasp the whole circumference of 4,000 yards, about two English miles and a half. 7229 To what useful purpose should they have descended into the valley of Ben Hinnom and Torrent of Cedron, 7230 or approached the precipices of the south and east, from whence they had nothing either to hope or fear? Their siege was more reasonably directed against the northern and western sides of the city. Godfrey of Bullion erected his standard on the first swell of Mount Calvary, to the left, as far as St. Stephen's Gate, the line of attack was continued by Tancred and the two Roberts, and Count Raymond established his quarters from the citadel to the foot of Mount Shown, which was no longer included within the precincts of the city. On the fifth day, the Crusaders made a general assault, in the fanatic hope of battering down the walls without engines, and of scaling them without ladders. By the dint of brutal force, they burst the first barrier. But they were driven back with shame and slaughter to the camp, the influence of vision and prophecy was deadened by the too frequent abuse of those pious stratagems, and time and labor were found to be the only means of victory. The time of the siege was indeed fulfilled in forty days, but they were forty days of calamity and anguish. A repetition of the old complaint of famine may be imputed in some degree to the voracious or disorderly appetite of the Franks. But the stony soil of Jerusalem is almost destitute of water, the scanty springs and hasty torrents were dry in the summer season, nor was the thirst of the besiegers relieved, as in the city, by the artificial supply of cisterns and aqueducts. The circumjacent country is equally destitute of trees for the uses of shade or building, but some large beams were discovered in a cave by the crusaders, a wood near Sikhem, the enchanted grove of Tasso. 7231 was cut down, the necessary timber was transported to the camp by the vigor and dexterity of Tancred. And the engines were framed by some Genoese artists, who had fortunately landed in the harbor of Jaffa. Two movable turrets were constructed at the expense, and in the stations, of the Duke of Lorraine and the Count of Thales, and rolled forwards with devout labor, not to the most accessible, but to the most neglected, parts of the fortification. Raymond's tower was reduced to ashes by the fire of the besieged, but his colleague was more vigilant and successful, 7232 the enemies were driven by his archers from the rampart, the drawbridge was let down. And on a Friday, at three in the afternoon, the day and hour of the Passion, Godfrey of Bullion stood victorious on the walls of Jerusalem. His example was followed on every side by the emulation of valor. And about 460 years after the conquest of Omar, the holy city was rescued from the Mahometan yoke. In the pillage of public and private wealth, the adventurers had agreed to respect the exclusive property of the first occupant. And the spoils of the great mosque, Seventy lamps and massy vases of gold and silver rewarded the diligence and displayed the generosity of Tancred. A bloody sacrifice was offered by his mistaken votaries to the God of the Christians, resistance might provoke, but neither age nor sex could mollify their implacable rage. They indulged themselves three days in a promiscuous massacre. 7233 And the infection of the dead bodies produced an epidemical disease. After seventy thousand Moslems had been put to the sword, and the harmless Jews had been burnt in their synagogue, they could still reserve a multitude of captives, whom interest or lassitude persuaded them to spare. Of these savage heroes of the cross, Tancred alone betrayed some sentiments of compassion, yet we may praise the more selfish lenity of Raymond, who granted a capitulation and safe conduct to the garrison of the citadel. 7234 The Holy Sepulchre was now free, and the bloody victors prepared to accomplish their vow. Bareheaded and barefoot, with contrite hearts, and in an humble posture, they ascended the hill of Calvary, amidst the loud anthems of the clergy. Kissed the stone which had covered the Saviour of the world, and bedewed with tears of joy and penitence the monument of their redemption. This union of the fiercest and most tender passions has been variously considered by two philosophers. By the one, 7235 as easy and natural, by the other, 7236 as absurd and incredible. Perhaps it is too rigorously applied to the same persons and the same hour, the example of the virtuous Godfrey awakened the piety of his companions. While they cleansed their bodies, they purified their minds, 
nor shall I believe that the most ardent in slaughter and rapine were the foremost in the procession to the Holy Sepulchre. Eight days after this memorable event, which Pope Urban did not live to hear, the Latin chiefs proceeded to the election of a king, to guard and govern their conquests in Palestine. Hugh the Great, and Stephen of Chartres, had retired with some loss of reputation, which they strove to regain by a second crusade and an honorable death. Baldwin was established at Edessa, and Bohemond at Antioch. And two Roberts, the Duke of Normandy 7237 and the Count of Flanders, preferred their fair inheritance in the West to a doubtful competition or a barren scepter. The jealousy and ambition of Raymond were condemned by his own followers, and the free, the just, the unanimous voice of the army proclaimed Godfrey of Bouillon the first and most worthy of the champions of Christendom. His magnanimity accepted a trust as full of danger as of glory, but in a city where his saviour had been crowned with thorns, the devout pilgrim rejected the name and ensigns of royalty. And the founder of the kingdom of Jerusalem contented himself with the modest title of defender and baron of the holy sepulchre. His government of a single year, 7238 too short for the public happiness, was interrupted in the first fortnight by a summons to the field, by the approach of the vizier or sultan of Egypt, who had been too slow to prevent. But who was impatient to avenge, the loss of Jerusalem? His total overthrow in the Battle of Ascalon sealed the establishment of the Latins in Syria, and signalized the valor of the French princes who in this action bade a long farewell to the holy wars. Some glory might be derived from the prodigious inequality of numbers, though I shall not count the myriads of horse and foot 7239 on the side of the Fatimites. But, except three thousand Ethiopians or blacks, who were armed with flails or scourges of iron, the barbarians of the south fled on the first onset. And afforded a pleasing comparison between the active valor of the Turks and the sloth and effeminacy of the natives of Egypt. After suspending before the Holy Sepulchre the sword and standard of the Sultan, the new king, he deserves the title, embraced his departing companions, and could retain only with the gallant Tancred three hundred knights. And two thousand foot soldiers for the defense of Palestine. His sovereignty was soon attacked by a new enemy, the only one against whom Godfrey was a coward. Adhemer, Bishop of Puy, who excelled both in counsel and action, had been swept away in the last plague at Antioch, the remaining ecclesiastics preserved only the pride and avarice of their character. And their seditious clamors had required that the choice of a bishop should precede that of a king. The revenue and jurisdiction of the lawful patriarch were usurped by the Latin clergy, the exclusion of the Greeks and Syrians was justified by the reproach of heresy or schism. 7240 and under the iron yoke of their deliverers, the Oriental Christians regretted the tolerating government of the Arabian Caliphs. Dainbert, Archbishop of Pisa, had long been trained in the secret policy of Rome, he brought a fleet at his countrymen to the succor of the Holy Land, and was installed, without a competitor, the spiritual and temporal head of the Church. 7241 The new patriarch 7242 immediately grasped the scepter which had been acquired by the toil and blood of the victorious pilgrims, and both Godfrey and Bohemond submitted to receive at his hands the investiture of their feudal possessions. Nor was this sufficient, Dainbert claimed the immediate property of Jerusalem and Jaffa, instead of a firm and generous refusal, the hero negotiated with the priest, a quarter of either city was ceded to the church. And the modest bishop was satisfied with an eventual reversion of the rest, on the death of Godfrey without children, or on the future acquisition of a new seat at Cairo or Damascus. Without this indulgence, the conqueror would have almost been stripped of his infant kingdom, which consisted only of Jerusalem and Jaffa, with about twenty villages and towns of the adjacent country. 7243 Within this narrow verge, the Mohammedans were still lodged in some impregnable castles, and the husbandman, the trader, and the pilgrim, were exposed to daily and domestic hostility. By the arms of Godfrey himself, and of the two Baldwins, his brother and cousin, who succeeded to the throne, the Latins breathed with more ease and safety. And at length they equaled, in the extent of their dominions, though not in the millions of their subjects, the ancient princes of Judah and Israel. 7244 After the reduction of the maritime cities of Laodicea, Tripoli, 
Tyre, and Ascalon 7245 which were powerfully assisted by the fleets of Venice, Genoa, and Pisa, and even of Flanders and Norway. 7246 The range of seacoast from Skanderun to the borders of Egypt was possessed by the Christian pilgrims. If the Prince of Antioch disclaimed his supremacy, the Counts of Edessa and Tripoli owned themselves the vassals of the King of Jerusalem, the Latins reigned beyond the Euphrates. And the four cities of Hems, Hama, Damascus, and Aleppo, were the only relics of the Mahometan conquests in Syria. 7247 The laws and language, the manners and titles, of the French nation and Latin church, were introduced into these transmarine colonies. According to the feudal jurisprudence, the principal states and subordinate baronies descended in the line of male and female succession, 7248 but the children of the first conquerors, 7249 a motley and degenerate race, were dissolved by the luxury of the climate. The arrival of new crusaders from Europe was a doubtful hope and a casual event. The service of the feudal tenure 7250 was performed by 666 knights, who might expect the aid of 200 more under the banner of the Count of Tripoli. And each knight was attended to the field by four squires or archers on horseback. 7251 5070 sergeants, most probably foot soldiers, were supplied by the churches and cities. And the whole legal militia of the kingdom could not exceed 11,000 men, a slender defense against the surrounding myriads of Saracens and Turks. 7252 But the firmest bulwark of Jerusalem was founded on the Knights of the Hospital of Esti. John, 7253 and of the Temple of Solomon, 7254 on the strange association of a monastic and military life, which fanaticism might suggest, but which policy must approve. The flower of the nobility of Europe aspired to wear the cross, and to profess the vows, of these respectable orders, their spirit and discipline were immortal. And the speedy donation of twenty-eight thousand farms, or manors, 7255 enabled them to support a regular force of cavalry and infantry for the defense of Palestine. The austerity of the convent soon evaporated in the exercise of arms. The world was scandalized by the pride, avarice, and corruption of these Christian soldiers, their claims of immunity and jurisdiction disturbed the harmony of the church and state, and the public peace was endangered by their jealous emulation. But in their most dissolute period, the knights of their hospital and temple maintained their fearless and fanatic character, they neglected to live, but they were prepared to die, in the service of Christ. And the spirit of chivalry, the parent and offspring of the Crusades, has been transplanted by this institution from the Holy Sepulchre to the Isle of Malta. 7256. The spirit of freedom, which pervades the feudal institutions, was felt in its strongest energy by the volunteers of the cross, who elected for their chief the most deserving of his peers. Amidst the slaves of Asia, unconscious of the lesson or example, a model of political liberty was introduced, and the laws of the French kingdom are derived from the purest source of equality and justice. Of such laws, the first and indispensable condition is the assent of those whose obedience they require, and for whose benefit they are designed. No sooner had Godfrey of Bouillon accepted the office of supreme magistrate, than he solicited the public and private advice of the Latin pilgrims, who were the best skilled in the statutes and customs of Europe. From these materials, with the counsel and approbation of the patriarch and barons, of the clergy and laity, Godfrey composed the Assize of Jerusalem 7257 a precious monument of feudal jurisprudence. The new code, attested by the seals of the king, the patriarch, and the viscount of Jerusalem, was deposited in the holy sepulchre, enriched with the improvements of succeeding times. And respectfully consulted as often as any doubtful question arose in the tribunals of Palestine. With the kingdom and city all was lost, 7258 The fragments of the written law were preserved by jealous tradition 7259 in variable practice till the middle of the 13th century, the code was restored by the pen of John D. Ibelin, Count of Jaffa. One of the principal feudatories. 7260 And the final revision was accomplished in the year 1369, for the use of the Latin kingdom of Cyprus. 7261 the justice and freedom of the constitution were maintained by two tribunals of unequal dignity, which were instituted by Godfrey of Bouillon after the conquest of Jerusalem. 
The king, in person, presided in the upper court, the court of the barons. Of these the four most conspicuous were the prince of Galilee, the lord of Sidon and Caesarea, and the counts of Jaffa and Tripoli, who, perhaps with the constable and marshal, 7262 were in a special manner the compeers and judges of each other. But all the nobles, who held their lands immediately of the crown, were entitled and bound to attend the king's court, and each baron exercised a similar jurisdiction on the subordinate assemblies of his own feudatories. The connection of lord and vassal was honorable and voluntary, reverence was due to the benefactor, protection to the dependent, but they mutually pledged their faith to each other. And the obligation on either side might be suspended by neglect or dissolved by injury. The cognizance of marriages and testaments was blended with religion, and usurped by the clergy, but the civil and criminal causes of the nobles, the inheritance and tenure of their fiefs, formed the proper occupation of the supreme court. Each member was the judge and guardian both of public and private rights. It was his duty to assert with his tongue and sword the lawful claims of the Lord. But if an unjust superior presumed to violate the freedom or property of a vassal, the confederate peers stood forth to maintain his quarrel by word and deed. They boldly affirmed his innocence and his wrongs. Demanded the restitution of his liberty or his lands, suspended, after a fruitless demand, their own service, rescued their brother from prison. And employed every weapon in his defense, without offering direct violence to the person of their lord, which was ever sacred in their eyes. 7263 In their pleadings, replies, and rejoinders, the advocates of the court were subtle and copious. But the use of argument and evidence was often superseded by judicial combat, and the Assize of Jerusalem admits in many cases this barbarous institution, which has been slowly abolished by the laws and manners of Europe. The trial by battle was established in all criminal cases which affected the life, or limb, or honor, of any person, and in all civil transactions, of or above the value of one mark of silver. It appears that in criminal cases the combat was the privilege of the accuser, who, except in a charge of treason, avenged his personal injury, or the death of those persons whom he had a right to represent. But wherever, from the nature of the charge, testimony could be obtained, it was necessary for him to produce witnesses of the fact. In civil cases, the combat was not allowed as the means of establishing the claim of the demandant. But he was obliged to produce witnesses who had, or assumed to have, knowledge of the fact. The combat was then the privilege of the defendant, because he charged the witness with an attempt by perjury to take away his right. He came therefore to be in the same situation as the appellant in criminal cases. It was not then as a mode of proof that the combat was received, nor as making negative evidence, according to the supposition of Montesquieu. 7264 But in every case the right to offer battle was founded on the right to pursue by arms the redress of an injury, and the judicial combat was fought on the same principle, and with the same spirit, as a private duel. Champions were only allowed to women, and to men maimed or past the age of sixty. The consequence of a defeat was death to the person accused, or to the champion or witness, as well as to the accuser himself, but in civil cases, the demandant was punished with infamy and the loss of his suit. While his witness and champion suffered ignominious death. In many cases it was in the option of the judge to award or to refuse the combat, but two are specified, in which it was the inevitable result of the challenge. If a faithful vassal gave the lie to his compeer, who unjustly claimed any portion of their lord's domains, or if an unsuccessful suitor presumed to impeach the judgment and veracity of the court. He might impeach them, but the terms were severe and perilous, in the same day he successively fought all the members of the tribunal, even those who had been absent, a single defeat was followed by death and infamy. And where none could hope for victory, it is highly probable that none would adventure the trial. In the Assize of Jerusalem, the legal subtlety of the Count of Jaffa is more laudably employed to elude, than to facilitate, the judicial combat, which he derives from a principle of honor rather than of superstition. 7265. Among the causes which enfranchise the plebeians from the yoke of feudal tyranny, the institution of cities and corporations is one of the most powerful. 
And if those of Palestine are coeval with the First Crusade, they may be ranked with the most ancient of the Latin world. Many of the pilgrims had escaped from their lords under the banner of the cross. And it was the policy of the French princes to tempt their stay by the assurance of the rights and privileges of freemen. It is expressly declared in the Assize of Jerusalem, that after instituting, for his knights and barons, the court of peers, in which he presided himself, Godfrey of Bouillon established a second tribunal, in which his person was represented by his viscount. The jurisdiction of this inferior court extended over the burgesses of the kingdom. And it was composed of a select number of the most discreet and worthy citizens, who were sworn to judge, according to the laws of the actions and fortunes of their equals. 7266 In the conquest and settlement of new cities, the example of Jerusalem was imitated by the kings and their great vassals, and above thirty similar corporations were founded before the loss of the Holy Land. Another class of subjects, the Syrians 7267 or Oriental Christians, were oppressed by the zeal of the clergy, and protected by the toleration of the state. Godfrey listened to their reasonable prayer, that they might be judged by their own national laws. A third court was instituted for their use, of limited and domestic jurisdiction, the sworn members were Syrians, in blood, language, and religion. But the office of the president, in Arabic, of the rice, was sometimes exercised by the viscount of the city. At an immeasurable distance below the nobles, the burgesses, and the strangers, the assize of Jerusalem condescends to mention the villains and slaves, the peasants of the land and the captives of war, who were almost equally considered as the objects of property. The relief or protection of these unhappy men was not esteemed worthy of the care of the legislator, but he diligently provides for the recovery, though not indeed for the punishment, of the fugitives. Like hounds, or hawks, who had strayed from the lawful owner, they might be lost and claimed, the slave and falcon were of the same value, but three slaves, or twelve oxen, were accumulated to equal the price of the warhorse. And a sum of three hundred pieces of gold was fixed, in the age of chivalry, as the equivalent of the more noble animal. Point seventy-two sixty-eight. LAX, The Crusades. Preservation of the Greek Empire. Numbers, passage, and event, of the Second and Third Crusades. St. Bernard. Reign of Saladin in Egypt and Syria. His conquest of Jerusalem. Naval Crusades. Richard I of England. Pope Innocent III, and the Fourth and Fifth Crusades. The Emperor Frederick II. Louis IX of France, and the two last Crusades. Expulsion of the Latins or Franks by the Mamelukes. In a style less grave than that of history, I should perhaps compare the Emperor Alexius 7269 to the jackal, who is said to follow the steps, and to devour the leavings, of the lion. Whatever had been his fears and toils in the passage of the First Crusade, they were amply recompensed by the subsequent benefits which he derived from the exploits of the Franks. His dexterity and vigilance secured their first conquest of Nice. And from this threatening station the Turks were compelled to evacuate the neighborhood of Constantinople. While the crusaders, with blind valor, advanced into the midland countries of Asia, the crafty Greek improved the favorable occasion when the emirs of the seacoast were recalled to the standard of the sultan. The Turks were driven from the isles of Rhodes and Chios, the cities of Ephesus and Smyrna, of Sardes, Philadelphia, and Laodicea, were restored to the empire, which Alexius enlarged from the Hellespont to the banks of the Meander. And the rocky shores of Pamphylia. The churches resumed their splendor, the towns were rebuilt and fortified, and the desert country was peopled with colonies of Christians, who were gently removed from the more distant and dangerous frontier. In these paternal cares, we may forgive Alexius, if he forgot the deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre, but, by the Latins, he was stigmatized with the foul reproach of treason and desertion. They had sworn fidelity and obedience to his throne. But he had promised to assist their enterprise in person, or, at least, with his troops and treasures, his base retreat dissolved their obligations. And the sword, which had been the instrument of their victory, was the pledge and title of their just independence. It does not appear that the emperor attempted to revive his obsolete claims over the kingdom of Jerusalem. 7270 But the borders of Cilicia and Syria were more recent in his possession, and more accessible to his arms. 
the great army of the Crusaders was annihilated or dispersed. The principality of Antioch was left without a head, by the surprise and captivity of Bohemond, his ransom had oppressed him with a heavy debt, and his Norman followers were insufficient to repel the hostilities of the Greeks and Turks. In this distress, Bohemond embraced a magnanimous resolution, of leaving the defense of Antioch to his kinsman, the faithful Tancred, of arming the West against the Byzantine Empire and of executing the design which he inherited from the lessons and example of his father Giscar. His embarkation was clandestine, and, if we may credit a tale of the princess and, he passed the hostile sea closely secreted in a coffin. 7271 But his reception in France was dignified by the public applause, and his marriage with the king's daughter, his return was glorious, since the bravest spirits of the age enlisted under his veteran command and he repassed the Adriatic at the head of five thousand horse and forty thousand foot, assembled from the most remote climates of Europe. 7272 The strength of Durazzo, and prudence of Alexius, the progress of famine and approach of winter, eluded his ambitious hopes, and the venal confederates were seduced from his standard. A treaty of peace 7273 suspended the fears of the Greeks. And they were finally delivered by the death of an adversary, whom neither oaths could bind, nor dangers could appall, nor prosperity could satiate. His children succeeded to the principality of Antioch. But the boundaries were strictly defined, the homage was clearly stipulated, and the cities of Tarsus and Malmistra were restored to the Byzantine emperors. Of the coast of Anatolia, they possessed the entire circuit from Trebizond to the Syrian gates. The Seljukian dynasty of Rum 7274 was separated on all sides from the sea and their Muslim brethren. The power of the Sultan was shaken by the victories and even the defeats of the Franks, and after the loss of Nice, they removed their throne to Cogni or Iconium, an obscure and inland town above 300 miles from Constantinople. 7275 Instead of trembling for their capital, the Comnenian princes waged an offensive war against the Turks, and the First Crusade prevented the fall of the declining empire. In the 12th century, three great emigrations marched by land from the west for the relief of Palestine. The soldiers and pilgrims of Lombardy, France, and Germany were excited by the example and success of the First Crusade. 7276 48 years after the deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre, the Emperor, and the French King, Conrad III and Louis VII, undertook the Second Crusade to support the falling fortunes of the Latins. 7277 A Grand Division of the Third Crusade was led by the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, 7278 who sympathized with his brothers of France and England in the common loss of Jerusalem. These three expeditions may be compared in their resemblance of the greatness of numbers, their passage through the Greek Empire, and the nature and event of their Turkish warfare, and a brief parallel may save the repetition of a tedious narrative. However splendid it may seem, a regular story of the Crusades would exhibit the perpetual return of the same causes and effects. And the frequent attempts for the defense or recovery of the Holy Land would appear so many faint and unsuccessful copies of the original. I. Of the swarms that so closely trod in the footsteps of the first pilgrims, the chiefs were equal in rank, though unequal in fame and merit, to Godfrey of Bouillon and his fellow adventurers. At their head were displayed the banners of the Dukes of Burgundy, Bavaria, and Aquitaine. The first a descendant of Hugh Capet, the second, a father of the Brunswick line, the Archbishop of Milan, a temporal prince, transported, for the benefit of the Turks, the treasures and ornaments of his church and palace. And the veteran crusaders, Hugh the Great and Stephen of Chartres, returned to consummate their unfinished vow. The huge and disorderly bodies of their followers moved forward in two columns. And if the first consisted of 260,000 persons, the second might possibly amount to 60,000 horse and 100,000 foot. 7279 7280 The armies of the Second Crusade might have claimed the conquest of Asia. The nobles of France and Germany were animated by the presence of their sovereigns. And both the rank and personal character of Conrad and Louis gave a dignity to their cause, and a discipline to their force, which might be vainly expected from the feudatory chiefs. The cavalry of the emperor, and that of the king, 
was each composed of seventy thousand knights, and their immediate attendants in the field. 7281 And if the light-armed troops, the peasant infantry, the women and children, the priests and monks, be rigorously excluded, the full account will scarcely be satisfied with four hundred thousand souls. The West, from Rome to Britain, was called into action, the kings of Poland and Bohemia obeyed the summons of Conrad. And it is affirmed by the Greeks and Latins, that, in the passage of a strait or river, the Byzantine agents, after a tale of nine hundred thousand, desisted from the endless and formidable computation. 7282 In the Third Crusade, as the French and English preferred the navigation of the Mediterranean, the host of Frederick Barbarossa was less numerous. Fifteen thousand knights, and as many squires, were the flower of the German chivalry, sixty thousand horse, and one hundred thousand foot, were mustered by the emperor in the plains of Hungary. And after such repetitions, we shall no longer be startled at the six hundred thousand pilgrims, which credulity has ascribed to this last emigration. 7283 Such extravagant reckonings prove only the astonishment of contemporaries. But their astonishment most strongly bears testimony to the existence of an enormous, though indefinite, multitude. The Greeks might applaud their superior knowledge of the arts and stratagems of war, but they confessed the strength and courage of the French cavalry, and the infantry of the Germans. 7284 And the strangers are described as an iron race, of gigantic stature, who darted fire from their eyes, and spilt blood like water on the ground. Under the banners of Conrad, a troop of females rode in the attitude and armor of men. And the chief of these Amazons, from her gilt spurs and buskins, obtained the epithet of the golden-footed dame. 2. The number and character of the strangers was an object of terror to the effeminate Greeks, and the sentiment of fear is nearly allied to that of hatred. This aversion was suspended or softened by the apprehension of the Turkish power. And the invectives of the Latins will not bias our more candid belief, that the Emperor Alexius dissembled their insolence, eluded their hostilities, counseled their rashness, and opened to their ardor the road of pilgrimage and conquest. But when the Turks had been driven from Nice and the sea coast, when the Byzantine princes no longer dreaded the distant sultans of Cogni, they felt with purer indignation the free and frequent passage of the western barbarians, who violated the majesty, and endangered the safety, of the empire. The second and third crusades were undertaken under the reign of Manuel Comnenus and Isaac Angelus. Of the former, the passions were always impetuous, and often malevolent. And the natural union of a cowardly and a mischievous temper was exemplified in the latter, who, without merit or mercy, could punish a tyrant, and occupy his throne. It was secretly, and perhaps tacitly, resolved by the prince and people to destroy, or at least to discourage, the pilgrims, by every species of injury and oppression. And their want of prudence and discipline continually afforded the pretense or the opportunity. The Western monarchs had stipulated a safe passage and fair market in the country of their Christian brethren. The treaty had been ratified by oaths and hostages, and the poorest soldier of Frederick's army was furnished with three marks of silver to defray his expenses on the road. But every engagement was violated by treachery and injustice. And the complaints of the Latins are attested by the honest confession of a Greek historian, who has dared to prefer truth to his country. 7285 Instead of a hospitable reception, the gates of the cities, both in Europe and Asia, were closely barred against the crusaders, and the scanty pittance of food was let down in baskets from the walls. Experience or foresight might excuse this timid jealousy, but the common duties of humanity prohibited the mixture of chalk, or other poisonous ingredients, in the bread. And should Manuel be acquitted of any foul connivance, he is guilty of coining base money for the purpose of trading with the pilgrims. In every step of their march they were stopped or misled, the governors had private orders to fortify the passes and break down the bridges against them, the stragglers were pillaged and murdered, the soldiers and horses were pierced in the woods by arrows from an invisible hand. The sick were burnt in their beds, and the dead bodies were hung on gibbets along the highways. These injuries exasperated the champions of the cross, who were not endowed with evangelical patience. And the Byzantine princes, who had provoked the unequal conflict, 
promoted the embarkation and march of these formidable guests. On the verge of the Turkish frontier Barbarossa spared the guilty Philadelphia, 7286 rewarded the hospitable Laodicea, and deplored the hard necessity that had stained his sword with any drops of Christian blood. In their intercourse with the monarchs of Germany and France, the pride of the Greeks was exposed to an anxious trial. They might boast that on the first interview the seat of Louis was a low stool, beside the throne of Manuel. 7287 But no sooner had the French king transported his army beyond the Bosphorus, than he refused the offer of a second conference, unless his brother would meet him on equal terms, either on the sea or land. With Conrad and Frederick, the ceremonial was still nicer and more difficult, like the successors of Constantine, they styled themselves emperors of the Romans, 7288 and firmly maintained the purity of their title and dignity. The first of these representatives of Charlemagne would only converse with Manuel on horseback in the open field, the second, by passing the Hellespont rather than the Bosphorus, declined the view of Constantinople and its sovereign. An emperor, who had been crowned at Rome, was reduced in the Greek epistles to the humble appellation of Rex, or Prince, of the Alamanni. And the vain and feeble Angelus affected to be ignorant of the name of one of the greatest men and monarchs of the age. While they viewed with hatred and suspicion the Latin pilgrims the Greek emperors maintained a strict, though secret, alliance with the Turks and Saracens. Isaac Angelus complained, that by his friendship for the great Saladin he had incurred the enmity of the Franks, and a mosque was founded at Constantinople for the public exercise of the religion of Mohammed. 7289. 3. The swarms that followed the First Crusade were destroyed in Anatolia by famine, pestilence, and the Turkish arrows, and the princes only escaped with some squadrons of horse to accomplish their lamentable pilgrimage. A just opinion may be formed of their knowledge and humanity, of their knowledge, from the design of subduing Persia and Khorasan in their way to Jerusalem. 7290 of their humanity, from the massacre of the Christian people, a friendly city, who came out to meet them with palms and crosses in their hands. The arms of Conrad and Louis were less cruel and imprudent. But the event of the Second Crusade was still more ruinous to Christendom, and the Greek Manuel is accused by his own subjects of giving seasonable intelligence to the Sultan, and treacherous guides to the Latin princes. Instead of crushing the common foe, by a double attack at the same time but on different sides, the Germans were urged by emulation, and the French were retarded by jealousy. Louis had scarcely passed the Bosphorus when he was met by the returning emperor, who had lost the greater part of his army in glorious, but unsuccessful, actions on the banks of the Meander. The contrast of the pomp of his rival hastened the retreat of Conrad, 7291 The desertion of his independent vassals reduced him to his hereditary troops, and he borrowed some Greek vessels to execute by sea the pilgrimage of Palestine. Without studying the lessons of experience, or the nature of the war, the King of France advanced through the same country to a similar fate. The vanguard which bore the royal banner and the oriflamme of Asti. Dennis 7292 had doubled their march with rash and inconsiderate speed, and the rear, which the king commanded in person, no longer found their companions in the evening camp. In darkness and disorder, they were encompassed, assaulted, and overwhelmed, by the innumerable host of Turks, who, in the art of war, were superior to the Christians of the twelfth century. 7293 Lewis, who climbed a tree in the general discomfiture, was saved by his own valour and the ignorance of his adversaries, and with the dawn of day he escaped alive, but almost alone, to the camp of the vanguard. But instead of pursuing his expedition by land, he was rejoiced to shelter the relics of his army in the friendly seaport of Satalia. From thence he embarked for Antioch. But so penurious was the supply of Greek vessels, that they could only afford room for his knights and nobles, and the plebeian crowd of infantry was left to perish at the foot of the Pamphylian hills. The emperor and the king embraced and wept at Jerusalem, their martial trains, the remnant of mighty armies, were joined to the Christian powers of Syria, and a fruitless siege of Damascus was the final effort of the Second Crusade. Conrad and Louis embarked for Europe with the personal fame of piety and courage, but the Orientals had braved these potent monarchs of the Franks, with whose names and military forces they had been so often threatened. 
7294 perhaps they had still more to fear from the veteran genius of Frederick I, who in his youth had served in Asia under his uncle Conrad. Forty campaigns in Germany and Italy had taught Barbarossa to command. And his soldiers, even the princes of the empire, were accustomed under his reign to obey. As soon as he lost sight of Philadelphia and Laodicea, the last cities of the Greek frontier, he plunged into the salt and barren desert, a land, says the historian, of horror and tribulation. 7,295 during twenty days, every step of his fainting and sickly march was besieged by the innumerable hordes of Turkmen's 7296 whose numbers and fury seemed after each defeat to multiply and inflame. The emperor continued to struggle and to suffer. And such was the measure of his calamities, that when he reached the gates of Iconium, no more than one thousand knights were able to serve on horseback. By a sudden and resolute assault he defeated the guards, and stormed the capital of the Sultan, 7297 who humbly sued for pardon and peace. The road was now open, and Frederick advanced in a career of triumph, till he was unfortunately drowned in a petty torrent of Cilicia. 7298 The remainder of his Germans was consumed by sickness and desertion, and the emperor's son expired with the greatest part of his Swabian vassals at the siege of Acre. Among the Latin heroes, Godfrey of Bouillon and Frederick Barbarossa could alone achieve the passage of the Lesser Asia, yet even their success was a warning. And in the last and most experienced age of the Crusades, every nation preferred the sea to the toils and perils of an inland expedition. 7299. The enthusiasm of the First Crusade is a natural and simple event, while hope was fresh, danger untried, and enterprise congenial to the spirit of the times. But the obstinate perseverance of Europe may indeed excite our pity and admiration. That no instruction should have been drawn from constant and adverse experience, that the same confidence should have repeatedly grown from the same failures. That six succeeding generations should have rushed headlong down the precipice that was opened before them. And that men of every condition should have staked their public and private fortunes on the desperate adventure of possessing or recovering a tombstone two thousand miles from their country. In a period of two centuries after the Council of Clermont, each spring and summer produced a new emigration of pilgrim warriors for the defense of the Holy Land. But the seven great armaments or crusades were excited by some impending or recent calamity, the nations were moved by the authority of their pontiffs, and the example of their kings, their zeal was kindled, and their reason was silenced. By the voice of their holy orators. And among these, Bernard, 7300 the monk, or the saint, may claim the most honorable place. 7301 About eight years before the first conquest of Jerusalem, he was born of a noble family in Burgundy. At the age of three and twenty he buried himself in the monastery of Citeaux, then in the primitive fervor of the institution. At the end of two years he led forth her third colony, or daughter, to the valley of Clairvaux 7302 in Champagne. And was content, till the hour of his death, with the humble station of abbot of his own community. A philosophic age has abolished, with too liberal and indiscriminate disdain, the honors of these spiritual heroes. The meanest among them are distinguished by some energies of the mind, they were at least superior to their votaries and disciples, and, in the race of superstition, they attained the prize for which such numbers contended. In speech, in writing, in action, Bernard stood high above his rivals and contemporaries, his compositions are not devoid of wit and eloquence. And he seems to have preserved as much reason and humanity as may be reconciled with the character of a saint. In a secular life, he would have shared the seventh part of a private inheritance. By a vow of poverty and penance, by closing his eyes against the visible world, 7303 by the refusal of all ecclesiastical dignities, the abbot of Clairvaux became the oracle of Europe, and the founder of 160 convents. Princes and pontiffs trembled at the freedom of his apostolical censures, France, England, and Milan, consulted and obeyed his judgment in a schism of the church, the debt was repaid by the gratitude of Innocent II. And his successor, Eugenius III, was the friend and disciple of the Holy Bernard. It was in the proclamation of the Second Crusade that he shone as the missionary and prophet of God, who called the nations to the defense of his holy sepulchre. 
7304 at the Parliament of Vézelay he spoke before the king, and Louis VII, with his nobles, received their crosses from his hand. The abbot of Clairvaux then marched to the less easy conquest of the Emperor Conrad, 7305 a phlegmatic people, ignorant of his language, was transported by the pathetic vehemence of his tone and gestures. And his progress, from Constance to Cologne, was the triumph of eloquence and zeal. Bernard applauds his own success in the depopulation of Europe, affirms that cities and castles were emptied of their inhabitants. And computes, that only one man was left behind for the consolation of seven widows. 7306 The blind fanatics were desirous of electing him for their general, but the example of the hermit Peter was before his eyes. And while he assured the crusaders of the divine favor, he prudently declined a military command, in which failure and victory would have been almost equally disgraceful to his character. 7307 Yet, after the calamitous event, the abbot of Clairvaux was loudly accused as a false prophet, the author of the public and private mourning, his enemies exulted, his friends blushed, and his apology was slow and unsatisfactory. He justifies his obedience to the commands of the Pope, expatiates on the mysterious ways of providence, imputes the misfortunes of the pilgrims to their own sins, and modestly insinuates that his mission had been approved by signs and wonders. 7308 Had the fact been certain, the argument would be decisive, and his faithful disciples, who enumerate twenty or thirty miracles in a day, appeal to the public assemblies of France and Germany, in which they were performed. 7309 At the present hour, such prodigies will not obtain credit beyond the precincts of Clairvaux. But in the preternatural cures of the blind, the lame, and the sick, who were presented to the man of God, it is impossible for us to ascertain the separate shares of accident, of fancy, of imposture, and of fiction. Omnipotence itself cannot escape the murmurs of its discordant votaries, since the same dispensation which was applauded as a deliverance in Europe, was deplored, and perhaps arraigned, as a calamity in Asia. After the loss of Jerusalem, the Syrian fugitives diffused their consternation and sorrow, Baghdad mourned in the dust, the Qadi Zianeddin of Damascus tore his beard in the Caliph's presence, and the whole divan shed tears at his melancholy tale. 7310 But the commanders of the faithful could only weep, they were themselves captives in the hands of the Turks, some temporal power was restored to the last age of the Abbasids. But their humble ambition was confined to Baghdad and the adjacent province. Their tyrants, the Seljukian sultans, had followed the common law of the Asiatic dynasties, the unceasing round of valor, greatness, discord, degeneracy, and decay. Their spirit and power were unequal to the defense of religion, and, in his distant realm of Persia, the Christians were strangers to the name and the arms of Sanjir, the last hero of his race. 7311 While the sultans were involved in the silken web of the harem, the pious task was undertaken by their slaves, the Adabeks 7312 a Turkish name, which, like the Byzantine patricians, may be translated by father of the prince. A scancer, a valiant Turk, had been the favorite of Malek Shah, from whom he received the privilege of standing on the right hand of the throne, but, in the civil wars that ensued on the monarch's death, he lost his head and the government of Aleppo. His domestic emirs persevered in their attachment to his son Zengi, who proved his first arms against the Franks in the defeat of Antioch, thirty campaigns in the service of the Caliph and Sultan established his military fame. And he was invested with the command of Mosul, as the only champion that could avenge the cause of the Prophet. The public hope was not disappointed, after a siege of twenty-five days, he stormed the city of Edessa. And recovered from the Franks their conquests beyond the Euphrates. 7313 The martial tribes of Kurdistan were subdued by the independent sovereign of Mosul and Aleppo, his soldiers were taught to behold the camp as their only country. They trusted to his liberality for their rewards, and their absent families were protected by the vigilance of Zengi. At the head of these veterans, his son Nureddin gradually united the Mahometan powers. 7314 added the kingdom of Damascus to that of Aleppo, and waged a long and successful war against the Christians of Syria. He spread his ample reign from the Tigris to the Nile, and the Abbasids rewarded their faithful servant with all the titles and prerogatives of royalty. 
The Latins themselves were compelled to own the wisdom and courage, and even the justice and piety, of this implacable adversary. 7315 In his life and government, the holy warrior revived the zeal and simplicity of the first caliphs. Gold and silk were banished from his palace, the use of wine from his dominions, the public revenue was scrupulously applied to the public service. And the frugal household of Nureddin was maintained from his legitimate share of the spoil which he vested in the purchase of a private estate. His favorite sultana sighed for some female object of expense. Alas, replied the king, I fear God, and am no more than the treasurer of the Moslems. Their property I cannot alienate, but I still possess three shops in the city of Hems, these you may take, and these alone can I bestow. His chamber of justice was the terror of the great and the refuge of the poor. Some years after the sultan's death, an oppressed subject called aloud in the streets of Damascus, O Nureddin, Nureddin, where art thou now? Arise, arise, to pity and protect us. A tumult was apprehended, and a living tyrant blushed or trembled at the name of a departed monarch. By the arms of the Turks and Franks, the Fatimites had been deprived of Syria. In Egypt the decay of their character and influence was still more essential. Yet they were still revered as the descendants and successors of the Prophet, they maintained their invisible state in the palace of Cairo. And their person was seldom violated by the profane eyes of subjects or strangers. The Latin ambassadors 7316 have described their own introduction, through a series of gloomy passages. And glittering porticos, the scene was enlivened by the warbling of birds and the murmur of fountains, it was enriched by a display of rich furniture and rare animals. Of the imperial treasures, something was shown, and much was supposed, and the long order of unfolding doors was guarded by black soldiers and domestic eunuchs. The sanctuary of the presence chamber was veiled with a curtain. And the vizier, who conducted the ambassadors, laid aside the scimitar, and prostrated himself three times on the ground, the veil was then removed. And they beheld the commander of the faithful, who signified his pleasure to the first slave of the throne. But this slave was his master, the viziers or sultans had usurped the supreme administration of Egypt. The claims of the rival candidates were decided by arms, and the name of the most worthy, of the strongest, was inserted in the royal patent of command. The factions of Dargham and Shaw alternately expelled each other from the capital and country. And the weaker side implored the dangerous protection of the Sultan of Damascus, or the King of Jerusalem, the perpetual enemies of the sect and monarchy of the Fatimites. By his arms and religion the Turk was most formidable. But the Frank, in an easy, direct march, could advance from Gaza to the Nile. While the intermediate situation of his realm compelled the troops of Nureddin to will round the skirts of Arabia, a long and painful circuit, which exposed them to thirst, fatigue, and the burning winds of the desert. The secret zeal and ambition of the Turkish prince aspired to reign in Egypt under the name of the Abbasides, but the restoration of the suppliant Shah was the ostensible motive of the first expedition. And the success was entrusted to the Emir Shiraku, a valiant and veteran commander. Dargham was oppressed and slain. But the ingratitude, the jealousy, the just apprehensions, of his more fortunate rival, soon provoked him to invite the king of Jerusalem to deliver Egypt from his insolent benefactors. To this union the forces of Shiraku were unequal, he relinquished the premature conquest, and the evacuation of Belbius or Pelusium was the condition of his safe retreat. As the Turks defiled before the enemy, and their general closed the rear, with a vigilant eye, and a battle-axe in his hand, a Frank presumed to ask him if he were not afraid of an attack. It is doubtless in your power to begin the attack, replied the intrepid emir, but rest assured, that not one of my soldiers will go to paradise till he has sent an infidel to hell. His report of the riches of the land, the effeminacy of the natives, and the disorders of the government, revived the hopes of Nureddin, the caliph of Baghdad applauded the pious design. And Shirakud descended into Egypt a second time with 12,000 Turks and 11,000 Arabs. Yet his forces were still inferior to the confederate armies of the Franks and Saracens. And I can discern an unusual degree of military art, in his passage of the Nile, his retreat into Thebais, his masterly evolutions in the Battle of Babine, 
the surprise of Alexandria. And his marches and countermarches in the flats and valley of Egypt, from the tropic to the sea. His conduct was seconded by the courage of his troops, and on the eve of action a Mameluke 7317 exclaimed, If we cannot wrest Egypt from the Christian dogs, why do we not renounce the honours and rewards of the Sultan? And retire to labour with the peasants, or to spin with the females of the harem? Yet, after all his efforts in the field, 7318 after the obstinate defence of Alexandria 7319 by his nephew Saladin, an honourable capitulation and retreat 7320 concluded the second enterprise of Shiraku. And Nureddin reserved his abilities for a third and more propitious occasion. It was soon offered by the ambition and avarice of Amalric or Amauri, king of Jerusalem, who had imbibed the pernicious maxim, that no faith should be kept with the enemies of God. 7321 A religious warrior, the great master of the hospital, encouraged him to proceed, the emperor of Constantinople either gave, or promised, a fleet to act with the armies of Syria. And the perfidious Christian, unsatisfied with spoil and subsidy, aspired to the conquest of Egypt. In this emergency, the Moslems turned their eyes towards the Sultan of Damascus. The vizier, whom danger encompassed on all sides, yielded to their unanimous wishes, and Nureddin seemed to be tempted by the fair offer of one-third of the revenue of the kingdom. The Franks were already at the gates of Cairo. But the suburbs, the old city, were burnt on their approach, they were deceived by an insidious negotiation, and their vessels were unable to surmount the barriers of the Nile. They prudently declined a contest with the Turks in the midst of a hostile country, and Amari retired into Palestine with the shame and reproach that always adhere to unsuccessful injustice. After this deliverance, Shiraku was invested with a robe of honor, which he soon stained with the blood of the unfortunate Shah. For a while, the Turkish emirs condescended to hold the office of vizier. But this foreign conquest precipitated the fall of the Fatimites themselves, and the bloodless change was accomplished by a message and a word. The caliphs had been degraded by their own weakness and the tyranny of the viziers, their subjects blushed, when the descendant and successor of the prophet presented his naked hand to the rude gripe of a Latin ambassador. They wept when he sent the hair of his women, a sad emblem of their grief and terror, to excite the pity of the Sultan of Damascus. By the command of Nureddin, and the sentence of the doctors, the holy names of Abubekar, Omar, and Othman, were solemnly restored, the Caliph Most Hadi, of Baghdad, was acknowledged in the public prayers as the true commander of the faithful. And the green livery of the sons of Ali was exchanged for the black color of the Abbasides. The last of his race, the Caliph Adit, who survived only ten days, expired in happy ignorance of his fate. His treasures secured the loyalty of the soldiers, and silenced the murmurs of the sectaries, and in all subsequent revolutions, Egypt has never departed from the orthodox tradition of the Moslems. 7322. The hilly country beyond the Tigris is occupied by the pastoral tribes of the Kurds, 7323 a people hardy, strong, savage impatient of the yoke, addicted to rapine, and tenacious of the government of their national chiefs. The resemblance of name, situation, and manners, seems to identify them with the Cardukians of the Greeks, 7324 and they still defend against the Ottoman port the antique freedom which they asserted against the successors of Cyrus. Poverty and ambition prompted them to embrace the profession of mercenary soldiers, the service of his father and uncle prepared the reign of the great Saladin. 7325 and the son of Jab or Ayad, a simple cord, magnanimously smiled at his pedigree, which flattery deduced from the Arabian caliphs. 7326 So unconscious was Nureddin of the impending ruin of his house, that he constrained the reluctant youth to follow his uncle Shiraku into Egypt, his military character was established by the defense of Alexandria. And, if we may believe the Latins, he solicited and obtained from the Christian general the profane honors of knighthood. 7327 On the death of Shiraku, the office of Grand Vizier was bestowed on Saladin, as the youngest and least powerful of the emirs. But with the advice of his father, whom he invited to Cairo, his genius obtained the ascendant over his equals, and attached the army to his person and interest. While Nureddin lived, these ambitious cords were the most humble of his slaves. 
and the indiscreet murmurs of the divan were silenced by the prudent Ayyub, who loudly protested that at the command of the sultan he himself would lead his sons in chains to the foot of the throne. Such language, he added in private, was prudent and proper in an assembly of your rivals, but we are now above fear and obedience, and the threats of Nureddin shall not extort the tribute of a sugar cane. His seasonable death relieved them from the odious and doubtful conflict, his son, a minor of eleven years of age, was left for a while to the emirs of Damascus. And the new lord of Egypt was decorated by the caliph with every title 7328 that could sanctify his usurpation in the eyes of the people. Nor was Saladin long content with the possession of Egypt. He despoiled the Christians of Jerusalem, and the Atabeks of Damascus, Aleppo, and Diyarbakir, Mecca and Medina acknowledged him for their temporal protector, his brother subdued the distant regions of Yemen, or the happy Arabia. And at the hour of his death, his empire was spread from the African Tripoli to the Tigris, and from the Indian Ocean to the mountains of Armenia. In the judgment of his character, the reproaches of treason and ingratitude strike forcibly on our minds, impressed, as they are, with the principle and experience of law and loyalty. But his ambition may in some measure be excused by the revolutions of Asia, 7329 which had erased every notion of legitimate succession, by the recent example of the Atabeks themselves, by his reverence to the son of his benefactor. His humane and generous behavior to the collateral branches, by their incapacity and his merit, by the approbation of the caliph, the sole source of all legitimate power. And, above all, by the wishes and interest of the people, whose happiness is the first object of government. In his virtues, and in those of his patron, they admired the singular union of the hero and the saint. For both Nureddin and Saladin are ranked among the Mahometan saints, and the constant meditation of the holy war appears to have shed a serious and sober color over their lives and actions. The youth of the latter 7330 was addicted to wine and women, but his aspiring spirit soon renounced the temptations of pleasure for the graver follies of fame and dominion, the garment of Saladin was of course woolen, water was his only drink. And, while he emulated the temperance, he surpassed the chastity, of his Arabian prophet. Both in faith and practice he was a rigid Muslim, he ever deplored that the defense of religion had not allowed him to accomplish the pilgrimage of Mecca. But at the stated hours, five times each day, the Sultan devoutly prayed with his brethren, the involuntary omission of fasting was scrupulously repaid. And his perusal of the Quran, on horseback between the approaching armies, may be quoted as a proof, however ostentatious, of piety and courage. 7331 The superstitious doctrine of the sect of Shafi was the only study that he deigned to encourage, the poets were safe in his contempt, but all profane science was the object of his aversion. And a philosopher, who had invented some speculative novelties, was seized and strangled by the command of the royal saint. The justice of his divan was accessible to the meanest suppliant against himself and his ministers. And it was only for a kingdom that Saladin would deviate from the rule of equity. While the descendants of Seljuk and Zengi held his stirrup and smoothed his garments, he was affable and patient with the meanest of his servants. So boundless was his liberality, that he distributed twelve thousand horses at the siege of Acre, and, at the time of his death, no more than forty-seven drams of silver and one piece of gold coin were found in the treasury. Yet, in a martial reign, the tributes were diminished, and the wealthy citizens enjoyed, without fear or danger, the fruits of their industry. Egypt, Syria, and Arabia, were adorned by the royal foundations of hospitals, colleges, and mosques. And Cairo was fortified with a wall and citadel, but his works were consecrated to public use, 7332 nor did the Sultan indulge himself in a garden or palace of private luxury. In a fanatic age, himself a fanatic, the genuine virtues of Saladin commanded the esteem of the Christians, the Emperor of Germany gloried in his friendship, 7333 the Greek Emperor solicited his alliance. 7334 and the conquest of Jerusalem diffused, and perhaps magnified, his fame both in the East and West. During its short existence, the Kingdom of Jerusalem 7335 was supported by the discord of the Turks and Saracens. 
and both the Fatimite caliphs and the sultans of Damascus were tempted to sacrifice the cause of their religion to the meaner considerations of private and present advantage. But the powers of Egypt, Syria, and Arabia, were now united by a hero, whom nature and fortune had armed against the Christians. All without now bore the most threatening aspect, and all was feeble and hollow in the internal state of Jerusalem. After the two first Baldwins, the brother and cousin of Godfrey of Bullion, the scepter devolved by female succession to Melisenda, daughter of the second Baldwin, and her husband Folk, Count of Anjou, the father, by a former marriage. Of our English Plantagenets. Their two sons, Baldwin III, and Amaury, waged a strenuous, and not unsuccessful, war against the infidels. But the son of Amaury, Baldwin IV, was deprived, by the leprosy, a gift of the Crusades, of the faculties both of mind and body. His sister Sibylla, the mother of Baldwin V, was his natural heiress, after the suspicious death of her child, she crowned her second husband, Guy of Lusignan, a prince of a handsome person, but of such base renown. That his own brother Geoffrey was heard to exclaim, since they have made him a king, surely they would have made me a god. The choice was generally blamed. And the most powerful vassal, Raymond Count of Tripoli, who had been excluded from the succession and regency, entertained an implacable hatred against the king, and exposed his honor and conscience to the temptations of the sultan. Such were the guardians of the holy city. A leper, a child, a woman, a coward, and a traitor, yet its fate was delayed twelve years by some supplies from Europe, by the valor of the military orders, and by the distant or domestic avocations of their great enemy. At length, on every side, the sinking state was encircled and pressed by a hostile line, and the truce was violated by the Franks, whose existence it protected. A soldier of fortune, Reginald of Chitillon, had seized a fortress on the edge of the desert, from whence he pillaged the caravans, insulted Muhammad, and threatened the cities of Mecca and Medina. Saladin condescended to complain. Rejoiced in the denial of justice, and at the head of fourscore thousand horse and foot invaded the Holy Land. The choice of Tiberius for his first siege was suggested by the Count of Tripoli, to whom it belonged. And the King of Jerusalem was persuaded to drain his garrison, and to arm his people, for the relief of that important place. 7336 By the advice of the perfidious Raymond, the Christians were betrayed into a camp destitute of water, he fled on the first onset, with the curses of both nations, 7337 Lusignan was overthrown, with the loss of thirty thousand men. And the wood of the true cross, a dire misfortune, was left in the power of the infidels. 7338 The royal captive was conducted to the tent of Saladin. And as he fainted with thirst and terror, the generous victor presented him with a cup of sherbet, cooled in snow, without suffering his companion, Reginald of Chitillon, to partake of this pledge of hospitality in pardon. The person and dignity of a king, said the sultan, are sacred, but this impious robber must instantly acknowledge the prophet, whom he has blasphemed, or meet the death which he has so often deserved. On the proud or conscientious refusal of the Christian warrior, Saladin struck him on the head with his scimitar, and Reginald was dispatched by the guards. 7339 The trembling Lusignan was sent to Damascus, to an honorable prison in speedy ransom. But the victory was stained by the execution of 230 knights of the hospital, the intrepid champions and martyrs of their faith. The kingdom was left without a head. And of the two grand masters of the military orders, the one was slain and the other was a prisoner. From all the cities, both of the sea coast and the inland country, the garrisons had been drawn away for this fatal field, Tyre and Tripoli alone could escape the rapid inroad of Saladin. And three months after the Battle of Tiberias, he appeared in arms before the gates of Jerusalem. 7340. He might expect that the siege of a city so venerable on earth and in heaven, so interesting to Europe and Asia, would rekindle the last sparks of enthusiasm. And that, of sixty thousand Christians, every man would be a soldier, and every soldier a candidate for martyrdom. But Queen Sibylla trembled for herself and her captive husband. And the barons and knights, who had escaped from the sword and chains of the Turks, displayed the same factious and selfish spirit in the public ruin. 
The most numerous portion of the inhabitants was composed of the Greek and Oriental Christians, whom experience had taught to prefer the Mahometan before the Latin yoke. 7341 and the Holy Sepulchre attracted a base and needy crowd, without arms or courage, who subsisted only on the charity of the pilgrims. Some feeble and hasty efforts were made for the defense of Jerusalem, but in the space of fourteen days, a victorious army drove back the sallies of the besieged, planted their engines, opened the wall to the breadth of fifteen cubits, applied their scaling ladders, and erected on the breach twelve banners of the Prophet and the Sultan. It was in vain that a barefoot procession of the queen, the women, and the monks, implored the Son of God to save his tomb and his inheritance from impious violation. Their sole hope was in the mercy of the conqueror, and to their first suppliant deputation that mercy was sternly denied. He had sworn to avenge the patience and long-suffering of the Moslems. The hour of forgiveness was elapsed, and the moment was now arrived to expiate, in blood, the innocent blood which had been spilt by Godfrey and the first crusaders. But a desperate and successful struggle of the Franks admonished the Sultan that his triumph was not yet secure. He listened with reverence to a solemn adjuration in the name of the common father of mankind. And a sentiment of human sympathy mollified the rigor of fanaticism and conquest. He consented to accept the city, and to spare the inhabitants. The Greek and Oriental Christians were permitted to live under his dominion, but it was stipulated, that in forty days all the Franks and Latins should evacuate Jerusalem, and be safely conducted to the seaports of Syria and Egypt. That ten pieces of gold should be paid for each man, five for each woman, and one for every child, and that those who were unable to purchase their freedom should be detained in perpetual slavery. Of some writers it is a favorite and invidious theme to compare the humanity of Saladin with the massacre of the First Crusade. The difference would be merely personal. But we should not forget that the Christians had offered to capitulate, and that the Mohammedans of Jerusalem sustained the last extremities of an assault and storm. Justice is indeed due to the fidelity with which the Turkish conqueror fulfilled the conditions of the treaty, and he may be deservedly praised for the glance of pity which he cast on the misery of the vanquished. Instead of a rigorous exaction of his debt, he accepted a sum of thirty thousand Byzants, for the ransom of seven thousand poor, two or three thousand more were dismissed by his gratuitous clemency and the number of slaves was reduced to eleven or fourteen thousand persons. In this interview with the Queen, his words, and even his tears suggested the kindest consolations. His liberal alms were distributed among those who had been made orphans or widows by the fortune of war. And while the knights of the hospital were in arms against him, he allowed their more pious brethren to continue, during the term of a year, the care and service of the sick. In these acts of mercy the virtue of Saladin deserves our admiration and love, he was above the necessity of dissimulation, and his stern fanaticism would have prompted him to dissemble, rather than to affect. This profane compassion for the enemies of the Quran. After Jerusalem had been delivered from the presence of the strangers, the Sultan made his triumphal entry, his banners waving in the wind, and to the harmony of martial music. The great mosque of Omar, which had been converted into a church, was again consecrated to one God and his prophet Muhammad, the walls and pavement were purified with rose water, and a pulpit, the labor of Nureddin, was erected in the sanctuary. But when the golden cross that glittered on the dome was cast down, and dragged through the streets, the Christians of every sect uttered a lamentable groan, which was answered by the joyful shouts of the Moslems. In four ivory chests the patriarch had collected the crosses, the images, the vases, and the relics of the holy place, they were seized by the conqueror, who was desirous of presenting the caliph with the trophies of Christian idolatry. He was persuaded, however, to entrust them to the patriarch and prince of Antioch, and the pious pledge was redeemed by Richard of England, at the expense of fifty-two thousand Byzants of gold. 7,342 the nations might fear and hope the immediate and final expulsion of the Latins from Syria, which was yet delayed above a century after the death of Saladin. 7343 In the career of victory, he was first checked by the resistance of Tyre. The troops and garrisons, which had capitulated, were imprudently conducted to the same port, 
their numbers were adequate to the defense of the place, and the arrival of Conrad of Montferrat inspired the disorderly crowd with confidence and union. His father, a venerable pilgrim, had been made prisoner in the Battle of Tiberius, but that disaster was unknown in Italy and Greece, when the son was urged by ambition and piety to visit the inheritance of his royal nephew, the infant Baldwin. The view of the Turkish banners warned him from the hostile coast of Jaffa, and Conrad was unanimously hailed as the prince and champion of Tyre, which was already besieged by the conqueror of Jerusalem. The firmness of his zeal, and perhaps his knowledge of a generous foe, enabled him to brave the threats of the sultan, and to declare, that should his aged parent be exposed before the walls, he himself would discharge the first arrow. And glory in his descent from a Christian martyr. 7344 The Egyptian fleet was allowed to enter the harbour of Tyre, but the chain was suddenly drawn, and five galleys were either sunk or taken, a thousand Turks were slain in a sally. And Saladin, after burning his engines, concluded a glorious campaign by a disgraceful retreat to Damascus. He was soon assailed by a more formidable tempest. The pathetic narratives, and even the pictures, that represented in lively colors the servitude and profanation of Jerusalem, awakened the torpid sensibility of Europe, the Emperor Frederick Barbarossa, and the kings of France and England. Assumed the cross. And the tardy magnitude of their armaments was anticipated by the maritime states of the Mediterranean and the ocean. The skillful and provident Italians first embarked in the ships of Genoa, Pisa, and Venice. They were speedily followed by the most eager pilgrims of France, Normandy, and the Western Isles. The powerful succor of Flanders, Frise, and Denmark, filled near a hundred vessels, and the northern warriors were distinguished in the field by a lofty stature and a ponderous battle-axe. 7345 Their increasing multitudes could no longer be confined within the walls of Tyre, or remain obedient to the voice of Conrad. They pitted the misfortunes, and revered the dignity, of Lusignan, who was released from prison, perhaps, to divide the army of the Franks. He proposed the recovery of Ptolemy, or Acre, thirty miles to the south of Tyre. And the place was first invested by two thousand horse and thirty thousand foot under his nominal command. I shall not expatiate on the story of this memorable siege, which lasted near two years, and consumed, in a narrow space, the forces of Europe and Asia. Never did the flame of enthusiasm burn with fiercer and more destructive rage. Nor could the true believers, a common appellation, who consecrated their own martyrs, refuse some applause to the mistaken zeal and courage of their adversaries. At the sound of the holy trumpet, the Moslems of Egypt, Syria, Arabia, and the Oriental provinces, assembled under the servant of the Prophet, 7346 his camp was pitched and removed within a few miles of Acre. And he labored, night and day, for the relief of his brethren and the annoyance of the Franks. Nine battles, not unworthy of the name, were fought in the neighborhood of Mount Carmel, with such vicissitude of fortune, that in one attack, the Sultan forced his way into the city, that in one sally, the Christians penetrated to the royal tent. By the means of divers and pigeons, a regular correspondence was maintained with the besieged, and, as often as the sea was left open, the exhausted garrison was withdrawn, and a fresh supply was poured into the place. The Latin camp was thinned by famine, the sword, and the climate, but the tents of the dead were replenished with new pilgrims, who exaggerated the strength and speed of their approaching countrymen. The vulgar was astonished by the report, that the Pope himself, with an innumerable crusade, was advanced as far as Constantinople. The march of the emperor filled the east with more serious alarms, the obstacles which he encountered in Asia, and perhaps in Greece, were raised by the policy of Saladin, his joy on the death of Barbarossa was measured by his esteem. And the Christians were rather dismayed than encouraged at the sight of the Duke of Swabia and his wayworn remnant of five thousand Germans. At length, in the spring of the second year, the royal fleets of France and England cast anchor in the Bay of Acre, and the siege was more vigorously prosecuted by the youthful emulation of the two kings, Philip Augustus and Richard Plantagenet. After every resource had been tried, and every hope was exhausted, the defenders of Acre submitted to their fate. A capitulation was granted, 
but their lives and liberties were taxed at the hard conditions of a ransom of 200,000 pieces of gold, the deliverance of 100 nobles, and 1,500 inferior captives. And the restoration of the wood of the Holy Cross. Some doubts in the agreement, and some delay in the execution, rekindled the fury of the Franks, and 3,000 Moslems, almost in the Sultan's view, were beheaded by the command of the sanguinary Richard. 7347 By the conquest of Acre, the Latin powers acquired a strong town and a convenient harbour, but the advantage was most dearly purchased. The minister and historian of Saladin computes, from the report of the enemy, that their numbers, at different periods, amounted to five or six hundred thousand, that more than one hundred thousand Christians were slain. That a far greater number was lost by disease or shipwreck, and that a small portion of this mighty host could return in safety to their native countries. 7348. Philip Augustus, and Richard I, are the only kings of France and England who have fought under the same banners, but the holy service in which they were enlisted was incessantly disturbed by their national jealousy. And the two factions, which they protected in Palestine, were more averse to each other than to the common enemy. In the eyes of the Orientals, the French monarch was superior in dignity and power. And, in the emperor's absence, the Latins revered him as their temporal chief. 7349 His exploits were not adequate to his fame. Philip was brave, but the statesman predominated in his character. He was soon weary of sacrificing his health and interest on a barren coast, the surrender of Acre became the signal of his departure. Nor could he justify this unpopular desertion, by leaving the Duke of Burgundy with five hundred knights and ten thousand foot, for the service of the Holy Land. The King of England, though inferior in dignity, surpassed his rival in wealth and military renown, 7350 and if heroism be confined to brutal and ferocious valour, Richard Plantagenet will stand high among the heroes of the age. The memory of Cur de Lion, of the lion-hearted prince, was long dear and glorious to his English subjects. And, at the distance of sixty years, it was celebrated in proverbial sayings by the grandsons of the Turks and Saracens, against whom he had fought, his tremendous name was employed by the Syrian mothers to silence their infants. And if a horse suddenly started from the way, his rider was wont to exclaim, Dost thou think King Richard is in that bush? 7351 His cruelty to the Mohammedans was the effect of temper and zeal. But I cannot believe that a soldier, so free and fearless in the use of his lance, would have descended to wed a dagger against his valiant brother Conrad of Montferrat, who was slain at Tyre by some secret assassins. 7352 After the surrender of Acre, and the departure of Philip, the King of England led the Crusaders to the recovery of the sea coast, and the cities of Caesarea and Jaffa were added to the fragments of the kingdom of Lusignan. A march of one hundred miles from Acre to Ascalon was a great and perpetual battle of eleven days. In the disorder of his troops, Saladin remained on the field with seventeen guards, without lowering his standard, or suspending the sound of his brazen kettle drum, he again rallied and renewed the charge. And his preachers or heralds called aloud on the Unitarians, manfully to stand up against the Christian idolaters. But the progress of these idolaters was irresistible. And it was only by demolishing the walls and buildings of Ascalon, that the Sultan could prevent them from occupying an important fortress on the confines of Egypt. During a severe winter, the armies slept. But in the spring, the Franks advanced within a day's march of Jerusalem, under the leading standard of the English king, and his active spirit intercepted a convoy, or caravan, of seven thousand camels. Saladin 7353 had fixed his station in the holy city, but the city was struck with consternation and discord, he fasted, he prayed, he preached, he offered to share the dangers of the siege. But his Mamelukes, who remembered the fate of their companions at Acre, pressed the Sultan with loyal or seditious clamours, to reserve his person and their courage for the future defence of the religion and empire. 7354 The Moslems were delivered by the sudden, or, as they deemed, the miraculous, retreat of the Christians, 7355 and the laurels of Richard were blasted by the prudence, or envy, of his companions. The hero, ascending a hill, and veiling his face, exclaimed with an indignant voice, those who are unwilling to rescue, are unworthy to view, the sepulchre of Christ. 
After his return to Acre, on the news that Jaffa was surprised by the Sultan, he sailed with some merchant vessels, and leaped foremost on the beach, the castle was relieved by his presence. And sixty thousand Turks and Saracens fled before his arms. The discovery of his weakness, provoked them to return in the morning, and they found him carelessly encamped before the gates with only seventeen knights and three hundred archers. Without counting their numbers, he sustained their charge. And we learn from the evidence of his enemies, that the King of England, grasping his lance, rode furiously along their front, from the right to the left wing, without meeting an adversary who dared to encounter his career. 7356 Am I writing the history of Orlando or Amadis? During these hostilities, a languid and tedious negotiation 7357 between the Franks and Moslems was started, and continued, and broken, and again resumed, and again broken. Some acts of royal courtesy, the gift of snow and fruit, the exchange of Norway hawks and Arabian horses, softened the asperity of religious war, from the vicissitude of success. The monarchs might learn to suspect that heaven was neutral in the quarrel. Nor, after the trial of each other, could either hope for a decisive victory. 7358 The health both of Richard and Saladin appeared to be in a declining state. And they respectively suffered the evils of distant and domestic warfare. Plantagenet was impatient to punish a perfidious rival who had invaded Normandy in his absence. And the indefatigable Sultan was subdued by the cries of the people, who was the victim and of the soldiers, who were the instruments, of his martial zeal. The first demands of the King of England were the restitution of Jerusalem, Palestine, and the True Cross. And he firmly declared, that himself and his brother pilgrims would end their lives in the pious labour, rather than return to Europe with ignominy and remorse. But the conscience of Saladin refused, without some weighty compensation, to restore the idols, or promote the idolatry, of the Christians, he asserted, with equal firmness, his religious and civil claim to the sovereignty of Palestine. Descanted on the importance and sanctity of Jerusalem, and rejected all terms of the establishment, or partition of the Latins. The marriage which Richard proposed, of his sister with the Sultan's brother, was defeated by the difference of faith. The princess abhorred the embraces of a Turk, and Adele, or Safedon, would not easily renounce a plurality of wives. A personal interview was declined by Saladin, who alleged their mutual ignorance of each other's language. And the negotiation was managed with much art and delay by their interpreters and envoys. The final agreement was equally disapproved by the zealots of both parties, by the Roman pontiff and the caliph of Baghdad. It was stipulated that Jerusalem and the Holy Sepulchre should be open, without tribute or vexation, to the pilgrimage of the Latin Christians, that, after the demolition of Ascalon, they should inclusively possess the sea coast from Jaffa to Tyre. That the Count of Tripoli and the Prince of Antioch should be comprised in the truce, and that, during three years and three months, all hostilities should cease. The principal chiefs of the two armies swore to the observance of the treaty. But the monarchs were satisfied with giving their word and their right hand, and the royal majesty was excused from an oath, which always implies some suspicion of falsehood and dishonor. Richard embarked for Europe, to seek a long captivity in a premature grave, and the space of a few months concluded the life and glories of Saladin. The Orientals describe his edifying death, which happened at Damascus. But they seem ignorant of the equal distribution of his alms among the three religions 7359 or of the display of a shroud, instead of a standard, to admonish the East of the instability of human greatness. The unity of empire was dissolved by his death, his sons were oppressed by the stronger arm of their uncle Saphadon, the hostile interests of the sultans of Egypt, Damascus, and Aleppo 7360 were again revived. And the Franks or Latins stood and breathed, and hoped, in their fortresses along the Syrian coast. The noblest monument of a conqueror's fame, and of the terror which he inspired, is the Solidine Tenth, a general tax which was imposed on the laity, and even the clergy, of the Latin Church, for the service of the Holy War. The practice was too lucrative to expire with the occasion, and this tribute became the foundation of all the tithes and tenths on ecclesiastical benefices, which have been granted by the Roman pontiffs to Catholic sovereigns. Or reserved for the immediate use of the apostolic see. 
7361 This pecuniary emolument must have tended to increase the interest of the popes in the recovery of Palestine, after the death of Saladin, they preached the crusade, by their epistles, their legates, and their missionaries. And the accomplishment of the pious work might have been expected from the zeal and talents of Innocent the third point seventy three sixty two under that young and ambitious priest, the successors of Esti. Peter attained the full meridian of their greatness, and in a reign of eighteen years, he exercised a despotic command over the emperors and kings, whom he raised and deposed. Over the nations, whom an interdict of months or years deprived, for the offense of their rulers, of the exercise of Christian worship. In the Council of the Lateran he acted as the ecclesiastical, almost as the temporal, sovereign of the East and West. It was at the feet of his legate that John of England surrendered his crown. An innocent may boast of the two most signal triumphs over sense and humanity, the establishment of transubstantiation, and the origin of the Inquisition. At his voice, two crusades, the fourth and the fifth, were undertaken. But, except a king of Hungary, the princes of the second order were at the head of the pilgrims, the forces were inadequate to the design, nor did the effects correspond with the hopes and wishes of the Pope and the people. The Fourth Crusade was diverted from Syria to Constantinople, and the conquest of the Greek or Roman Empire by the Latins will form the proper and important subject of the next chapter. In the fifth, 7363 200,000 francs were landed at the eastern mouth of the Nile. They reasonably hoped that Palestine must be subdued in Egypt, the seat and storehouse of the Sultan. And, after a siege of sixteen months, the Moslems deplored the loss of Damietta. But the Christian army was ruined by the pride and insolence of the legate Pelagius, who, in the Pope's name, assumed the character of general, the sickly Franks were encompassed by the waters of the Nile and the Oriental forces. And it was by the evacuation of Damietta that they obtained a safe retreat, some concessions for the pilgrims, and the tardy restitution of the doubtful relic of the true cross. The failure may in some measure be ascribed to the abuse and multiplication of the Crusades, which were preached at the same time against the pagans of Livonia, the Moors of Spain, the Albigeois of France, and the kings of Sicily of the imperial family. 7364 In these meritorious services, the volunteers might acquire at home the same spiritual indulgence, and a larger measure of temporal rewards. And even the popes, in their zeal against a domestic enemy, were sometimes tempted to forget the distress of their Syrian brethren. From the last age of the Crusades they derived the occasional command of an army and revenue. And some deep reasoners have suspected that the whole enterprise, from the first synod of Placentia, was contrived and executed by the policy of Rome. The suspicion is not founded either in nature or in fact. The successors of Esti. Peter appear to have followed, rather than guided, the impulse of manners and prejudice, without much foresight of the seasons, or cultivation of the soil, they gathered the ripe and spontaneous fruits of the superstition of the times. They gathered these fruits without toil or personal danger, in the council of the Lateran, Innocent III declared an ambiguous resolution of animating the crusaders by his example, but the pilot of the sacred vessel could not abandon the helm. Nor was Palestine ever blessed with the presence of a Roman pontiff. 7365. The persons, the families, and estates of the pilgrims, were under the immediate protection of the popes. And these spiritual patrons soon claimed the prerogative of directing their operations, and enforcing, by commands and censures, the accomplishment of their vow. Frederick II, 7366 the grandson of Barbarossa, was successively the pupil, the enemy, and the victim of the church. At the age of twenty-one years, and in obedience to his guardian Innocent III, he assumed the cross. The same promise was repeated at his royal and imperial coronations, and his marriage with the heiress of Jerusalem forever bound him to defend the kingdom of his son Conrad. But as Frederick advanced in age and authority, he repented of the rash engagements of his youth, his liberal sense and knowledge taught him to despise the phantoms of superstition and the crowns of Asia, he no longer entertained the same reverence for the successors of Innocent, and his ambition was occupied by the restoration of the Italian monarchy from Sicily to the Alps. But the success of this project would have reduced the popes to their primitive simplicity. 
And, after the delays and excuses of twelve years, they urged the emperor, with entreaties and threats, to fix the time and place of his departure for Palestine. In the harbours of Sicily and Apulia, he prepared a fleet of one hundred galleys, and of one hundred vessels, that were framed to transport and land two thousand five hundred knights, with their horses and attendants. His vassals of Naples and Germany formed a powerful army and the number of English crusaders was magnified to sixty thousand by the report of fame. But the inevitable or affected slowness of these mighty preparations consumed the strength and provisions of the more indigent pilgrims, the multitude was thinned by sickness and desertion. And the sultry summer of Calabria anticipated the mischiefs of a Syrian campaign. At length the emperor hoisted sail at Brundusium, with a fleet and army of forty thousand men, but he kept the sea no more than three days. And his hasty retreat, which was ascribed by his friends to a grievous indisposition, was accused by his enemies as a voluntary and obstinate disobedience. For suspending his vow was Frederick excommunicated by Gregory IX. For presuming, the next year, to accomplish his vow, he was again excommunicated by the same Pope. 7367 While he served under the banner of the cross, a crusade was preached against him in Italy. And after his return he was compelled to ask pardon for the injuries which he had suffered. The clergy and military orders of Palestine were previously instructed to renounce his communion and dispute his commands. And in his own kingdom, the emperor was forced to consent that the orders of the camp should be issued in the name of God and of the Christian Republic. Frederick entered Jerusalem in triumph. And with his own hands, for no priest would perform the office, he took the crown from the altar of the Holy Sepulchre. But the patriarch cast an interdict on the church which his presence had profaned. And the knights of the hospital and temple informed the sultan how easily he might be surprised and slain in his unguarded visit to the river Jordan. In such a state of fanaticism and faction, victory was hopeless, and defense was difficult. But the conclusion of an advantageous peace may be imputed to the discord of the Mohammedans, and their personal esteem for the character of Frederick. The enemy of the church is accused of maintaining with the miscreants an intercourse of hospitality and friendship unworthy of a Christian, of despising the barrenness of the land, and of indulging a profane thought, that if Jehovah had seen the kingdom of Naples he never would have selected Palestine for the inheritance of his chosen people. Yet Frederick obtained from the Sultan the restitution of Jerusalem, of Bethlehem and Nazareth, of Tyre and Sidon, the Latins were allowed to inhabit and fortify the city. An equal code of civil and religious freedom was ratified for the sectaries of Jesus and those of Muhammad. And, while the former worshipped at the Holy Sepulchre, the latter might pray and preach in the Mosque of the Temple, 7368 from whence the Prophet undertook his nocturnal journey to heaven. The clergy deplored this scandalous toleration. And the weaker Moslems were gradually expelled, but every rational object of the Crusades was accomplished without bloodshed, the churches were restored, the monasteries were replenished. And, in the space of fifteen years, the Latins of Jerusalem exceeded the number of six thousand. This peace and prosperity, for which they were ungrateful to their benefactor, was terminated by the eruption of the strange and savage hordes of Charismians. 7369 Flying from the arms of the Mughals, those shepherds 7370 of the Caspian rolled headlong on Syria, and the union of the Franks with the sultans of Aleppo, Hems, and Damascus, was insufficient to stem the violence of the torrent. Whatever stood against them was cut off by the sword, or dragged into captivity, the military orders were almost exterminated in a single battle. And in the pillage of the city, in the profanation of the Holy Sepulchre, the Latins confess and regret the modesty and discipline of the Turks and Saracens. Of the seven crusades, the two last were undertaken by Louis IX, King of France, who lost his liberty in Egypt, and his life on the coast of Africa. Twenty-eight years after his death, he was canonized at Rome, and sixty-five miracles were readily found, and solemnly attested, to justify the claim of the royal saint. 7371 The voice of history renders a more honorable testimony, that he united the virtues of a king, a hero, and a man, that his martial spirit was tempered by the love of private and public justice. And that Louis was the father of his people, the friend of his neighbors, and the terror of the infidels.
superstition alone, in all the extent of her baleful influence. 7372 corrupted his understanding and his heart, his devotion stooped to admire and imitate the begging friars of Francis and Dominic, he pursued with blind and cruel zeal the enemies of the faith. And the best of kings twice descended from his throne to seek the adventures of a spiritual knight errant. A monkish historian would have been content to applaud the most despicable part of his character. But the noble and gallant Joinville, 7373, who shared the friendship and captivity of Louis, has traced with the pencil of nature the free portrait of his virtues as well as of his failings. From this intimate knowledge, we may learn to suspect the political views of depressing their great vassals which are so often imputed to the royal authors of the Crusades. Above all the princes of the Middle Ages, Louis IX successfully labored to restore the prerogatives of the crown. But it was at home and not in the East, that he acquired for himself and his posterity, his vow was the result of enthusiasm and sickness, and if he were the promoter, he was likewise the victim, of his holy madness. For the invasion of Egypt, France was exhausted of her troops and treasures, he covered the Sea of Cyprus with 1,800 sails, the most modest enumeration amounts to 50,000 men. And, if we might trust his own confession, as it is reported by Oriental Vanity, he disembarked 9,500 horse, and 130,000 foot, who performed their pilgrimage under the shadow of his power. 7,374. In complete armor, the oriflamme waving before him, Louis leaped foremost on the beach, and the strong city of Damietta, which had cost his predecessors a siege of sixteen months, was abandoned on the first assault by the trembling Moslems. But Damietta was the first and the last of his conquests, and in the fifth and sixth crusades, the same causes, almost on the same ground, were productive of similar calamities. 7375 After a ruinous delay, which introduced into the camp the seeds of an epidemic disease, the Franks advanced from the seacoast towards the capital of Egypt, and strove to surmount the unseasonable inundation of the Nile, which opposed their progress. Under the eye of their intrepid monarch, the barons and knights of France displayed their invincible contempt of danger and discipline, his brother, the Count of Artois, stormed with inconsiderate valour the town of Masura and the carrier pigeons announced to the inhabitants of Cairo that all was lost. But a soldier, who afterwards usurped the scepter, rallied the flying troops, the main body of the Christians was far behind the vanguard. And Artois was overpowered and slain. A shower of Greek fire was incessantly poured on the invaders, the Nile was commanded by the Egyptian galleys, the open country by the Arabs, all provisions were intercepted. Each day aggravated the sickness and famine, and about the same time a retreat was found to be necessary and impracticable. The Oriental writers confess, that Louis might have escaped, if he would have deserted his subjects. He was made prisoner, with the greatest part of his nobles, all who could not redeem their lives by service or ransom were inhumanly massacred, and the walls of Cairo were decorated with a circle of Christian heads. 7376 The King of France was loaded with chains. But the generous victor, a great grandson of the brother of Saladin, sent a robe of honor to his royal captive, and his deliverance, with that of his soldiers, was obtained by the restitution of Damietta 7377 and the payment of 400,000 pieces of gold. In a soft and luxurious climate, the degenerate children of the companions of Nureddin and Saladin were incapable of resisting the flower of European chivalry, they triumphed by the arms of their slaves or Mamelukes, the hardy natives of Tartary, who at a tender age had been purchased of the Syrian merchants, and were educated in the camp and palace of the Sultan. But Egypt soon afforded a new example of the danger of Praetorian bands, and the rage of these ferocious animals, who had been let loose on the strangers, was provoked to devour their benefactor. In the pride of conquest, Turan Shah, the last of his race, was murdered by his Mamelukes, and the most daring of the assassins entered the chamber of the captive king, with drawn scimitars, and their hands imbrued in the blood of their sultan. The firmness of Louis commanded their respect, 7378 their avarice prevailed over cruelty and zeal, the treaty was accomplished, and the king of France, with the relics of his army, was permitted to embark for Palestine. He wasted four years within the walls of Acre, unable to visit Jerusalem, 
and unwilling to return without glory to his native country. The memory of his defeat excited Lewis, after sixteen years of wisdom and repose, to undertake the seventh and last of the Crusades. His finances were restored, his kingdom was enlarged. A new generation of warriors had arisen, and he advanced with fresh confidence at the head of six thousand horse and thirty thousand foot. The loss of Antioch had provoked the enterprise. A wild hope of baptizing the king of Tunis tempted him to steer for the African coast, and the report of an immense treasure reconciled his troops to the delay of their voyage to the Holy Land. Instead of a proselyte, he found a siege, the French panted and died on the burning sands, St. Louis expired in his tent. And no sooner had he closed his eyes, than his son and successor gave the signal of the retreat. 7379, it is thus, says a lively writer, that a Christian king died near the ruins of Carthage, waging war against the sectaries of Muhammad, in a land to which Dido had introduced the deities of Syria. 7380. A more unjust and absurd constitution cannot be devised than that which condemns the natives of a country to perpetual servitude, under the arbitrary dominion of strangers and slaves. Yet such has been the state of Egypt above five hundred years. The most illustrious sultans of the Baharite and Borgite dynasties 7381 were themselves promoted from the Tartar and Circassian bands. And the four and twenty bays, or military chiefs, have ever been succeeded, not by their sons, but by their servants. They produced the great charter of their liberties, the Treaty of Selim I with the Republic, 7382 and the Othman Emperor still accepts from Egypt a slight acknowledgement of tribute and subjection. With some breathing intervals of peace and order, the two dynasties are marked as a period of rapine and bloodshed, 7383 but their throne, however shaken, reposed on the two pillars of discipline and valor, their sway extended over Egypt, Nubia, Arabia, and Syria, their Mamelukes were multiplied from 800 to 25,000 horse. And their numbers were increased by a provincial militia of 107,000 foot, and the occasional aid of 66,000 Arabs. 7,384 princes of such power and spirit could not long endure on their coast a hostile and independent nation. And if the ruin of the Franks was postponed about forty years, they were indebted to the cares of an unsettled reign, to the invasion of the Mughals, and to the occasional aid of some warlike pilgrims. Among these, the English reader will observe the name of our first Edward, who assumed the cross in the lifetime of his father Henry. At the head of a thousand soldiers the future conqueror of Wales and Scotland delivered Acre from a siege. Marched as far as Nazareth with an army of nine thousand men, emulated the fame of his uncle Richard, extorted, by his valour, a ten years' truce, 7385 and escaped, with a dangerous wound, from the dagger of a fanatic assassin. 7386 7387 Antioch, 7388 whose situation had been less exposed to the calamities of the Holy War, was finally occupied and ruined by Bandakhtar, or Bibars, Sultan of Egypt and Syria, the Latin principality was extinguished. And the first seed of the Christian name was dispeopled by the slaughter of seventeen, and the captivity of one hundred, thousand of her inhabitants. The maritime towns of Laodicea, Gabala, Tripoli, Baratus, Sidon, Tyre and Jaffa, and the stronger castles of the Hospitallers and Templars, successively fell, and the whole existence of the Franks was confined to the city and colony of Asti. John of Acre, which is sometimes described by the more classic title of Ptolemy. After the loss of Jerusalem, Acre, 7389 which is distant about seventy miles, became the metropolis of the Latin Christians, and was adorned with strong and stately buildings, with aqueducts, an artificial port, and a double wall. The population was increased by the incessant streams of pilgrims and fugitives, in the pauses of hostility the trade of the east and west was attracted to this convenient station. And the market could offer the produce of every clime and the interpreters of every tongue. But in this conflux of nations, every vice was propagated and practiced. Of all the disciples of Jesus and Muhammad, the male and female inhabitants of Acre were esteemed the most corrupt. Nor could the abuse of religion be corrected by the discipline of law. The city had many sovereigns, and no government. The kings of Jerusalem and Cyprus, of the house of Lusignan, 
the princes of Antioch, the counts of Tripoli and Sidon, the great masters of the hospital, the temple, and the Teutonic order, the republics of Venice, Genoa, and Pisa, the Pope's legate. The kings of France and England, assumed an independent command, seventeen tribunals exercised the power of life and death. Every criminal was protected in the adjacent quarter, and the perpetual jealousy of the nations often burst forth in acts of violence and blood. Some adventurers, who disgraced the ensign of the cross, compensated their want of pay by the plunder of the Mahometan villages, nineteen Syrian merchants, who traded under the public faith, were despoiled and hanged by the Christians. And the denial of satisfaction justified the arms of the Sultan Khalil. He marched against Acre. At the head of sixty thousand horse and one hundred and forty thousand foot, his train of artillery, if I may use the word, was numerous and weighty the separate timbers of a single engine were transported in one hundred wagons. And the royal historian Abulfida, who served with the troops of Hama, was himself a spectator of the holy war. Whatever might be the vices of the Franks, their courage was rekindled by enthusiasm and despair. But they were torn by the discord of seventeen chiefs, and overwhelmed on all sides by the powers of the sultan. After a siege of thirty-three days, the double wall was forced by the Moslems, the principal tower yielded to their engines. The Mamluks made a general assault, the city was stormed, and death or slavery was the lot of sixty thousand Christians. The convent, or rather fortress, of the Templars resisted three days longer, but the great master was pierced with an arrow. And, of five hundred knights, only ten were left alive, less happy than the victims of the sword, if they lived to suffer on a scaffold, in the unjust and cruel proscription of the whole order. The king of Jerusalem, the patriarch and the great master of the hospital, effected their retreat to the shore, but the sea was rough, the vessels were insufficient. And great numbers of the fugitives were drowned before they could reach the Isle of Cyprus, which might comfort Lusignan for the loss of Palestine. By the command of the sultan, the churches and fortifications of the Latin cities were demolished, a motive of avarice or fear still opened the holy sepulchre to some devout and defenceless pilgrims. And a mournful and solitary silence prevailed along the coast which had so long resounded with the world's debate. 7390. LX, the Fourth Crusade. Schism of the Greeks and Latins. State of Constantinople. De, revolt of the Bulgarians. De, Isaac Angelus dethroned by his brother Alexius. De, origin of the Fourth Crusade. De, alliance of the French and Venetians with the son of Isaac. Their naval expedition to Constantinople did, the two sieges and final conquest of the city by the Latins. The restoration of the Western Empire by Charlemagne was speedily followed by the separation of the Greek and Latin churches. 7391 A religious and national animosity still divides the two largest communions of the Christian world. And the schism of Constantinople, by alienating her most useful allies, and provoking her most dangerous enemies, has precipitated the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in the East. In the course of the present history, the aversion of the Greeks for the Latins has been often visible and conspicuous. It was originally derived from the disdain of servitude, inflamed, after the time of Constantine, by the pride of equality or dominion and finally exasperated by the preference which their rebellious subjects had given to the alliance of the Franks. In every age the Greeks were proud of their superiority in profane and religious knowledge, they had first received the light of Christianity, they had pronounced the decrees of the seven general councils. They alone possessed the language of scripture and philosophy, nor should the barbarians, immersed in the darkness of the West, 7392 presumed to argue on the high and mysterious questions of theological science. Those barbarians despised and then turned the restless and subtle levity of the Orientals, the authors of every heresy, and blessed their own simplicity, which was content to hold the tradition of the Apostolic Church. Yet in the seventh century, the synods of Spain, and afterwards of France, improved or corrupted the Nicene Creed, on the mysterious subject of the third person of the Trinity. 7393 In the long controversies of the East, the nature and generation of the Christ had been scrupulously defined, and the well-known relation of Father and Son seemed to convey a faint image to the human mind. The idea of birth was less analogous to the Holy Spirit, 
who, instead of a divine gift or attribute, was considered by the Catholics as a substance, a person, a god, he was not begotten, but in the orthodox style he proceeded. Did he proceed from the Father alone, perhaps by the Son? Or from the Father and the Son? The first of these opinions was asserted by the Greeks, the second by the Latins. And the addition to the Nicene Creed of the word filioque, kindled the flame of discord between the Oriental and the Gallic churches. In the origin of the disputes the Roman pontiffs affected a character of neutrality and moderation, 7394 they condemned the innovation, but they acquiesced in the sentiment. Of their Transalpine brethren, they seemed desirous of casting a veil of silence and charity over the superfluous research. And in the correspondence of Charlemagne and Leo III, the Pope assumes the liberality of a statesman, and the prince descends to the passions and prejudices of a priest. 7395 But the orthodoxy of Rome spontaneously obeyed the impulse of the temporal policy, and the filioque, which Leo wished to erase, was transcribed in the symbol and chanted in the liturgy of the Vatican. The Nicene and Athanasian creeds are held as the Catholic faith, without which none can be saved. And both Papists and Protestants must now sustain and return the anathemas of the Greeks, who deny the procession of the Holy Ghost from the Son, as well as from the Father. Such articles of faith are not susceptible of treaty. But the rules of discipline will vary in remote and independent churches, and the reason, even of divines, might allow, that the difference is inevitable and harmless. The craft or superstition of Rome has imposed on her priests and deacons the rigid obligation of celibacy, among the Greeks it is confined to the bishops, the loss is compensated by dignity or annihilated by age. And the parochial clergy, the papas, enjoy the conjugal society of the wives whom they have married before their entrance into holy orders. A question concerning the asms was fiercely debated in the 11th century, and the essence of the Eucharist was supposed in the East and West to depend on the use of leavened or unleavened bread. Shall I mention in a serious history the furious reproaches that were urged against the Latins, who for a long while remained on the defensive? They neglected to abstain, according to the apostolical decree, from things strangled, and from blood, they fasted, a Jewish observance, on the Saturday of each week, during the first week of Lent they permitted the use of milk and cheese. 7,396 their infirm monks were indulged in the taste of flesh. An animal grease was substituted for the want of vegetable oil, the holy chrism or unction in baptism was reserved to the episcopal order, the bishops, as the bridegrooms of their churches, were decorated with rings. Their priests shaved their faces, and baptized by a single immersion. Such were the crimes which provoked the zeal of the patriarchs of Constantinople, and which were justified with equal zeal by the doctors of the Latin Church. 7397. Bigotry and national aversion are powerful magnifiers of every object of dispute. But the immediate cause of the schism of the Greeks may be traced in the emulation of the leading prelates, who maintained the supremacy of the old metropolis superior to all, and of the reigning capital, inferior to none, in the Christian world. About the middle of the ninth century, Photius, 7398 an ambitious layman, the captain of the guards and principal secretary, was promoted by merit and favor to the more desirable office of Patriarch of Constantinople. In science, even ecclesiastical science, he surpassed the clergy of the age, and the purity of his morals has never been impeached, but his ordination was hasty, his rise was irregular. And Ignatius, his abdicated predecessor, was yet supported by the public compassion and the obstinacy of his adherents. They appealed to the tribunal of Nicholas I, one of the proudest and most aspiring of the Roman pontiffs, who embraced the welcome opportunity of judging and condemning his rival of the East. Their quarrel was embittered by a conflict of jurisdiction over the king and nation of the Bulgarians. Nor was their recent conversion to Christianity of much avail to either prelate, unless he could number the proselytes among the subjects of his power. With the aid of his court the Greek patriarch was victorious. But in the furious contest he deposed in his turn the successor of St. Peter, and involved the Latin Church in the reproach of heresy and schism. Photius sacrificed the peace of the world to a short and precarious reign, he fell with his patron, the Caesar Bardas. 
and Basil the Macedonian performed an act of justice in the restoration of Ignatius, whose age and dignity had not been sufficiently respected. From his monastery, or prison, Photius solicited the favor of the emperor by pathetic complaints and artful flattery, and the eyes of his rival were scarcely closed, when he was again restored to the throne of Constantinople. After the death of Basil he experienced the vicissitudes of courts and the ingratitude of a royal pupil, the patriarch was again deposed, and in his last solitary hours he might regret the freedom of a secular and studious life. In each revolution, the breath, the nod, of the sovereign had been accepted by a submissive clergy, and a synod of three hundred bishops was always prepared to hail the triumph, or to stigmatize the fall, of the holy, or the execrable, Photius. 7399 By a delusive promise of succor or reward, the popes were tempted to countenance these various proceedings, and the synods of Constantinople were ratified by their epistles or legates. But the court and the people, Ignatius and Photius, were equally adverse to their claims, their ministers were insulted or imprisoned, the procession of the Holy Ghost was forgotten, Bulgaria was forever annexed to the Byzantine throne and the schism was prolonged by their rigid censure of all the multiplied ordinations of an irregular patriarch. The darkness and corruption of the tenth century suspended the intercourse, without reconciling the minds, of the two nations. But when the Norman sword restored the churches of Apulia to the jurisdiction of Rome, the departing flock was warned, by a petulant epistle of the Greek patriarch, to avoid and abhor the errors of the Latins. The rising majesty of Rome could no longer brook the insolence of a rebel, and Michael Serralarius was excommunicated in the heart of Constantinople by the Pope's legates. Shaking the dust from their feet, they deposited on the altar of Asti. Sophia a direful anathema 7400 which enumerates the seven mortal heresies of the Greeks, and devotes the guilty teachers, and their unhappy sectaries, to the eternal society of the devil and his angels. According to the emergencies of the church and state, a friendly correspondence was sometimes resumed, the language of charity and concord was sometimes affected, but the Greeks have never recanted their errors. The popes have never repealed their sentence, and from this thunderbolt we may date the consummation of the schism. It was enlarged by each ambitious step of the Roman pontiffs, the emperors blushed and trembled at the ignominious fate of their royal brethren of Germany, and the people were scandalized by the temporal power and military life of the Latin clergy. 7401. The aversion of the Greeks and Latins was nourished and manifested in the three first expeditions to the Holy Land. Alexius Comnus contrived the absence at least of the formidable pilgrims, his successors, Manuel and Isaac Angelus, conspired with the Moslems for the ruin of the greatest princes of the Franks. And their crooked and malignant policy was seconded by the active and voluntary obedience of every order of their subjects. Of this hostile temper, a large portion may doubtless be ascribed to the difference of language, dress, and manners, which severs and alienates the nations of the globe. The pride, as well as the prudence, of the sovereign was deeply wounded by the intrusion of foreign armies, that claimed the right of traversing his dominions. And passing under the walls of his capital, his subjects were insulted and plundered by the rude strangers of the West, and the hatred of the pusillanimous Greeks was sharpened by secret envy of the bold and pious enterprises of the Franks. But these profane causes of national enmity were fortified and inflamed by the venom of religious zeal. Instead of a kind embrace, a hospitable reception from their Christian brethren of the East, every tongue was taught to repeat the names of schismatic and heretic. More odious to an orthodox ear than those of pagan and infidel, instead of being loved for the general conformity of faith and worship, they were abhorred for some rules of discipline, some questions of theology, in which themselves or their teachers might differ from the Oriental Church. In the crusade of Louis VII, the Greek clergy washed and purified the altars which had been defiled by the sacrifice of a French priest. The companions of Frederick Barbarossa deplore the injuries which they endured, both in word and deed, from the peculiar rancor of the bishops and monks. Their prayers and sermons excited the people against the impious barbarians. And the patriarch is accused of declaring, that the faithful might obtain the redemption of all their sins by the extirpation of the schismatics. 
7402 An enthusiast, named Dorotheus, alarmed the fears, and restored the confidence, of the emperor, by a prophetic assurance, that the German heretic, after assaulting the gate of Blacherns, would be made a signal example of the divine vengeance. The passage of these mighty armies were rare and perilous events, but the Crusades introduced a frequent and familiar intercourse between the two nations, which enlarged their knowledge without abating their prejudices. The wealth and luxury of Constantinople demanded the productions of every climate, these imports were balanced by the art and labor of her numerous inhabitants, her situation invites the commerce of the world. And, in every period of her existence, that commerce has been in the hands of foreigners. After the decline of Amalfi, the Venetians, Pisans, and Genoese, introduced their factories and settlements into the capital of the empire, their services were rewarded with honors and immunities, they acquired the possession of lands and houses. Their families were multiplied by marriages with the natives, and, after the toleration of a Mahometan mosque, it was impossible to interdict the churches of the Roman Rite. 7403 The two wives of Manuel Comnes 7404 were of the race of the Franks, the first, a sister-in-law of the Emperor Conrad. The second, a daughter of the Prince of Antioch, he obtained for his son Alexius a daughter of Philip Augustus, King of France. And he bestowed his own daughter on a Marquis of Montferrat, who was educated and dignified in the palace of Constantinople. The Greek encountered the arms, and aspired to the empire, of the West, he esteemed the valor, and trusted the fidelity, of the Franks, 7405 Their military talents were unfitly recompensed by the lucrative offices of judges and treasures. The policy of Manuel had solicited the alliance of the Pope, and the popular voice accused him of a partial bias to the nation and religion of the Latins. 7406 During his reign, and that of his successor Alexius, they were exposed at Constantinople to the reproach of foreigners, heretics, and favorites. And this triple guilt was severely expiated in the tumult, which announced the return and elevation of Andronicus. 7407 The people rose in arms, from the Asiatic shore the tyrant dispatched his troops and galleys to assist the national revenge. And the hopeless resistance of the strangers served only to justify the rage, and sharpen the daggers, of the assassins. Neither age, nor sex, nor the ties of friendship or kindred, could save the victims of national hatred, and avarice, and religious zeal, the Latins were slaughtered in their houses and in the streets, their quarter was reduced to ashes. The clergy were burnt in their churches, and the sick in their hospitals, and some estimate may be formed of the slain from the clemency which sold above four thousand Christians in perpetual slavery to the Turks. The priests and monks were the loudest and most active in the destruction of the schismatics. And they chanted a thanksgiving to the Lord, when the head of a Roman cardinal, the Pope's legate, was severed from his body, fastened to the tail of a dog, and dragged, with savage mockery, through the city. The more diligent of the strangers had retreated, on the first alarm, to their vessels, and escaped through the Hellespont from the scene of blood. In their flight, they burnt and ravaged two hundred miles of the sea coast. Inflicted a severe revenge on the guiltless subjects of the empire, marked the priests and monks as their peculiar enemies, and compensated, by the accumulation of plunder, the loss of their property and friends. On their return, they exposed to Italy and Europe the wealth and weakness, the perfidy and malice, of the Greeks, whose vices were painted as the genuine characters of heresy and schism. The scruples of the first crusaders had neglected the fairest opportunities of securing, by the possession of Constantinople, the way to the Holy Land, domestic revolution invited, and almost compelled. The French and Venetians to achieve the conquest of the Roman Empire of the East. In the series of the Byzantine princes, I have exhibited the hypocrisy and ambition, the tyranny and fall, of Andronicus, the last male of the Comnenian family who reigned at Constantinople. The revolution, which cast him headlong from the throne, saved and exalted Isaac Angelus 7408 who descended by the females from the same imperial dynasty. The successor of a second Nero might have found it an easy task to deserve the esteem and affection of his subjects, they sometimes had reason to regret the administration of Andronicus. The sound and vigorous mind of the tyrant was capable of discerning the connection between his own and the public interest. 
And while he was feared by all who could inspire him with fear, the unsuspected people, and the remote provinces, might bless the inexorable justice of their master. But his successor was vain and jealous of the supreme power, which he wanted courage and abilities to exercise, his vices were pernicious, his virtues, if he possessed any virtues, were useless, to mankind. And the Greeks, who imputed their calamities to his negligence, denied him the merit of any transient or accidental benefits of the times. Isaac slept on the throne, and was awakened only by the sound of pleasure, his vacant hours were amused by comedians and buffoons. And even to these buffoons the emperor was an object of contempt, his feasts and buildings exceeded the examples of royal luxury, the number of his eunuchs and domestics amounted to twenty thousand. And a daily sum of four thousand pounds of silver would swell to four million sterling the annual expense of his household and table. His poverty was relieved by oppression. And the public discontent was inflamed by equal abuses in the collection, and the application, of the revenue. While the Greeks numbered the days of their servitude, a flattering prophet, whom he rewarded with the dignity of patriarch, assured him of a long and victorious reign of thirty-two years. During which he should extend his sway to Mount Libanus, and his conquests beyond the Euphrates. But his only step towards the accomplishment of the prediction was a splendid and scandalous embassy to Saladin 7409 to demand the restitution of the Holy Sepulchre. And to propose an offensive and defensive league with the enemy of the Christian name. In these unworthy hands, of Isaac and his brother, the remains of the Greek Empire crumbled into dust. The island of Cyprus, whose name excites the ideas of elegance and pleasure, was usurped by his namesake, a Comnenian prince. And by a strange concatenation of events, the sword of our English Richard bestowed that kingdom on the house of Lusignan, a rich compensation for the loss of Jerusalem. The honor of the monarchy and the safety of the capital were deeply wounded by the revolt of the Bulgarians and Wallachians. Since the victory of the second Basil, they had supported, above a hundred and seventy years, the loose dominion of the Byzantine princes, but no effectual measures had been adopted to impose the yoke of laws and manners on these savage tribes. By the command of Isaac, their sole means of subsistence, their flocks and herds, were driven away, to contribute towards the pomp of the royal nuptials. And their fierce warriors were exasperated by the denial of equal rank and pay in the military service. Peter and Asen, two powerful chiefs, of the race of the ancient kings 7410 asserted their own rights and the national freedom. Their demoniac impostors proclaimed to the crowd, that their glorious patron Saint Demetrius had forever deserted the cause of the Greeks, and the conflagration spread from the banks of the Danube to the hills of Macedonia and Thrace. After some faint efforts, Isaac Angelus and his brother acquiesced in their independence and the imperial troops were soon discouraged by the bones of their fellow soldiers, that were scattered along the passes of Mount Hemus. By the arms and policy of John or Jonases, the second kingdom of Bulgaria was firmly established. The subtle barbarian sent an embassy to Innocent III, to acknowledge himself a genuine son of Rome in descent and religion 7411 humbly received from the Pope the license of coining money, the royal title and a Latin archbishop or patriarch. The Vatican exulted in the spiritual conquest of Bulgaria, the first object of the schism, and if the Greeks could have preserved the prerogatives of the Church, they would gladly have resigned the rights of the monarchy. The Bulgarians were malicious enough to pray for the long life of Isaac Angelus, the surest pledge of their freedom and prosperity. Yet their chiefs could involve in the same indiscriminate contempt the family and nation of the emperor. In all the Greeks, said Aeson to his troops, the same climate, and character, and education, will be productive of the same fruits. Behold my lance, continued the warrior, and the long streamers that float in the wind. They differ only in color. They are formed of the same silk, and fashioned by the same workman, nor has the stripe that is stained in purple any superior price or value above its fellows. 7412 Several of these candidates for the purple successively rose and fell under the empire of Isaac, a general, who had repelled the fleets of Sicily, was driven to revolt and ruin by the ingratitude of the prince. And his luxurious repose was disturbed by secret conspiracies and popular insurrections. The emperor was saved by accident, 
or the merit of his servants, he was at length oppressed by an ambitious brother, who, for the hope of a precarious diadem, forgot the obligations of nature, of loyalty, and of friendship. 7413 While Isaac in the Thracian valleys pursued the idle and solitary pleasures of the chase, his brother, Alexius Angelus, was invested with the purple, by the unanimous suffrage of the camp, the capital and the clergy subscribed to their choice. And the vanity of the new sovereign rejected the name of his fathers for the lofty and royal appellation of the Comnenian race. On the despicable character of Isaac I have exhausted the language of contempt, and can only add, that, in a reign of eight years, the baser Alexia 7414 was supported by the masculine vices of his wife Euphrosyne. The first intelligence of his fall was conveyed to the late emperor by the hostile aspect and pursuit of the guards, no longer his own, he fled before them above fifty miles, as far as Stagira, in Macedonia. But the fugitive, without an object or a follower, was arrested, brought back to Constantinople, deprived of his eyes, and confined in a lonesome tower, on a scanty allowance of bread and water. At the moment of the revolution, his son Alexius, whom he educated in the hope of empire, was twelve years of age. He was spared by the usurper, and reduced to attend his triumph both in peace and war. But as the army was encamped on the seashore, an Italian vessel facilitated the escape of the royal youth. And, in the disguise of a common sailor, he eluded the search of his enemies, passed the Hellespont, and found a secure refuge in the Isle of Sicily. After saluting the threshold of the Apostles, and imploring the protection of Pope Innocent III, Alexius accepted the kind invitation of his sister Irene, the wife of Philip of Swabia, King of the Romans. But in his passage through Italy, he heard that the flower of Western chivalry was assembled at Venice for the deliverance of the Holy Land. And a ray of hope was kindled in his bosom, that their invincible swords might be employed in his father's restoration. About ten or twelve years after the loss of Jerusalem, the nobles of France were again summoned to the holy war by the voice of a third prophet, less extravagant, perhaps, than Peter the Hermit, but far below a stee. Bernard in the merit of an orator and a statesman. An illiterate priest of the neighborhood of Paris, Folk of Neuilly, 7415 forsook his parochial duty, to assume the more flattering character of a popular and itinerant missionary. The fame of his sanctity and miracles was spread over the land, he declaimed, with severity and vehemence, against the vices of the age. And his sermons, which he preached in the streets of Paris, converted the robbers, the usurers, the prostitutes, and even the doctors and scholars of the university. No sooner did Innocent III ascend the chair of Asti. Peter, than he proclaimed in Italy, Germany, and France, the obligation of a new crusade. 7416 The eloquent pontiff described the ruin of Jerusalem, the triumph of the pagans, and the shame of Christendom. His liberality proposed the redemption of sins, a plenary indulgence to all who should serve in Palestine, either a year in person, or two years by a substitute. 7417 And among his legates and orators who blew the sacred trumpet, Folk of Neuilly was the loudest and most successful. The situation of the principal monarchs was averse to the pious summons. The Emperor Frederick II was a child. And his kingdom of Germany was disputed by the rival houses of Brunswick and Swabia, the memorable factions of the Guelphs and Guidelines. Philip Augustus of France had performed, and could not be persuaded to renew, the perilous vow. But as he was not less ambitious of praise than of power, he cheerfully instituted a perpetual fund for the defense of the Holy Land. Richard of England was satiated with the glory and misfortunes of his first adventure. And he presumed to deride the exhortations of Folk of Neuilly, who was not abashed in the presence of kings. You advise me, said Plantagenet, to dismiss my three daughters, pride, avarice, and incontinence, I bequeath them to the most deserving. My pride to the Knights Templars, my avarice to the monks of Sisto, and my incontinence to the prelates. But the preacher was heard and obeyed by the great vassals, the princes of the second order. And Theobald, or Thibault, Count of Champagne, was the foremost in the holy race. The valiant youth, at the age of twenty-two years, was encouraged by the domestic examples of his father, who marched in the second crusade, and of his elder brother, 
who had ended his days in Palestine with the title of King of Jerusalem. 2,200 knights owed service and homage to his peerage, 7418 The nobles of Champagne excelled in all the exercises of war. 7419 And, by his marriage with the heiress of Navarre, Thibault could draw a band of hardy Gascons from either side of the Pyrenean Mountains. His companion in arms was Louis, Count of Blois and Chartres. Like himself of regal lineage, for both the princes were nephews, at the same time, of the kings of France and England. In a crowd of prelates and barons, who imitated their zeal, I distinguished the birth and merit of Matthew of Montmorency. The famous Simon of Montfort, the scourge of the Albigeois. And a valiant noble, Geoffrey of Villahardouin, 7420 Marshal of Champagne, 7421 who has condescended, in the rude idiom of his age and country. 7422 to write or dictate 7423 an original narrative of the councils and actions in which he bore a memorable part. At the same time, Baldwin, Count of Flanders, who had married the sister of Thibault, assumed the cross at Bruges, with his brother Henry, and the principal knights and citizens of that rich and industrious province. 7424 The vow which the chiefs had pronounced in churches, they ratified in tournaments, the operations of the war were debated in full and frequent assemblies. And it was resolved to seek the deliverance of Palestine and Egypt, a country, since Saladin's death, which was almost ruined by famine and civil war. But the fate of so many royal armies displayed the toils and perils of a land expedition. And if the Flemings dwelt along the ocean, the French barons were destitute of ships and ignorant of navigation. They embraced the wise resolution of choosing six deputies or representatives, of whom Villahardouin was one, with a discretionary trust to direct the motions, and to pledge the faith, of the whole confederacy. The maritime states of Italy were alone possessed of the means of transporting the holy warriors with their arms and horses, and the six deputies proceeded to Venice, to solicit, on motives of piety or interest, the aid of that powerful republic. In the invasion of Italy by Attila, I have mentioned 7425 the flight of the Venetians from the fallen cities of the continent, and their obscure shelter in the chain of islands that lined the extremity of the Adriatic Gulf. In the midst of the waters, free, indigent, laborious, and inaccessible, they gradually coalesced into a republic, the first foundations of Venice were laid in the island of Rialto. And the annual election of the twelve tribunes was superseded by the permanent office of a duke or doge. On the verge of the two empires, the Venetians exult in the belief of primitive and perpetual independence. 7426 Against the Latins, their antique freedom has been asserted by the sword, and may be justified by the pen. Charlemagne himself resigned all claims of sovereignty to the islands of the Adriatic Gulf, his son Pepin was repulsed in the attacks of the lagunas or canals, too deep for the cavalry, and too shallow for the vessels. And in every age, under the German Caesars, the lands of the Republic have been clearly distinguished from the Kingdom of Italy. But the inhabitants of Venice were considered by themselves, by strangers, and by their sovereigns, as an inalienable portion of the Greek Empire, 7427 in the 9th and 10th centuries, the proofs of their subjection are numerous and unquestionable. And the vain titles, the servile honours, of the Byzantine court, so ambitiously solicited by their dukes, would have degraded the magistrates of a free people. But the bands of this dependence, which was never absolute or rigid, were imperceptibly relaxed by the ambition of Venice and the weakness of Constantinople. Obedience was softened into respect, privilege ripened into prerogative, and the freedom of domestic government was fortified by the independence of foreign dominion. The maritime cities of Istria and Dalmatia bowed to the sovereigns of the Adriatic. And when they armed against the Normans in the cause of Alexius, the emperor applied, not to the duty of his subjects, but to the gratitude and generosity of his faithful allies. The sea was their patrimony, 7428 The western parts of the Mediterranean, from Tuscany to Gibraltar, were indeed abandoned to their rivals of Pisa and Genoa, but the Venetians acquired an early and lucrative share of the commerce of Greece and Egypt. Their riches increased with the increasing demand of Europe, their manufactures of silk and glass, perhaps the institution of their bank, are of high antiquity. 
and they enjoyed the fruits of their industry in the magnificence of public and private life. To assert her flag, to avenge her injuries, to protect the freedom of navigation, the Republic could launch and man a fleet of a hundred galleys. And the Greeks, the Saracens, and the Normans, were encountered by her naval arms. The Franks of Syria were assisted by the Venetians in the reduction of the sea coast, but their zeal was neither blind nor disinterested. And in the conquest of Tyre, they shared the sovereignty of a city, the first seat of the commerce of the world. The policy of Venice was marked by the avarice of a trading, and the insolence of a maritime, power. Yet her ambition was prudent, nor did she often forget that if armed galleys were the effect and safeguard, merchant vessels were the cause and supply, of her greatness. In her religion, she avoided the schisms of the Greeks, without yielding a servile obedience to the Roman pontiff, and a free intercourse with the infidels of every clime appears to have allayed betimes the fever of superstition. Her primitive government was a loose mixture of democracy and monarchy, the doge was elected by the votes of the general assembly, as long as he was popular and successful, he reigned with the pomp and authority of a prince. But in the frequent revolutions of the state, he was deposed, or banished, or slain, by the justice or injustice of the multitude. The twelfth century produced the first rudiments of the wise and jealous aristocracy, which has reduced the doge to a pageant, and the people to a cipher. 7429. When the six ambassadors of the French pilgrims arrived at Venice, they were hospitably entertained in the palace of St. Mark, by the reigning duke, his name was Henry Dandolo. 7430 and he shone in the last period of human life as one of the most illustrious characters of the times. Under the weight of years, and after the loss of his eyes, 7431 Dandolo retained a sound understanding and a manly courage, the spirit of a hero, ambitious to signalize his reign by some memorable exploits. And the wisdom of a patriot, anxious to build his fame on the glory and advantage of his country. He praised the bold enthusiasm and liberal confidence of the barons and their deputies, in such a cause, and with such associates, he should aspire, were he a private man, to terminate his life. But he was the servant of the Republic, and some delay was requisite to consult, on this arduous business, the judgment of his colleagues. The proposal of the French was first debated by the six sages who had been recently appointed to control the administration of the Doge, it was next disclosed to the forty members of the Council of State. And finally communicated to the Legislative Assembly of 450 representatives, who were annually chosen in the six quarters of the city. In peace and war, the Doge was still the chief of the Republic. His legal authority was supported by the personal reputation of Dandolo, his arguments of public interest were balanced and approved, and he was authorized to inform the ambassadors of the following conditions of the treaty. 7432 It was proposed that the Crusaders should assemble at Venice, on the feast of St. John of the ensuing year. That flat-bottomed vessels should be prepared for 4,500 horses, and 9,000 squires, with a number of ships sufficient for the embarkation of 4,500 knights, and 20,000 foot. That during a term of nine months they should be supplied with provisions, and transported to whatsoever coast the service of God and Christendom should require, and that the Republic should join the armament with a squadron of fifty galleys. It was required, that the pilgrims should pay, before their departure, a sum of eighty-five thousand marks of silver, and that all conquests, by sea and land, should be equally divided between the Confederates. The terms were hard. But the emergency was pressing, and the French barons were not less profuse of money than of blood. A general assembly was convened to ratify the treaty, the stately chapel and place of St. Mark were filled with ten thousand citizens. And the noble deputies were taught a new lesson of humbling themselves before the majesty of the people. Illustrious Venetians, said the Marshal of Champagne, we are sent by the greatest and most powerful barons of France to implore the aid of the masters of the sea for the deliverance of Jerusalem. They have enjoined us to fall prostrate at your feet, nor will we rise from the ground till you have promised to avenge with us the injuries of Christ. The eloquence of their words and tears, 7433 their martial aspect, and suppliant attitude, were applauded by a universal shout, as it were, says Geoffrey by the sound of an earthquake. 
The Venerable Doge ascended the pulpit to urge their request by those motives of honor and virtue, which alone can be offered to a popular assembly, the treaty was transcribed on parchment, attested with oaths and seals. Mutually accepted by the weeping and joyful representatives of France and Venice. And dispatched to Rome for the approbation of Pope Innocent III. Two thousand marks were borrowed of the merchants for the first expenses of the armament. Of the six deputies, two repassed the Alps to announce their success, while their four companions made a fruitless trial of the zeal and emulation of the republics of Genoa and Pisa. The execution of the treaty was still opposed by unforeseen difficulties and delays. The marshal, on his return to Troyes, was embraced and approved by Thibault Count of Champagne, who had been unanimously chosen general of the Confederates. But the health of that valiant youth already declined, and soon became hopeless, and he deplored the untimely fate, which condemned him to expire, not in a field of battle, but on a bed of sickness. To his brave and numerous vassals, the dying prince distributed his treasures, they swore in his presence to accomplish his vow and their own, but some there were, says the marshal, who accepted his gifts and forfeited their words. The more resolute champions of the cross held a parliament at Soissons for the election of a new general. But such was the incapacity, or jealousy, or reluctance, of the princes of France, that none could be found both able and willing to assume the conduct of the enterprise. They acquiesced in the choice of a stranger, of Boniface Marquis of Montferrat, descended of a race of heroes, and himself of conspicuous fame in the wars and negotiations of the times. 7434 Nor could the piety or ambition of the Italian chief decline this honorable invitation. After visiting the French court, where he was received as a friend and kinsman, the Marquis, in the Church of Soissons, was invested with the cross of a pilgrim and the staff of a general. And immediately repassed the Alps, to prepare for the distant expedition of the East. About the festival of the Pentecost he displayed his banner, and marched towards Venice at the head of the Italians, he was preceded or followed by the Counts of Flanders and Blois, and the most respectable barons of France. And their numbers were swelled by the pilgrims of Germany 7435 whose object and motives were similar to their own. The Venetians had fulfilled, and even surpassed, their engagements, stables were constructed for the horses, and barracks for the troops, the magazines were abundantly replenished with forage and provisions. And the fleet of transports, ships, and galleys, was ready to hoist sail as soon as the Republic had received the price of the freight and armament. But that price far exceeded the wealth of the crusaders who were assembled at Venice. The Flemings, whose obedience to their count was voluntary and precarious, had embarked in their vessels for the long navigation of the ocean and Mediterranean. And many of the French and Italians had preferred a cheaper and more convenient passage from Marseilles and Apulia to the Holy Land. Each pilgrim might complain, that after he had furnished his own contribution, he was made responsible for the deficiency of his absent brethren, the gold and silver plate of the chiefs, which they freely delivered to the treasury of Esti. Marx was a generous but inadequate sacrifice, and after all their efforts, 34,000 marks were still wanting to complete the stipulated sum. The obstacle was removed by the policy and patriotism of the doge, who proposed to the barons, that if they would join their arms in reducing some revolted cities of Dalmatia, he would expose his person in the holy war. And obtain from the republic a long indulgence, till some wealthy conquest should afford the means of satisfying the debt. After much scruple and hesitation, they chose rather to accept the offer than to relinquish the enterprise. And the first hostilities of the fleet and army were directed against Zara, 7436 a strong city of the Sclavonian coast, which had renounced its allegiance to Venice, and implored the protection of the king of Hungary. 7437 the crusaders burst the chain or boom of the harbour, landed their horses, troops, and military engines. And compelled the inhabitants, after a defence of five days, to surrender at discretion, their lives were spared but the revolt was punished by the pillage of their houses and the demolition of their walls. The season was far advanced. The French and Venetians resolved to pass the winter in a secure harbour and plentiful country, but their repose was disturbed by national and tumultuous quarrels of the soldiers and mariners. The conquest of Zara had scattered the seeds of discord and scandal, 
the arms of the allies had been stained in their outset with the blood, not of infidels. But of Christians, the king of Hungary and his new subjects were themselves enlisted under the banner of the cross. And the scruples of the devout were magnified by the fear of lassitude of the reluctant pilgrims. The Pope had excommunicated the false crusaders who had pillaged and massacred their brethren 7438 and only the Marquis Boniface and Simon of Montfort 7439 escaped these spiritual thunders. The one by his absence from the siege, the other by his final departure from the camp. Innocent might absolve the simple and submissive penitents of France. But he was provoked by the stubborn reason of the Venetians, who refused to confess their guilt, to accept their pardon, or to allow, in their temporal concerns, the interposition of a priest. The assembly of such formidable powers by sea and land had revived the hopes of young 7440 Alexius, and both at Venice and Zara, he solicited the arms of the crusaders, for his own restoration in his father s 7441 deliverance. The royal youth was recommended by Philip King of Germany, his prayers and presence excited the compassion of the camp, and his cause was embraced and pleaded by the Marquis of Montferrat and the Doge of Venice. A double alliance, and the dignity of Caesar, had connected with the imperial family the two elder brothers of Boniface, 7442 he expected to derive a kingdom from the important service. And the more generous ambition of Dandolo was eager to secure the inestimable benefits of trade and dominion that might accrue to his country. 7443 Their influence procured a favorable audience for the ambassadors of Alexius. And if the magnitude of his offers excited some suspicion, the motives and rewards which he displayed might justify the delay in diversion of those forces which had been consecrated to the deliverance of Jerusalem. He promised in his own and his father's name, that as soon as they should be seated on the throne of Constantinople, they would terminate the long schism of the Greeks, and submit themselves and their people to the lawful supremacy of the Roman Church. He engaged to recompense the labors and merits of the Crusaders, by the immediate payment of two hundred thousand marks of silver, to accompany them in person to Egypt. Or, if it should be judged more advantageous, to maintain, during a year, ten thousand men, and, during his life, five hundred knights, for the service of the Holy Land. These tempting conditions were accepted by the Republic of Venice. And the eloquence of the Doge and Marquis persuaded the Counts of Flanders, Blois, and Street Pole, with eight barons of France, to join in the glorious enterprise. A treaty of offensive and defensive alliance was confirmed by their oaths and seals. And each individual, according to his situation and character, was swayed by the hope of public or private advantage, by the honor of restoring an exiled monarch, or by the sincere and probable opinion, that their efforts in Palestine would be fruitless and unavailing, and that the acquisition of Constantinople must precede and prepare the recovery of Jerusalem. But they were the chiefs or equals of a valiant band of freemen and volunteers, who thought and acted for themselves, the soldiers and clergy were divided. And, if a large majority subscribed to the alliance, the numbers and arguments of the dissidents were strong and respectable. 7444 The boldest hearts were appalled by the report of the naval power and impregnable strength of Constantinople. And their apprehensions were disguised to the world, and perhaps to themselves, by the more decent objections of religion and duty. They alleged the sanctity of a vow which had drawn them from their families and homes to the rescue of the Holy Sepulchre. Nor should the dark and crooked counsels of human policy divert them from a pursuit, the event of which was in the hands of the Almighty. Their first offense, the attack of Zara, had been severely punished by the reproach of their conscience and the censures of the Pope, nor would they again imbrue their hands in the blood of their fellow Christians. The Apostle of Rome had pronounced, nor would they usurp the right of avenging with the sword the schism of the Greeks and the doubtful usurpation of the Byzantine monarch. On these principles or pretenses, many pilgrims, the most distinguished for their valor and piety, withdrew from the camp. And their retreat was less pernicious than the open or secret opposition of a discontented party, that labored, on every occasion, to separate the army and disappoint the enterprise. Notwithstanding this defection, the departure of the fleet and army was vigorously pressed by the Venetians, whose zeal for the service of the royal youth concealed a just resentment to his nation and family. They were mortified by the recent preference which had been given to Pisa, the rival of their trade, 
they had a long arrear of debt and injury to liquidate with the Byzantine court. And Dandolo might not discourage the popular tale, that he had been deprived of his eyes by the Emperor Manuel, who perfidiously violated the sanctity of an ambassador. A similar armament, for ages, had not rode the Adriatic, it was composed of 120 flat-bottomed vessels or palanders for the horses, 240 transports filled with men and arms. Seventy storeships laden with provisions, and fifty stout galleys, well prepared for the encounter of an enemy. 7445 While the wind was favorable, the sky serene, and the water smooth, every eye was fixed with wonder and delight on the scene of military and naval pomp which overspread the sea. 7446 The shields of the knights and squires, at once an ornament and a defense, were arranged on either side of the ships, the banners of the nations and families were displayed from the stern. Our modern artillery was supplied by three hundred engines for casting stones and darts, the fatigues of the way were cheered with the sound of music. And the spirits of the adventurers were raised by the mutual assurance, that forty thousand Christian heroes were equal to the conquest of the world. 7447 In the navigation 7448 from Venice and Zara, the fleet was successfully steered by the skill and experience of the Venetian pilots, at Durazzo. The Confederates first landed on the territories of the Greek Empire, the Isle of Corfu afforded a station and repose. They doubled, without accident, the perilous Cape of Malia, the southern point of Peloponnesus or the Moria, made a descent in the islands of Negropont and Andrus, and cast anchor at Abydus on the Asiatic side of the Hellespont. These preludes of conquest were easy and bloodless, the Greeks of the provinces, without patriotism or courage, were crushed by an irresistible force, the presence of the lawful heir might justify their obedience. And it was rewarded by the modesty and discipline of the Latins. As they penetrated through the Hellespont, the magnitude of their navy was compressed in a narrow channel, and the face of the waters was darkened with innumerable sails. They again expanded in the basin of the Propontis, and traversed that placid sea, till they approached the European shore, at the Abbey of St. Stephen, three leagues to the west of Constantinople. The prudent doge dissuaded them from dispersing themselves in a populous and hostile land. And, as their stock of provisions was reduced, it was resolved, in the season of harvest, to replenish their store ships in the fertile islands of the Propontis. With this resolution, they directed their course, but a strong gale, and their own impatience, drove them to the eastward. And so near did they run to the shore and the city, that some volleys of stones and darts were exchanged between the ships and the rampart. As they passed along, they gazed with admiration on the capital of the east, or, as it should seem, of the earth, rising from her seven hills, and towering over the continents of Europe and Asia. The swelling domes and lofty spires of five hundred palaces and churches were gilded by the sun and reflected in the waters, the walls were crowded with soldiers and spectators, whose numbers they beheld, of whose temper they were ignorant. And each heart was chilled by the reflection, that, since the beginning of the world, such an enterprise had never been undertaken by such a handful of warriors. But the momentary apprehension was dispelled by hope and valor. And every man, says the Marshal of Champagne, glanced his eye on the sword or lance which he must speedily use in the glorious conflict. 7449 The Latins cast anchor before Chalcedon. The mariners only were left in the vessels, the soldiers, horses, and arms, were safely landed, and, in the luxury of an imperial palace, the barons tasted the first fruits of their success. On the third day, the fleet and army moved toward Scutari, the Asiatic suburb of Constantinople, a detachment of five hundred Greek horse was surprised and defeated by fourscore French knights. And in a halt of nine days, the camp was plentifully supplied with forage and provisions. In relating the invasion of a great empire, it may seem strange that I have not described the obstacles which should have checked the progress of the strangers. The Greeks, in truth, were an unwarlike people. But they were rich, industrious, and subject to the will of a single man, had that man been capable of fear, when his enemies were at a distance, or of courage, when they approached his person. The first rumor of his nephew's alliance with the French and Venetians was despised by the usurper Alexius, his flatterers persuaded him, that in this contempt he was bold and sincere. 
And each evening, in the close of the banquet, he thrice discomfited the barbarians of the West. These barbarians had been justly terrified by the report of his naval power. And the 1600 fishing boats of Constantinople 7450 could have manned a fleet, to sink them in the Adriatic, or stop their entrance in the mouth of the Hellespont. But all force may be annihilated by the negligence of the prince and the venality of his ministers. The great duke, or admiral, made a scandalous, almost a public, auction of the sails, the masts, and the rigging, the royal forests were reserved for the more important purpose of the chase. And the trees, says Nicetas, were guarded by the eunuchs, like the groves of religious worship. 7451 From his dream of pride, Alexius was awakened by the siege of Zara, and the rapid advances of the Latins. As soon as he saw the danger was real, he thought it inevitable, and his vain presumption was lost in abject despondency and despair. He suffered these contemptible barbarians to pitch their camp in the sight of the palace. And his apprehensions were thinly disguised by the pomp and menace of a suppliant embassy. The sovereign of the Romans was astonished, his ambassadors were instructed to say, at the hostile appearance of the strangers. If these pilgrims were sincere in their vow for the deliverance of Jerusalem, his voice must applaud, and his treasures should assist, their pious design but should they dare to invade the sanctuary of empire, their numbers. Were they ten times more considerable, should not protect them from his just resentment. The answer of the doge and barons was simple and magnanimous. In the cause of honor and justice, they said, we despise the usurper of Greece, his threats, and his offers. Our friendship and his allegiance are due to the lawful heir, to the young prince, who is seated among us, and to his father, the emperor Isaac, who has been deprived of his scepter, his freedom, and his eyes, by the crime of an ungrateful brother. Let that brother confess his guilt and implore forgiveness, and we ourselves will intercede, that he may be permitted to live in affluence and security. But let him not insult us by a second message. Our reply will be made in arms, in the palace of Constantinople. On the tenth day of their encampment at Scutari, the crusaders prepared themselves, as soldiers and as Catholics, for the passage of the Bosphorus. Perilous indeed was the adventure. The stream was broad and rapid, in a calm the current of the Euxine might drive down the liquid and unextinguishable fires of the Greeks, and the opposite shores of Europe were defended by seventy thousand horse and foot in formidable array. On this memorable day, which happened to be bright and pleasant, the Latins were distributed in six battles or divisions. The first, or vanguard, was led by the Count of Flanders, one of the most powerful of the Christian princes in the skill and number of his crossbows. The four successive battles of the French were commanded by his brother Henry, the Counts of Esti. Paul and Blois, and Matthew of Montmorency, the last of whom was honoured by the voluntary service of the Marshal and Nobles of Champagne. The sixth division, the rear guard and reserve of the army, was conducted by the Marquis of Montferrat, at the head of the Germans and Lombards. The chargers, saddled, with their long caparisons dragging on the ground, were embarked in the flat palanders, 7452 and the knights stood by the side of their horses, in complete armor, their helmets laced, and their lances in their hands. The numerous train of sergeant 7453 and archers occupied the transports, and each transport was towed by the strength and swiftness of a galley. The six divisions traversed the Bosphorus, without encountering an enemy or an obstacle, to land the foremost was the wish, to conquer or die was the resolution, of every division and of every soldier. Jealous of the preeminence of danger, the knights in their heavy armor leaped into the sea, when it rose as high as their girdle, the sergeants and archers were animated by their valor. And the squires, letting down the drawbridges of the palanders, led the horses to the shore. Before their squadrons could mount, and form, and couch their lances, the seventy thousand Greeks had vanished from their sight, the timid Alexius gave the example to his troops. And it was only by the plunder of his rich pavilions that the Latins were informed that they had fought against an emperor. In the first consternation of the flying enemy, they resolved, by a double attack, to open the entrance of the harbour. The tower of Galata 7454 in the suburb of Pera, was attacked and stormed by the French, 
while the Venetians assumed the more difficult task of forcing the boom or chain that was stretched from that tower to the Byzantine shore. After some fruitless attempts, their intrepid perseverance prevailed, twenty ships of war, the relics of the Grecian navy, were either sunk or taken, the enormous and massy links of iron were cut asunder by the shears, or broken by the weight. Of the galleys. 7455 and the Venetian fleet, safe and triumphant, rode at anchor in the port of Constantinople. By these daring achievements, a remnant of 20,000 Latins solicited the license of besieging a capital which contained above 400,000 inhabitants 7456 able, though not willing, to bear arms in defense of their country. Such an account would indeed suppose a population of near two millions, but whatever abatement may be required in the numbers of the Greeks, the belief of those numbers will equally exalt the fearless spirit of their assailants. In the choice of the attack, the French and Venetians were divided by their habits of life and warfare. The former affirmed with truth, that Constantinople was most accessible on the side of the sea and the harbour. The latter might assert with honour, that they had long enough trusted their lives and fortunes to a frail bark and a precarious element, and loudly demanded a trial of knighthood, a firm ground, and a close onset, either on foot or on horseback. After a prudent compromise, of employing the two nations by sea and land, in the service best suited to their character, the fleet covering the army. They both proceeded from the entrance to the extremity of the harbour, the stone bridge of the river was hastily repaired. And the six battles of the French formed their encampment against the front of the capital, the basis of the triangle which runs about four miles from the port to the Propontis. 7457 on the edge of a broad ditch, at the foot of a lofty rampart, they had leisure to contemplate the difficulties of their enterprise. The gates to the right and left of their narrow camp poured forth frequent sallies of cavalry and light infantry, which cut off their stragglers, swept the country of provisions, sounded the alarm five or six times in the course of each day, and compelled them to plant a palisade, and sink an entrenchment, for their immediate safety. In the supplies and convoys the Venetians had been too sparing, or the Franks too voracious, the usual complaints of hunger and scarcity were heard, and perhaps felt their stock of flour would be exhausted in three weeks. And their disgust of salt meat tempted them to taste the flesh of their horses. The trembling usurper was supported by Theodore Lascaris, his son-in-law, a valiant youth, who aspired to save and to rule his country. The Greeks, regardless of that country, were awakened to the defense of their religion, but their firmest hope was in the strength and spirit of the Varangian guards, of the Danes and English, as they are named in the writers of the times. 7458 After ten days' incessant labor, the ground was leveled, the ditch filled, the approaches of the besiegers were regularly made, and 250 engines of assault exercised their various powers to clear the rampart, to batter the walls, and to sap the foundations. On the first appearance of a breach, the scaling ladders were applied, the numbers that defended the vantage ground repulsed and oppressed the adventurous Latins. But they admired the resolution of fifteen knights and sergeants, who had gained the ascent, and maintained their perilous station till they were precipitated or made prisoners by the imperial guards. On the side of the harbour the naval attack was more successfully conducted by the Venetians, and that industrious people employed every resource that was known and practiced before the invention of gunpowder. A double line, three bowshots in front, was formed by the galleys and ships. And the swift motion of the former was supported by the weight and loftiness of the latter, whose decks, and poops, and turret, were the platforms of military engines, that discharged their shot over the heads of the first line. The soldiers, who leaped from the galleys on shore, immediately planted and ascended their scaling ladders, while the large ships, advancing more slowly into the intervals, and lowering a drawbridge, opened a way through the air from their masts to the rampart. In the midst of the conflict, the doge, a venerable and conspicuous form, stood aloft in complete armor on the prow of his galley. The great standard of St. Mark was displayed before him. His threats, promises, and exhortations, urged the diligence of the rowers, his vessel was the first that struck, and Dandolo was the first warrior on the shore. The nations admired the magnanimity of the blind old man, without reflecting that his age and infirmities diminished the price of life, and enhanced the value of immortal glory. 
On a sudden, by an invisible hand, for the standard bearer was probably slain, the banner of the Republic was fixed on the rampart, twenty-five towers were rapidly occupied. And, by the cruel expedient of fire, the Greeks were driven from the adjacent quarter. The Doge had dispatched the intelligence of his success, when he was checked by the danger of his confederates. Nobly declaring that he would rather die with the pilgrims than gain a victory by their destruction, Dandolo relinquished his advantage, recalled his troops, and hastened to the scene of action. He found the six weary diminutive battles of the French encompassed by sixty squadrons of the Greek cavalry, the least of which was more numerous than the largest of their divisions. Shame and despair had provoked Alexius to the last effort of a general sally, but he was awed by the firm order and manly aspect of the Latins, and, after skirmishing at a distance, withdrew his troops in the close of the evening. The silence or tumult of the night exasperated his fears, and the timid usurper, collecting a treasure of ten thousand pounds of gold, basely deserted his wife, his people, and his fortune, threw himself into a bark, stole through the Bosphorus, and landed in shameful safety in an obscure harbour of Thrace. As soon as they were apprised of his flight, the Greek nobles sought pardon and peace in the dungeon where the blind Isaac expected each hour the visit of the executioner. Again saved and exalted by the vicissitudes of fortune, the captive in his imperial robes was replaced on the throne, and surrounded with prostrate slaves, whose real terror and affected joy he was incapable of discerning. At the dawn of day, hostilities were suspended, and the Latin chiefs were surprised by a message from the lawful and reigning emperor, who was impatient to embrace his son, and to reward his generous deliverers. 7459 but these generous deliverers were unwilling to release their hostage, till they had obtained from his father the payment, or at least the promise, of their recompense. They chose four ambassadors, Matthew of Montmorency, our historian the Marshal of Champagne, and two Venetians, to congratulate the emperor. The gates were thrown open on their approach, the streets on both sides were lined with the battle axes of the Danish and English guard, the presence chamber glittered with gold and jewels. The false substitute of virtue and power, by the side of the blind Isaac his wife was seated, the sister of the king of Hungary, and by her appearance, the noble matrons of Greece were drawn from their domestic retirement, and mingled with the circle of senators and soldiers. The Latins, by the mouth of the marshal, spoke like men conscious of their merits, but who respected the work of their own hands. And the emperor clearly understood, that his son's engagements with Venice and the pilgrims must be ratified without hesitation or delay. Withdrawing into a private chamber with the empress, a chamberlain, an interpreter, and the four ambassadors, the father of young Alexius inquired with some anxiety into the nature of his stipulations. The submission of the Eastern Empire to the Pope, the succor of the Holy Land, and a present contribution of two hundred thousand marks of silver. These conditions are weighty, was his prudent reply, they are hard to accept, and difficult to perform. But no conditions can exceed the measure of your services and deserts. After this satisfactory assurance, the barons mounted on horseback, and introduced the heir of Constantinople to the city and palace, his youth and marvellous adventures engaged every heart in his favour. And Alexius was solemnly crowned with his father in the Dome of Asti. Sophia in the first days of his reign, the people, already blessed with the restoration of plenty and peace, was delighted by the joyful catastrophe of the tragedy. And the discontent of the nobles, their regret, and their fears, were covered by the polished surface of pleasure and loyalty the mixture of two discordant nations in the same capital might have been pregnant with mischief and danger. And the suburb of Galata, or Pera, was assigned for the quarters of the French and Venetians. But the liberty of trade and familiar intercourse was allowed between the friendly nations, and each day the pilgrims were tempted by devotion or curiosity to visit the churches and palaces of Constantinople. Their rude minds, insensible perhaps of the finer arts, were astonished by the magnificent scenery, and the poverty of their native towns enhanced the populousness and riches of the first metropolis of Christendom. 7460 Descending from his state, young Alexius was prompted by interest and gratitude to repeat his frequent and familiar visits to his Latin allies. And in the freedom of the table, 
the gay petulance of the French sometimes forgot the Emperor of the East. 7461 In their most serious conferences, it was agreed that the reunion of the two churches must be the result of patience and time. But avarice was less tractable than zeal, and a larger sum was instantly dispersed to appease the wants and silence the importunity of the crusaders. 7462 Alexius was alarmed by the approaching hour of their departure, their absence might have relieved him from the engagement which he was yet incapable of performing. But his friends would have left him, naked and alone, to the caprice and prejudice of a perfidious nation. He wished to bribe their stay, the delay of a year, by undertaking to defray their expense, and to satisfy, in their name, the freight of the Venetian vessels. The offer was agitated in the council of the barons. And, after a repetition of their debates and scruples, a majority of votes again acquiesced in the advice of the doge and the prayer of the young emperor. At the price of sixteen hundred pounds of gold, he prevailed on the Marquis of Montferrat to lead him with an army round the provinces of Europe. To establish his authority, and pursue his uncle, while Constantinople was awed by the presence of Baldwin and his confederates of France and Flanders. The expedition was successful, the blind emperor exulted in the success of his arms, and listened to the predictions of his flatterers, that the same providence which had raised him from the dungeon to the throne, would heal his gout. Restore his sight, and watch over the long prosperity of his reign. Yet the mind of the suspicious old man was tormented by the rising glories of his son. Nor could his pride conceal from his envy, that, while his own name was pronounced in faint and reluctant acclamations, the royal youth was the theme of spontaneous and universal praise. 7463. By the recent invasion, the Greeks were awakened from a dream of nine centuries, from the vain presumption that the capital of the Roman Empire was impregnable to foreign arms. The strangers of the West had violated the city, and bestowed the scepter, of Constantine, their imperial clients soon became as unpopular as themselves, the well-known vices of Isaac were rendered still more contemptible by his infirmities. And the young Alexius was hated as an apostate, who had renounced the manners and religion of his country. His secret covenant with the Latins was divulged or suspected, the people, and especially the clergy, were devoutly attached to their faith and superstition. And every convent, and every shop, resounded with the danger of the church and the tyranny of the Pope. 7464 An empty treasury could ill supply the demands of regal luxury and foreign extortion, the Greeks refused to avert, by a general tax, the impending evils of servitude and pillage. The oppression of the rich excited a more dangerous and personal resentment, and if the emperor melted the plate, and despoiled the images, of the sanctuary, he seemed to justify the complaints of heresy and sacrilege. During the absence of Marquis Boniface and his imperial pupil, Constantinople was visited with a calamity which might be justly imputed to the zeal and indiscretion of the Flemish pilgrims. 7465 In one of their visits to the city, they were scandalized by the aspect of a mosque or synagogue, in which one god was worshipped, without a partner or a son. Their effectual mode of controversy was to attack the infidels with the sword, and their habitation with fire, but the infidels, and some Christian neighbors, presumed to defend their lives and properties. And the flames which bigotry had kindled, consumed the most orthodox and innocent structures. During eight days and nights, the conflagration spread above a league in front, from the harbor to the Propontis, over the thickest and most populous regions of the city. It is not easy to count the stately churches and palaces that were reduced to a smoking ruin, to value the merchandise that perished in the trading streets, or to number the families that were involved in the common destruction. By this outrage, which the doge and the barons in vain affected to disclaim, the name of the Latins became still more unpopular. And the colony of that nation, above fifteen thousand persons, consulted their safety in a hasty retreat from the city to the protection of their standard in the suburb of Pera. The emperor returned in triumph. But the firmest and most dexterous policy would have been insufficient to steer him through the tempest, which overwhelmed the person and government of that unhappy youth. His own inclination, and his father's advice, attached him to his benefactors, but Alexius hesitated between gratitude and patriotism, between the fear of his subjects and of his allies. 
7466 by his feeble and fluctuating conduct he lost the esteem and confidence of both. And, while he invited the Marquis of Montferrat to occupy the palace, he suffered the nobles to conspire, and the people to arm, for the deliverance of their country. Regardless of his painful situation, the Latin chiefs repeated their demands, resented his delays, suspected his intentions, and exacted a decisive answer of peace or war. The haughty summons was delivered by three French knights and three Venetian deputies, who girded their swords, mounted their horses, pierced through the angry multitude, and entered, with a fearful countenance. The Palace and Presence of the Greek Emperor In a peremptory tone, they recapitulated their services and his engagements, and boldly declared, that unless their just claims were fully and immediately satisfied, they should no longer hold him either as a sovereign or a friend. After this defiance, the first that had ever wounded an imperial ear, they departed without betraying any symptoms of fear, but their escape from a servile palace and a furious city astonished the ambassadors themselves. And their return to the camp was the signal of mutual hostility. Among the Greeks, all authority and wisdom were overborne by the impetuous multitude, who mistook their rage for valor, their numbers for strength, and their fanaticism for the support and inspiration of heaven. In the eyes of both nations Alexius was false and contemptible, the base and spurious race of the Angeli was rejected with clamorous disdain, and the people of Constantinople encompassed the Senate, to demand at their hands a more worthy emperor. To every senator, conspicuous by his birth or dignity, they successively presented the purple, by each senator the deadly garment was repulsed, the contest lasted three days. And we may learn from the historian Nicetas, one of the members of the assembly, that fear and weaknesses were the guardians of their loyalty. A phantom, who vanished in oblivion, was forcibly proclaimed by the crowd, 7467 but the author of the tumult, and the leader of the war, was a prince of the house of Ducas. And his common appellation of Alexius must be discriminated by the epithet of Merzufel 7468 which in the vulgar idiom expressed the close junction of his black and shaggy eyebrows. At once a patriot and a courtier, the perfidious Merzufel, who was not destitute of cunning and courage, opposed the Latins both in speech and action, inflamed the passions and prejudices of the Greeks. And insinuated himself into the favor and confidence of Alexius, who trusted him with the office of great chamberlain, and tinged his buskins with the colors of royalty. At the dead of night, he rushed into the bedchamber with an affrighted aspect, exclaiming, that the palace was attacked by the people and betrayed by the guards. Starting from his couch, the unsuspecting prince threw himself into the arms of his enemy, who had contrived his escape by a private staircase. But that staircase terminated in a prison, Alexius was seized, stripped, and loaded with chains. And, after tasting some days the bitterness of death, he was poisoned, or strangled, or beaten with clubs, at the command, or in the presence, of the tyrant. The Emperor Isaac Angelus soon followed his son to the grave. And Merzufel, perhaps, might spare the superfluous crime of hastening the extinction of impotence and blindness. The death of the emperors, and the usurpation of Merzufel, had changed the nature of the quarrel. It was no longer the disagreement of allies who overvalued their services, or neglected their obligations, the French and Venetians forgot their complaints against Alexius, dropped a tear on the untimely fate of their companion, and swore revenge against the perfidious nation who had crowned his assassin. Yet the prudent doge was still inclined to negotiate, he asked as a debt, a subsidy, or a fine, fifty thousand pounds of gold, about two million sterling. Nor would the conference have been abruptly broken, if the zeal, or policy, of Merzufel had not refused to sacrifice the Greek church to the safety of the state. 7469 Amidst the invectives of his foreign and domestic enemies, we may discern, that he was not unworthy of the character which he had assumed, of the public champion, the second siege of Constantinople was far more laborious than the first. The treasury was replenished, and discipline was restored, by a severe inquisition into the abuses of the former reign. And Merzufel, an iron mace in his hand, visiting the posts, and affecting the port and aspect of a warrior, was an object of terror to his soldiers, at least, and to his kinsmen. 
Before and after the death of Alexius, the Greeks made two vigorous and well-conducted attempts to burn the navy in the harbour, but the skill and courage of the Venetians repulsed the fireships. And the vagrant flames wasted themselves without injury in the sea. 7470 In a nocturnal sally the Greek emperor was vanquished by Henry, brother of the Count of Flanders, the advantages of number and surprise aggravated the shame of his defeat, his buckler was found on the field of battle. And the imperial standard 7471 a divine image of the Virgin, was presented, as a trophy and a relic to the Cistercian monks, the disciples of Saint Bernard. Near three months, without accepting the holy season of Lent, were consumed in skirmishes and preparations, before the Latins were ready or resolved for a general assault. The land fortifications had been found impregnable. And the Venetian pilots represented, that, on the shore of the Propontis, the anchorage was unsafe, and the ships must be driven by the current far away to the Straits of the Hellespont. A prospect not unpleasing to the reluctant pilgrims, who sought every opportunity of breaking the army. From the harbour, therefore, the assault was determined by the assailants, and expected by the besieged. And the emperor had placed his scarlet pavilions on a neighbouring height, to direct and animate the efforts of his troops. A fearless spectator, whose mind could entertain the ideas of pomp and pleasure, might have admired the long array of two embattled armies, which extended above half a league, the one on the ships and galleys. The other on the walls and towers raised above the ordinary level by several stages of wooden turrets. Their first fury was spent in the discharge of darts, stones, and fire, from the engines, but the water was deep, the French were bold, the Venetians were skillful, they approached the walls. And a desperate conflict of swords, spears, and battle axes, was fought on the trembling bridges that grappled the floating, to the stable, batteries. In more than a hundred places, the assault was urged, and the defense was sustained. Till the superiority of ground and numbers finally prevailed, and the Latin trumpets sounded a retreat. On the ensuing days, the attack was renewed with equal vigor, and a similar event. And, in the night, the doge and the barons held a council, apprehensive only for the public danger, not a voice pronounced the words of escape or treaty. And each warrior, according to his temper, embraced the hope of victory, or the assurance of a glorious death. 7472 By the experience of the former siege, the Greeks were instructed, but the Latins were animated. And the knowledge that Constantinople might be taken, was of more avail than the local precautions which that knowledge had inspired for its defence. In the third assault, two ships were linked together to double their strength. A strong north wind drove them on the shore, the bishops of Troyes and Soissons led the van, and the auspicious names of the pilgrim and the paradise resounded along the line. 7473 The episcopal banners were displayed on the walls. A hundred marks of silver had been promised to the first adventurers, and if their reward was intercepted by death, their names have been immortalized by fame. 7474 Four towers were scaled, three gates were burst open. And the French knights, who might tremble on the waves, felt themselves invincible on horseback on the solid ground. Shall I relate that the thousands who guarded the emperor's person fled on the approach, and before the lance, of a single warrior? Their ignominious flight is attested by their countryman Nicetas, an army of phantoms marched with the French hero, and he was magnified to a giant in the eyes of the Greeks. 74-75 While the fugitives deserted their posts and cast away their arms, the Latins entered the city under the banners of their leaders, the streets and gates opened for their passage. And either design or accident kindled a third conflagration, which consumed in a few hours the measure of three of the largest cities of France. 74-76 In the close of evening, the barons checked their troops, and fortified their stations, they were awed by the extent and populousness of the capital, which might yet require the labor of a month. If the churches and palaces were conscious of their internal strength. But in the morning, a suppliant procession, with crosses and images, announced the submission of the Greeks. And deprecated the wrath of the conquerors, the usurper escaped through the Golden Gate, the palaces of Blacherny and Bucolian were occupied by the Count of Flanders and the Marquis of Montferrat. And the empire, which still bore the name of Constantine, and the title of Roman, 
was subverted by the arms of the Latin pilgrims. 7477. Constantinople had been taken by storm. And no restraints, except those of religion and humanity, were imposed on the conquerors by the laws of war. Boniface, Marquis of Montferrat, still acted as their general. And the Greeks, who revered his name as that of their future sovereign, were heard to exclaim in a lamentable tone, Holy Marquis King, have mercy upon us. His prudence or compassion opened the gates of the city to the fugitives. And he exhorted the soldiers of the cross to spare the lives of their fellow Christians. The streams of blood that flowed down the pages of Nicetas may be reduced to the slaughter of two thousand of his unresisting countrymen. 7478 and the greater part was massacred, not by the strangers, but by the Latins, who had been driven from the city, and who exercised the revenge of a triumphant faction. Yet of these exiles, some were less mindful of injuries than of benefits. And Nicetas himself was indebted for his safety to the generosity of a Venetian merchant. Pope Innocent III accuses the pilgrims for respecting, in their lust, neither age, nor sex, nor religious profession. And bitterly laments that the deeds of darkness, fornication, adultery, and incest, were perpetrated in open day, and that noble matrons and holy nuns were polluted by the grooms and peasants of the Catholic camp. 7479 It is indeed probable that the license of victory prompted and covered a multitude of sins, but it is certain, that the capital of the East contained a stock of venal or willing beauty. Sufficient to satiate the desires of twenty thousand pilgrims. And female prisoners were no longer subject to the right or abuse of domestic slavery. The Marquis of Montferrat was the patron of discipline and decency. The Count of Flanders was the mirror of chastity, they had forbidden, under pain of death, the rape of married women, or virgins, or nuns, and the proclamation was sometimes invoked by the vanquished 7480 and respected by the victors. Their cruelty and lust were moderated by the authority of the chiefs, and feelings of the soldiers, for we are no longer describing an eruption of the northern savages. And however ferocious they might still appear, time, policy, and religion had civilized the manners of the French, and still more of the Italians. But a free scope was allowed to their avarice, which was glutted, even in the Holy Week, by the pillage of Constantinople. The right of victory, unshackled by any promise or treaty, had confiscated the public and private wealth of the Greeks. And every hand, according to its size and strength, might lawfully execute the sentence and seize the forfeiture. A portable and universal standard of exchange was found in the coined and uncoined metals of gold and silver, which each captor, at home or abroad, might convert into the possessions most suitable to his temper and situation. Of the treasures, which trade and luxury had accumulated, the silks, velvets, furs, the gems, spices, and rich movables, were the most precious, as they could not be procured for money in the ruder countries of Europe. An order of rapin was instituted, nor was the share of each individual abandoned to industry or chance. Under the tremendous penalties of perjury, excommunication, and death, the Latins were bound to deliver their plunder into the common stock, three churches were selected for the deposit and distribution of the spoil, a single share was allotted to a foot soldier. Two for a sergeant on horseback, four to a knight, and larger proportions according to the rank and merit of the barons and princes. For violating this sacred engagement, a knight belonging to the Count of Esti. Paul was hanged with his shield and coat of arms round his neck, his example might render similar offenders more artful and discreet, but avarice was more powerful than fear. And it is generally believed that the secret far exceeded the acknowledged plunder. Yet the magnitude of the prize surpassed the largest scale of experience or expectation. 7481 After the whole had been equally divided between the French and Venetians, 50,000 marks were deducted to satisfy the debts of the former and the demands of the latter. The residue of the French amounted to 400,000 marks of silver, 7482 about 800,000 pounds sterling. Nor can I better appreciate the value of that sum in the public and private transactions of the age, than by defining it as seven times the annual revenue of the Kingdom of England. 7483. 
In this great revolution we enjoy the singular felicity of comparing the narratives of Villaharduin and Nicetas, the opposite feelings of the Marshal of Champagne and the Byzantine Senator. 7484 At the first view it should seem that the wealth of Constantinople was only transferred from one nation to another, and that the loss and sorrow of the Greeks is exactly balanced by the joy and advantage of the Latins. But in the miserable account of war, the gain is never equivalent to the loss, the pleasure to the pain, the smiles of the Latins were transient and fallacious, the Greeks forever wept over the ruins of their country. And their real calamities were aggravated by sacrilege and mockery. What benefits accrued to the conquerors from the three fires which annihilated so vast a portion of the buildings and riches of the city? What a stock of such things, as could neither be used nor transported, was maliciously or wantonly destroyed? How much treasure was idly wasted in gaming, debauchery, and riot? And what precious objects were bartered for a vile price by the impatience or ignorance of the soldiers, whose reward was stolen by the base industry of the last of the Greeks? These alone, who had nothing to lose, might derive some profit from the revolution, but the misery of the upper ranks of society is strongly painted in the personal adventures of Nicetas himself. His stately palace had been reduced to ashes in the second conflagration, and the senator, with his family and friends, found an obscure shelter in another house which he possessed near the church of St. Sophia. It was the door of this mean habitation that his friend, the Venetian merchant, guarded in the disguise of a soldier, till Nicetas could save, by a precipitate flight, the relics of his fortune and the chastity of his daughter. In a cold, wintry season, these fugitives, nursed in the lap of prosperity, departed on foot, his wife was with child, the desertion of their slaves compelled them to carry their baggage on their own shoulders. And their women, whom they placed in the center, were exhorted to conceal their beauty with dirt. Instead of adorning it with paint and jewels every step was exposed to insult and danger, the threats of the strangers were less painful than the taunts of the plebeians, with whom they were now leveled. Nor did the exiles breathe in safety till their mournful pilgrimage was concluded at Salimbria, above forty miles from the capital. On the way they overtook the patriarch, without attendance and almost without apparel, riding on an ass, and reduced to a state of apostolical poverty, which, had it been voluntary, might perhaps have been meritorious. In the meanwhile, his desolate churches were profaned by the licentiousness and party zeal of the Latins. After stripping the gems and pearls, they converted the chalices into drinking cups. Their tables, on which they gamed and feasted, were covered with the pictures of Christ and the saints, and they trampled underfoot the most venerable objects of the Christian worship. In the Cathedral of Esti. Sophia, the ample veil of the sanctuary was rent asunder for the sake of the golden fringe, and the altar, a monument of art and riches, was broken in pieces and shared among the captors. Their mules and horses were laden with the wrought silver and gilt carvings, which they tore down from the doors and pulpit. And if the beasts stumbled under the burden, they were stabbed by their impatient drivers, and the holy pavement streamed with their impure blood. A prostitute was seated on the throne of the patriarch. And that daughter of Belial, as she is styled, sung and danced in the church, to ridicule the hymns and processions of the Orientals. Nor were the repositories of the royal dead secure from violation, in the church of the apostles, the tombs of the emperors were rifled. And it is said, that after six centuries the corpse of Justinian was found without any signs of decay or putrefaction. In the streets, the French and Flemings clothed themselves and their horses in painted robes and flowing headdresses of linen. And the coarse intemperance of their feast 7485 insulted the splendid sobriety of the East. To expose the arms of a people of scribes and scholars, they affected to display a pen, an inkhorn, and a sheet of paper, without discerning that the instruments of science and valor were alike feeble and useless in the hands of the modern Greeks. Their reputation and their language encouraged them, however, to despise the ignorance and to overlook the progress of the Latins. 7486 In the love of the arts, the national difference was still more obvious and real. The Greeks preserved with reverence the works of their ancestors, which they could not imitate, and, in the destruction of the statues of Constantinople, we are provoked to join in the complaints and invectives of the Byzantine historian. 
7487 we have seen how the rising city was adorned by the vanity and despotism of the imperial founder, in the ruins of paganism, some gods and heroes were saved from the acts of superstition. And the Forum and Hippodrome were dignified with the relics of a better age. Several of these are described by Nicetas 7488 in a florid and affected style, and from his descriptions I shall select some interesting particulars. 1. The victorious charioteers were cast in bronze, at their own or the public charge, and fitly placed in the hippodrome, they stood aloft in their chariots, wheeling round the goal, the spectators could admire their attitude. And judge of the resemblance. And of these figures, the most perfect might have been transported from the Olympic Stadium. 2. The Sphinx, River Horse, and Crocodile, denote the climate and manufacture of Egypt and the spoils of that ancient province. 3. The she-wolf suckling Romulus and Remus, a subject alike pleasing to the old and the new Romans, but which could really be treated before the decline of the Greek sculpture. 4. An eagle holding and tearing a serpent in his talons, a domestic monument of the Byzantines, which they ascribed, not to a human artist, but to the magic power of the philosopher Apollonius, who, by this talisman, delivered the city from such venomous reptiles. 5. An ass and his driver, which were erected by Augustus in his colony of Nicopolis, to commemorate a verbal omen of the victory of Actium. 6. An equestrian statue which passed, in the vulgar opinion, for Joshua, the Jewish conqueror, stretching out his hand to stop the course of the descending sun. A more classical tradition recognized the figures of Bellerophon and Pegasus. And the free attitude of the steed seemed to mark that he trod on air, rather than on the earth. 7. A square and lofty obelisk of brass, the sides were embossed with a variety of picturesque and rural scenes, birds singing. Rustics laboring, or playing on their pipes, sheep bleeding, lambs skipping, the sea, and a scene of fish and fishing, little naked cupids laughing, playing, and pelting each other with apples. And, on the summit, a female figure, turning with the slightest breath, and thence denominated the wind's attendant. 8. The Phrygian shepherd presenting to Venus the prize of beauty, the apple of discord. 9. The incomparable statue of Helen, which is delineated by Nicetas in the words of admiration and love, her well-turned feet, snowy arms, rosy lips, bewitching smiles, swimming eyes, arched eyebrows, the harmony of her shape, the lightness of her drapery, and her flowing locks that waved in the wind. A beauty that might have moved her barbarian destroyers to pity and remorse. 10. The manly or divine form of Hercules 7489 as he was restored to life by the master hand of Lysippus. Of such magnitude, that his thumb was equal to his waist, his leg to the stature, of a common man, 7490 his chest ample, his shoulders broad, his limbs strong and muscular, his hair curled, his aspect commanding. Without his bow, or quiver, or club, his lion's skin carelessly thrown over him, he was seated on an osier basket, his right leg and arm stretched to the utmost, his left knee bent, and supporting his elbow, his head reclining on his left hand. His countenance indignant and pensive. 11. A colossal statue of Juno, which had once adorned her temple of Samos, the enormous head by four yoke of oxen was laboriously drawn to the palace. 12. Another colossus, of Pallas or Minerva, thirty feet in height, and representing with admirable spirit the attributes and character of the martial maid. Before we accuse the Latins, it is just to remark, that this palace was destroyed after the first siege, by the fear and superstition of the Greeks themselves. 7491 The other statues of brass which I have enumerated were broken and melted by the unfeeling avarice of the Crusaders, the cost and labor were consumed in a moment, the soul of genius evaporated in smoke. And the remnant of base metal was coined into money for the payment of the troops. Bronze is not the most durable of monuments, from the marble forms of Phidias and Praxiteles, the Latins might turn aside with stupid contempt. 7492 But unless they were crushed by some accidental injury, those useless stones stood secure on their pedestals. 7493 The most enlightened of the strangers, above the gross and sensual pursuits of their countrymen, 
more piously exercised the right of conquest in the search and seizure of the relics of the saints. 7494 immense was the supply of heads and bones, crosses and images, that were scattered by this revolution over the churches of Europe. And such was the increase of pilgrimage and ablation, that no branch, perhaps, of more lucrative plunder was imported from the East Point 7495 of the writings of antiquity, many that still existed in the 12th century, are now lost. But the pilgrims were not solicitous to save or transport the volumes of an unknown tongue, the perishable substance of paper or parchment can only be preserved by the multiplicity of copies. The literature of the Greeks had almost centered in the metropolis, and, without computing the extent of our loss, we may drop a tear over the libraries that have perished in the triple fire of Constantinople.7496. LXI, Partition of the Empire by the French and Venetians. Partition of the Empire by the French and Venetians, five Latin emperors of the houses of Flanders and Courtney. Their wars against the Bulgarians and Greeks. Weakness and poverty of the Latin Empire. Recovery of Constantinople by the Greeks. General consequences of the Crusades. After the death of the lawful princes, the French and Venetians, confident of justice and victory, agreed to divide and regulate their future possessions. 7497 It was stipulated by treaty, that twelve electors, six of either nation, should be nominated, that a majority should choose the Emperor of the East. And that, if the votes were equal, the decision of chance should ascertain the successful candidate. To him, with all the titles and prerogatives of the Byzantine throne, they assigned the two palaces of Bacolian and Blacherny, with a fourth part of the Greek monarchy. It was defined that the three remaining portions should be equally shared between the Republic of Venice and the barons of France. That each feudatory, with an honorable exception for the doge, should acknowledge and perform the duties of homage and military service to the supreme head of the empire. That the nation which gave an emperor, should resign to their brethren the choice of a patriarch. And that the pilgrims, whatever might be their impatience to visit the Holy Land, should devote another year to the conquest and defense of the Greek provinces. After the conquest of Constantinople by the Latins, the treaty was confirmed and executed, and the first and most important step was the creation of an emperor. The six electors of the French nation were all ecclesiastics, the abbot of Lox, the archbishop-elect of Acre in Palestine, and the bishops of Troyes, Soissons, Halberstadt, and Bethlehem. The last of whom exercised in the camp the office of Pope's legate, their profession and knowledge were respectable. And as they could not be the objects, they were best qualified to be the authors of the choice. The six Venetians were the principal servants of the state, and in this list the noble families of Carini and Contarini are still proud to discover their ancestors. The twelve assembled in the chapel of the palace. And after the solemn invocation of the Holy Ghost, they proceeded to deliberate and vote. A just impulse of respect and gratitude prompted them to crown the virtues of the doge, his wisdom had inspired their enterprise. And the most youthful knights might envy and applaud the exploits of blindness and age. But the patriot Dandolo was devoid of all personal ambition, and fully satisfied that he had been judged worthy to reign. His nomination was overruled by the Venetians themselves, his countrymen, and perhaps his friends 7498 represented, with the eloquence of truth, the mischiefs that might arise to national freedom and the common cause. From the union of two incompatible characters, of the first magistrate of a republic and the emperor of the East. The exclusion of the doge left room for the more equal merits of Boniface and Baldwin, and at their names all meaner candidates respectfully withdrew. The Marquis of Montferrat was recommended by his mature age and fair reputation, by the choice of the adventurers, and the wishes of the Greeks. Nor can I believe that Venice, the mistress of the sea, could be seriously apprehensive of a petty lord at the foot of the Alps. 7499 But the Count of Flanders was the chief of a wealthy and warlike people he was valiant, pious, and chaste. In the prime of life, since he was only thirty-two years of age, a descendant of Charlemagne, a cousin of the King of France, and a compeer of the prelates and barons who had yielded with reluctance to the command of a foreigner. Without the chapel, these barons, with the doge and marquis at their head, expected the decision of the twelve electors. It was announced by the Bishop of Soissons, 
in the name of his colleagues, ye have sworn to obey the prince whom we should choose, by our unanimous suffrage, Baldwin Count of Flanders and Hainaut is now your sovereign. And the Emperor of the East. He was saluted with loud applause, and the proclamation was re-echoed through the city by the joy of the Latins, and the trembling adulation of the Greeks. Boniface was the first to kiss the hand of his rival, and to raise him on the buckler, and Baldwin was transported to the cathedral, and solemnly invested with the purple buskins. At the end of three weeks he was crowned by the legate, in the vacancy of the patriarch, but the Venetian clergy soon filled the chapter of Asti. Sophia, seated Thomas Morosini on the ecclesiastical throne, and employed every art to perpetuate in their own nation the honours and benefices of the Greek Church. 7500 Without delay the successor of Constantine instructed Palestine, France, and Rome, of this memorable revolution. To Palestine he sent, as a trophy, the gates of Constantinople, and the chain of the harbour. 7501 And adopted, from the Assize of Jerusalem, the laws or customs best adapted to a French colony in conquest in the East. In his epistles, the natives of France are encouraged to swell that colony, and to secure that conquest, to people a magnificent city and a fertile land, which will reward the labours both of the priest and the soldier. He congratulates the Roman pontiff on the restoration of his authority in the East, invites him to extinguish the Greek schism by his presence in a general council, and implores his blessing and forgiveness for the disobedient pilgrims. Prudence and dignity are blended in the answer of Innocent.7502 In the subversion of the Byzantine Empire, he arraigns the vices of man, and adores the providence of God, the conquerors will be absolved or condemned by their future conduct. The validity of their treaty depends on the judgment of St. Peter. But he inculcates their most sacred duty of establishing a just subordination of obedience and tribute, from the Greeks to the Latins, from the magistrate to the clergy, and from the clergy to the Pope. In the division of the Greek provinces 7503 the share of the Venetians was more ample than that of the Latin emperor. No more than one-fourth was appropriated to his domain, a clear moiety of the remainder was reserved for Venice. And the other moiety was distributed among the adventurers of France and Lombardy. The venerable Dandolo was proclaimed despot of Romania, and invested after the Greek fashion with the purple buskins. He ended at Constantinople his long and glorious life. And if the prerogative was personal, the title was used by his successors till the middle of the fourteenth century, with the singular, though true, addition of lords of one-fourth and a half of the Roman Empire. 7504 The Doge, a slave of state, was seldom permitted to depart from the helm of the Republic. But his place was supplied by the bail, or regent, who exercised a supreme jurisdiction over the colony of Venetians, they possessed three of the eight quarters of the city. And his independent tribunal was composed of six judges, four councillors, two chamberlains, two fiscal advocates, and a constable. Their long experience of the eastern trade enabled them to select their portion with discernment, they had rashly accepted the dominion and defence of Adrianople. But it was the more reasonable aim of their policy to form a chain of factories, and cities, and islands, along the maritime coast, from the neighbourhood of Ragusa to the Hellespont and the Bosphorus. The labour and cost of such extensive conquests exhausted their treasury, they abandoned their maxims of government, adopted a feudal system, and contented themselves with the homage of their nobles. 7505 For the possessions which these private vassals undertook to reduce and maintain. And thus it was that the family of Sanet acquired the Duchy of Naxos, which involved the greatest part of the archipelago. For the price of 10,000 marks, the Republic purchased of the Marquis of Montferrat the fertile island of Crete or Candia, with the ruins of a hundred cities, 7506 but its improvement was stinted by the proud and narrow spirit of an aristocracy. 7507 And the wisest senators would confess that the sea, not the land, was the treasury of St. Mark. In the moiety of the adventurers the Marquis Boniface might claim the most liberal reward. And, besides the Isle of Crete, his exclusion from the throne was compensated by the royal title and the provinces beyond the Hellespont. But he prudently exchanged that distant and difficult conquest for the kingdom of Thessalonica Macedonia, twelve days' journey from the capital, where he might be supported by the neighbouring powers of his brother-in-law the king of Hungary. 
His progress was hailed by the voluntary or reluctant acclamations of the natives, and Greece, the proper and ancient Greece, again received a Latin conqueror, 7508 who trod with indifference that classic ground. He viewed with a careless eye the beauties of the Valley of Tempe, traversed with a cautious step the Straits of Thermopylae, occupied the unknown cities of Thebes, Athens, and Argos and assaulted the fortifications of Corinth and Napoli, 7509 which resisted his arms. The lots of the Latin pilgrims were regulated by chance, or choice, or subsequent exchange. And they abused, with intemperate joy, their triumph over the lives and fortunes of a great people. After a minute survey of the provinces, they weighed in the scales of avarice the revenue of each district, the advantage of the situation, and the ample or scanty supplies for the maintenance of soldiers and horses. Their presumption claimed and divided the long-lost dependencies of the Roman scepter, the Nile and Euphrates rolled through their imaginary realms, and happy was the warrior who drew for his prize the palace of the Turkish Sultan of Iconium. 7510 I shall not descend to the pedigree of families and the rent roll of estates, but I wish to specify that the Counts of Blois and Esti. Pole were invested with the Duchy of Nice and the Lordship of Demotica, 7511 The principal fiefs were held by the service of constable, chamberlain, cupbearer, butler, and chief cook. And our historian, Geoffrey of Villahardouin, obtained a fair establishment on the banks of the Hebrus, and united the double office of Marshal of Champagne in Romania. At the head of his knights and archers, each baron mounted on horseback to secure the possession of his share, and their first efforts were generally successful. But the public force was weakened by their dispersion. And a thousand quarrels must arise under a law, and among men, whose sole umpire was the sword. Within three months after the conquest of Constantinople, the emperor and the king of Thessalonica drew their hostile followers into the field. They were reconciled by the authority of the doge, the advice of the marshal, and the firm freedom of their peers. 7512. Two fugitives, who had reigned at Constantinople, still asserted the title of emperor. And the subjects of their fallen throne might be moved to pity by the misfortunes of the elder Alexius, or excited to revenge by the spirit of Merzufel. A domestic alliance, a common interest, a similar guilt, and the merit of extinguishing his enemies, a brother and a nephew, induced the more recent usurper to unite with the former the relics of his power. Merzufel was received with smiles and honors in the camp of his father Alexius, but the wicked can never love, and should rarely trust, their fellow criminals. He was seized in the bath, deprived of his eyes, stripped of his troops and treasures, and turned out to wander an object of horror and contempt to those who with more propriety could hate, and with more justice could punish. The Assassin of the Emperor Isaac and His Son As the tyrant, pursued by fear or remorse, was stealing over to Asia, he was seized by the Latins of Constantinople, and condemned, after an open trial, to an ignominious death. His judges debated the mode of his execution, the axe, the wheel, or the stake, and it was resolved that Merzufel 7513 should ascend the Theodosian Column, a pillar of white marble of 147 feet in height. 7514 From the summit he was cast down headlong, and dashed in pieces on the pavement, in the presence of innumerable spectators, who filled the Forum of Taurus, and admired the accomplishment of an old prediction. Which was explained by this singular event. 7515 The fate of Alexius is less tragical, he was sent by the Marquis a captive to Italy, and a gift to the King of the Romans. But he had not much to applaud his fortune, if the sentence of imprisonment and exile were changed from a fortress in the Alps to a monastery in Asia. But his daughter, before the national calamity, had been given in marriage to a young hero who continued the succession, and restored the throne, of the Greek princes. 7516 The valor of Theodore Lascaris was signalized in the two sieges of Constantinople. After the flight of Merzufel, when the Latins were already in the city, he offered himself as their emperor to the soldiers and people. And his ambition, which might be virtuous, was undoubtedly brave. Could he have infused a soul into the multitude, they might have crushed the strangers under their feet, their abject despair refused his aid. And Theodore retired to breathe the air of freedom in Anatolia, beyond the immediate view and pursuit of the conquerors.
Under the title, at first of despot, and afterwards of emperor, he drew to his standard the bolder spirits, who were fortified against slavery by the contempt of life. And as every means was lawful for the public safety implored without scruple the alliance of the Turkish Sultan Nice, where Theodore established his residence, Prusa and Philadelphia, Smyrna and Ephesus. Opened their gates to their deliverer, he derived strength and reputation from his victories, and even from his defeats. And the successor of Constantine preserved a fragment of the empire from the banks of the Meander to the suburbs of Nicomedia, and at length of Constantinople. Another portion, distant and obscure, was possessed by the lineal heir of the Comnene, a son of the virtuous Manuel, a grandson of the tyrant Andronicus. His name was Alexius. And the epithet of Great 7517 was applied perhaps to his stature, rather than to his exploits. By the indulgence of the Angeli, he was appointed governor or Duke of Trebizond 7518-7519 His birth gave him ambition, the revolution independence. And, without changing his title, he reigned in peace from Sinope to the Phasis, along the coast of the Black Sea. His nameless son and successor 7520 is described as the vassal of the Sultan, whom he served with two hundred lances, that Comnenian prince was no more than Duke of Trebizond. And the title of emperor was first assumed by the pride and envy of the grandson of Alexius. In the west, a third fragment was saved from the common shipwreck by Michael, a bastard of the house of Angeli, who, before the revolution, had been known as a hostage, a soldier, and a rebel. His flight from the camp of the Marquis Boniface secured his freedom. By his marriage with the governor's daughter, he commanded the important place of Durazzo, assumed the title of despot, and founded a strong and conspicuous principality in Epirus, Aetolia, and Thessaly, which have ever been peopled by a warlike race. The Greeks, who had offered their service to their new sovereigns, were excluded by the haughty Latin 7521 from all civil and military honors, as a nation born to tremble and obey. Their resentment prompted them to show that they might have been useful friends, since they could be dangerous enemies, their nerves were braced by adversity, whatever was learned or holy, whatever was noble or valiant. Rolled away into the independent states of Trebizond, Epirus, and Nice. And a single patrician is marked by the ambiguous praise of attachment and loyalty to the Franks. The vulgar herd of the cities and the country would have gladly submitted to a mild and regular servitude. And the transient disorders of war would have been obliterated by some years of industry and peace. But peace was banished, and industry was crushed, in the disorders of the feudal system. The Roman emperors of Constantinople, if they were endowed with abilities, were armed with power for the protection of their subjects, their laws were wise, and their administration was simple. The Latin throne was filled by a titular prince, the chief, and often the servant, of his licentious confederates, the fiefs of the empire, from a kingdom to a castle, were held and ruled by the sword of the barons. And their discord, poverty, and ignorance, extended the ramifications of tyranny to the most sequestered villages. The Greeks were oppressed by the double weight of the priests, who were invested with temporal power, and of the soldier, who was inflamed by fanatic hatred. And the insuperable bar of religion and language forever separated the stranger and the native. As long as the crusaders were united at Constantinople, the memory of their conquest, and the terror of their arms, imposed silence on the captive land, their dispersion betrayed the smallness of their numbers and the defects of their discipline. And some failures and mischances revealed the secret, that they were not invincible. As the fears of the Greeks abetted, their hatred increased. They murdered, they conspired. And before a year of slavery had elapsed, they implored, or accepted, the succor of a barbarian, whose power they had felt, and whose gratitude they trusted. 7522. The Latin conquerors had been saluted with a solemn and early embassy from John, or Joan Nice, or Kalojan, the revolted chief of the Bulgarians and Wallachians. He deemed himself their brother, as the votary of the Roman pontiff, from whom he had received the regal title and a holy banner, and in the subversion of the Greek monarchy, he might aspire to the name of their friend and accomplice. But Kalojan was astonished to find, that the Count of Flanders had assumed the pomp and pride of the successors of Constantine. 
and his ambassadors were dismissed with a haughty message, that the rebel must deserve a pardon, by touching with his forehead the footstool of the imperial throne. His resentment 7523 would have exhaled in acts of violence and blood, his cooler policy watched the rising discontent of the Greeks, affected a tender concern for their sufferings. And promised, that their first struggles for freedom should be supported by his person and kingdom. The conspiracy was propagated by national hatred, the firmest band of association and secrecy, the Greeks were impatient to sheath their daggers in the breasts of the victorious strangers. But the execution was prudently delayed, till Henry, the emperor's brother, had transported the flower of his troops beyond the Hellespont. Most of the towns and villages of Thrace were true to the moment and the signal. And the Latins, without arms or suspicion, were slaughtered by the vile and merciless revenge of their slaves. From Demotica, the first scene of the massacre, the surviving vassals of the Count of St. Paul escaped to Adrianople. But the French and Venetians, who occupied that city, were slain or expelled by the furious multitude, the garrisons that could effect their retreat fell back on each other towards the metropolis. And the fortresses, that separately stood against the rebels, were ignorant of each other's and of their sovereign's fate. The voice of fame and fear announced the revolt of the Greeks and the rapid approach of their Bulgarian ally. And Kalojan, not depending on the forces of his own kingdom, had drawn from the Scythian wilderness a body of fourteen thousand Comans, who drank, as it was said, the blood of their captives. And sacrificed the Christians on the altars of their gods. 7524. Alarmed by this sudden and growing danger, the emperor dispatched a swift messenger to recall Count Henry and his troops. And had Baldwin expected the return of his gallant brother, with a supply of 20,000 Armenians, he might have encountered the invader with equal numbers and a decisive superiority of arms and discipline. But the spirit of chivalry could seldom discriminate caution from cowardice, and the emperor took the field with a hundred and forty knights, and their train of archers and sergeants. The marshal, who dissuaded and obeyed, led the vanguard in their march to Adrianople, the main body was commanded by the Count of Blois, the aged doge of Venice followed with the rear. And their scanty numbers were increased from all sides by the fugitive Latins. They undertook to besiege the rebels of Adrianople. And such was the pious tendency of the Crusades that they employed the Holy Week in pillaging the country for their subsistence, and in framing engines for the destruction of their fellow Christians. But the Latins were soon interrupted and alarmed by the light cavalry of the Comans, who boldly skirmished to the edge of their imperfect lines, and a proclamation was issued by the Marshal of Romania, that, on the trumpet's sound, the cavalry should mount and form. But that none, under pain of death, should abandon themselves to a desultory and dangerous pursuit. This wise injunction was first disobeyed by the Count of Blois, who involved the Emperor in his rashness and ruin. The Comans, of the Parthian or Tartar school, fled before their first charge. But after a career of two leagues, when the knights and their horses were almost breathless, they suddenly turned, rallied, and encompassed the heavy squadrons of the Franks. The Count was slain on the field, the emperor was made prisoner. And if the one disdained to fly, if the other refused to yield, their personal bravery made a poor atonement for their ignorance, or neglect, of the duties of a general. 7525. Proud of his victory in his royal prize, the Bulgarian advanced to relieve Adrianople and achieve the destruction of the Latins. They must inevitably have been destroyed, if the Marshal of Romania had not displayed a cool courage and consummate skill, uncommon in all ages, but most uncommon in those times, when war was a passion, rather than a science. His grief and fears were poured into the firm and faithful bosom of the doge, but in the camp he diffused an assurance of safety, which could only be realized by the general belief. All day he maintained his perilous station between the city and the barbarians, Villa Harduin decamped in silence at the dead of night, and his masterly retreat of three days would have deserved the praise of Xenophon and the Ten Thousand. In the rear, the marshal supported the weight of the pursuit, in the front, he moderated the impatience of the fugitives, and wherever the Comans approached, they were repelled by a line of impenetrable spears. On the third day, the weary troops beheld the sea, 
the solitary town of Rodasta 7526 and their friends, who had landed from the Asiatic shore. They embraced, they wept, but they united their arms and councils. And in his brother's absence, Count Henry assumed the regency of the empire, at once in a state of childhood and caducity. 7527 If the Comans withdrew from the summer heats, 7,000 Latins, in the hour of danger, deserted Constantinople, their brethren, and their vows. Some partial success was overbalanced by the loss of 120 knights in the field of Rusium, and of the imperial domain, no more was left than the capital, with two or three adjacent fortresses on the shores of Europe and Asia. The king of Bulgaria was resistless and inexorable and Kalojan respectfully eluded the demands of the Pope, who conjured his new proselyte to restore peace and the Emperor to the afflicted Latins. The deliverance of Baldwin was no longer, he said, in the power of man, that prince had died in prison, and the manner of his death is variously related by ignorance and credulity. The lovers of a tragic legend will be pleased to hear, that the royal captive was tempted by the amorous queen of the Bulgarians, that his chaste refusal exposed him to the falsehood of a woman and the jealousy of a savage. That his hands and feet were severed from his body, that his bleeding trunk was cast among the carcasses of dogs and horses, and that he breathed three days, before he was devoured by the birds of prey. 7528 About twenty years afterwards, in a wood of the Netherlands, a hermit announced himself as the true Baldwin, the Emperor of Constantinople, and lawful sovereign of Flanders. He related the wonders of his escape, his adventures, and his penance, among a people prone to believe and to rebel, and, in the first transport, Flanders acknowledged her long-lost sovereign. A short examination before the French court detected the impostor, who was punished with an ignominious death, but the Fleming still adhered to the pleasing error. And the Countess Jane is accused by the gravest historians of sacrificing to her ambition the life of an unfortunate father. 7529. In all civilized hostility, a treaty is established for the exchange or ransom of prisoners. And if their captivity be prolonged, their condition is known, and they are treated according to their rank with humanity or honor. But the savage Bulgarian was a stranger to the laws of war, his prisons were involved in darkness and silence. And above a year elapsed before the Latins could be assured of the death of Baldwin, before his brother, the regent Henry, would consent to assume the title of emperor. His moderation was applauded by the Greeks as an act of rare and inimitable virtue. Their light and perfidious ambition was eager to seize or anticipate the moment of a vacancy, while a law of succession, the guardian both of the prince and people, was gradually defined and confirmed in the hereditary monarchies of Europe. In the support of the Eastern Empire, Henry was gradually left without an associate, as the heroes of the Crusade retired from the world or from the war. The Doge of Venice, the Venerable Dandolo, in the fullness of years and glory, sunk into the grave. The Marquis of Montferrat was slowly recalled from the Peloponnesian War to the revenge of Baldwin and the defense of Thessalonica. Some nice disputes of feudal homage and service were reconciled in a personal interview between the emperor and the king, they were firmly united by mutual esteem and the common danger. And their alliance was sealed by the nuptials of Henry with the daughter of the Italian prince. He soon deplored the loss of his friend and father. At the persuasion of some faithful Greeks, Boniface made a bold and successful inroad among the hills of Rodope, the Bulgarians fled on his approach, they assembled to harass his retreat. On the intelligence that his rear was attacked, without waiting for any defensive armor, he leaped on horseback, couched his lance, and drove the enemies before him, but in the rash pursuit he was pierced with a mortal wound. And the head of the king of Thessalonica was presented to Kalajan, who enjoyed the honors, without the merit, of victory. It is here, at this melancholy event, that the pen or the voice of Geoffrey of Villahardouin seems to drop or to expire. 7530 And if he still exercised his military office of Marshal of Romania, his subsequent exploits are buried in oblivion. 7531 The character of Henry was not unequal to his arduous situation, in the siege of Constantinople, and beyond the Hellespont, he had deserved the fame of a valiant knight and a skillful commander. And his courage was tempered with a degree of prudence and mildness unknown to his impetuous brother. 
In the double war against the Greeks of Asia and the Bulgarians of Europe, he was ever the foremost on shipboard or on horseback. And though he cautiously provided for the success of his arms, the drooping Latins were often roused by his example to save and to second their fearless emperor. But such efforts, and some supplies of men and money from France, were of less avail than the errors, the cruelty, and death, of their most formidable adversary. When the despair of the Greek subjects invited Kalojan as their deliverer, they hoped that he would protect their liberty and adopt their laws, they were soon taught to compare the degrees of national ferocity. And to execrate the savage conqueror, who no longer dissembled his intention of dispeopling Thrace, of demolishing the cities, and of transplanting the inhabitants beyond the Danube. Many towns and villages of Thrace were already evacuated, a heap of ruins marked the place of Philippopolis, and a similar calamity was expected at Demotica and Adrianople, by the first authors of the revolt. They raised a cry of grief and repentance to the throne of Henry, the emperor alone had the magnanimity to forgive and trust them. No more than four hundred knights, with their sergeants and archers, could be assembled under his banner. And with this slender force he fought seventy-five thirty-two and repulsed the Bulgarian, who, besides his infantry, was at the head of forty thousand horse. In this expedition, Henry felt the difference between a hostile and a friendly country, the remaining cities were preserved by his arms, and the savage, with shame and loss, was compelled to relinquish his prey. The siege of Thessalonica was the last of the evils which Kalojan inflicted or suffered, he was stabbed in the night in his tent. And the general, perhaps the assassin, who found him weltering in his blood, ascribed the blow, with general applause, to the lance of St. Demetrius. 7533 After several victories, the prudence of Henry concluded an honorable peace with the successor of the tyrant, and with the Greek princes of Nice and Epirus. If he ceded some doubtful limits, an ample kingdom was reserved for himself and his feudatories, and his reign, which lasted only ten years, afforded a short interval of prosperity and peace. Far above the narrow policy of Baldwin and Boniface, he freely entrusted to the Greeks the most important offices of the state and army. And this liberality of sentiment and practice was the more seasonable, as the princes of Nice and Epirus had already learned to seduce and employ the mercenary valor of the Latins. It was the aim of Henry to unite and reward his deserving subjects, of every nation and language, but he appeared less solicitous to accomplish the impracticable union of the two churches. Pelagius, the Pope's legate, who acted as the sovereign of Constantinople, had interdicted the worship of the Greeks, and sternly imposed the payment of tithes, the double procession of the Holy Ghost, and a blind obedience to the Roman pontiff. As the weaker party, they pleaded the duties of conscience, and implored the rights of toleration, our bodies, they said, are Caesar's, but our souls belong only to God. The persecution was checked by the firmness of the emperor, 7534 and if we can believe that the same prince was poisoned by the Greeks themselves, we must entertain a contemptible idea of the sense and gratitude of mankind. His valor was a vulgar attribute, which he shared with ten thousand knights, but Henry possessed the superior courage to oppose, in a superstitious age, the pride and avarice of the clergy. In the Cathedral of Esti. Sophia he presumed to place his throne on the right hand of the patriarch, and this presumption excited the sharpest censure of Pope Innocent III. By a salutary edict, one of the first examples of the laws of Mortmain, he prohibited the alienation of fiefs, many of the Latins, desirous of returning to Europe, resigned their estates to the Church for a spiritual or temporal reward. These holy lands were immediately discharged from military service, and a colony of soldiers would have been gradually transformed into a college of priests. 7535. The virtuous Henry died at Thessalonica, in the defense of that kingdom, and of an infant, the son of his friend Boniface. In the two first emperors of Constantinople the male line of the Counts of Flanders was extinct. But their sister Yolanda was the wife of a French prince, the mother of a numerous progeny, and one of her daughters had married Andrew King of Hungary, a brave and pious champion of the cross. By seating him on the Byzantine throne, the barons of Romania would have acquired the forces of a neighboring and warlike kingdom, but the prudent Andrew revered the laws of succession. And the princess Yolanda, 
with her husband Peter of Courtney, Count of Auxerre, was invited by the Latins to assume the Empire of the East. The royal birth of his father, the noble origin of his mother, recommended to the barons of France the first cousin of their king. His reputation was fair, his possessions were ample, and in the bloody crusade against the Albigeois, the soldiers and the priests had been abundantly satisfied of his zeal and valor. Vanity might applaud the elevation of a French emperor of Constantinople, but prudence must pity, rather than envy, his treacherous and imaginary greatness. To assert and adorn his title, he was reduced to sell or mortgage the best of his patrimony. By these expedients, the liberality of his royal kinsman Philip Augustus, and the national spirit of chivalry, he was enabled to pass the Alps at the head of 140 knights, and 5,500 sergeants and archers. After some hesitation, Pope Honorius III was persuaded to crown the successor of Constantine, but he performed the ceremony in a church without the walls. Lest he should seem to imply or to bestow any right of sovereignty over the ancient capital of the empire. The Venetians had engaged to transport Peter and his forces beyond the Adriatic, and the Empress, with her four children, to the Byzantine palace. But they required, as the price of their service, that he should recover Durazzo from the despot of Epirus. Michael Angelus, or Comnus, the first of his dynasty, had bequeathed the succession of his power and ambition to Theodore his legitimate brother, who already threatened and invaded the establishments of the Latins. After discharging his debt by a fruitless assault, the emperor raised the siege to prosecute a long and perilous journey overland from Durazzo to Thessalonica. He was soon lost in the mountains of Epirus, the passes were fortified. His provisions exhausted, he was delayed and deceived by a treacherous negotiation. And, after Peter of Courtney and the Roman legate had been arrested in a banquet, the French troops, without leaders or hopes, were eager to exchange their arms for the delusive promise of mercy and bread. The Vatican thundered. And the impious Theodore was threatened with the vengeance of earth and heaven, but the captive emperor and his soldiers were forgotten, and the reproaches of the Pope are confined to the imprisonment of his legate. No sooner was he satisfied by the deliverance of the priests and a promise of spiritual obedience, than he pardoned and protected the despot of Epirus. His peremptory commands suspended the ardor of the Venetians and the king of Hungary. And it was only by a natural or untimely death 7536 that Peter of Courtney was released from his hopeless captivity. 7537. The long ignorance of his fate, and the presence of the lawful sovereign, of Yolanda, his wife or widow, delayed the proclamation of a new emperor. Before her death, and in the midst of her grief, she was delivered of a son, who was named Baldwin, the last and most unfortunate of the Latin princes of Constantinople. His birth endeared him to the barons of Romania. But his childhood would have prolonged the troubles of a minority, and his claims were superseded by the elder claims of his brethren. The first of these, Philip of Courtney, who derived from his mother the inheritance of Namur, had the wisdom to prefer the substance of a marquisate to the shadow of an empire. And on his refusal, Robert, the second of the sons of Peter and Yolanda, was called to the throne of Constantinople. Warned by his father's mischance, he pursued his slow and secure journey through Germany and along the Danube, a passage was opened by his sister's marriage with the King of Hungary. And the Emperor Robert was crowned by the Patriarch in the Cathedral of St. Sophia. But his reign was an era of calamity and disgrace, and the colony, as it was styled, of New France yielded on all sides to the Greeks of Nice and Epirus. After a victory, which he owed to his perfidy rather than his courage, Theodore Angelus entered the kingdom of Thessalonica, expelled the feeble Demetrius, the son of the Marquis Boniface, erected his standard on the walls of Adrianople and added, by his vanity, a third or a fourth name to the list of rival emperors. The relics of the Asiatic province were swept away by John Vatases, the son-in-law and successor of Theodore Lascaris, and who, in a triumphant reign of thirty-three years, displayed the virtues both of peace and war. Under his discipline, the swords of the French mercenaries were the most effectual instruments of his conquests, and their desertion from the service of their country was at once a symptom and a cause of the rising ascendant of the Greeks. By the construction of a fleet, he obtained the command of the Hellespont, 
reduced the islands of Lesbos and Rhodes, attacked the Venetians of Candia, and intercepted the rare and parsimonious succors of the West. Once, and once only, the Latin emperor sent an army against Vataces, and in the defeat of that army, the veteran knights, the last of the original conquerors, were left on the field of battle. But the success of a foreign enemy was less painful to the pusillanimous Robert than the insolence of his Latin subjects, who confounded the weakness of the emperor and of the empire. His personal misfortunes will prove the anarchy of the government and the ferociousness of the times. The amorous youth had neglected his Greek bride, the daughter of Vataces, to introduce into the palace a beautiful maid, of a private, though noble family of Artois. And her mother had been tempted by the luster of the purple to forfeit her engagements with a gentleman of Burgundy. His love was converted into rage. He assembled his friends, forced the palace gates, threw the mother into the sea, and inhumanly cut off the nose and lips of the wife or concubine of the emperor. Instead of punishing the offender, the barons avowed and applauded the savage deed, 7538 which, as a prince and as a man, it was impossible that Robert should forgive. He escaped from the guilty city to implore the justice or compassion of the Pope, the Emperor was coolly exhorted to return to his station, before he could obey, he sunk under the weight of grief, shame, and impotent resentment. 7539. It was only in the age of chivalry, that valor could ascend from a private station to the thrones of Jerusalem and Constantinople. The titular kingdom of Jerusalem had devolved to Mary, the daughter of Isabella and Conrad of Montferrat, and the granddaughter of Almeric or Amaury. She was given to John of Brienne, of a noble family in Champagne, by the public voice, and the judgment of Philip Augustus, who named him as the most worthy champion of the Holy Land. 7540 In the Fifth Crusade, he led a hundred thousand Latins to the conquest of Egypt, by him the siege of Damietta was achieved, and the subsequent failure was justly ascribed to the pride and avarice of the legate. After the marriage of his daughter with Frederick II, 7541 he was provoked by the emperor's ingratitude to accept the command of the army of the church. And though advanced in life, and despoiled of royalty, the sword and spirit of John of Brienne were still ready for the service of Christendom. In the seven years of his brother's reign, Baldwin of Courtney had not emerged from a state of childhood, and the barons of Romania felt the strong necessity of placing the scepter in the hands of a man and a hero. The veteran king of Jerusalem might have disdained the name and office of regent. They agreed to invest him for his life with the title and prerogatives of emperor, on the sole condition that Baldwin should marry his second daughter, and succeed at a mature age to the throne of Constantinople. The expectation, both of the Greeks and Latins, was kindled by the renown, the choice, and the presence of John of Brienne. And they admired his martial aspect, his green and vigorous age of more than fourscore years, and his size and stature, which surpassed the common measure of mankind. 7542 But avarice, and the love of ease, appear to have chilled the ardor of enterprise. 7543 His troops were disbanded, and two years rolled away without action or honor, till he was awakened by the dangerous alliance of Vatace's emperor of Nice and of Azen king of Bulgaria. They besieged Constantinople by sea and land, with an army of one hundred thousand men, and a fleet of three hundred ships of war. While the entire force of the Latin emperor was reduced to one hundred and sixty knights, and a small addition of sergeants and archers. I tremble to relate, that instead of defending the city, the hero made a sally at the head of his cavalry. And that of forty-eight squadrons of the enemy, no more than three escaped from the edge of his invincible sword. Fired by his example, the infantry and the citizens boarded the vessels that anchored close to the walls. And twenty-five were dragged in triumph into the harbour of Constantinople. At the summons of the emperor, the vassals and allies armed in her defence, broke through every obstacle that opposed their passage. And, in the succeeding year, obtained a second victory over the same enemies. By the rude poets of the age, John of Brienne is compared to Hector, Roland, and Judas Maccabeus, 7544, but their credit, and his glory, received some abatement from the silence of the Greeks. The empire was soon deprived of the last of her champions. And the dying monarch was ambitious to enter paradise in the habit of a Franciscan friar. 
7545. In the double victory of John of Brienne, I cannot discover the name or exploits of his pupil Baldwin, who had attained the age of military service, and who succeeded to the imperial dignity on the decease of his adoptive father. 7546 The royal youth was employed on a commission more suitable to his temper, he was sent to visit the western courts, of the Pope more especially, and of the King of France, to excite their pity by the view of his innocence and distress. And to obtain some supplies of men or money for the relief of the sinking empire. He thrice repeated these mendicant visits, in which he seemed to prolong his stay and postpone his return. Of the five and twenty years of his reign, a greater number were spent abroad than at home, and in no place did the emperor deem himself less free and secure than in his native country and his capital. On some public occasions, his vanity might be soothed by the title of Augustus, and by the honours of the purple. And at the General Council of Lyons, when Frederick II was excommunicated and deposed, his Oriental colleague was enthroned on the right hand of the Pope. But how often was the exile, the vagrant, the imperial beggar, humbled with scorn, insulted with pity, and degraded in his own eyes and those of the nations. In his first visit to England, he was stopped at Dover by a severe reprimand, that he should presume, without leave, to enter an independent kingdom. After some delay, Baldwin, however, was permitted to pursue his journey, was entertained with cold civility, and thankfully departed with a present of seven hundred marks. 7547 From the avarice of Rome he could only obtain the proclamation of a crusade, and a treasure of indulgences, a coin whose currency was depreciated by too frequent and indiscriminate abuse. His birth and misfortunes recommended him to the generosity of his cousin Louis IX, but the martial zeal of the saint was diverted from Constantinople to Egypt and Palestine. And the public and private poverty of Baldwin was alleviated, for a moment, by the alienation of the Marquisate of Namur and the Lordship of Courtney, the last remains of his inheritance. 7548 By such shameful or ruinous expedients, he once more returned to Romania, with an army of 30,000 soldiers, whose numbers were doubled in the apprehension of the Greeks. His first dispatches to France and England announced his victories and his hopes, he had reduced the country round the capital to the distance of three days' journey. And if he succeeded against an important, though nameless, city, most probably Caiorli, the frontier would be safe and the passage accessible. But these expectations, if Baldwin was sincere, quickly vanished like a dream, the troops and treasures of France melted away in his unskillful hands. And the throne of the Latin emperor was protected by a dishonorable alliance with the Turks and Comans. To secure the former, he consented to bestow his niece on the unbelieving Sultan of Cogni. To please the latter, he complied with their pagan rites, a dog was sacrificed between the two armies, and the contracting parties tasted each other's blood, as a pledge of their fidelity. 7549 In the palace, or prison, of Constantinople, the successor of Augustus demolished the vacant houses for winter fuel, and stripped the lead from the churches for the daily expense of his family. Some usurious loans were dealt with a scanty hand by the merchants of Italy, and Philip, his son and heir, was pawned at Venice as the security for a debt. 7550 Thirst, hunger, and nakedness, are positive evils, but wealth is relative. And a prince who would be rich in a private station, may be exposed by the increase of his wants to all the anxiety and bitterness of poverty. But in this abject distress, the emperor and empire were still possessed of an ideal treasure, which drew its fantastic value from the superstition of the Christian world. The merit of the true cross was somewhat impaired by its frequent division. And a long captivity among the infidels might shed some suspicion on the fragments that were produced in the East and West. But another relic of the passion was preserved in the imperial chapel of Constantinople. And the crown of thorns which had been placed on the head of Christ was equally precious and authentic. It had formerly been the practice of the Egyptian debtors to deposit, as a security, the mummies of their parents. And both their honor and religion were bound for the redemption of the pledge. In the same manner, and in the absence of the emperor, the barons of Romania borrowed the sum of 13,134 pieces of gold 7551 on the credit of the Holy Crown, they failed in the performance of their contract. And a rich Venetian, Nicholas Carini, 
undertook to satisfy their impatient creditors, on condition that the relic should be lodged at Venice, to become his absolute property, if it were not redeemed within a short and definite term. The barons apprised their sovereign of the hard treaty and impending loss and as the empire could not afford a ransom of seven thousand pounds sterling, Baldwin was anxious to snatch the prize from the Venetians. And to vest it with more honour and emolument in the hands of the most Christian king. 7552 Yet the negotiation was attended with some delicacy. In the purchase of relics, the saint would have started at the guilt of simony. But if the mode of expression were changed, he might lawfully repay the debt, accept the gift, and acknowledge the obligation. His ambassadors, two Dominicans, were dispatched to Venice to redeem and receive the holy crown which had escaped the dangers of the sea and the galleys of that aces. On opening a wooden box, they recognized the seals of the doge and barons, which were applied on a shrine of silver, and within this shrine the monument of the passion was enclosed in a golden vase. The reluctant Venetians yielded to justice and power, the Emperor Frederick granted a free and honorable passage. The court of France advanced as far as Troyes in Champagne, to meet with devotion this inestimable relic, it was borne in triumph through Paris by the king himself, barefoot, and in his shirt. And a free gift of ten thousand marks of silver reconciled Baldwin to his loss. The success of this transaction tempted the Latin emperor to offer with the same generosity the remaining furniture of his chapel. 7553 A large and authentic portion of the true cross, the baby linen of the Son of God, the lance, the sponge, and the chain, of his passion, the rod of Moses, and part of the skull of St. John the Baptist. For the reception of these spiritual treasures, twenty thousand marks were expended by St. Louis on a stately foundation, the Holy Chapel of Paris, on which the Muse of Boileau has bestowed a comic immortality. The truth of such remote and ancient relics, which cannot be proved by any human testimony, must be admitted by those who believe in the miracles which they have performed. About the middle of the last age, an inveterate ulcer was touched and cured by a holy prickle of the holy crown, 7554 The prodigy is attested by the most pious and enlightened Christians of France. Nor will the fact be easily disproved, except by those who are armed with a general antidote against religious credulity. 7555. The Latins of Constantinople 7556 were on all sides encompassed and pressed. Their sole hope, the last delay of their ruin, was in the division of their Greek and Bulgarian enemies, and of this hope they were deprived by the superior arms and policy of Vataces, Emperor of Nice. From the Propontis to the rocky coast of Pamphylia, Asia was peaceful and prosperous under his reign, and the events of every campaign extended his influence in Europe. The strong cities of the hills of Macedonia and Thrace were rescued from the Bulgarians, and their kingdom was circumscribed by its present and proper limits, along the southern banks of the Danube. The sole emperor of the Romans could no longer brook that a lord of Epirus, a Comnenian prince of the West, should presume to dispute or share the honours of the purple. And the humble Demetrius changed the colour of his buskins, and accepted with gratitude the appellation of despot. His own subjects were exasperated by his baseness and incapacity, they implored the protection of their supreme lord. After some resistance, the kingdom of Thessalonica was united to the empire of Nice, and Vataces reigned without a competitor from the Turkish borders to the Adriatic Gulf. The princes of Europe revered his merit and power. And had he subscribed an orthodox creed, it should seem that the Pope would have abandoned without reluctance the Latin throne of Constantinople. But the death of Vataces, the short and busy reign of Theodore his son, and the helpless infancy of his grandson John, suspended the restoration of the Greeks. In the next chapter, I shall explain their domestic revolutions. In this place, it will be sufficient to observe, that the young prince was oppressed by the ambition of his guardian and colleague, Michael Paleologus, who displayed the virtues and vices that belonged to the founder of a new dynasty. The Emperor Baldwin had flattered himself, that he might recover some provinces or cities by an impotent negotiation. His ambassadors were dismissed from Nice with mockery and contempt. At every place which they named, Paleologus alleged some special reason, which rendered it dear and valuable in his eyes, in the one he was born, in another he had been first promoted to military command. And in a third he had enjoyed, 
and hoped long to enjoy, the pleasures of the chase. And what then do you propose to give us, said the astonished deputies. Nothing, replied the Greek, not a foot of land. If your master be desirous of peace, let him pay me, as an annual tribute, the sum which he receives from the trade and customs of Constantinople. On these terms, I may allow him to reign. If he refuses, it is war. I am not ignorant of the art of war, and I trust the event to God and my sword. 7557 An expedition against the despot of Epirus was the first prelude of his arms. If a victory was followed by a defeat. If the race of the Conmany or Angeli survived in those mountains his efforts and his reign, the captivity of Villa Harduin, Prince of Achaia, deprived the Latins of the most active and powerful vassal of their expiring monarchy. The republics of Venice and Genoa disputed, in the first of their naval wars, the command of the sea and the commerce of the east. Pride and interest attached the Venetians to the defense of Constantinople. Their rivals were tempted to promote the designs of her enemies, and the alliance of the Genoese with the schismatic conqueror provoked the indignation of the Latin Church. 7558. Intent on his great object, the Emperor Michael visited in person and strengthened the troops and fortifications of Thrace. The remains of the Latins were driven from their last possessions, he assaulted without success the suburb of Galata. And corresponded with a perfidious baron, who proved unwilling, or unable, to open the gates of the metropolis. The next spring, his favorite general, Alexius Stratagopulus, whom he had decorated with the title of Caesar, passed the Hellespont with 800 horse and some infantry, 7559 on a secret expedition. His instructions enjoined him to approach, to listen, to watch, but not to risk any doubtful or dangerous enterprise against the city. The adjacent territory between the Propontis and the Black Sea was cultivated by a hardy race of peasants and outlaws, exercised in arms, uncertain in their allegiance, but inclined by language, religion, and present advantage. To the party of the Greeks. They were styled the Volunteers, 7560 and by their free service the army of Alexius, with the regulars of Thrace and the Coleman Auxiliaries, 7561 was augmented to the number of five and twenty thousand men. By the ardor of the volunteers, and by his own ambition, the Caesar was stimulated to disobey the precise orders of his master, in the just confidence that success would plead his pardon and reward. The weakness of Constantinople, and the distress and terror of the Latins, were familiar to the observation of the volunteers, and they represented the present moment as the most propitious to surprise and conquest. A rash youth, the new governor of the Venetian colony, had sailed away with thirty galleys, and the best of the French knights, on a wild expedition to Daphnusia, a town on the Black Sea, at the distance of forty leagues. 7562 and the remaining Latins were without strength or suspicion. They were informed that Alexius had passed the Hellespont, but their apprehensions were lulled by the smallness of his original numbers. And their imprudence had not watched the subsequent increase of his army. If he left his main body to second and support his operations, he might advance unperceived in the night with a chosen detachment. While some applied scaling ladders to the lowest part of the walls, they were secure of an old Greek, who would introduce their companions through a subterraneous passage into his house. They could soon on the inside break an entrance through the Golden Gate, which had been long obstructed, and the conqueror would be in the heart of the city before the Latins were conscious of their danger. After some debate, the Caesar resigned himself to the faith of the volunteers, they were trusty, bold, and successful, and in describing the plan, I have already related the execution in success. 7563 But no sooner had Alexius passed the threshold of the Golden Gate, than he trembled at his own rashness, he paused, he deliberated. Till the desperate volunteers urged him forwards, by the assurance that in retreat lay the greatest and most inevitable danger. Whilst the Caesar kept his regulars in firm array, the Comans dispersed themselves on all sides. An alarm was sounded, and the threats of fire and pillage compelled the citizens to a decisive resolution. The Greeks of Constantinople remembered their native sovereigns, the Genoese merchants their recent alliance and Venetian foes. Every quarter was in arms, and the air resounded with a general acclamation of long life and victory to Michael and John, the august emperors of the Romans. 
Their rival, Baldwin, was awakened by the sound. But the most pressing danger could not prompt him to draw his sword in the defense of a city which he deserted, perhaps, with more pleasure than regret, he fled from the palace to the seashore. Where he described the welcome sails of the fleet returning from the vain and fruitless attempt on Daphnusia. Constantinople was irrecoverably lost. But the Latin emperor and the principal families embarked on board the Venetian galleys, and steered for the Isle of Yuba, and afterwards for Italy. Where the royal fugitive was entertained by the Pope and Sicilian king with a mixture of contempt and pity. From the loss of Constantinople to his death, he consumed thirteen years, soliciting the Catholic powers to join in his restoration, the lesson had been familiar to his youth. Nor was his last exile more indigent or shameful than his three former pilgrimages to the courts of Europe. His son Philip was the heir of an ideal empire. And the pretensions of his daughter Catherine were transported by her marriage to Charles of Valois, the brother of Philip the Fair, King of France. The House of Courtney was represented in the female line by successive alliances, till the title of Emperor of Constantinople, too bulky and sonorous for a private name, modestly expired in silence and oblivion. 7564. After this narrative of the expeditions of the Latins to Palestine and Constantinople, I cannot dismiss the subject without resolving the general consequences on the countries that were the scene, and on the nations that were the actors. Of these memorable crusades. 7565 As soon as the arms of the Franks were withdrawn, the impression, though not the memory, was erased in the Mahometan realms of Egypt and Syria. The faithful disciples of the Prophet were never tempted by a profane desire to study the laws or language of the idolaters. Nor did the simplicity of their primitive manners receive the slightest alteration from their intercourse in peace and war with the unknown strangers of the West. The Greeks, who thought themselves proud, but who were only vain, showed a disposition somewhat less inflexible. In the efforts for the recovery of their empire, they emulated the valor, discipline, and tactics of their antagonists. The modern literature of the West they might justly despise. But its free spirit would instruct them in the rights of man, and some institutions of public and private life were adopted from the French. The correspondence of Constantinople and Italy diffused the knowledge of the Latin tongue, and several of the fathers and classics were at length honored with a Greek version. 7566 But the national and religious prejudices of the Orientals were inflamed by persecution, and the reign of the Latins confirmed the separation of the two churches. If we compare the era of the Crusades, the Latins of Europe with the Greeks and Arabians, their respective degrees of knowledge, industry, and art, our rude ancestors must be content with the third rank in the scale of nations. Their successive improvement and present superiority may be ascribed to a peculiar energy of character, to an active and imitative spirit, unknown to their more polished rivals, who at that time were in a stationary or retrograde state. With such a disposition, the Latins should have derived the most early and essential benefits from a series of events which opened to their eyes the prospect of the world. And introduced them to a long and frequent intercourse with the more cultivated regions of the East. The first and most obvious progress was in trade and manufactures, in the arts which are strongly prompted by the thirst of wealth, the calls of necessity, and the gratification of the sense or vanity. Among the crowd of unthinking fanatics, a captive or a pilgrim might sometimes observe the superior refinements of Cairo and Constantinople, the first importer of windmills 7567 was the benefactor of nations. And if such blessings are enjoyed without any grateful remembrance, history has condescended to notice the more apparent luxuries of silk and sugar, which were transported into Italy from Greece and Egypt. But the intellectual wants of the Latins were more slowly felt and supplied, the ardor of studious curiosity was awakened in Europe by different causes and more recent events. And, in the age of the Crusades, they viewed with careless indifference the literature of the Greeks and Arabians. Some rudiments of mathematical and medicinal knowledge might be imparted in practice and in figures. Necessity might produce some interpreters for the grosser business of merchants and soldiers, but the commerce of the Orientals had not diffused the study and knowledge of their languages in the schools of Europe. 7568 If a similar principle of religion repulsed the idiom of the Quran, 
it should have excited their patience and curiosity to understand the original text of the Gospel. And the same grammar would have unfolded the sense of Plato and the beauties of Homer. Yet in a reign of sixty years, the Latins of Constantinople disdained the speech and learning of their subjects. And the manuscripts were the only treasures which the natives might enjoy without rapine or envy. Aristotle was indeed the oracle of the Western universities, but it was a barbarous Aristotle. And, instead of ascending to the fountain head, his Latin votaries humbly accepted a corrupt and remote version, from the Jews and Moors of Andalusia. The principle of the Crusades was a savage fanaticism. And the most important effects were analogous to the cause. Each pilgrim was ambitious to return with his sacred spoils, the relics of Greece and Palestine, 7569 and each relic was preceded and followed by a train of miracles and visions. The belief of the Catholics was corrupted by new legends, their practice by new superstitions. And the establishment of the Inquisition, the mendicant orders of monks and friars, the last abuse of indulgences, and the final progress of idolatry, flowed from the baleful fountain of the Holy War. The active spirit of the Latins preyed on the vitals of their reason and religion, and if the ninth and tenth centuries were the times of darkness, the thirteenth and fourteenth were the age of absurdity and fable. In the profession of Christianity, in the cultivation of a fertile land, the northern conquerors of the Roman Empire insensibly mingled with the provincials, and rekindled the embers of the arts of antiquity. Their settlements about the age of Charlemagne had acquired some degree of order and stability, when they were overwhelmed by new swarms of invaders, the Normans, Saracens, 7570 and Hungarians, who replunged the western countries of Europe into their former state of anarchy and barbarism. About the 11th century, the second tempest had subsided by the expulsion or conversion of the enemies of Christendom, the tide of civilization, which had so long ebbed, began to flow with a steady and accelerated course. And a fairer prospect was open to the hopes and efforts of the rising generations. Great was the increase, and rapid the progress, during the two hundred years of the Crusades. And some philosophers have applauded the propitious influence of these holy wars, which appear to me to have checked rather than forwarded the maturity of Europe. 7571 The lives and labors of millions, which were buried in the East, would have been more profitably employed in the improvement of their native country, the accumulated stock of industry and wealth would have overflowed in navigation and trade. And the Latins would have been enriched and enlightened by a pure and friendly correspondence with the climates of the East. In one respect I can indeed perceive the accidental operation of the Crusades, not so much in producing a benefit as in removing an evil. The larger portion of the inhabitants of Europe was chained to the soil, without freedom, or property, or knowledge, and the two orders of ecclesiastics and nobles, whose numbers were comparatively small, alone deserved the name of citizens and men. This oppressive system was supported by the arts of the clergy and the swords of the barons. The authority of the priests operated in the darker ages as a salutary antidote, they prevented the total extinction of letters, mitigated the fierceness of the times, sheltered the poor and defenseless, and preserved or revived the peace and order of civil society. But the independence, rapine, and discord of the feudal lords were unmixed with any semblance of good, and every hope of industry and improvement was crushed by the iron weight of the martial aristocracy. Among the causes that undermine that Gothic edifice, a conspicuous place must be allowed to the Crusades. The estates of the barons were dissipated, and their race was often extinguished, in these costly and perilous expeditions. Their poverty extorted from their pride those charters of freedom which unlocked the fetters of the slave, secured the farm of the peasant and the shop of the artificer, and gradually restored a substance and a soul to the most numerous and useful part of the community. The conflagration which destroyed the tall and barren trees of the forest gave air and scope to the vegetation of the smaller and nutritive plants of the soil. 7572. Digression on the family of Courtney. The purple of three emperors, who have reigned at Constantinople, will authorize or excuse a digression on the origin and singular fortunes of the House of Courtney. 7573 in the three principal branches, I, of Edessa, two. Of France and three. Of England, of which the last only has survived the revolutions of eight hundred years. I. 
Before the introduction of trade, which scatters riches, and of knowledge, which dispels prejudice, the prerogative of birth is most strongly felt and most humbly acknowledged. In every age, the laws and manners of the Germans have discriminated the ranks of society, the dukes and counts, who shared the empire of Charlemagne, converted their office to an inheritance. And to his children, each feudal lord bequeathed his honor and his sword. The proudest families are content to lose, in the darkness of the Middle Ages, the tree of their pedigree, which, however deep and lofty, must ultimately rise from a plebeian root. And their historians must descend ten centuries below the Christian era, before they can ascertain any lineal succession by the evidence of surnames, of arms, and of authentic records. With the first rays of light, 7574 we discern the nobility in opulence of Atho, a French knight, his nobility, in the rank and title of a nameless father. His opulence, in the foundation of the castle of Courtney in the district of Gatinois, about 56 miles to the south of Paris. From the reign of Robert, the son of Hugh Capet, the barons of Courtney are conspicuous among the immediate vassals of the crown, and Jocelyn, the grandson of Atho and a noble dame, is enrolled among the heroes of the First Crusade. A domestic alliance, their mothers were sisters, attached him to the standard of Baldwin of Bruges, the second count of Edessa, a princely fief, which he was worthy to receive, and able to maintain, announces the number of his martial followers. And after the departure of his cousin, Jocelyn himself was invested with the county of Edessa on both sides of the Euphrates. By economy and peace, his territories were replenished with Latin and Syrian subjects. His magazines with corn, wine, and oil, his castles with gold and silver, with arms and horses. In a holy warfare of thirty years, he was alternately a conqueror and a captive, but he died like a soldier, in a horse litter at the head of his troops. And his last glance beheld the flight of the Turkish invaders who had presumed on his age and infirmities. His son and successor, of the same name, was less deficient in valor than in vigilance. But he sometimes forgot that dominion is acquired and maintained by the same arms. He challenged the hostility of the Turks, without securing the friendship of the Prince of Antioch. And, amidst the peaceful luxury of Turbasil, in Syria, 7575 Jocelyn neglected the defense of the Christian frontier beyond the Euphrates. In his absence, Zengi, the first of the Atabeks, besieged and stormed his capital, Edessa, which was feebly defended by a timorous and disloyal crowd of Orientals, the Franks were oppressed in a bold attempt for its recovery. And Courtney ended his days in the prison of Aleppo. He still left a fair and ample patrimony but the victorious Turks oppressed on all sides the weakness of a widow and orphan. And, for the equivalent of an annual pension, they resigned to the Greek emperor the charge of defending, and the shame of losing, the last relics of the Latin conquest. The Countess Dowager of Edessa retired to Jerusalem with her two children. The daughter, Agnes, became the wife and mother of a king, the son, Jocelyn III, accepted the office of Seneschal, the first of the kingdom, and held his new estates in Palestine by the service of fifty knights. His name appears with honor in the transactions of peace and war, but he finally vanishes in the fall of Jerusalem, and the name of Courtney, in this branch of Edessa, was lost by the marriage of his two daughters with a French and German baron. 7576. 2. While Jocelyn reigned beyond the Euphrates, his elder brother Milo, the son of Jocelyn, the son of Atho, continued, near the Seine, to possess the castle of their fathers, which was at length inherited by Reynaud, or Reginald. The youngest of his three sons. Examples of genius or virtue must be rare in the annals of the oldest families, and, in a remote age their pride will embrace a deed of rapine and violence. Such, however, as could not be perpetrated without some superiority of courage, or, at least, of power. A descendant of Reginald of Courtney may blush for the public robber, who stripped and imprisoned several merchants, after they had satisfied the king's duties at Sens and Orleans. He will glory in the offense, since the bold offender could not be compelled to obedience and restitution, till the regent and the Count of Champagne prepared to march against him at the head of an army. 7577 Reginald bestowed his estates on his eldest daughter, 
and his daughter on the seventh son of King Louis the Fat, and their marriage was crowned with a numerous offspring. We might expect that a private should have merged in a royal name. And that the descendants of Peter of France and Elizabeth of Courtney would have enjoyed the titles and honours of princes of the blood. But this legitimate claim was long neglected, and finally denied. And the causes of their disgrace will represent the story of this second branch. 1. Of all the families now extant, the most ancient, doubtless, and the most illustrious, is the House of France, which has occupied the same throne above 800 years, and descends, in a clear and lineal series of males. From the middle of the 9th century. 7578 In the age of the Crusades, it was already revered both in the East and West. But from Hugh Capet to the marriage of Peter, no more than five reigns or generations had elapsed. And so precarious was their title, that the eldest sons, as a necessary precaution, were previously crowned during the lifetime of their fathers. The peers of France have long maintained their precedency before the younger branches of the royal line, nor had the princes of the blood, in the twelfth century, acquired that hereditary luster which is now diffused over the most remote candidates for the succession. 2. The barons of Courtney must have stood high in their own estimation, and in that of the world. Since they could impose on the son of a king the obligation of adopting for himself and all his descendants the name and arms of their daughter and his wife. In the marriage of an heiress with her inferior or her equal, such exchange was often required and allowed, but as they continued to diverge from the regal stem, the sons of Louis the Fat were insensibly confounded with their maternal ancestors. And the new Courtenays might deserve to forfeit the honours of their birth, which a motive of interest had tempted them to renounce. 3. The shame was far more permanent than the reward, and a momentary blaze was followed by a long darkness. The eldest son of these nuptials, Peter of Courtney, had married, as I have already mentioned, the sister of the Counts of Flanders, the two first emperors of Constantinople, he rashly accepted the invitation of the barons of Romania. His two sons, Robert and Baldwin, successively held and lost the remains of the Latin Empire in the east, and the granddaughter of Baldwin II again mingled her blood with the blood of France and of Valois. To support the expenses of a troubled and transitory reign, their patrimonial estates were mortgaged or sold, and the last emperors of Constantinople depended on the annual charity of Rome and Naples. While the elder brothers dissipated their wealth in romantic adventures, and the castle of Courtney was profaned by a plebeian owner, the younger branches of that adopted name were propagated and multiplied. But their splendor was clouded by poverty and time, after the decease of Robert, great butler of France, they descended from princes to barons, the next generations were confounded with the simple gentry. The descendants of Hugh Capet could no longer be visible in the rural lords of Tanley and of Champignols. The more adventurous embraced without dishonor the profession of a soldier, the least active and opulent might sink, like their cousins of the branch of Drill, into the condition of peasants. Their royal descent, in a dark period of four hundred years, became each day more obsolete and ambiguous. And their pedigree, instead of being enrolled in the annals of the kingdom, must be painfully searched by the minute diligence of heralds and genealogists. It was not till the end of the sixteenth century, on the accession of a family almost as remote as their own, that the princely spirit of the Courtenays again revived. And the question of the nobility provoked them to ascertain the royalty of their blood. They appealed to the justice and compassion of Henry IV. Obtained a favorable opinion from twenty lawyers of Italy and Germany, and modestly compared themselves to the descendants of King David, whose prerogatives were not impaired by the lapse of ages or the trade of a carpenter. 75-79 But every ear was deaf, and every circumstance was adverse, to their lawful claims. The Bourbon kings were justified by the neglect of the Valois. The princes of the blood, more recent and lofty, disdained the alliance of his humble kindred, the Parliament, without denying their proofs, eluded a dangerous precedent by an arbitrary distinction, and established as T. Lewis as the first father of the royal line. Point seventy-five eighty a repetition of complaints and protests was repeatedly disregarded, and the hopeless pursuit was terminated in the present century by the death of the last male of the family. 
7581 Their painful and anxious situation was alleviated by the pride of conscious virtue, they sternly rejected the temptations of fortune and favor. And the dying Courtney would have sacrificed his son, if the youth could have renounced, for any temporal interest, the right and title of a legitimate prince of the blood of France. 7582. 3. According to the old register of Ford Abbey, the Courtneys of Devonshire are descended from Prince Floris, the second son of Peter, and the grandson of Louis the Fat. 7583 This fable of the grateful or venal monks was too respectfully entertained by our antiquaries, Camden 7584 and Dugdale, 7585 but it is so clearly repugnant to truth and time. That the rational pride of the family now refuses to accept this imaginary founder. Their most faithful historians believe, that, after giving his daughter to the king's son, Reginald of Courtney abandoned his possessions in France, and obtained from the English monarch a second wife and a new inheritance. It is certain, at least, that Henry II distinguished in his camps and councils a Reginald, of the name and arms, and, as it may be fairly presumed, of the genuine race, of the Courtneys of France. The right of wardship enabled a feudal lord to reward his vassal with the marriage and estate of a noble heiress, and Reginald of Courtney acquired a fair establishment in Devonshire, where his posterity has been seated above six hundred years. 7586 From a Norman baron, Baldwin de Bryonius, who had been invested by the conqueror, Hawise, the wife of Reginald, derived the honour of Oakhampton, which was held by the service of ninety-three knights. And a female might claim the manly offices of hereditary viscount or sheriff, and of captain of the royal castle of Exeter. Their son Robert married the sister of the Earl of Devon, at the end of a century, on the failure of the family of Rivers 7587 his great-grandson, Hugh II, succeeded to a title which was still considered as a territorial dignity. And twelve earls of Devonshire, of the name of Courtney, have flourished in a period of two hundred and twenty years. They were ranked among the chief of the barons of the realm. Nor was it till after a strenuous dispute, that they yielded to the fief of Arundel the first place in the Parliament of England, their alliances were contracted with the noblest families, the Veres, Dispensers, St. Johns, Talbots, Bohuns, and even the Plantagenets themselves. And in a contest with John of Lancaster, a Courtney, Bishop of London, and afterwards Archbishop of Canterbury, might be accused of profane confidence in the strength and number of his kindred. In peace, the earls of Devon resided in their numerous castles and manors of the West, their ample revenue was appropriated to devotion and hospitality. And the epitaph of Edward, surnamed from his misfortune, the blind, from his virtues, the good, earl, inculcates with much ingenuity a moral sentence, which may, however, be abused by thoughtless generosity. After a grateful commemoration of the fifty-five years of union and happiness which he enjoyed with Mabe his wife, the good earl thus speaks from the tomb. What we gave, we have. What we spent, we had. What we left, we lost. 7588. But their losses, in this sense, were far superior to their gifts and expenses, and their heirs, not less than the poor, were the objects of their paternal care. The sums which they paid for livery and season attest the greatness of their possessions, and several estates have remained in their family since the 13th and 14th centuries. In war, the Courtneys of England fulfilled the duties, and deserved the honours, of chivalry. They were often entrusted to levy and command the militia of Devonshire and Cornwall, they often attended their supreme lord to the borders of Scotland. And in foreign service, for a stipulated price, they sometimes maintained fourscore men-at-arms and as many archers. By sea and land they fought under the standard of the Edwards and Henrys, their names are conspicuous in battles, in tournaments, and in the original list of the Order of the Garter, three brothers shared the Spanish victory of the Black Prince. And in the lapse of six generations, the English Courtneys had learned to despise the nation and country from which they derived their origin. In the quarrel of the two roses, the earls of Devon adhered to the house of Lancaster. And three brothers successively died either in the field or on the scaffold. Their honours and estates were restored by Henry VII, a daughter of Edward IV was not disgraced by the nuptials of a Courtney. 
Their son, who was created Marquis of Exeter, enjoyed the favour of his cousin Henry VIII, and in the camp of Cloth of Gold, he broke a lance against the French monarch. But the favour of Henry was the prelude of disgrace. His disgrace was the signal of death, and of the victims of the jealous tyrant, the Marquis of Exeter is one of the most noble and guiltless. His son Edward lived a prisoner in the tower, and died in exile at Padua. And the secret love of Queen Mary, whom he slighted, perhaps for the Princess Elizabeth, has shed a romantic color on the story of this beautiful youth. The relics of his patrimony were conveyed into strange families by the marriages of his four aunts, and his personal honors, as if they had been legally extinct, were revived by the patents of succeeding princes. But there still survived a lineal descendant of Hugh, the first Earl of Devon, a younger branch of the Courtenays, who have been seated at Powderham Castle above four hundred years, from the reign of Edward III to the present hour. Their estates have been increased by the grant and improvement of lands in Ireland, and they have been recently restored to the honours of the peerage. Yet the Courtenays still retain the plaintive motto, which asserts the innocence, and deplores the fall, of their ancient house. 7589 While they sigh for past greatness, they are doubtless sensible of present blessings, in the long series of the Courtney Annals, the most splendid era is likewise the most unfortunate. Nor can an opulent peer of Britain be inclined to envy the emperors of Constantinople, who wandered over Europe to solicit alms for the support of their dignity and the defence of their capital.